on America this morning, the record-breaking Arctic blast gripping the nation turns deadly. At least nine deaths now reported. Wind chills below zero in the deep south. Cars and trucks slip sliding away. And now parts of the country bracing for up to three feet of additional snow. Debate canceled. Why Nikki Haley has pulled out of the GOP primary debate just days before voters in New Hampshire make their choice. And this morning, Haley and Trump exchanging new attacks on everything from taxes to Social Security. The migrant crisis now turning into a housing crisis in several big cities as lawmakers consider billions more in taxpayer money to address the issue. We get an exclusive look at one migrant shelter housing mothers and their children seeking asylum. New evidence revealed against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer, what prosecutors say they found while following the suspect's daughter. Plus, more parents now choosing to homeschool their kids. What's behind the trend? The big retirement news from the NFL, a league favorite reportedly preparing to say goodbye. And the new crackdown at Costco. Get your membership card ready. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimber. Good Wednesday. I'm Rhiannon Alley. We want to begin with the extreme weather taking a deadly toll from the deep south all the way to the northeast. At least nine deaths are now being blamed on the Arctic conditions. Parts of Tennessee have seen twice their annual snowfall average. And below zero wind chill temperatures are expected again this morning. In the Northeast, two weather related deaths in New Jersey. That region is now bracing for even more snow on Friday. But we begin right now in the south. This morning, the record setting Arctic blast gripping much of the country has turned deadly in the south. At least six people have now died in Tennessee as a result of the extreme conditions. 11 inches of snow falling in Knoxville, wind chills plunging to 15 below zero. In Alabama, ice-covered roads made driving nearly impossible. These cars left stranded after sliding off the road. This tractor-trailer outside Birmingham swerving in all directions before jackknifing into the guardrail. And this truck sliding down a driveway after it was put in park. In Chicago, where it felt like 30 below zero, fires were lit under these train tracks to keep them free of snow and ice. Tesla vehicles were lining up at this charging station in Chicago. Owners say they had trouble charging their batteries in the extreme cold. At least 10 electric cars were reportedly towed from this charging station. In the Rockies, new avalanche warnings in Colorado after a series of deadly snow slides in neighboring states. New video shows the moment Bob Tillotson was rescued from an avalanche in Utah. Rescuers digging through feet of snow, finally saving Tillotson after about 15 minutes. But it appears no one can match Buffalo for snowfall totals. Another three feet of lake effect snow is expected by tomorrow night, on top of the 40 inches that forced the Bills game to be postponed over the weekend. Meanwhile, in the nation's capital, fun and games on the National Mall as people enjoyed a rare blast of winter. It's a lot of fun. I've been waiting a long time. More bitter cold extends from the Midwest to the deep south this morning, and the Midwest and Northeast could see more snow by this weekend. We'll check your forecast in a few minutes. Now to the race for the White House. Former President Trump is launching new attacks against former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley just six days before the New Hampshire primary. Here's ABC's Lana Moise. This morning, debate canceled. Thursday's GOP primary debate in New Hampshire scrapped after Nikki Haley pulled out, saying she'd only attend if former President Trump was also on stage. That's who I'm running against. There is nobody else I need to debate. I have had five strong debates and have done plenty of them. He can't hide forever. Trump, fresh off his landslide win in Iowa, now focusing his attacks on Haley, who's been surging in the polls in New Hampshire. Trump last night hitting Haley on taxes and social security she's not tough enough nikki haley supported a brutal 23 percent national sales tax which is a disaster by the way why she did it and that's why some people call her the nikki new tax i don't i don't think that's particularly good Haley's campaign slamming Trump, depicting him as a bully and a liar. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis, after his second place finish in Iowa, touted his record on tax cuts while speaking in New Hampshire last night. And I think what I represent is somebody that has delivered uh, on those key conservative policies that we've all been wanting to see in Washington, D.C. ABC's Rachel Scott spoke to voters in the Granite State where independents can vote in next week's primary. Basically, I'm up in the air about whether I'm going to support Trump or Haley. Well, 
I think Nikki Haley is a nice girl. I think she's very smart, but she won't touch Trump. She really won't. She won't. She won't touch him at all. Haley is also making headlines after being asked on Fox News yesterday whether being a woman of color hurts her chances at winning the nomination. We're not a racist country, Brian. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Are we perfect? No. In the meantime, President Biden weighing in on the race. I'm still the only person to ever beat Donald Trump. And I'm looking forward to it again for the good of this country. Today, Trump is expected back in a New York courtroom for his defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Carroll. She is expected to take the stand. The jury is deciding whether damages should be awarded for comments Trump made about Carroll's sexual assault allegations. He was already found liable for sexually abusing her. Rhiannon, Andrew. Lionel, thank you. The Biden administration is expected to relist Yemen's Houthi rebels as a terrorist group after the U.S. carried out a new airstrike against them, destroying more missiles. This latest strike is in response to a series of attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea, impacting global trade. The Houthis are supported by Iran. The CEO of Chevron warns oil prices could rise quickly if the attacks lead to a major disruption in shipments. New help for Israeli hostages being held by Hamas for more than 100 days now. The government of Qatar says a deal has been reached to deliver medicine to the hostages. It comes after Israel confirmed the deaths of two hostages seen in a recent Hamas video. The agreement reached by Qatar also provides more aid for Gaza. We turn now to the migrant crisis, which is also a housing crisis in several big cities. The extreme winter weather only adding to the challenges. This morning, ABC News is streaming channel ABC News Live, getting an exclusive look at a New York City migrant shelter that houses mothers and their children seeking asylum. We're at capacity for everyone. We really don't have any room at all. Christine Quinn, whose organization runs the shelter, says most of those staying here do not qualify for housing benefits or food stamps, making it difficult for them to move out and provide for their families. Families. And now, with the bitter winter cold settling in, many are unprepared. These families came to us and continue to come with the t-shirt on their back and the flip-flops on their feet. They're not ready for snow. They don't have winter jackets. New York's governor yesterday requested more than $2 billion to provide housing and health care for the roughly 70,000 migrants currently in the state, many of them sent by bus from Texas. This is the right thing to do for the migrants and for the city of New York. Continue focusing on securing work authorization and put the migrants and asylum workers to work. In Illinois, the governor has announced $17 million in new funds for Chicago suburbs that agreed to house migrants. Hundreds have been sleeping on city buses to keep warm. Many arrived wearing only shorts and T-shirts. Migrant crossings at the U.S. southern border hit a record high last month. Today, President Biden is meeting with congressional leaders, urging them to pass new border security funds, part of a $106 billion funding request that also includes money for the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. As part of that spending plan, Republicans have demanded stricter asylum laws and also expanded deportations. JetBlue and Spirit are deciding whether to appeal a federal judge's decision blocking their $3.8 billion merger. The Justice Department opposed the deal, saying it would lead to higher airfares. JetBlue and Spirit insist they need help competing with bigger airlines. A 10-year-old from Maryland is the latest visitor to the Bahamas to be bitten by a shark. Police say the boy was injured during a shark tank expedition at a resort on Paradise Island. He is reportedly in stable condition this morning. And just last month, a Massachusetts woman was killed by a shark in the Bahamas. Time now for your Wednesday weather. Good morning. Waking up below zero again today from Chicago back to Omaha. Wake up weather will be the same in New York City as it will be in Houston, Texas. 19 degrees. Watch out for slick spots on the roads. Meantime, today will be dry and cool for most of the country. Some lake effect snow and some ice this morning in Portland, Oregon. Our next storm comes out of Texas on Thursday into Thursday night. The snow will spread through Friday night one to three inches into the early part of the weekend from Boston to D.C. I'm Mackie with a meteorologist Kevin Coskren. Coming up, a new crackdown at Costco. But first, the new evidence against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer. 
What prosecutors say they found while following the suspect's daughter. And cicada invasion, a warning about this upcoming spring. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Back now with the sound of cicadas, which are coming back in force in just a few months. Experts warn two different groups will emerge from the ground in late spring across the Midwest and Southeast. It will be the first double cicada emergence in more than 200 years. The two cicada broods are expected to hit Illinois and Indiana the hardest. New evidence has been revealed in the case against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer in New York. But prosecutors say the investigation isn't over yet. Here's ABC's Andrea Fuji. This morning, the accused serial killer charged with murdering three women in New York is now charged with killing a fourth. The victim's daughter speaking publicly for the first time. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Maureen Brainard Barnes went missing in 2007 while working as an escort. Her body was found near three other women buried near Gilgo Beach on Long Island, New York. Rex Hewerman was already charged in the deaths of Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, and Melissa Bartholomew. They were known as the Gilgo Four as their deaths went unsolved for more than a decade. There are countless times I needed her and she was not there. I remember she read to me every night and now I can no longer remember the sound of her voice. Now prosecutors have revealed how they were able to link Hewerman to Brainard Barnes. The biggest uh, change is the DNA evidence. They say investigators followed Hewerman's daughter, who was not implicated in any of the killings, and were able to extract her DNA from a discarded drink, which linked Hewerman to the murder. The hair that was found on uh, Brainard uh, Barnes, it was found on the buckle uh, of the belt that secured her lower body. But prosecutors say the investigation is far from over. They say they've scoured electronic devices from Hewerman's home and office, including two burner phones they say he used to contact sex workers as recently as last year, while also searching for porn and for information of the deceased victims. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all of the charges. Six other bodies were found near Gilgo Beach. Authorities say it's unclear if Hewerman was involved in those unsolved cases. His next court date is February 6th. Rhiannon, Andrew. Andrea, thank you. Costco has started a crackdown to keep non-members from using the store. Instead of just showing a membership card to a staffer when you walk in, some locations are now requiring that card be scanned. The scanners have been seen at Costco's in Washington State. The goal is to keep non-members from getting into the store with cards that do not belong to them. 
Coming up, a new study on the health effects of drinking juice, even 100% fruit juice. Also ahead, the big retirement news in the NFL. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's going to get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health. Your money. Breaking news. Pop culture. With the biggest stars. Music. Trends. And, of course, good food. GMA 3. What you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us. Afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We're back with the man who survived this dramatic crash near Los Angeles. Cornell Patrick was ejected from an RV after the vehicle hit the center divider on the freeway. He tells KABC, despite initial reports, he was not the one behind the wheel. His wife was driving. I had to get up and use the restroom. That's okay. the only reason my seatbelt was unbuckled. Okay. I was getting up to use the restroom. When I got up, I noticed that we weren't going straight. We were going sideways toward the median. She had fallen asleep. <gasps> Patrick says he suffered multiple broken bones after being thrown from the RV. Glad he is okay. A warning for parents who give their kids 100% fruit juice. A new study finds, despite the juice having no added sugar, it is still associated with weight gain in children. Experts advise no juice for infants and just four to six ounces per day for older kids. And health officials are warning air travelers who pass through Washington, D.C. about a possible measles exposure. A person with a confirmed case passed through Dulles and Reagan airports two weeks ago. The unvaccinated may be at risk. The U.S. declared measles eliminated in 2000, but vaccine hesitancy is being blamed for more outbreaks. We turn now to the big retirement news from the NFL. This morning, one of the most popular players in the NFL reportedly calling it quits. Great job, Jason Kelsey. Run him out of the building. Sources tell ESPN Eagles all-star center Jason Kelsey intends to retire, making the announcement to his teammates after Monday night's loss. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. Kelsey was visibly emotional after losing to the Bucks, ending the Eagles season. The 36-year-old is the highest-paid center in football, playing all 13 of his seasons in Philadelphia and winning a Super Bowl. Everybody wanted it more, and that's why we're up here today. Kelsey's fame skyrocketed in recent years after launching a podcast and starring in a documentary on Amazon Prime. Then, of course, Mama is the guy on the Jason's younger brother, Travis, is now dating Taylor Swift. You know, we kind of started last year with the podcast and everything, and it's continually built up more and more from the Super Bowl. and. Um, you know, uh, my brother's love life. People Magazine also named Jason one of the sexiest men alive this year. At one point this season, his jersey was the top selling among women buyers. You've noticed the attention over the past couple years, right? Yes. I mean, I think it's completely warranted, but I'm biased. Kelsey, also known for getting laughs, even dressing up as Batman after a game on Halloween. In his Amazon documentary filmed in 2022, Kelsey was candid about his concerns as a father with young daughters. I am fearful that, you know, who knows what the impacts of playing football are going to mean long term. Yeah, I have two girls and you know, some people end up getting 
CTE, some guys live long, healthy lives. I have no idea what's going to happen. Jason has yet to answer questions publicly about his future. Coming up, Hulk Hogan to the rescue. Plus, what we've learned about the iPhone that survived a drop from 16,000 feet. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt someone's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 20 true crime mystery. There is a monster in me. Friday night on ABC. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from the New Year celebration in Times Square, New York, I'm Alex Perche. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the polls. We begin with no doubt reuniting after more than a decade. Can you believe it? Gwen Stefani made the announcement on Instagram saying the band is joining Coachella, the annual music festival in California. No doubt found mainstream success back in the mid-90s with songs like this one, Just a Girl. Stefani had a huge solo career after the band went on hiatus in 2004. They briefly reunited in 2012, but No Doubt says they'll be back together in full swing at Coachella in April. Next, we're seeing a spike in homeschooling across the country. An estimated 2.7 million children are currently being homeschooled. That's compared to 1.5 million before the pandemic. Some parents are forming cooperatives to teach their kids together after voicing concern about traditional schools. Many of the reasons that top the list have to do with the school environment. So parents cite, uh, for instance, bullying safety, you know, general concerns about the quality of academics in schools, uh, school shootings. Now, critics of homeschooling worry about the quality of education, citing a lack of standardized testing and progress reports, as well as social development. Good Morning America will take a closer look later this morning. Next, new details about the iPhone we told you about that reportedly survived falling 16,000 feet from a plane. An Oregon man says he found the phone after a door plug mishap on an Alaska Airlines plane this month, and now the brand of the phone case has been revealed. Spiegan says it made the case that protected the guy phone. The case is called the Cryo Armor. It sells for about 25 bucks online. Next, Hulk Hogan to the rescue. The 70-year-old pro wrestling legend was out with his wife and a friend Sunday night in Tampa, and on the way home, they witnessed a multi-vehicle car crash with one car on its roof. So Hogan says he used a pen to pop the deployed airbag and then pull the 17-year-old driver to safety. Thankfully, police reported only minor injuries. Finally, Kansas City Chiefs head coach Andy Reid's mustache has finally thawed after that playoff win over the weekend. The image summed up the brutal cold that the Chiefs and Dolphins were facing, and now a Kansas City bakery is offering their <laughs> Andy Reid cake. Frozen mustache included. It could be frozen again Sunday when the Chiefs travel to Buffalo, where it is also cold. <laughs> Top headlines next. 
It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. Me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt someone's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Checking more top stories now, the Club Q killer has pleaded not guilty to federal hate crime and weapons charges. Five people were killed at the Colorado Springs LGBTQ club back in 2022. The shooter pleaded guilty to state murder charges last summer. Former President Trump and Nikki Haley are taking new swipes at each other ahead of the New Hampshire primary, now just six days away. This Thursday's debate has been canceled. Haley refused to attend unless Trump is also on the stage and Trump declined. Safety violations at a Mississippi poultry plant are being blamed for the death of a 16-year-old from Guatemala last year. Officials say he was pulled into a machine while cleaning it. The plant's owner faces more than $200,000 in fines. Today's weather, several feet of lake effect snow in western New York. More dangerously cold conditions across the Midwest and the South rain in the northwest finally the revival we've all been waiting for a vhs tapes our danny new explains quick where the schwarzenegger films foreign films are in the back ah oh, video stores we may not see them as much these days but the tapes stuck around vhs never left there has always been people watching vhs tapes josh schaefer here runs lunch meat a magazine and releasing label dedicated to the increasing number of folks who still love popping in a good old vhs why do you think VHS is coming back, but not DVDs? I think VHS has a particular feel to it. I think that people like the physicality of it. To generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. 1.21 gigawatts! Just a few summers ago, a copy of Back to the Future sold at auction for $75,000. <laughs> and a copy of The Goonies was listed on eBay for $125,000. And then it went national, nice. and now it's in our area, too, in a couple spots. Here's the one in Lafayette. And as I reported last year, these free blockbuster dispensers have been popping up all over the country, offering people a lending library to share nostalgia together. There's a vibe. There's an aesthetic to it. It is important to preserve that look and to show it to new generations. I can't wait to tell my kids how often I taped American Idol. Three favorite movies, go. Uh, The Apartment. Sure, shows like Stranger Things have also turned up the nostalgia. And artists like Taylor Swift continue to dominate in vinyl sales. Before last Christmas, Luminate reported that more than 2 million vinyls were sold in one week. Clearly, folks have a hankering to own their favorite pieces of media again. You never know when something's going to go off streaming. You own and can operate at your leisure. Okay, kids, so once you have the tape, you need this thing called a VCR, and then you put it in there, unless there's already a tape in there, and then you can't, guys. That's the rule. <laughs> Thanks for the demo, Danny. And be kind. Rewind. <gasps> Right 
Right now on America This Morning, the record-breaking Arctic blast gripping the nation turns deadly. At least nine deaths now reported. Wind chills below zero in the deep south. Cars and trucks slip sliding away. And now parts of the country bracing for up to three feet of additional snow. Debate canceled. Why Nikki Haley has pulled out of the GOP primary debate just days before voters in New Hampshire make their choice. And this morning, Haley and Trump exchanging new attacks on everything from taxes to Social Security. The migrant crisis now turning into a housing crisis in several big cities as lawmakers consider billions more in taxpayer money to address the issue. We get an exclusive look at one migrant shelter housing mothers and their children seeking asylum. New evidence revealed against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer, what prosecutors say they found while following the suspect's daughter. Plus, more parents now choosing to homeschool their kids. What's behind the trend? The big retirement news from the NFL, a league favorite reportedly preparing to say goodbye. And the new crackdown at Costco. Get your membership card ready. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimber. Good Wednesday. I'm Rhiannon Alley. We want to begin with the extreme weather taking a deadly toll from the deep south all the way to the northeast. At least nine deaths are now being blamed on the Arctic conditions. Parts of Tennessee have seen twice their annual snowfall average. And below zero wind chill temperatures are expected again this morning. In the northeast, two weather-related deaths in New Jersey. That region is now bracing for even more snow on Friday. But we begin right now in the south. This morning, the record-setting Arctic blast gripping much of the country has turned deadly in the south. At least six people have now died in Tennessee as a result of the extreme conditions. 11 inches of snow falling in Knoxville, wind chills plunging to 15 below zero. In Alabama, ice-covered roads made driving nearly impossible. These cars left stranded after sliding off the road. This tractor-trailer outside Birmingham swerving in all directions before jackknifing into the guardrail. And this truck sliding down a driveway after it was put in park. In Chicago, where it felt like 30 below zero, fires were lit under these train tracks to keep them free of snow and ice. Tesla vehicles were lining up at this charging station in Chicago. Owners say they had trouble charging their batteries in the extreme cold. At least 10 electric cars were reportedly towed from this charging station. In the Rockies, new avalanche warnings in Colorado after a series of deadly snow slides in neighboring states. New video shows the moment Bob Tillotson was rescued from an avalanche in Utah. Rescuers digging through feet of snow, finally saving Tillotson after about 15 minutes. But it appears no one can match Buffalo for snowfall totals. Another three feet of lake effect snow is expected by tomorrow night, on top of the 40 inches that forced the Bills game to be postponed over the weekend. Meanwhile, in the nation's capital, fun and games on the National Mall as people enjoyed a rare blast of winter. It's a lot of fun. I've been waiting a long time. More bitter cold extends from the Midwest to the deep south this morning, and the Midwest and Northeast could see more snow by this weekend. We'll check your forecast in a few minutes. Now to the race for the White House. Former President Trump is launching new attacks against former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley just six days before the New Hampshire primary. Here's ABC's Lionel Moise. This morning, debate canceled. Thursday's GOP primary debate in New Hampshire scrapped after Nikki Haley pulled out, saying she'd only attend if former President Trump was also on stage. That's who I'm running against. There is nobody else I need to debate. I have had five strong debates and have done plenty of them. He can't hide forever. Trump, fresh off his landslide win in Iowa, now focusing his attacks on Haley, who's been surging in the polls in New Hampshire. Trump last night hitting Haley on taxes and social security she's not tough enough nikki haley supported a brutal 23 percent national sales tax which is a disaster by the way why she did it and that's why some people call her the nikki new tax i don't i don't think that's particularly good haley's campaign slamming trump depicting him as a bully and a liar meanwhile ron DeSantis, after his second place finish in iowa touted his record on tax cuts while speaking in new hampshire last night and I think what I represent is somebody that has delivered uh, on those key conservative policies that we've all been wanting to see in Washington, D.C. ABC's Rachel Scott spoke to voters in the Granite State where independents can vote in next week's primary. Basically, I'm up in the air about whether I'm going to support Trump or Haley. Well, 
I think Nikki Haley is a nice girl. I think she's very smart, but she won't touch Trump. She really won't. She won't. She won't touch him at all. Haley is also making headlines after being asked on Fox News yesterday whether being a woman of color hurts her chances at winning the nomination. We're not a racist country, Brian. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Are we perfect? No. In the meantime, President Biden weighing in on the race. I'm still the only person to ever beat Donald Trump. And I'm looking forward to it again for the good of this country. Today, Trump is expected back in a New York courtroom for his defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Carroll. She is expected to take the stand. The jury is deciding whether damages should be awarded for comments Trump made about Carroll's sexual assault allegations. He was already found liable for sexually abusing her. Rhiannon, Andrew. Lionel, thank you. The Biden administration is expected to relist Yemen's Houthi rebels as a terrorist group after the U.S. carried out a new airstrike against them, destroying more missiles. This latest strike is in response to a series of attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea, impacting global trade. The Houthis are supported by Iran. The CEO of Chevron warns oil prices could rise quickly if the attacks lead to a major disruption in shipments. New help for Israeli hostages being held by Hamas for more than 100 days now. The government of Qatar says a deal has been reached to deliver medicine to the hostages. It comes after Israel confirmed the deaths of two hostages seen in a recent Hamas video. The agreement reached by Qatar also provides more aid for Gaza. We turn now to the migrant crisis, which is also a housing crisis in several big cities. The extreme winter weather only adding to the challenges. This morning, ABC News is streaming channel ABC News Live, getting an exclusive look at a New York City migrant shelter that houses mothers and their children seeking asylum. We're at capacity for everyone. We really don't have any room at all. Christine Quinn, whose organization runs the shelter, says most of those staying here do not qualify for housing benefits or food stamps, making it difficult for them to move out and provide for their families. Families. And now, with the bitter winter cold settling in, many are unprepared. These families came to us and continue to come with the t-shirt on their back and the flip-flops on their feet. They're not ready for snow. They don't have winter jackets. New York's governor yesterday requested more than $2 billion to provide housing and health care for the roughly 70,000 migrants currently in the state, many of them sent by bus from Texas. This is the right thing to do for the migrants and for the city of New York. Continue focusing on securing work authorization and put the migrants and asylum workers to work. In Illinois, the governor has announced $17 million in new funds for Chicago suburbs that agreed to house migrants. Hundreds have been sleeping on city buses to keep warm. Many arrived wearing only shorts and T-shirts. Migrant crossings at the U.S. southern border hit a record high last month. Today, President Biden is meeting with congressional leaders, urging them to pass new border security funds, part of a $106 billion funding request that also includes money for the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. As part of that spending plan, Republicans have demanded stricter asylum laws and also expanded deportations. JetBlue and Spirit are deciding whether to appeal a federal judge's decision blocking their $3.8 billion merger. The Justice Department opposed the deal, saying it would lead to higher airfares. JetBlue and Spirit insist they need help competing with bigger airlines. A 10-year-old from Maryland is the latest visitor to the Bahamas to be bitten by a shark. Police say the boy was injured during a shark tank expedition at a resort on Paradise Island. He is reportedly in stable condition this morning. And just last month, a Massachusetts woman was killed by a shark in the Bahamas. Time now for your Wednesday weather. Good morning. Waking up below zero again today from Chicago back to Omaha. Wake up weather will be the same in New York City as it will be in Houston, Texas. 19 degrees. Watch out for slick spots on the roads. Meantime, today will be dry and cool for most of the country. Some lake effect snow and some ice this morning in Portland, Oregon. Our next storm comes out of Texas on Thursday into Thursday night. The snow will spread through Friday night one to three inches into the early part of the weekend from Boston to D.C. I'm Mackie with a meteorologist Kevin Coscarin. Coming up, a new crackdown at Costco. But first, the new evidence against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer. 
What prosecutors say they found while following the suspect's daughter. And cicada invasion, a warning about this upcoming spring. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. news breaks it's so important to always remember that lives are changed here in london in buffalo uvalde texas edinburgh scotland reporting from rolling fork mississippi ukrainian refugees here in warsaw we're heading to a small community outside of mexico city getting you behind the stories as they happen abc news live prime we'll take you there stream abc news live weeknights wherever you stream your news only on abc news live why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Reporting from outside the courthouse in Walterboro, South Carolina, I'm M. Wynn. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Back now with the sound of cicadas, which are coming back in force in just a few months. Experts warn two different groups will emerge from the ground in late spring across the Midwest and Southeast. It will be the first double cicada emergence in more than 200 years. The two cicada broods are expected to hit Illinois and Indiana the hardest. New evidence has been revealed in the case against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer in New York. But prosecutors say the investigation isn't over yet. Here's ABC's Andrea Fujii. This morning, the accused serial killer charged with murdering three women in New York is now charged with killing a fourth. The victim's daughter speaking publicly for the first time. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Maureen Brainard Barnes went missing in 2007 while working as an escort. Her body was found near three other women buried near Gilgo Beach on Long Island, New York. Rex Hewerman was already charged in the deaths of Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, and Melissa Bartholomew. They were known as the Gilgo Four as their deaths went unsolved for more than a decade. There are countless times I needed her and she was not there. I remember she read to me every night and now I can no longer remember the sound of her voice. Now prosecutors have revealed how they were able to link Hewerman to Brainard Barnes. The biggest uh, change is the DNA evidence. They say investigators followed Hewerman's daughter, who was not implicated in any of the killings, and were able to extract her DNA from a discarded drink, which linked Hewerman to the murder. The hair that was found on uh, Brainard uh, Barnes, it was found on the buckle uh, of the belt that secured her lower body. But prosecutors say the investigation is far from over. They say they've scoured electronic devices from Hewerman's home and office, including two burner phones they say he used to contact sex workers as recently as last year, while also searching for porn and for information of the deceased victims. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all of the charges. Six other bodies were found near Gilgo Beach. Authorities say it's unclear if Hewerman was involved in those unsolved cases. His next court date is February 6th. Rhiannon, Andrew. Andrea, thank you. Costco has started a crackdown to keep non-members from using the store. Instead of just showing a membership card to a staffer when you walk in, some locations are now requiring that card be scanned. The scanners have been seen at Costco's in Washington State. The goal is to keep non-members from getting into the store with cards that do not belong to them. 
Coming up, a new study on the health effects of drinking juice, even 100% fruit juice. Also ahead, the big retirement news in the NFL. So much at stake, so much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 20 true crime mystery. There is a monster in me. Friday night on ABC. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. We're back with the man who survived this dramatic crash near Los Angeles. Cornell Patrick was ejected from an RV after the vehicle hit the center divider on the freeway. He tells KABC, despite initial reports, he was not the one behind the wheel. His wife was driving. I had to get up and use the restroom. That's okay. the only reason my seatbelt was unbuckled. Okay. I was getting up to use the restroom. When I got up, I noticed that we weren't going straight. We were going sideways toward the median. She had fallen asleep. Oh. Patrick says he suffered multiple broken bones after being thrown from the RV. Glad he is okay. A warning for parents who give their kids 100% fruit juice. A new study finds, despite the juice having no added sugar, it is still associated with weight gain in children. Experts advise no juice for infants and just four to six ounces per day for older kids. And health officials are warning air travelers who pass through Washington, D.C. about a possible measles exposure. A person with a confirmed case passed through Dulles and Reagan airports two weeks ago. The unvaccinated may be at risk. The U.S. declared measles eliminated in 2000, but vaccine hesitancy is being blamed for more outbreaks. We turn now to the big retirement news from the NFL. This morning, one of the most popular players in the NFL reportedly calling it quits. Great job, Jason Kelsey. Run him out of the building. Sources tell ESPN Eagles All-Star Center Jason Kelsey intends to retire, making the announcement to his teammates after Monday night's loss. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. Kelsey was visibly emotional after losing to the Bucks, ending the Eagles season. The 36-year-old is the highest-paid center in football, playing all 13 of his seasons in Philadelphia and winning a Super Bowl. Everybody wanted it more, and that's why we're up here today. Kelsey's fame skyrocketed in recent years after launching a podcast and starring in a documentary on Amazon Prime. Then, of course, Mama is the guy on the Jason's younger brother, Travis, is now dating Taylor Swift. You know, we kind of started last year with the podcast and everything, and it's continually built up more and more from the Super Bowl. and. Um, you know, uh, my brother's love life. People Magazine also named Jason one of the sexiest men alive this year. At one point this season, his jersey was the top selling among women buyers. You've noticed the attention over the past couple years, right? Yes. I mean, I think it's completely warranted, but I'm biased. Kelsey, also known for getting laughs, even dressing up as Batman after a game on Halloween. In his Amazon documentary filmed in 2022, Kelsey was candid about his concerns as a father with young daughters. I am fearful that, you know, who knows what the impacts of playing football are going to mean long term. Yeah, I have two girls and you know, some people end up getting 
CTE, some guys live long, healthy lives. I have no idea what's going to happen. Jason has yet to answer questions publicly about his future. Coming up, Hulk Hogan to the rescue. Plus, what we've learned about the iPhone that survived a drop from 16,000 feet. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Reporting from the scene of the Monterey Park mass shooting, I'm Juju Chang. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the polls. We begin with no doubt reuniting after more than a decade. Can you believe it? Gwen Stefani made the announcement on Instagram saying the band is joining Coachella, the annual music festival in California. No doubt found mainstream success back in the mid-90s with songs like this one, Just a Girl. Stefani had a huge solo career after the band went on hiatus in 2004. They briefly reunited in 2012, but No Doubt says they'll be back together in full swing at Coachella in April. Next, we're seeing a spike in homeschooling across the country. An estimated 2.7 million children are currently being homeschooled. That's compared to 1.5 million before the pandemic. Some parents are forming cooperatives to teach their kids together after voicing concern about traditional schools. Many of the reasons that top the list have to do with the school environment. So parents cite, uh, for instance, bullying safety, you know, general concerns about the quality of academics in schools, uh, school shootings. Now, critics of homeschooling worry about the quality of education, citing a lack of standardized testing and progress reports, as well as social development. Good Morning America will take a closer look later this morning. Next, new details about the iPhone we told you about that reportedly survived falling 16,000 feet from a plane. An Oregon man says he found the phone after a door plug mishap on an Alaska Airlines plane this month, and now the brand of the phone case has been revealed. Spiegan says it made the case that protected the guy phone. The case is called the Cryo Armor. It sells for about 25 bucks online. Next, Hulk Hogan to the rescue. The 70-year-old pro wrestling legend was out with his wife and a friend Sunday night in Tampa, and on the way home, they witnessed a multi-vehicle car crash with one car on its roof. So Hogan says he used a pen to pop the deployed airbag and then pull the 17-year-old driver to safety. Thankfully, police reported only minor injuries. Finally, Kansas City Chiefs head coach Andy Reid's mustache has finally thawed after that playoff win over the weekend. The image summed up the brutal cold that the Chiefs and Dolphins were facing, and now a Kansas City bakery is offering their <laughs> Andy Reid cake. Frozen mustache included. It could be frozen again Sunday when the Chiefs travel to Buffalo, where it is also cold. <laughs> Top headlines next. 
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Checking more top stories now, the Club Q killer has pleaded not guilty to federal hate crime and weapons charges. Five people were killed at the Colorado Springs LGBTQ club back in 2022. The shooter pleaded guilty to state murder charges last summer. Former President Trump and Nikki Haley are taking new swipes at each other ahead of the New Hampshire primary, now just six days away. This Thursday's debate has been canceled. Haley refused to attend unless Trump is also on the stage and Trump declined. Safety violations at a Mississippi poultry plant are being blamed for the death of a 16-year-old from Guatemala last year. Officials say he was pulled into a machine while cleaning it. The plant's owner faces more than $200,000 in fines. Today's weather, several feet of lake effect snow in western New York. More dangerously cold conditions across the Midwest and the South rain in the northwest finally the revival we've all been waiting for of vhs tapes our danny new explains quick what are schwarzenegger films foreign films are in the back ah oh, video stores we may not see them as much these days but the tapes stuck around vhs never left there has always been people watching vhs tapes josh schaefer here runs lunch meat a magazine and releasing label dedicated to the increasing number of folks who still love popping in a good old vhs why do you think VHS is coming back, but not DVDs? I think VHS has a particular feel to it. I think that people like the physicality of it. To generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. 1.21 gigawatts! Just a few summers ago, a copy of Back to the Future sold at auction for $75,000. <laughs> and a copy of The Goonies was listed on eBay for $125,000. And then it went national, nice. and now it's in our area, too, in a couple spots. Here's the one in Lafayette. And as I reported last year, these free blockbuster dispensers have been popping up all over the country, offering people a lending library to share nostalgia together. There's a vibe. There's an aesthetic to it. It is important to preserve that look and to show it to new generations. I can't wait to tell my kids how often I taped American Idol. Three favorite movies, go. Uh, The Apartment. Sure, shows like Stranger Things have also turned up the nostalgia. And artists like Taylor Swift continue to dominate in vinyl sales. Before last Christmas, Luminate reported that more than 2 million vinyls were sold in one week. Clearly, folks have a hankering to own their favorite pieces of media again. You never know when something's going to go off streaming. You own and can operate at your leisure. Okay, kids, so once you have the tape, you need this thing called a VCR, and then you put it in there, unless there's already a tape in there, and then you can't, guys. That's the rule. <laughs> Thanks for the demo, Danny. And be kind. Rewind. <gasps> Right 
Right now on America This Morning, the record-breaking Arctic blast gripping the nation turns deadly. At least nine deaths now reported. Wind chills below zero in the deep south. Cars and trucks slip sliding away. And now parts of the country bracing for up to three feet of additional snow. Debate canceled. Why Nikki Haley has pulled out of the GOP primary debate just days before voters in New Hampshire make their choice. And this morning, Haley and Trump exchanging new attacks on everything from taxes to Social Security. The migrant crisis now turning into a housing crisis in several big cities as lawmakers consider billions more in taxpayer money to address the issue. We get an exclusive look at one migrant shelter housing mothers and their children seeking asylum. New evidence revealed against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer. What prosecutors say they found while following the suspect's daughter. Plus, more parents now choosing to homeschool their kids. What's behind the trend? The big retirement news from the NFL. A league favorite reportedly preparing to say goodbye. And the new crackdown at Costco. Get your membership card ready. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimber. Good Wednesday. I'm Rhiannon and Allie. We want to begin with the extreme weather, taking a deadly toll from the deep south all the way to the northeast. At least nine deaths are now being blamed on the Arctic conditions. Parts of Tennessee have seen twice their annual snowfall average. And below zero wind chill temperatures are expected again this morning. In the northeast, two weather-related deaths in New Jersey. That region is now bracing for even more snow on Friday. But we begin right now in the south. This morning, the record-setting Arctic blast gripping much of the country has turned deadly in the south. At least six people have now died in Tennessee as a result of the extreme conditions. 11 inches of snow falling in Knoxville, wind chills plunging to 15 below zero. In Alabama, ice-covered roads made driving nearly impossible. These cars left stranded after sliding off the road. This tractor trailer outside Birmingham swerving in all directions before jackknifing into the guardrail. And this truck sliding down a driveway after it was put in park. In Chicago, where it felt like 30 below zero, fires were lit under these train tracks to keep them free of snow and ice. Tesla vehicles were lining up at this charging station in Chicago. Owners say they had trouble charging their batteries in the extreme cold. At least 10 electric cars were reportedly towed from this charging station. In the Rockies, new avalanche warnings in Colorado after a series of deadly snow slides in neighboring states. New video shows the moment Bob Tillotson was rescued from an avalanche in Utah. Rescuers digging through feet of snow, finally saving Tillotson after about 15 minutes. But it appears no one can match Buffalo for snowfall totals. Another three feet of lake effect snow is expected by tomorrow night, on top of the 40 inches that forced the Bills game to be postponed over the weekend. Meanwhile, in the nation's capital, fun and games on the National Mall as people enjoyed a rare blast of winter. It's a lot of fun. I've been waiting a long time. More bitter cold extends from the Midwest to the deep south this morning, and the Midwest and Northeast could see more snow by this weekend. We'll check your forecast in a few minutes. Now to the race for the White House. Former President Trump is launching new attacks against former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley just six days before the New Hampshire primary. Here's ABC's Lana Moise. This morning, debate canceled. Thursday's GOP primary debate in New Hampshire scrapped after Nikki Haley pulled out, saying she'd only attend if former President Trump was also on stage. That's who I'm running against. There is nobody else I need to debate. I have had five strong debates and have done plenty of them. He can't hide forever. Trump, fresh off his landslide win in Iowa, now focusing his attacks on Haley, who's been surging in the polls in New Hampshire. Trump last night hitting Haley on on taxes and Social Security. She's not tough enough. Nikki Haley supported a brutal 23% national sales tax, which is a disaster, by the way, why she did it. And that's why some people call her the Nikki New Tax. I don't, I don't think that's particularly good. Haley's campaign slamming Trump, depicting him as a bully and a liar. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis, after his second place finish in Iowa, touted his record on tax cuts while speaking in New Hampshire last night. And I think what I represent is somebody that has delivered uh, on those key conservative policies that we've all been wanting to see in Washington, D.C. ABC's Rachel Scott spoke to voters in the Granite State where independents can vote in next week's primary. Basically, I'm up in the air about whether I'm going to support Trump or Haley. Well, 
I think Nikki Haley is a nice girl. I think she's very smart, but she won't touch Trump. She really won't. She won't. She won't touch him at all. Haley is also making headlines after being asked on Fox News yesterday whether being a woman of color hurts her chances at winning the nomination. We're not a racist country, Brian. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Are we perfect? No. In the meantime, President Biden weighing in on the race. I'm still the only person to ever beat Donald Trump. And I'm looking forward to it again for the good of this country. Today, Trump is expected back in a New York courtroom for his defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Carroll. She is expected to take the stand. The jury is deciding whether damages should be awarded for comments Trump made about Carroll's sexual assault allegations. He was already found liable for sexually abusing her. Rhiannon, Andrew. Lionel, thank you. The Biden administration is expected to relist Yemen's Houthi rebels as a terrorist group after the U.S. carried out a new airstrike against them, destroying more missiles. This latest strike is in response to a series of attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea, impacting global trade. The Houthis are supported by Iran. The CEO of Chevron warns oil prices could rise quickly if the attacks lead to a major disruption in shipments. New help for Israeli hostages being held by Hamas for more than 100 days now. The government of Qatar says a deal has been reached to deliver medicine to the hostages. It comes after Israel confirmed the deaths of two hostages seen in a recent Hamas video. The agreement reached by Qatar also provides more aid for Gaza. We turn now to the migrant crisis, which is also a housing crisis in several big cities. The extreme winter weather only adding to the challenges. This morning, ABC News is streaming channel ABC News Live, getting an exclusive look at a New York City migrant shelter that houses mothers and their children seeking asylum. We're at capacity for everyone. We really don't have any room at all. Christine Quinn, whose organization runs the shelter, says most of those staying here do not qualify for housing benefits or food stamps, making it difficult for them to move out and provide for their families. Families. And now, with the bitter winter cold settling in, many are unprepared. These families came to us and continue to come with the T-shirt on their back and the flip-flops on their feet. They're not ready for snow. They don't have winter jackets. New York's governor yesterday requested more than $2 billion to provide housing and health care for the roughly 70,000 migrants currently in the state, many of them sent by bus from Texas. This is the right thing to do for the migrants and for the city of New York. Continue focusing on securing work authorization and put the migrants and asylum workers to work. In Illinois, the governor has announced $17 million in new funds for Chicago suburbs that agreed to house migrants. Hundreds have been sleeping on city buses to keep warm. Many arrived wearing only shorts and T-shirts. Migrant crossings at the U.S. southern border hit a record high last month. Today, President Biden is meeting with congressional leaders, urging them to pass new border security funds, part of a $106 billion funding request that also includes money for the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. As part of that spending plan, Republicans have demanded stricter asylum laws and also expanded deportations. JetBlue and Spirit are deciding whether to appeal a federal judge's decision blocking their $3.8 billion merger. The Justice Department opposed the deal, saying it would lead to higher airfares. JetBlue and Spirit insist they need help competing with bigger airlines. A 10-year-old from Maryland is the latest visitor to the Bahamas to be bitten by a shark. Police say the boy was injured during a shark tank expedition at a resort on Paradise Island. He is reportedly in stable condition this morning. And just last month, a Massachusetts woman was killed by a shark in the Bahamas. Time now for your Wednesday weather. Good morning. Waking up below zero again today from Chicago back to Omaha. Wake up weather will be the same in New York City as it will be in Houston, Texas. 19 degrees. Watch out for slick spots on the roads. Meantime, today will be dry and cool for most of the country. Some lake effect snow and some ice this morning in Portland, Oregon. Our next storm comes out of Texas on Thursday into Thursday night. The snow will spread through Friday night one to three inches into the early part of the weekend from Boston to D.C. I'm AccuWeather meteorologist Kevin Coskerin. Coming up, a new crackdown at Costco. But first, the new evidence against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer. 
What prosecutors say they found while following the suspect's daughter. And cicada invasion, a warning about this upcoming spring. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Back now with the sound of cicadas, which are coming back in force in just a few months. Experts warn two different groups will emerge from the ground in late spring across the Midwest and Southeast. It will be the first double cicada emergence in more than 200 years. The two cicada broods are expected to hit Illinois and Indiana the hardest. New evidence has been revealed in the case against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer in New York. But prosecutors say the investigation isn't over yet. Here's ABC's Andrea Fuji. This morning, the accused serial killer charged with murdering three women in New York is now charged with killing a fourth, the victim's daughter speaking publicly for the first time. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Maureen Brainard Barnes went missing in 2007 while working as an escort. Her body was found near three other women buried near Gilgo Beach on Long Island, New York. Rex Hewerman was already charged in the deaths of Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, and Melissa Bartholomew. They were known as the Gilgo Four as their deaths went unsolved for more than a decade. There are countless times I needed her and she was not there. I remember she read to me every night and now I can no longer remember the sound of her voice. Now prosecutors have revealed how they were able to link Hewerman to Brainard Barnes. The biggest uh, change is the DNA evidence. They say investigators followed Hewerman's daughter, who was not implicated in any of the killings, and were able to extract her DNA from a discarded drink, which linked Hewerman to the murder. The hair that was found on uh, Brainerd uh, Barnes, it was found on the buckle uh, of the belt that secured her lower body. But prosecutors say the investigation is far from over. They say they've scoured electronic devices from Hewerman's home and office, including two burner phones they say he used to contact sex workers as recently as last year, while also searching for porn and for information of the deceased victims. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all of the charges. Six other bodies were found near Gilgo Beach. Authorities say it's unclear if Hewerman was involved in those unsolved cases. His next court date is February 6th. Rhiannon, Andrew. Andrea, thank you. Costco has started a crackdown to keep non-members from using the store. Instead of just showing a membership card to a staffer when you walk in, some locations are now requiring that card be scanned. The scanners have been seen at Costco's in Washington State. The goal is to keep non-members from getting into the store with cards that do not belong to them. 
Coming up, a new study on the health effects of drinking juice, even 100% fruit juice. Also ahead, the big retirement news in the NFL. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We're back with the man who survived this dramatic crash near Los Angeles. Cornell Patrick was ejected from an RV after the vehicle hit the center divider on the freeway. He tells KABC, despite initial reports, he was not the one behind the wheel. His wife was driving. I had to get up and use the restroom. That's okay. the only reason my seatbelt was unbuckled. Okay. I was getting up to use the restroom. When I got up, I noticed that we weren't going straight. We were going sideways toward the median. She had fallen asleep. <gasps> Patrick says he suffered multiple broken bones after being thrown from the RV. Glad he is okay. A warning for parents who give their kids 100% fruit juice. A new study finds, despite the juice having no added sugar, it is still associated with weight gain in children. Experts advise no juice for infants and just four to six ounces per day for older kids. And health officials are warning air travelers who pass through Washington, D.C. about a possible measles exposure. A person with a confirmed case passed through Dulles and Reagan airports two weeks ago. The unvaccinated may be at risk. The U.S. declared measles eliminated in 2000, but vaccine hesitancy is being blamed for more outbreaks. We turn now to the big retirement news from the NFL. This morning, one of the most popular players in the NFL reportedly calling it quits. Great job, Jason Kelsey. Run him out of the building. Sources tell ESPN Eagles All-Star Center Jason Kelsey intends to retire, making the announcement to his teammates after Monday night's loss. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. Kelsey was visibly emotional after losing to the Bucks, ending the Eagles season. The 36-year-old is the highest paid center in football, playing all 13 of his seasons in Philadelphia and winning a Super Bowl. Everybody wanted it more, and that's why we're up here today. Chelsea's fame skyrocketed in recent years after launching a podcast and starring in a documentary on Amazon Prime. Then, of course, Mama is the guy on the street. Jason's younger brother, Travis, is now dating Taylor Swift. Yeah, we kind of started last year with the podcast and everything, and it's continually built up more and more from the Super Bowl. and. Um, you know, uh, my brother's love life. People Magazine also named Jason one of the sexiest men alive this year. At one point this season, his jersey was the top selling among women buyers. You've noticed the attention over the past couple years, right? Yes. I mean, I think it's completely warranted, but I'm biased. Kelsey, also known for getting laughs, even dressing up as Batman after a game on Halloween. In his Amazon documentary filmed in 2022, Kelsey was candid about his concerns as a father with young daughters. I am fearful that, you know, who knows what the impacts of playing football are going to mean long term. Yeah, I have two girls and you know, some people end up getting 
CTE. Some guys live long, healthy lives. I have no idea what's going to happen. Jason has yet to answer questions publicly about his future. Coming up, Hulk Hogan to the rescue. Plus, what we've learned about the iPhone that survived a drop from 16,000 feet. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. You couldn't meet a couple with more going for them, but... Am I ever gonna love again? There's a time when love becomes betrayal, and a time when betrayal becomes murder. Bad Romance, the all-new 2020 limited series, premiering Monday night on ABC. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed, getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Reporting from the site of the 2024 Iowa caucuses, I'm Victor Okendo. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the pulse. We begin with no doubt reuniting after more than a decade. Can you believe it? Gwen Stefani made the announcement on Instagram saying the band is joining Coachella, the annual music festival in California. No doubt found mainstream success back in the mid-90s with songs like this one, Just a Girl. Stefani had a huge solo career after the band went on hiatus in 2004. They briefly reunited in 2012, but No Doubt says they'll be back together in full swing at Coachella in April. Next, we're seeing a spike in homeschooling across the country. An estimated 2.7 million children are currently being homeschooled. That's compared to 1.5 million before the pandemic. Some parents are forming cooperatives to teach their kids together after voicing concern about traditional schools. Many of the reasons that top the list have to do with the school environment. So parents cite, uh, for instance, bullying safety, you know, general concerns about the quality of academics in schools, uh, school shootings. Now, critics of homeschooling worry about the quality of education, citing a lack of standardized testing and progress reports, as well as social development. Good Morning America will take a closer look later this morning. Next, new details about the iPhone we told you about that reportedly survived falling 16,000 feet from a plane. An Oregon man says he found the phone after a door plug mishap on an Alaska Airlines plane this month, and now the brand of the phone case has been revealed. Spiegan says it made the case that protected the iPhone. The case is called the Cryo Armor. It sells for about 25 bucks online. Next, Hulk Hogan to the rescue. The 70-year-old pro wrestling legend was out with his wife and a friend Sunday night in Tampa. And on the way home, they witnessed a multi-vehicle car crash with one car on its roof. So Hogan says he used a pen to pop the deployed airbag and then pull the 17-year-old driver to safety. Thankfully, police reported only minor injuries. Finally, Kansas City Chiefs head coach Andy Reid's mustache has finally thawed after that playoff win over the weekend. The image summed up the brutal cold that the Chiefs and Dolphins were facing, and now a Kansas City bakery is offering their Andy Reid cake, frozen mustache included. It could be frozen again Sunday when the Chiefs travel to Buffalo, where it is also cold. <laughs> Top headlines next. 
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoon. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Checking more top stories now. The Club Q killer has pleaded not guilty to federal hate crime and weapons charges. Five people were killed at the Colorado Springs LGBTQ Club back in 2022. The shooter pleaded guilty to state murder charges last summer. Former President Trump and Nikki Haley are taking new swipes at each other ahead of the New Hampshire primary, now just six days away. This Thursday's debate has been canceled. Haley refused to attend unless Trump is also on the stage and Trump declined. Safety violations at a Mississippi poultry plant are being blamed for the death of a 16-year-old from Guatemala last year. Officials say he was pulled into a machine while cleaning it. The plant's owner faces more than $200,000 in fines. Today's weather, several feet of lake effect snow in western New York. More dangerously cold conditions across the Midwest and the South rain in the northwest finally the revival we've all been waiting for of vhs tapes our danny new explains quick where the schwarzenegger films foreign films are in the back ah oh, video stores we may not see them as much these days but the tapes stuck around vhs never left there has always been people watching vhs tapes josh schaefer here runs lunch meat a magazine and releasing label dedicated to the increasing number of folks who still love popping in a good old vhs why do you think VHS is coming back, but not DVDs? I think VHS has a particular feel to it. I think that people like the physicality of it. To generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. 1.21 gigawatts! Just a few summers ago, a copy of Back to the Future sold at auction for $75,000. <laughs> and a copy of The Goonies was listed on eBay for $125,000. And then it went national, nice. and now it's in our area, too, in a couple spots. Here's the one in Lafayette. And as I reported last year, these free blockbuster dispensers have been popping up all over the country, offering people a lending library to share nostalgia together. There's a vibe. There's an aesthetic to it. It is important to preserve that look and to show it to new generations. I can't wait to tell my kids how often I taped American Idol. Three favorite movies, go. Uh, The Apartment. Sure, shows like Stranger Things have also turned up the nostalgia. And artists like Taylor Swift continue to dominate in vinyl sales. Before last Christmas, Luminate reported that more than 2 million vinyls were sold in one week. Clearly, folks have a hankering to own their favorite pieces of media again. You never know when something's going to go off streaming. You own and can operate at your leisure. Okay, kids, so once you have the tape, you need this thing called a VCR, and then you put it in there, unless there's already a tape in there, and then you can't, guys. That's the rule. <laughs> Thanks for the demo, Danny. Be kind. Rewind. <gasps>
It's Wednesday, January 17th. Donald Trump shows up to a Manhattan courthouse to watch his own jury selection. We start here. The former president stands trial in another defamation case. A continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. A New York jury will decide damages in E. Jean Carroll's case. Leaders of a dysfunctional Congress are summoned to the White House. It's anybody's guess what sort of solution they're going to come up with. What will it take to keep the government from shutting down? And Ukraine says it's running out of ammunition. Well, we're on a test drive of a Ukrainian armored infantry vehicle. An exclusive look inside a Ukrainian arms production facility. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Ann Flaherty. Good morning. Brad is fresh off his trip to Iowa and headed to New Hampshire, so I'll be filling in today. Just 12 hours after winning the Iowa caucuses, former President Donald Trump was back in a New York courthouse, this time opting to appear voluntarily, where he took a seat directly behind E. Jean Carroll. Carol is the magazine columnist who says Trump sexually abused her in a Manhattan dressing room in the 1990s. She sued him for that incident and for later defaming her in social media posts. But I uh, uh, felt strong because I knew I was telling the truth and I just stuck to it. Last spring, a jury agreed and awarded her $5 million. The verdict is a disgrace, a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. Trump is appealing that verdict, denying all wrongdoing, and saying he doesn't know who Carol is, or at least he didn't before she took him to court. Now Carol's taken Trump to court again to answer defamation charges from 2019. To explain all this, let's bring in ABC correspondent Aaron Katursky, who sat in the courtroom yesterday watching it unfold. Aaron, first, can you explain, didn't she win this case already? She did win her case already, and yes, this is a separate case. It was last May. Good memory, Anne, that E. Jean Carroll won a $5 million judgment against former President Trump. The judge has already said the earlier trial established the facts, established that Trump sexually assaulted E. Jean Carroll. Trump defamed E. Jean Carroll. So all that's at issue this time, Anne, is how much in damages, if any, Trump should pay. Okay, and I understand that the former president, GOP frontrunner, was there during the jury selection. That must have been a surreal scene. Describe to us what happened. Can you imagine prospective jurors, you know, who are already annoyed they're at jury selection, they come into a courtroom not knowing anything, and there's the former president of the United States seated at the defense table. One woman seemed to either laugh or smile. Uh, There was a guy who stared at him for a good 10 seconds, whether in in disbelief or awe or hatred or what, we don't know. Uh, But uh, one by one, they went through all of the, the questions you might expect when you're talking about a jury to sit in judgment of the former president. Uh, They were asked about their politics. They were asked about their social media. They were even asked if they had watched The Apprentice, which 10 hands went up in the room. And in the end, uh, none of the people who who talked about their their political views or the guy who said he donated to Trump and, and believed the lie that the election was stolen from him, he didn't make it on the jury. And it's it's uh, nine citizens who are going to decide whether E. Jean Carroll deserves more money than she has already won from Trump for defamatory statements denying her rape claim. She's accusing me of rape. A woman that I have no idea who she is. It came out of the blue. And I will tell you, I made that statement and I said, well, it's politically incorrect. She's not my type. And that's 100 percent true. She's not my type. The lawyer for E. Jean Carroll, a woman named Sean Crowley, who's a former federal prosecutor, asked the jury to ask themselves, what is it going to take? How much money is it going to take for former President Trump to stop? In fact, as he sat in court, the plaintiff's attorney counted 22 social media posts from Trump disparaging E. Jean Carroll, calling her a fake woman, calling the case fake, saying that he didn't know her, never touched her. And those are the same kinds of statements that got him in trouble with the jury last year and that could get him in trouble with with a jury this time, too. So he keeps speaking about her and in ways that could get him in trouble. Can she just sue him over and over again? I suppose she could. But look, E. Jean Carroll is 80 years old and her attorneys say that when he called her a liar, said she made up her rape claim, uh, talked about her as a political operative, said she had ulterior motives in an instant 
her attorney said Trump unleashed his his supporters and within days a reputation that she built over decades as an advice columnist form, formerly of Elle magazine and, and television all that disappeared in an instant and and she ended up enduring a barrage of, of not only criticism but some rather you know vulgar things said about her uh, that that she says destroyed her her reputation and and made her unable to, to, to function socially the way she had and the defense message was essentially, got to suck it up. You're famous. That's what you wanted. And you don't deserve any more money. Wow. So what happens next? Opening statements come today. And and we should hear from E. Jean Carroll straight away. She's not going to be as expansive as she was in the last trial, explaining what happened in that dressing room. So many of these facts are already established. And the judge said they're off limits in this trial. But she is ex- expected to explain how she says she was affected by Trump's words. Her attorney said that he was the president of the United States when he made these disparaging and defamatory remarks. So he had the the loudest microphone in the world. And and she's going to explain to the jury what it was like to be on the receiving end of that. So it's a total false accusation. And I don't know anything about her. And she's made this charge against others. His attorney has signaled that former President Trump wants to testify. In fact, He asked that the trial be put off until after his mother-in-law's funeral scheduled for Thursday so that he could testify more easily. And the judge wasn't going to do that, but did make arrangements for him to testify on Monday the 22nd, if he so chooses. But, and he is going to be really limited in what he can say. He cannot say he doesn't know this woman. He cannot say that this sexual assault never happened. The judge has already told the jury that it did. So the challenge for Trump and his defense attorneys are going to rest, uh, try to restrain the, the parameters of his testimony. Aaron Katursky, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Ann. Next up on Start Here, a high-stakes meeting at the White House. More when we come back. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. In Washington yesterday, like much of the country, it was a snow day. School was canceled, the federal government was closed, and kids, including my own, spent the day making pancakes and sledding with their friends. It's all good stuff, except if you work for Congress, because in just two days, the government runs out of money. House Republicans remain divided on whether to negotiate with Democrats, and many are insisting upon a major overhaul of the U.S. immigration system. It's a seriously tall order with just hours left on the clock. Now, House and Senate leaders say they have a plan for a short-term bill to keep the government afloat until March. But what about after that? Well, today, President Biden has summoned the four top leaders of Congress to the White House, including House Speaker Mike Johnson, to figure all this out. Let's bring in ABC's Capitol Hill reporter, Allie Pacorn, to break this down. Allie, what are we expecting from the meeting today? Well, it'll certainly be a big meeting. This is going to be one of the first times that the newly minted Speaker Mike Johnson meets with President Biden face to face. And when all four of these leaders get in the room... And it's anybody's guess what sort of solution they're going to come up with. Because as it comes to the southern border, we're in a bit of a knot. And that knot is affecting our ability to fund all sorts of things, including Ukraine and Israel, other items that are huge priorities for this administration. So Mike Johnson's going to be there. He's sort of representing this, uh, you know, the, the kind of the hard right of the Republican Party. They want to change U.S. border policy. Um, is he going to be in the minority in this room? 
Yeah, so everyone in the room, including Democrats, would tell you that they recognize that there's a problem going on at the southern border and they want to address it. The question is, how do we address it and what would it mean to address it in a way that's going to be palatable to both Democrats and Republicans who would ultimately be needed to pass any sort of package here. So when we get into the room today, you're going to have Johnson, as you mentioned, he he represents that most hardline approach. And his perspective is he wants a very aggressive border bill that was passed by the House earlier this year using exclusively Republican support. If President Biden wants a supplemental spending bill focused on national security, it better begin by defending America's national security. Democrats have already declared that bill dead on arrival in the Senate. But also on the other side of the table will be your Senate leaders. That's Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. It's not often that you see these two getting together to advocate for the same thing. So this supplemental request that they're going to be going over today in the room is kind of a rarity. And that Schumer and McConnell both really want it. At stake is the security of our country. The security of our friends abroad, including Ukraine and Israel, and nothing less than the future of Western democracy. We cannot afford to let these issues go unaddressed. Both of these men are huge supporters of Ukraine, but McConnell, in an effort to appease some of the Republicans in his conference, has said he's not going to back any Ukraine aid package that doesn't also include substantive policy changes at the southern border. Addressing the border crisis at home is a fundamental part of legislation that will help America meet each of the most glaring national security challenges. However, what that looks like for Mitch McConnell and what that looks like for Mike Johnson are different. And it's created what is essentially a pretty massive staring contest going on with no clear solution about how to fix things at the southern border. So President Biden is going to be calling in everyone today to see if there's a way to get to yes. So while this top level meeting happens, there's just going to be a lot of media attention on that. But there is this other issue, which is that the government's going to run out of money. So what happens next with that? That's right. The government is actually a matter of days from shutting down on Friday night at midnight. And so Congress is going to need to be acting pretty quickly over the next few days to try to stop that from occurring. If they don't on Friday night at midnight, there will be a partial government shutdown. The good news is, The ball has already started rolling to try to kick the can down the road and buy Congress a little bit more time to work out longer term funding solutions. The Senate voted last night, the first in a series of procedural steps, to extend the government funding deadline through March. But that actually still doesn't address the longer term issues with government funding that have plagued this Congress for several months now. So House Speaker Johnson, he has members within his own party who are very upset about another continuing resolution. Is he risking his speakership by putting this out there? That's a great question, because you certainly wouldn't be wrong to point out that what Johnson is teeing his members up to vote on on Friday is exactly what Kevin McCarthy led his members into voting for that eventually got him stripped of his role as Speaker of the House in October. It is a near identical comparison. Johnson is once again going to be relying on Democratic votes to move a stopgap funding measure that does nothing to exact cuts that Republicans want to see forward. We don't think Johnson's going to lose his job for it. There is a lot less of an appetite to get rid of Speaker Johnson, who's only been in the role for about three months. I think House Republicans recognize that it's not necessarily great for the conference to be without a leader, especially going into an election year. We haven't seen a lot of that call to like strip him fully of his role, but certainly his right flank is very unhappy with this move. House Freedom Caucus, after it was announced on Sunday night that the Senate and House would try to move forward with this stopgap measure, called it a surrender. There were efforts to talk Johnson out of a larger funding agreement he and Schumer struck. Johnson is sticking by his decision to move forward with a short-term bill. He's saying it's going to buy Republicans the time they need to work out these longer solutions. But certainly, he's going to have some hell to pay with his right flank, who's very unhappy with this position. ABC's Allie Picorn on Capitol Hill. Allie will be watching your reporting. Thanks so much. Thank you. 
Okay, with all this dysfunction in Congress, it's almost easy to forget that there's another major crisis thousands of miles away, but one that Pentagon officials say is taking on increased urgency. The most effective response to Russia's ongoing missile and UAV attacks is to provide Ukraine with vital air defense capabilities and other types of military equipment that it needs to defend itself. Earlier this month, Ukraine's Air Force said it was only able to shoot down 18 of the 51 Russian missiles fired in a single night, raising questions about the country's air defense missiles missile stocks. The country also is believed to be running seriously low on ammunition. The, the race to produce more military equipment. Can, can Ukraine compete with Russia on that? Sure. Sure, we can compete, and we are competing very successfully, I think. This week, ABC foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge got an exclusive look inside a secret location in Ukraine to check out some of the country's growing domestic arms production. Let's bring in Tom to talk about it. Tom, let's start with the current state of fighting there right now. What is it that you're seeing on the ground? Well, and um, we were sort of near the fighting quite recently. Um, when you get close to the front lines, you can hear it. I mean, you can hear the booms of artillery, mortars. You can hear small arms fire. We also visited a medical stabilization point. I mean, that is a kind of makeshift, very simplistic hospital in a secret location because they're worried that it could be targeted by the Russians. Just back from the front lines. What are the typical injuries you're seeing at your stabilization point? Um, I would say the majority is uh, uh, fragment wounds uh, of the limbs. Uh, we have um, a lot of soldiers uh, stepping on the landmines. The chief doctor there basically said to us that he has seen 15,000 casualties in the entire war and he's basically become numb by everything. I think that the consequences of this um, I, I will see in like a couple of years after the war ends, if I survive. And he says at the moment they're seeing up to 80 casualties uh, in a matter of hours once things get busy. And we went to a major trauma hospital just a few hours west of there, so away from the fighting. Very hard for you and your staff. And doctors there told us they're seeing a 30% rise in casualties now. Heavily wounded soldiers coming through their doors compared to just a few weeks ago. So I think, you know, casualties for the Ukrainians are mounting. What's happened in the last few weeks is the Russians have, I think, retaken the initiative. <laughs> They have way more firepower, and Ukrainian soldiers are telling this, this time and time again. You, the Russians have more artillery, more artillery ammunition, more drones, and we're talking about lethal explosive drones, which are kind of flown on kind of single journeys at a target, and the Russians have way more of those deadly drones, and we're seeing the impact of that in those rising casualties. So a real mismatch in firepower resulting in these higher casualties. But so tell us about this arms production facility that you went to. Well, the Ukrainians are definitely, and I think this has taken added urgency because of the deadlock between the Biden administration and Congress over additional funding for the war here in Ukraine. And really the, the funding, people have got to realize, the funding that has been approved by Congress is pretty much running out. And that's what the White House is saying now. On the ground in Ukraine, there's been this impetus over the last few months to build up Ukrainian arms production. And I think that's taken on this added urgency now. Well, we're on a test drive of a Ukrainian armoured infantry vehicle, and Ukraine is really ramping up its arms production. We went inside a series of warehouses, a secret location. All of these boxes along here, there are mortar launchers, are there? Yep. The company, a Ukrainian company called Ukrainian Armor, which manufactures mortars, mortar shells, armored vehicles, and trucks for carrying missile launchers, they spread their production very thinly over multiple sites because what we've seen in those missile attacks you mentioned at the top from Russia is that they are trying increasingly to target Ukrainian arms manufacturing sites. But they are ramping up production. Uh, the military production is booming, not only in quantities, booming in quantities, but also extended in the product range. As in uh, you're producing more military equipment and different types Different now. types, and we extend and we adopt to the conditions of the war. The, the problem is, is that Ukraine is starting from a much lower base than Russia. And I think at the moment in the war, we're really seeing the fact that, you know, ever since Vladimir Putin first became president of Russia, and that's 24 years ago, 
you know, Russia has been building up its military. And yes, lots of Western officials have said, well, Russia's missile stocks are running low because they fired so many throughout the course of this long war. But I think in the autumn, what we've been told by Ukrainian officials is that the Russians were stockpiling missiles. We're seeing that now from their recent attacks. And the, the Russians just simply have way more military might, way more firepower, and way more capacity to build arms and produce weaponry. And that is a major challenge for the Ukrainians, which they're trying to address. So then what happens if the U.S. doesn't reach an agreement and the money dries up, the support from overseas dries up? Well, we're already seeing the fact that Ukrainian artillery units, we visited an artillery unit a, a few miles back from the front lines in a position where they were firing from. We could really feel the force of this American gun. But these Ukrainian artillery units are now having to limit the amount they fire. The commander showed us their sort of stash of artillery shells, US supplied, and they had about 20 shells. And he said during the summer when the Ukrainians were on the offensive, they would have about 150, 160 shells. So it's a massive, massive reduction. They're having to limit how much they fire. Ukrainian officials are telling me this, that sometimes they're chat chatting to troops on the ground and the troops are saying, where is the ammunition? And they are limited. They can't give cover to Ukrainian infantry, which is a massive, massive thing. So we're already seeing the impact. Although the, the shortage of artillery shells is also down to the fact that the West overall isn't producing enough artillery shells for this war and for the demand more generally. Israel has taken some of the American stock as well. In terms of Ukraine's manufacturing of weaponry, what it's calling out for from the United States and its allies is more cooperation, more technology coming to the Ukrainians to help them build better weaponry. They probably can't for many, many years produce as much as the Russians, but what they're saying is share more of your technology, maybe not your most sensitive stuff, but share something more with us, help us, help us build better weaponry. And, and that is where we think we can get an edge over the Russians. Even if we run out of uh, weapons, we will fight with shovels. And we sat down with the foreign minister of Ukraine, uh, Dmitry Kulieba, and he came up with a pretty stark warning. If the West is not able of uh, stopping Russia in Ukraine, who else is it able to stop in other parts of the world? China. You, you think China you have, you, I, I, leave, I leave these answers to you. You have, you have to reflect on this. And he was pretty resolute, the foreign minister of Ukraine. He ruled out sitting down for negotiations with Russia until Ukraine has a much more favorable position on the battlefield. And of course, the argument by the Ukrainians is that the only thing standing between Russia and Western Europe is their military. So do you want them fighting with shovels or do you want to supply them with real munitions? Great reporting from ABC's Tom Sufi Burge. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Anne. OK, one more quick break. When we come back, honk if you hate silly road signs. One last thing is next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. You couldn't meet a couple with more going for them, but... Am I ever gonna love again? There's a time when love becomes betrayal, and a time when betrayal becomes murder. Bad Romance, the all-new 2020 limited series, premiering Monday night on ABC. Ing McCorkalak, one of the biggest unclimbed rock faces on the planet. Now I'm starting to get very excited. If we manage to climb Ing McCorkalak, it'll be the biggest first ascent we've ever done. Oh my god, so scary! Ultimately, what's at stake with climbing? This is not what I signed up for. It's always your life. Rock, 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 rock! Ice, ice, ice! Oh! And one last thing. If you ever got a chuckle from a highway road sign, that's about to change. We're talking about those big light up boards on the side of the road that might say something goofy like, don't hurry, drive happy. In fact, the signs are so popular in Arizona that the state's transportation department even let the public vote on their favorites for the past seven years. Signal to the left, signal to the right, merge real smooth. You see that one right there says designated drivers make the best New Year's dates. Last year's winners were seatbelts always pass the vibe check, along with 
I'm just a sign asking a driver to use turn signals. But what if you didn't get that that last sign was a reference to Julia Roberts in the movie Notting Hill, which would be a lot of you considering the movie is now 25 years old. I'm also just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love her. What if you wound up focusing on trying to figure that out instead of focusing on, say, driving safely? Well, enter the U.S. government. A federal agency has finalized a new 1,100-page rule book for traffic control devices that officially puts the kibosh on anything funny. The Federal Highway Administration now says signs can't include an obscure meaning, references to pop culture, or messages that are, quote, intended to be humorous. Instead, safety billboards have to be, quote, clear and direct and meaningful to the road user. The feds are giving states two years to make the change. So that sign in Massachusetts that says visiting in-laws, slow down, get there late. Or the Pennsylvania sign, hocus pocus, drive with focus. Those will all be in violation of federal rules. The Federal Highway Administration says those humorous or lighthearted displays could be misunderstood or understood by only some drivers. And they say if that happens, it defeats the purpose of posting the sign in the first place. Of course, not everyone is happy with the government steering in this direction. Some critics say it's an example of federal bureaucrats telling states what to do. Drivers who've enjoyed these funny signs will have to find something else to fuel their laughter. For these and more stories, check out abcnews.com or the ABC News app. Before we go, I want to wish a quick happy birthday to my niece, Caroline Dommel, who is turning 21 today. It's a huge milestone. I'm Ann Flaherty. Brad's back in tomorrow. I'll catch you next time. at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wiener Mobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. You couldn't meet a couple with more going for them, but. Am I ever gonna love again? There's a time when love becomes betrayal, and a time when betrayal becomes murder. Bad Romance, the all-new 2020 limited series, premiering Monday night on ABC. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now.
Reporting from the Gulf Coast of Florida, covering Hurricane Adalia, I'm Micah Jachi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Right now on America This Morning, the record-breaking Arctic blast gripping the nation turns deadly. At least nine deaths now reported. Wind chills below zero in the deep south. Cars and trucks slip sliding away. And now parts of the country bracing for up to three feet of additional snow. Debate canceled why Nikki Haley has pulled out of the GOP primary debate just days before voters in New Hampshire make their choice. And this morning, Haley and Trump exchanging new attacks on everything from taxes to Social Security. The migrant crisis now turning into a housing crisis in several big cities as lawmakers consider billions more in taxpayer money to address the issue. We get an exclusive look at one migrant shelter housing mothers and their children seeking asylum. New evidence revealed against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer, what prosecutors say they found while following the suspect's daughter. Plus, more parents now choosing to homeschool their kids. What's behind the trend? The big retirement news from the NFL, a league favorite reportedly preparing to say goodbye. And the new crackdown at Costco. Get your membership card ready. From ABC News in New York, this is America This Morning. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm Andrew Dimber. Good Wednesday. I'm Rhiannon and Allie. We want to begin with the extreme weather taking a deadly toll from the deep south all the way to the northeast. At least nine deaths are now being blamed on the Arctic conditions. Parts of Tennessee have seen twice their annual snowfall average. And below zero wind chill temperatures are expected again this morning. In the northeast, two weather-related deaths in New Jersey. That region is now bracing for even more snow on Friday. But we begin right now in the south. This morning, the record-setting Arctic blast gripping much of the country has turned deadly in the south. At least six people have now died in Tennessee as a result of the extreme conditions. 11 inches of snow falling in Knoxville, wind chills plunging to 15 below zero. In Alabama, ice-covered roads made driving nearly impossible. These cars left stranded after sliding off the road. This tractor-trailer outside Birmingham swerving in all directions before jackknifing into the guardrail. And this truck sliding down a driveway after it was put in park. In Chicago, where it felt like 30 below zero, fires were lit under these train tracks to keep them free of snow and ice. Tesla vehicles were lining up at this charging station in Chicago. Owners say they had trouble charging their batteries in the extreme cold. At least 10 electric cars were reportedly towed from this charging station. In the Rockies, new avalanche warnings in Colorado after a series of deadly snow slides in neighboring states. New video shows the moment Bob Tillotson was rescued from an avalanche in Utah. Rescuers digging through feet of snow, finally saving Tillotson after about 15 minutes. But it appears no one can match Buffalo for snowfall totals. Another three feet of lake effect snow is expected by tomorrow night, on top of the 40 inches that forced the Bills game to be postponed over the weekend. Meanwhile, in the nation's capital, fun and games on the National Mall as people enjoyed a rare blast of winter. It's a lot of fun. I've been waiting a long time. More bitter cold extends from the Midwest to the deep south this morning, and the Midwest and Northeast could see more snow by this weekend. We'll check your forecast in a few minutes. Now to the race for the White House. Former President Trump is launching new attacks against former South Carolina Governor Nikki Haley just six days before the New Hampshire primary. Here's ABC's Lana Moise. This morning, debate canceled. Thursday's GOP primary debate in New Hampshire scrapped after Nikki Haley pulled out, saying she'd only attend if former President Trump was also on stage. That's who I'm running against. There is nobody else I need to debate. I have had five strong debates and have done plenty of them. He can't hide forever. Trump, fresh off his landslide win in Iowa, now focusing his attacks on Haley, who's been surging in the polls in New Hampshire. Trump last night hitting Haley on taxes and social security she's not tough enough nikki haley supported a brutal 23 percent national sales tax which is a disaster by the way why she did it and that's why some people call her the nikki new tax i don't i don't think that's particularly good haley's campaign slamming trump depicting him as a bully and a liar meanwhile ron DeSantis, after his second place finish in iowa touted his record on tax cuts while speaking in new hampshire last night and i think what i represent is somebody that has delivered 
uh, on those key conservative policies that we've all been wanting to see in Washington, D.C. ABC's Rachel Scott spoke to voters in the Granite State where independents can vote in next week's primary. Basically, I'm up in the air about whether I'm going to support Trump or Haley. Well, I think Nikki Haley is a nice girl. I think she's very smart, but she won't touch Trump. She really won't. She won't. She won't touch him at all. Haley is also making headlines after being asked on Fox News yesterday whether being a woman of color hurts her chances at winning the nomination. We're not a racist country, Brian. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Are we perfect? No. In the meantime, President Biden weighing in on the race. I'm still the only person to ever beat Donald Trump. And I'm looking forward to it again for the good of this country. Today, Trump is expected back in a New York courtroom for his defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Carroll. She is expected to take the stand. The jury is deciding whether damages should be awarded for comments Trump made about Carroll's sexual assault allegations. He was already found liable for sexually abusing her. Rhiannon, Andrew. Lionel, thank you. The Biden administration is expected to relist Yemen's Houthi rebels as a terrorist group after the U.S. carried out a new airstrike against them, destroying more missiles. This latest strike is in response to a series of attacks on commercial ships in the Red Sea, impacting global trade. The Houthis are supported by Iran. The CEO of Chevron warns oil prices could rise quickly if the attacks lead to a major disruption in shipments. New help for Israeli hostages being held by Hamas for more than 100 days now. The government of Qatar says a deal has been reached to deliver medicine to the hostages. It comes after Israel confirmed the deaths of two hostages seen in a recent Hamas video. The agreement reached by Qatar also provides more aid for Gaza. We turn now to the migrant crisis, which is also a housing crisis in several big cities. The extreme winter weather only adding to the challenges. This morning, ABC News' is streaming channel, ABC News Live, getting an exclusive look at a New York City migrant shelter that houses mothers and their children seeking asylum. We're at capacity for everyone. We really don't have any room at all. Christine Quinn, whose organization runs the shelter, says most of those staying here do not qualify for housing benefits or food stamps, making it difficult for them to move out and provide for their families. Families. And now, with the bitter winter cold settling in, many are unprepared. These families came to us and continue to come with the t-shirt on their back and the flip-flops on their feet. They're not ready for snow. They don't have winter jackets. New York's governor yesterday requested more than $2 billion to provide housing and health care for the roughly 70,000 migrants currently in the state, many of them sent by bus from Texas. It's the right thing to do for the migrants and for the city of New York. Continue focusing on securing work authorization and put the migrants and asylum workers to work. In Illinois, the governor has announced $17 million in new funds for Chicago suburbs that agreed to house migrants. Hundreds have been sleeping on city buses to keep warm. Many arrived wearing only shorts and T-shirts. Migrant crossings at the U.S. southern border hit a record high last month. Today, President Biden is meeting with congressional leaders, urging them to pass new border security funds, part of a $106 billion funding request that also includes money for the wars in Ukraine and Gaza. As part of that spending plan, Republicans have demanded stricter asylum laws and also expanded deportations. JetBlue and Spirit are deciding whether to appeal a federal judge's decision blocking their $3.8 billion merger. The Justice Department opposed the deal, saying it would lead to higher airfares. JetBlue and Spirit insist they need help competing with bigger airlines. A 10-year-old from Maryland is the latest visitor to the Bahamas to be bitten by a shark. Police say the boy was injured during a shark tank expedition at a resort on Paradise Island. He is reportedly in stable condition this morning. And just last month, a Massachusetts woman was killed by a shark in the Bahamas. Time now for your Wednesday weather.
Good morning. Waking up below zero again today from Chicago back to Omaha. Wake up weather will be the same in New York City as it will be in Houston, Texas. 19 degrees. Watch out for slick spots on the roads. Meantime, today will be dry and cool for most of the country. Some lake effect snow and some ice this morning in Portland, Oregon. Our next storm comes out of Texas on Thursday into Thursday night. The snow will spread through Friday night one to three inches into the early part of the weekend from Boston to D.C. I'm AccuWeather meteorologist Kevin Coskrin. Coming up, a new crackdown at Costco. But first, the new evidence against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer. What prosecutors say they found while following the suspect's daughter. And cicada invasion, a warning about this upcoming spring. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Friday night. He told me I've killed before. And I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive. Now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Back now with the sound of cicadas, which are coming back in force in just a few months. Experts warn two different groups will emerge from late spring across the Midwest and Southeast. It will be the first double cicada emergence in more than 200 years. The two cicada broods are expected to hit Illinois and Indiana the hardest. New evidence has been revealed in the case against the suspected Gilgo Beach serial killer in New York, but prosecutors say the investigation isn't over yet. Here's ABC's Andrea Fuji. This morning, the accused serial killer charged with murdering three women in New York is now charged with killing a fourth. The victim's daughter speaking publicly for the first time. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Maureen Brainard Barnes went missing in 2007 while working as an escort. Her body was found near three other women buried near Gilgo Beach on Long Island, New York. Rex Hewerman was already charged in the deaths of Megan Waterman, Amber Costello, and Melissa Bartholomew. They were known as the Gilgo Four as their deaths went unsolved for more than a decade. There are countless times I needed her and she was not there. I remember she read to me every night and now I can no longer remember the sound of her voice. Now prosecutors have revealed how they were able to link Hewerman to Brainard Barnes. The biggest uh, change is the DNA evidence. They say investigators followed Hewerman's daughter, who was not implicated in any of the killings, and were able to extract her DNA from a discarded drink, which linked Hewerman to the murder. The hair that was found on uh, Brainard uh, Barnes, it was found on the buckle uh, of the belt that secured her lower body. 
But prosecutors say the investigation is far from over. They say they've scoured electronic devices from Huerman's home and office, including two burner phones they say he used to contact sex workers as recently as last year, while also searching for porn and for information of the deceased victims. Huerman has pleaded not guilty to all of the charges. Six other bodies were found near Gilgo Beach. Authorities say it's unclear if Huerman was involved in those unsolved cases. His next court date is February 6th. Rhiannon, Andrew. Andrea, thank you. Costco has started a crackdown to keep non-members from using the store. Instead of just showing a membership card to a staffer when you walk in, some locations are now requiring that card be scanned. The scanners have been seen at Costco's in Washington State. The goal is to keep non-members from getting into the store with cards that do not belong to them. Coming up, a new study on the health effects of drinking juice, even 100% fruit juice. Also ahead, the big retirement news in the NFL. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live, streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir. Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We're back with the man who survived this dramatic crash near Los Angeles. Cornell Patrick was ejected from an RV after the vehicle hit the center divider on the freeway. He tells KABC, despite initial reports, he was not the one behind the wheel. His wife was driving. I had to get up and use the restroom. That's okay. the only reason my seatbelt was unbuckled. Okay. I was getting up to use the restroom. When I got up, I noticed that we weren't going straight. We were going sideways toward the median. She had fallen asleep. Oh. Patrick says he suffered multiple broken bones after being thrown from the RV. Glad he is okay. A warning for parents who give their kids 100% fruit juice. A new study finds, despite the juice having no added sugar, it is still associated with weight gain in children. Experts advise no juice for infants and just four to six ounces per day for older kids. And health officials are warning air travelers who pass through Washington, D.C. about a possible measles exposure. A person with a confirmed case passed through Dulles and Reagan airports two weeks ago. The unvaccinated may be at risk. The U.S. declared measles eliminated in 2000, but vaccine hesitancy is being blamed for more outbreaks. We turn now to the big retirement news from the NFL. This morning, one of the most popular players in the NFL reportedly calling it quits. Great job, Jason Kelsey. Run him out of the building. Sources tell ESPN Eagles All-Star Center Jason Kelsey intends to retire, making the announcement to his teammates after Monday night's loss. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. Kelsey was visibly emotional after losing to the Bucks, ending the Eagles season. The 36-year-old is the highest paid center in football, playing all 13 of his seasons in Philadelphia and winning a Super Bowl. Everybody wanted it more, and that's why we're up here today. Kelsey's fame skyrocketed in recent years after launching a podcast and starring in a documentary on Amazon Prime. 
Then, of course, Mama is the guy on the Jason's younger brother, Travis, is now dating Taylor Swift. You know, we kind of started last year with the podcast and everything, and it's continually built up more and more from the Super Bowl and, um, you know, uh, my brother's love life. People Magazine also named Jason one of the sexiest men alive this year. At one point this season, his jersey was the top selling among women buyers. You've noticed the attention over the past couple years, right? Yes. I mean, I think it's completely warranted, but I'm biased. Kelsey, also known for getting laughs, even dressing up as Batman after a game on Halloween. In his Amazon documentary filmed in 2022, Kelsey was candid about his concerns as a father with young daughters. I am fearful that, you know, who knows what the impacts of playing football are going to mean long term. Yeah, I have two girls and you know, some people end up getting CTE. Some guys live long, healthy lives. I have no idea what's going to happen. Jason has yet to answer questions publicly about his future. Coming up, Hulk Hogan to the rescue. Plus, what we've learned about the iPhone that survived a drop from 16,000 feet. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. You couldn't meet a couple with more going for them, but... Am I ever gonna love again? There's a time when love becomes betrayal, and a time when betrayal becomes murder. Bad Romance, the all-new 2020 limited series, premiering Monday night on ABC. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all new 2020. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Time to check the polls. We begin with no doubt reuniting after more than a decade. Can you believe it? Gwen Stefani made the announcement on Instagram saying the band is joining Coachella, the annual music festival in California. No doubt found mainstream success back in the mid 90s with songs like this one, Just a Girl. Stefani had a huge solo career after the band went on hiatus in 2004. They briefly reunited in 2012, but no doubt says they'll be back together in full swing at Coachella in April. Next, we're seeing a spike in homeschooling across the country. An estimated 2.7 million children are currently being homeschooled. That's compared to 1.5 million before the pandemic. Some parents are forming cooperatives to teach their kids together after voicing concern about traditional schools. Many of the reasons that top the list have to do with the school environment. So parents cite, uh, for instance, bullying safety, you know, general concerns about the quality of academics in schools, uh, school shootings. Now, critics of homeschooling worry about the quality of education, citing a lack of standardized testing and progress reports, as well as social development. Good Morning America will take a closer look later this morning.
Next, new details about the iPhone we told you about that reportedly survived falling 16,000 feet from a plane. An Oregon man says he found the phone after a door plug mishap on an Alaska Airlines plane this month, and now the brand of the phone case has been revealed. Spiegan says it made the case that protected the guy phone. The case is called the Cryo Armor. It sells for about 25 bucks online. Next, Hulk Hogan to the rescue. The 70-year-old pro wrestling legend was out with his wife and a friend Sunday night in Tampa. And on the way home, they witnessed a multi-vehicle car crash with one car on its roof. So Hogan says he used a pen to pop the deployed airbag and then pull the 17-year-old driver to safety. Thankfully, police reported only minor injuries. Finally, Kansas City Chiefs head coach Andy Reid's mustache has finally thawed after that playoff win over the weekend. The image summed up the brutal cold that the Chiefs and Dolphins were facing, and now a Kansas City bakery is offering their Andy Reid cake, frozen mustache included. It could be frozen again Sunday when the Chiefs travel to Buffalo, where it is also cold. <laughs> Top headlines next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries? In the car. I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Friday night. He told me, I've killed before, and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today, we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir. Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Checking more top stories now. The Club Q killer has pleaded not guilty to federal hate crime and weapons charges. Five people were killed at the Colorado Springs LGBTQ club back in 2022. The shooter pleaded guilty to state murder charges last summer. Former President Trump and Nikki Haley are taking new swipes at each other ahead of the New Hampshire primary, now just six days away. This Thursday's debate has been canceled. Haley refused to attend unless Trump is also on the stage, and Trump declined. Safety violations at a Mississippi poultry plant are being blamed for the death of a 16-year-old from Guatemala last year. Officials say he was pulled into a machine while cleaning it. The plant's owner faces more than $200,000 in fines. Today's weather, several feet of lake effect snow in western New York. More dangerously cold conditions across the Midwest and the South. Rain in the Northwest. Finally, the revival we've all been waiting for of VHS tapes. Our Danny New explains. Quick, where are the Schwarzenegger films? Foreign films are in the back. Ah, oh, video stores. We may not see them as much these days, but the tapes stuck around. VHS never left. There has always been people watching VHS tapes. Josh Schaefer here runs Lunch Meat, a magazine and releasing label dedicated to the increasing number of folks who still love popping in a good old VHS. Why do you think VHS is coming back but not DVDs? I think VHS has a particular feel to it. I think that people like the physicality of it. To generate the 1.21 gigawatts of electricity. 1.21 gigawatts! Just a few summers ago, a copy of Back to the Future sold at auction for $75,000. <laughs> and a copy of The Goonies was listed on eBay for $125,000.
and then it went national, nice. and now it's in our area too, in a couple spots. Here's the one in Lafayette. And as I reported last year, these free blockbuster dispensers have been popping up all over the country, offering people a lending library to share nostalgia together. There's a vibe. There's an aesthetic to it. It is important to preserve that look and to show it to new generations. I can't wait to tell my kids how often I taped American Idol. Three favorite movies, go. Uh, The Apartment. Sure, shows like Stranger Things have also turned up the nostalgia. And artists like Taylor Swift continue to dominate in vinyl sales. Before last Christmas, Luminate reported that more than 2 million vinyls were sold in one week. Clearly, folks have a hankering to own their favorite pieces of media again. You never know when something's going to go off streaming. You own and can operate at your leisure. Okay, kids, so once you have the tape, you need this thing called a VCR, and then you put it in there, unless there's already a tape in there, and then you can't, guys. That's the rule. <laughs> Thanks for the demo, Danny. And be kind. Rewind. <gasps> It's Wednesday, January 17th. Donald Trump shows up to a Manhattan courthouse to watch his own jury selection. We start here. The former president stands trial in another defamation case. A continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. A New York jury will decide damages in E. Jean Carroll's case. Leaders of a dysfunctional Congress are summoned to the White House. It's anybody's guess what sort of solution they're going to come up with. What will it take to keep the government from shutting down? And Ukraine says it's running out of ammunition. Well, we're on a test drive of a Ukrainian armored infantry vehicle. An exclusive look inside a Ukrainian arms production facility. From ABC News, this is Start Here. I'm Ann Flaherty. Good morning. Brad is fresh off his trip to Iowa and headed to New Hampshire, so I'll be filling in today. Just 12 hours after winning the Iowa caucuses, former President Donald Trump was back in a New York courthouse, this time opting to appear voluntarily, where he took a seat directly behind E. Jean Carroll. Carol is the magazine columnist who says Trump sexually abused her in a Manhattan dressing room in the 1990s. She sued him for that incident and for later defaming her in social media posts. But I uh, uh, felt strong because I knew I was telling the truth and I just stuck to it. Last spring, a jury agreed and awarded her $5 million. The verdict is a disgrace, a continuation of the greatest witch hunt of all time. Trump is appealing that verdict, denying all wrongdoing, and saying he doesn't know who Carol is, or at least he didn't before she took him to court. Now Carol's taken Trump to court again to answer defamation charges from 2019. To explain all this, let's bring in ABC correspondent Aaron Katursky, who sat in the courtroom yesterday watching it unfold. Aaron, first, can you explain, didn't she win this case already? She did win her case already, and yes, this is a separate case. It was last May. Good memory, and that E. Jean Carroll won a $5 million judgment against former President Trump. The judge has already said the earlier trial established the facts, established that Trump sexually assaulted E. Jean Carroll. Trump defamed E. Jean Carroll. So all that's at issue this time, and is how much in damages, if any, Trump should pay. Okay, and I understand that the former president, GOP frontrunner, was there during the jury selection. That must have been a surreal scene. Describe to us what happened. Can you imagine prospective jurors, you know, who are already annoyed they're at jury selection, they come into a courtroom not knowing anything, and there's the former president of the United States seated at the defense table. One woman seemed to either laugh or smile. Uh, there was a guy who stared at him for a good 10 seconds, whether in, in disbelief or awe or hatred or what, we don't know. Uh, but uh, one by one, they went through all of the, the questions you might expect when you're talking about a jury to sit in judgment of the former president. Uh, they were asked about their politics. They were asked about their social media. They were even asked if they had watched The Apprentice, which you know, 10 hands went up in the room. And in the end, uh, none of the people who, who talked about their, their political views or the guy who said he donated to Trump and, and believed the lie that the election was stolen from him, he didn't make it on the jury. And it's, it's uh, nine citizens who are going to decide 
whether E. Jean Carroll deserves more money than she has already won from Trump for defamatory statements denying her rape claim. She's accusing me of rape. A woman that I have no idea who she is. It came out of the blue. And I will tell you, I made that statement and I said, well, it's politically incorrect. She's not my type. And that's 100% true. She's not my type. The lawyer for E. Jean Carroll, a woman named Sean Crowley, who's a former federal prosecutor, asked the jury to ask themselves, what is it going to take? How much money is it going to take for former President Trump to stop? In fact, as he sat in court, the plaintiff's attorney counted 22 social media posts from Trump disparaging E. Jean Carroll, calling her a fake woman, calling the case fake, saying that he didn't know her, never touched her. And those are the same kinds of statements that got him in trouble with the jury last year and that could get him in trouble with, with a jury this time, too. So he keeps speaking about her and in ways that could get him in trouble. Can she just sue him over and over again? I suppose she could. But look, E. Jean Carroll is 80 years old and her attorneys say that when he called her a liar, said she made up her rape claim, uh, talked about her as a political operative, said she had ulterior motives, in an instant... Her attorney said Trump unleashed his his supporters and within days, a reputation that she built over decades as an advice columnist, form, formerly of Elle magazine and, and television, all that disappeared in an instant. And, and she ended up enduring a barrage of, of not only criticism, but some rather, you know, vulgar things said about her uh, that that she says destroyed her her reputation and and made her unable to 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 function socially the way she had and the defense message was essentially gotta suck it up you're famous that's what you wanted and you don't deserve any more money wow so what happens next opening statements come today and and we should hear from e Jean carroll straight away She's not going to be as expansive as she was in the last trial explaining what happened in that dressing room. So many of these facts are already established, and the judge said they're off limits in this trial. But she is ex expected to explain how she says she was affected by Trump's words. Her attorney said that he was the president of the United States when he made these disparaging and defamatory remarks. So he had the, the loudest microphone in the world. And, and she's going to explain to the jury what it was like to be on the receiving end of that. So it's a total false accusation. And I don't know anything about her. And she's made this charge against others. His attorney has signaled that former President Trump wants to testify. In fact, he asked that the trial be put off until after his mother-in-law's funeral scheduled for Thursday so that he could testify more easily. And the judge wasn't going to do that, but did make arrangements for him to testify on Monday the 22nd, if he so chooses. But, and he is going to be really limited in what he can say. He cannot say he doesn't know this woman. He cannot say that this sexual assault never happened. The judge has already told the jury that it did. So the challenge for Trump and his defense attorneys are going to rest, uh, try to restrain the, the parameters of his testimony. Aaron Katursky, thanks so much for being with us. Thank you, Ann. Next up on Start Here, a high-stakes meeting at the White House. More when we come back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. You couldn't meet a couple with more going for them, but... Am I ever gonna love again? There's a time when love becomes betrayal, and a time when betrayal becomes murder. Bad Romance, the all-new 2020 limited series, premiering Monday night on ABC. 
In Washington yesterday, like much of the country, it was a snow day. School was canceled, the federal government was closed, and kids, including my own, spent the day making pancakes and sledding with their friends. It's all good stuff, except if you work for Congress, because in just two days, the government runs out of money. House Republicans remain divided on whether to negotiate with Democrats, and many are insisting upon a major overhaul of the U.S. immigration system. It's a seriously tall order with just hours left on the clock. Now, House and Senate leaders say they have a plan for a short-term bill to keep the government afloat until March, but what about after that? Well, today, President Biden has summoned the four top leaders of Congress to the White House, including House Speaker Mike Johnson, to figure all this out. Let's bring in ABC's Capitol Hill reporter, Ali Pacorn, to break this down. Ali, what are we expecting from the meeting today? Well, it'll certainly be a big meeting. This is going to be one of the first times that the newly minted Speaker Mike Johnson meets with President Biden face to face. And when all four of these leaders get in the room... And it's anybody's guess what sort of solution they're going to come up with because as it comes to the southern border, we're in a bit of a knot. And that knot is affecting our ability to fund all sorts of things, including Ukraine and Israel, other items that are huge priorities for this administration. So Mike Johnson's going to be there. He's sort of representing this, uh, you know, the, the kind of the hard right of the Republican Party. They want to change U.S. border policy. Um, is he going to be in the minority in this room? Yeah, so everyone in the room, including Democrats, would tell you that they recognize that there's a problem going on at the southern border and they want to address it. The question is, how do we address it and what would it mean to address it in a way that's going to be palatable to both Democrats and Republicans who would ultimately be needed to pass any sort of package here. So when we get into the room today, you're going to have Johnson, as you mentioned, he he represents that most hardline approach. And his perspective is he wants a very aggressive border bill that was passed by the House earlier this year using exclusively Republican support. If President Biden wants a supplemental spending bill focused on national security, it better begin by defending America's national security. Democrats have already declared that bill dead on arrival in the Senate. But also on the other side of the table will be your Senate leaders. That's Majority Leader Chuck Schumer and Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. It's not often that you see these two getting together to advocate for the same thing. So this supplemental request that they're going to be going over today in the room is kind of a rarity and that Schumer and McConnell both really want it. At stake is the security of our country. The security of our friends abroad, including Ukraine and Israel, and nothing less than the future of Western democracy. We cannot afford to let these issues go unaddressed. Both of these men are huge supporters of Ukraine, but McConnell, in an effort to appease some of the Republicans in his conference, has said he's not going to back any Ukraine aid package that doesn't also include substantive policy changes at the southern border. Addressing the border crisis at home is a fundamental part of legislation that will help America meet each of the most glaring national security challenges. However, what that looks like for Mitch McConnell and what that looks like for Mike Johnson are different. And it's created what is essentially a pretty massive staring contest going on with no clear solution about how to fix things at the southern border. So President Biden is going to be calling in everyone today to see if there's a way to get to yes. So. While this top level meeting happens, there's just going to be a lot of media attention on that. But there is this other issue, which is that the government's going to run out of money. So what happens next with that? That's right. The government is actually a matter of days from shutting down on Friday night at midnight. And so Congress is going to need to be acting pretty quickly over the next few days to try to stop that from occurring. If they don't on Friday night at midnight, there will be a partial government shutdown. The good news is the ball has already started rolling to try to kick the can down the road and buy Congress a little bit more time to work out longer term funding solutions. The Senate voted last night the first in a series of procedural steps to extend the government funding deadline through March. But that actually still doesn't address the longer term issues with government funding that have plagued this Congress for several months now. So House Speaker Johnson, he has members within his own party who are very upset about another continuing resolution. Is he risking his speakership by putting this out there? Now that's a great question because you certainly wouldn't be wrong to point out that what Johnson is teeing his members up to vote on on Friday is exactly what Kevin McCarthy led his members into voting for that eventually got him stripped of his role as Speaker of the House in October. 
It is a near identical comparison. Johnson is once again going to be relying on Democratic votes to move a stopgap funding measure that does nothing to exact cuts that Republicans want to see forward. We don't think Johnson's going to lose his job for it. There is a lot less of an appetite to get rid of Speaker Johnson, who's only been in the role for about three months. I think House Republicans recognize that it's not necessarily great for the conference to be without a leader, especially going into an election year. We haven't seen a lot of that call to like strip him fully of his role, but certainly his right flank is very unhappy with this move. House Freedom Caucus, after it was announced on Sunday night that the Senate and House would try to move forward with this stopgap measure, called it a surrender. There were efforts to talk Johnson out of a larger funding agreement he and Schumer struck. Johnson is sticking by his decision to move forward with a short-term bill. He's saying it's going to buy Republicans the time they need to work out these longer solutions. But certainly, he's going to have some hell to pay with his right flank, who's very unhappy with this position. ABC's Allie Picorn on Capitol Hill. Allie will be watching your reporting. Thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, with all this dysfunction in Congress, it's almost easy to forget that there's another major crisis thousands of miles away, but one that Pentagon officials say is taking on increased urgency. The most effective response to Russia's ongoing missile and UAV attacks is to provide Ukraine with vital air defense capabilities and other types of military equipment that it needs to defend itself. Earlier this month, Ukraine's Air Force said it was only able to shoot down 18 of the 51 Russian missiles fired in a single night, raising questions about the country's air defense missile stocks. The country also is believed to be running seriously low on ammunition. The, the race to produce more military equipment. Can, can Ukraine compete with Russia on that? Sure. Sure, we can compete and we are competing very successfully, I think. This week, ABC foreign correspondent Tom Sufi Burge got an exclusive look inside a secret location in Ukraine to check out some of the country's growing domestic arms production. Let's bring in Tom to talk about it. Tom, let's start with the current state of fighting there right now. What is it that you're seeing on the ground? Well, and um, we were sort of near the fighting quite recently. Um, when you get close to the front lines, you can hear it. I mean, you can hear the booms of artillery, mortars. You can hear small arms fire. We also visited a medical stabilization point. I mean, that is a kind of makeshift, very simplistic hospital in a secret location because they're worried that it could be targeted by the Russians just back from the front lines. What are the typical injuries you're seeing at your stabilization point? Um, I would say the majority is uh, uh, fragment wounds uh, of the limbs. Uh, we have um, a lot of soldiers uh, stepping on the landmines. The chief doctor there basically said to us that he has seen 15,000 casualties in the entire war and he's basically become numb by everything. I think that the consequences of this um, I, I will see in like a couple of years after the war ends, if I survive. And he says at the moment they're seeing up to 80 casualties uh, in a matter of hours once things get busy. And we went to a major trauma hospital just a few hours west of there, so away from the fighting. Very hard for you and your staff. And doctors there told us they're seeing a 30% rise in casualties now. Heavily wounded soldiers coming through their doors compared to just a few weeks ago. So I think, you know, casualties for the Ukrainians are mounting. What's happened in the last few weeks is the Russians have, I think, retaken the initiative. <laughs> They have way more firepower, and Ukrainian soldiers are telling this, this time and time again. The, the Russians have more artillery, more artillery ammunition, more drones, and we're talking about lethal explosive drones, which are kind of flown on kind of single journeys at a target, and the Russians have way more of those deadly drones, and we're seeing the impact of that in those rising casualties. So a real mismatch in firepower resulting in these higher casualties. But so tell us about this arms production facility that you went to. Well, the Ukrainians are definitely, and I think this has taken added urgency because of the deadlock between the Biden administration and Congress over additional funding for the war here in Ukraine. And really the, the funding, people have got to realize, the funding that has been approved by Congress is pretty much running out. And that's what the White House is saying now. 
On the ground in Ukraine, there's been this impetus over the last few months to build up Ukrainian arms production. And I think that's taken on this added urgency now. Well, we're on a test drive of a Ukrainian armoured infantry vehicle, and Ukraine is really ramping up its arms production. We went inside a series of warehouses, a secret location. All of these boxes along here, there are mortar launchers, are there? Yep. The company, a Ukrainian company called Ukrainian Armour, which manufactures mortars, mortar shells, armoured vehicles, and trucks for carrying missile launchers, they spread their production very thinly over multiple sites because what we've seen in those missile attacks you mentioned at the top from Russia is that they are trying increasingly to target Ukrainian arms manufacturing sites. But they are ramping up production. Uh, the military production is booming, not only in quantities, booming in quantities, but also extending the product range. As in you're producing uh, more military equipment and different types. Different now. types, and we extend and we adopt to the conditions of the war. The, the problem is, is that Ukraine is starting from a much lower base than Russia. And I think at the moment in the war, we're really seeing the fact that, you know, ever since Vladimir Putin first became president of Russia, and that's 24 years ago, you know, Russia has been building up its military. And yes, lots of Western officials have said, well, Russia's missile stocks are running low because they fired so many throughout the course of this long war. But I think in the autumn, what we've been told by Ukrainian officials is that the Russians were stockpiling missiles. We're seeing that now from their recent attacks. And the, the Russians just simply have way more military might, way more firepower, and way more capacity to build arms and produce weaponry. And that is a major challenge for the Ukrainians, which they're trying to address. So then what happens if the U.S. doesn't reach an agreement and the money dries up, the support from overseas dries up? Well, we're already seeing the fact that Ukrainian artillery units, we visited an artillery unit a, a few miles back from the front lines in a position where they were firing from. We could really feel the force of this American gun. But these Ukrainian artillery units are now having to limit the amount they fire. The commander showed us their sort of stash of artillery shells, US supplied, and they had about 20 shells. And he said during the summer when the Ukrainians were on the offensive, they would have about 150, 160 shells. So it's a massive, massive reduction. They're having to limit how much they fire. Ukrainian officials are telling me this, that sometimes they're chat chatting to troops on the ground and the troops are saying, where is the ammunition? And they are limited. They can't give cover to Ukrainian infantry, which is a massive, massive thing. So we're already seeing the impact. Although... The, the shortage of artillery shells is also down to the fact that the West overall isn't producing enough artillery shells for this war and for the demand more generally. Israel has taken some of the American stock as well. In terms of Ukraine's manufacturing of weaponry, what it's calling out for from the United States and its allies is more cooperation, more technology coming to the Ukrainians to help them build better weaponry. They probably can't, for many, many years, produce as much as the Russians, but what they're saying is, share more of your technology, maybe not your most sensitive stuff, but share something more with us, help us, help us build better weaponry. And, and that is where we think we can get an edge over the Russians. Even if we run out of uh, weapons, we will fight with shovels. And we sat down with the foreign minister of Ukraine, uh, Dmitry Kulieba, and he came up with a pretty stark warning. If the West is not able of uh, stopping Russia in Ukraine, who else is it able to stop in other parts of the world? China. If you, China, China, you have, you, I, I, leave, I leave these answers to you. You have, you have to reflect on this. And he was pretty resolute, the foreign minister of Ukraine. He ruled out sitting down for negotiations with Russia until Ukraine has a much more favorable position on the battlefield. And of course, the argument by the Ukrainians is that the only thing standing between Russia and Western Europe is their military. So do you want them fighting with shovels or do you want to supply them with real munitions? Great reporting from ABC's Tom Sufi Burge. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Anne. Okay, one more quick break. When we come back, honk if you hate silly road signs. One last thing is next. All right, here we go. You ready? Okay. 
Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all new 2020. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. And one last thing. If you ever got a chuckle from a highway road sign, that's about to change. We're talking about those big light up boards on the side of the road that might say something goofy like, don't hurry, drive happy. In fact, the signs are so popular in Arizona that the state's transportation department even let the public vote on their favorites for the past seven years. Signal to the left, signal to the right, merge real smooth. You see that one right there says designated drivers make the best New Year's dates. Last year's winners were seatbelts always pass the vibe check along with I'm just a sign asking a driver to use turn signals. But what if you didn't get that that last sign was a reference to Julia Roberts in the movie Notting Hill, which would be a lot of you considering the movie is now 25 years old. I'm also just a girl standing in front of a boy asking him to love her. What if you wound up focusing on trying to figure that out instead of focusing on, say, driving safely? Well, enter the U.S. government. A federal agency has finalized a new 1,100-page rule book for traffic control devices that officially puts the kibosh on anything funny. The Federal Highway Administration now says signs can't include an obscure meaning, references to pop culture, or messages that are, quote, intended to be humorous. Instead, safety billboards have to be, quote, clear and direct and meaningful to the road user. The feds are giving states two years to make the change. So that sign in Massachusetts that says visiting in-laws, slow down, get there late. Or the Pennsylvania sign, hocus pocus, drive with focus. Those will all be in violation of federal rules. The Federal Highway Administration says those humorous or lighthearted displays could be misunderstood or understood by only some drivers. And they say if that happens, it defeats the purpose of posting the sign in the first place. Of course, not everyone is happy with the government steering in this direction. Some critics say it's an example of federal bureaucrats telling states what to do. Drivers who've enjoyed these funny signs will have to find something else to fuel their laughter. For these and more stories, check out abcnews.com or the ABC News app. Before we go, I want to wish a quick happy birthday to my niece, Caroline Dommel, who is turning 21 today. It's a huge milestone. I'm Ann Flaherty. Brad's back in tomorrow. I'll catch you next time. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all new 2020. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight.
We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting on Capitol Hill, I'm Devin Dwyer. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, a deadly winter weather emergency. Snow and ice are creating slick conditions on the roads, sending buses and trucks sliding out of control, and thousands of flights are canceled. The latest on the conditions, plus the new bitter cold blast on the way. Former President Trump is sharpening his attacks on Nikki Haley. What polls show about the former U.S. ambassador's support in New Hampshire as attention turns to the first in the nation primary. And Trump is expected back in court in his New York defamation trial. The case will determine how much he has to pay for defaming E. Jean Carroll. What's at stake for the former president as Carroll takes the stand? Plus, screen time and sensory issues in children. Dr. Patel digs into a new study with tips on how much time is too much and how to monitor it all. But we begin with that winter weather emergency. 26 states from North Dakota to Florida are under wind chill alerts today. The snow and ice forced more than 2,000 flight cancellations on Tuesday and at least 800 already today in the U.S. Trevor Alt is at LaGuardia Airport here in New York with the latest. More than 100 million Americans on alert as brutal wind chills, dangerous snow and ice conditions blast the country. Tennessee under a state of emergency as officials say six people have died due to the winter storm. Arctic air and record lows creating havoc on the streets. Oh God. In Philadelphia, a bus sliding down this icy road crashing into a fire hydrant. And in Alabama, this truck swerving on I-65 before jackknifing into the guardrail. Even this parked vehicle sliding down a slick driveway all on its own. Freezing temperatures leading to increased calls to plumbers. Watch as this homeowner in Allen, Texas, checks on the pipes for his pool. The filter exploding with icy shards flying into the air just as he walks away. And a pipe burst at this Chicago restaurant, completely flooding the floor, even spilling to the outside for the water to freeze again. It's just pain. It's just, uh, you're not, not expected. Experts now advising residents to shut off their water. The severe weather also downing power lines across the country, leaving thousands without power. We're a little concerned. We're bundled up and trying to stay warm. And in the sky, more than 2,000 flights canceled nationwide Tuesday, creating a travel nightmare for passengers like Regina Nelson Fambro. And it's a domino effect. So that made for an extremely long day to meet two TSA issues and one weather delay. And there's already been about 800 flight cancellations so far today. It's something I can definitely relate to. I tried to fly to Buffalo last night for this winter storm coverage. I tried two different flights with two different airlines at two different airports. And here I am reporting from LaGuardia. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt, thank you. An avalanche warnings are in effect in Colorado through tomorrow night as a new snowstorm moves into the Rockies. Heavy snow and strong winds have created very dangerous avalanche conditions. ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is in Steamboat, Colorado with more. Uh, Rob, heavy snow and strong winds in the Rockies, that seems normal. So why is the avalanche danger so high? Well, they've had, uh, for one thing, they've had over six feet of snow in 15 days. But more importantly, Diane, before that last month, I mean, everybody across the U.S. didn't have snow, including uh, the Rockies in the West. So sun, warm temperatures that created a very uh, slick and unstable base for all this snow to fall off on. So that's why we've seen just a myriad of, of snow slides the past week and a half. And here we go again. I mean, the snow just started an hour ago and we've we've got already an inch on the ground. We're probably gonna get one to two feet. We've got avalanche warnings that are up. 
category or a level four out of five being the worst. And some of the experts that we've talked to say that the conditions they've seen, some of the worst they've seen in like 30 years. So uh, you get a slope like this. We're down at the bottom of Steamboat, by the way. Uh, this sort of slope is not going to slide. You go steeper, that's when it starts to slide. But on this sort of terrain, you know, they break out snowcats like this on, on inbounds on mountain resorts, and that certainly helps smooth out the terrain and, and stabilize it somewhat. Uh, they got 30 of these here uh, in Tahoe where they had that slide. They didn't have snowcats. It was way too steep. So that was a problem there, Diane. All right, senior meteorologist Rob Marciano. Stay safe, Rob. Thank you. And ABC News meteorologist Mara Theodore is tracking that new storm system and those freezing temperatures settling in across the country. Samara? We are in for another shot of reinforcing cold air. So after we get to, through today's cold air, take a look at this. Over the next three days, a lot more cities, especially in the Northeast, are going to be feeling the chill. New York City feeling like nine degrees Sunday morning. Memphis, Saturday, feeling like a degree below zero. Even Chicago just as cold there. Now, we're also tracking this lake effect snow. They have not been able to catch a break. They've seen over 40 inches of snow this past weekend in cities like Buffalo, uh, Watertown. They are in for potentially another four feet of snow as the lake effect snow machine keeps going at least through Thursday and then we're tracking our next storm entering through the northwest states like Oregon under ice storm warnings from Portland into Eugene they could see up to an inch of ice accretions throughout the state we have winter storm warnings throughout the plains and even an avalanche warning in parts of Colorado there they've seen a ton of snow and they're in for more they could see one to two feet of snow along the coastline from Seattle down to Medford from San Francisco to Los Angeles anywhere from two to six inches of rain Diane all right, ABC News meteorologist Mara Theodore, thank you. Former President Trump is sharpening his attacks on Nikki Haley as polls show the former U.N. ambassador trailing him by just single digits in New Hampshire. Less than a week until the first in the nation primary there, Haley is betting big on New Hampshire after securing support from the state's governor. And after a stop in South Carolina, Ron DeSantis is also now making his case directly to New Hampshire voters. ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest from New Hampshire with that first primary just six days away. Donald Trump going straight from a Manhattan courtroom to the campaign trail, touching down in the Granite State for a rally. Get out and vote and make sure we win by big margins. The bigger the margin, the bigger the mandate that we have, the stronger we're going to be. The former president fresh off his resounding victory in the Iowa caucuses, going after his biggest opponent in the New Hampshire primary, Nikki Haley. I worked with her for a long time, and she was okay, not great. She was not great. She's not tough enough to deal with these people. I will tell you that. She's not tough enough. Polls show Haley trailing Trump by single digits. Dave Sweeney, a retired tech worker from Atkinson, said he's torn between Trump and Haley. What can Trump say today to win you over? Well, if he stops obsessing with the past and starts laying out a vision for the future for this country. Haley is betting big on this state after a disappointing third place finish in Iowa. We came out strong. Now we want to finish New Hampshire and come out even stronger. The former South Carolina governor who faced criticism for failing to mention the word slavery when asked about the cause of the Civil War, rejecting the suggestion that being a woman of color may hurt her chances of becoming the nominee. We're not a racist country. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis edged out Haley in the caucuses, heading directly to her home state of South Carolina, before appearing in a town hall in New Hampshire, making his case to voters. She does not have the ability to build the type of coalition that you need to win a Republican primary period, much less take on Donald Trump. DeSantis is trailing Nikki Haley here in New Hampshire. He was forced to cancel one of his events due to road conditions and weather. As for Nikki Haley, her campaign releasing a statement saying that America has always had racism but has never been a racist country. Haley says she will not agree to debate unless the former president agrees to do the same. Trump has provided no indication that he plans to take the debate stage. So the ABC News WMUR debate scheduled for tomorrow night has been canceled with the primary just six days away, Diane. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And former President Trump is heading back to court for his defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Carroll. Trump was already found liable for sexually assaulting Carroll in the 90s, then defaming her in 2022. Now she's expected to take the stand to make the case that he also defamed her in 2019 and should pay additional damages. Senior Investigative Correspondent Erin Katursky has the latest.
Former President Trump again today choosing the courtroom over the campaign trail, returning to his civil defamation trial here where his accuser is expected to testify. This is all part of an unprecedented campaign. As Rachel says, while his Republican rivals grinded out in the primary states, Trump detours to court, at one point taking his seat right behind former advice columnist E. Jean Carroll and twisting and turning to eye prospective jurors as they answered questions about everything from politics to social media to whether they watch The Apprentice. And this is Trump's second defamation trial against Carol. Last year, a jury finding him liable for sexually assaulting and defaming her, awarding $5 million in damages. Still, as Trump sat in court, Carol's attorney said she counted 22 posts on social media from Trump, calling it a fake case from a fake woman. Trump did not stick around long enough to hear Carol's attorney then ask the jury, it's time to make him stop. It's time to make him pay. Carol's asking for at least $10 million. Trump's attorney, meanwhile, minimized the case, saying Carol's just out for a windfall because some people on social media said mean things about her. Money is the only issue at this trial, but for Trump, it's another chance to turn a legal liability into a political weapon. Senior investigative correspondent Erica Tursky, thank you. And the Biden administration says it plans to relist Yemen's Houthi rebels as a global terrorist group. This comes after repeated attacks by its militants on commercial shipping in the Red Sea and the Gulf of Aden. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce has the latest. Hi, Mary. Well, after weeks of relentless missile and drone attacks by the Houthis, today the Biden administration plans to designate the militia as a terrorist organization, putting them back on the list after President Biden removed them in 2021 over humanitarian concerns, worried that the designation would make it nearly impossible for critical aid to reach Yemen's impoverished civilians. But now, beginning in the middle of next month, the U.S. will consider the Iran-backed militants as a specially designated global terrorist group, blocking their access to the global financial system. The militants have been terrorizing commercial vessels in the Red Sea and the Sea of Aden for weeks, claiming to retaliate for Israel's war with Hamas. It has caused a costly disruption to one of the busiest shipping routes in the world. Now, after issuing multiple warnings that were ignored, the Biden administration responding with strikes three times in the last week. The president's national security advisor saying this is now an all hands on deck situation. Diane. Chief White House correspondent Mary Bruce, thank you. Coming up, the suspected Long Island serial killer pleads not guilty in a fourth killing. The new evidence prosecutors say links him to the murder. Also ahead, a Costco crackdown, the change that could be coming to the Superstore and how it could impact your membership. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir. Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show.
Welcome back to ABC News Live. First, homeschooling is on the rise despite easing COVID restrictions. While schools are now open, millions of students are currently estimated to be homeschooled, with some parents saying they're concerned about safety and bullying. ABC News' Becky Worley has more. Alicia Wright of Richmond, Virginia, has been homeschooling her four children for nearly 10 years. It was a challenging decision. We have always been fans of child-led education. She built the curriculum around subjects that piqued their interest and banded together with other parents in a cooperative where multiple students learn from other parents or, in Wright's case, an outside instructor. We don't spend a lot of time in our house at a kitchen table. We really prescribe to the idea of experiential learning. So we visit a lot of museums. We attend a lot of plays and theaters. We're out in the community trying to um, get engaged and be involved through community service. Experts say the pandemic caused the number of children homeschooled to increase. People thought that homeschooling would maybe peak with the pandemic, but instead the secret is out. And I think that's what has happened. It did not go back down as everybody expected it would be to pre-pandemic levels. And the Washington Post found that nailing down an exact number of children homeschooled is close to impossible. 11 states don't even require parents to report if their child is homeschooled. But the Post estimating that there are currently 2.7 million homeschooled kids compared to 1.5 million in 2019. Many of the reasons that top the list have to do with the school environment. So parents cite, uh, for instance, bullying, safety, you know, general concerns about the quality of academics in schools, uh, school shootings. But some critics of homeschooling worry about the quality of education that kids are receiving, citing a lack of standardized testing and in many states, no requirements to submit assessments of progress. Some criticism is valid and some is not valid. Homeschooling can differ in quality just like schools can differ in quality. I think the mistake is to measure homeschooling by school standards alone when many of us are not trying to replicate school. While Wright admits homeschooling isn't for everyone, she says it works for her family. Homeschooling uh, allows parents to still stay actively involved, to still stay actively engaged, and to build even closer relationships because you are really helping to facilitate and guide their interests and their passions. Our thanks to Becky Worley for that report. And while we might think of homeschooling as one parent sitting at a table all day going over lessons, many are also joining co-op style setups where they have some at-home instructions but are also learning in small groups in the community. Meanwhile, new research is showing a link between fruit juice and weight gain in kids. The new JAMA Pediatrics Analysis looks at more than a dozen studies, which found a positive association between drinking 100% fruit juice and BMI. Earlier on GMA, ABC News medical correspondent Dr. Darian Sutton explained the findings and what they mean. So what did the study find? Well, you know, first and foremost, these studies are helpful because they help us provide evidence-based decisions so that we can mm -hmm. guide our children to better decisions about their diet and habits around food. So if you look at this study, it's an analysis of over 40 different studies. And what they found is that just one glass of that 100% juice, uh, and that's a juice that's labeled uh, sometimes deceptively of no mm. added sugar, is associated to an increase in weight, weight gain, and an increase in BMI. And, you know, this is important because more than almost 15 million children live with childhood obesity in this country. Country, right. And that is correlated to other types of diseases, such as metabolic disease, diabetes, liver disease, aside from obesity-related cancers. So mm -hmm. it's about controlling these habits now so that we can have a better future. And you're going to show us just how much sugar we're talking about just here. How and much. what's the difference when you say the 100% juice as opposed to other juices? So when you see the 100% juice, you'll often see the label, or the label beneath it stating no added sugar. And that's simply, Robin, because there's already enough sugar in it. So mm -hmm. let's just take a look okay. at it. Our orange juice. A cup of orange juice has four and a half teaspoons spoons of sugar and one gram of fiber and I'll get to fiber in a second because it's really important as opposed to a whole orange is three teaspoons of sugar and three grams of fiber and then if you look at a cup of apple juice you have six, excuse me six teaspoons of sugar zero grams of fiber and then an wow. apple at three grams of fiber and the reason why it's important to address the fiber is because that helps children stay full and as opposed to juices fruits also break down more slowly in the body that leads to less spikes in your blood glucose that leads to less spikes in your insulin and 
and then that eventually will lead to, if you don't treat it, insulin insensitivity, which is the basis of diabetes. Yeah, that's right. Okay, you mentioned fiber. Yes. Okay, so how can you sneak in a little something, an alternative for kids? You have to be creative yeah. uh, because it's really difficult. Sometimes children just do not want to get off the mm -hmm. sugar, and I understand it. I was a child who loved juice as well. And so here are some examples. It's about making your water creative. You can use different types of fruits like strawberries, mm. mangoes, pineapples, and you can even freeze these and use these instead of ice cubes so that when they break down, it provides some sweetness for the child. And then if your child likes bubbly drinks, you can also use sparkling water and you can add fruits to it to make it more flavorful. And it's not about juice being, you know, don't eliminate it fully. If the child loves it, you can use it, but it shouldn't be a regular part of their diet. Treat it like a treat. And if you want to give them some, you can dilute it. Pour a little bit in the water, pour a little uh. bit in the, um, the sparkling juice, or excuse me, sparkling water. And it has some taste to it, but it's just less sugar. Good tips there from Dr. Sutton. Thank you. Coming up, new findings on cancer and young adults. Why the American Cancer Society says cases in one age group are rising and how to lower your risk. But first, is Eagle star Jason Kelsey flying off into retirement? What he and his brother Travis are sharing on their new podcast about what's next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. Friday night. He told me, I've killed before, and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today, we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Streaming free on ABC News Live. You couldn't meet a couple with more going for them, but... Am I ever gonna love again? There's a time when love becomes betrayal, and a time when betrayal becomes murder. Bad Romance, the all-new 2020 limited series, premiering Monday night on ABC. Reporting from the border of Texas and Mexico, I'm Mireya Villargal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. The 35th annual GLAAD Media Awards nominations are out. The awards highlight programming with fair and inclusive representations of LGBTQ people and issues. And we are proud to say ABC News is nominated for six awards in outstanding journalism, including ABC News Live's Pride Across America special, which included five hours of live coverage from some of the nation's biggest pride marches. The GLAAD Media Awards will be held on Thursday, March 14th in Los Angeles and Saturday, May 11th in New York. And Jason Kelsey is speaking out about reports that he's retiring. The seven-time pro bowler spent all 13 of his seasons in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles. Now in their new podcast episode, he tells his brother Travis Kelsey he doesn't know what next year is going to look like and he's not ready to make an official announcement. ABC's Will Reeve has the latest. Reports Jason Kelsey is saying goodbye to the game he loves. When he says he's done, it's just going to be because he's tired of playing yeah. because he's still at the top of his profession. The future Hall of Famer reportedly telling his Philadelphia Eagles teammates after their Monday night playoff loss that he's retiring after 13 seasons. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. But this morning on the latest episode of the New Heights podcast, 
Kelsey telling brother Travis it was too soon to make an official announcement. I don't think that it would be uh, respectful or even accurate uh, to be able to do that right after a game like that. Yeah. The 36-year-old Kelsey was the best center of his generation, selected to seven Pro Bowls, six All-Pro teams, and winning a Super Bowl. But his notoriety far exceeding the norm for an offensive lineman. His outsized personality regularly making headlines on new heights. The popular podcast he hosts with brother Travis. You were People Magazine's finalist for Sexiest Man Alive. And um, unfortunately, would you come in like second? According to people, but if you ask Twitter, I was first. One of the greatest Eagles players ever. He's a man amongst the people. I used to joke around with him, whenever you retire, we always have a job for you. He was a force at the front of the Eagles' signature play, the Brotherly Shove. Brotherly Shove again. Touchdown, Philadelphia. And known for that brotherly love with brother Travis who said he chose his number 87 with the Chiefs to honor the year his big brother was born. You're the only reason why we're 87 anyway. <laughs> Never told you that, man. You started the legacy. The two playing each other in last year's Super Bowl. In November, on the eve of what would end up being the final time Jason and Travis faced each other in the NFL, it's, it's their mom really Donna reflecting on what a trip it's all been. Do How does the dream of what you might have had for your boys growing up compare to the reality that they're living now? Oh, this far surpasses anything I could have imagined. Jason's wife Kylie, the mother of their three daughters, looking forward to the next chapter. I would love for Jason to retire. I always say I would love for him to retire when he can still get down on the floor and play with the girls. Fly, eagle, fly. Jason himself looking forward to what's next in the Amazon Prime documentary, Kelsey. At every meaningful part of my life, I've had people there to reaffirm me, whether it's my parents, whether it's my family members, or this whole city. They've been there. Whatever's next, for 13 years, Kelsey was tough and loyal and real in a city where those qualities take you further than most. He started 156 consecutive games to finish his career. That's a franchise record. And he's hinted at retiring for a few years now. He's pointed to the potential long-term effects to the brain that taking so many hits can have, especially as a center. It's a rather anonymous position, but Kelsey transcended it through his play, his bond with the only city he ever played for, and yes, being Taylor Swift's boyfriend's brother. Some combination of all that helped his number 62 jersey reach number five on the NFL jersey sales list. It's actually a few spots ahead of Travis, Diane. Interesting. ABC's Will Reeve, thanks for that. Coming up, Alec Murdoch's push for a new trial heads to a hearing. How long it's expected to last and the ground rules set by the judge. Also ahead, investigative journalist Mariana Van Zeller is here to talk season four of Trafficked what it's like to infiltrate black markets and what you can expect in tonight's first episode. Plus, meet the viral librarian spreading joy through books, how he became an internet sensation and his advice for those dealing with internet bullies. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all new 2020. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at Portland, Maine on this Wednesday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. 26 states from North Dakota to Florida are under wind chill alerts today. The snow and ice forced more than 2,000 flight cancellations on Tuesday and nearly 800 already today. Parts of Tennessee have seen twice their annual snowfall average, and more snow is expected in the Northeast this Friday. President Biden is set to host congressional leaders at the White House today to discuss funding for Ukraine, Israel, and border security. The $106 billion request has been stalled in Congress for months as Republicans demand major changes in immigration policy. The administration is warning that aid for Ukraine is running out and that further delay will help Vladimir Putin on the battlefield. And Costco is trying a new way to crack down on membership sharing. According to USA Today, the retail giant is testing out devices at store entrances where customers would scan their membership cards. This would keep non-members out and end the practice of having to show your card and photo ID at checkout. Meanwhile, the judge is laying ground rules as Alec Murdoch pushes for a new murder trial. In 13 days, the disgraced attorney is expected back in court for a three-day hearing to determine if he gets a new trial for the murders of his wife and son. Now the judge says the convicted killer won't be allowed to testify about his claims that the court clerk in his trial tampered with the jury. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest. The stage now set for Alec Murdoch's push for a retrial. After a tense hearing, the convicted murderer learning who will and won't be allowed to testify in an upcoming hearing regarding his claims that court clerk Becky Hill tampered with the jury during his trial. Are we entitled to evidentiary hearing? The law is crystal clear that we are. The disgraced lawyer who was found guilty of killing his wife and son sitting quietly watching as the judge decided that the only witnesses that can be questioned will be the 12 jurors who decided his fate and Hill herself who read their verdict. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Murdoch's legal team accusing Hill of pushing the jury to make a quick decision to secure for herself a book deal and media appearances that would not happen in the event of a mistrial. Hill denying those allegations, but later admitting to plagiarizing part of her book about the trial, which has since been pulled for purchase. Motive, selling books. But the judge limiting what questions Murdoch's defense team can ask Hill when she takes the stand. Because this is not the trial of Ms. Hill. It is about her contact, if any, with the juror and what she said. 
And let's not forget these jurors already gave six weeks of their time during this trial. The judge planning only one day to question them to limit them having to miss even more work. Court clerk Becky Hill will need to be available all three days. Meanwhile, state investigators now confirming they have opened two investigations into her behavior. Diane. Eva Pilgrim, thanks for that. And prosecutors in the Gilgo Beach murders case say they have new evidence linking suspected serial killer Rex Huerman to the killings. This is Huerman pleaded not guilty to a fourth murder charge. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has the latest. Suspected serial killer Rex Huerman indicted in the death of a fourth woman found murdered near Gilgo Beach in Long Island. We've charged the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes to add to the, uh, to the already charged murders. Maureen Brainard Barnes' remains were found in 2010, along with three other women known as the Gilgo Four. Last July, Hewerman was arrested and charged with the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. In a new filing, prosecutors also say they have new DNA evidence connecting Hewerman to the murders, linking a hair found on a belt buckle used to restrain Ms. Brainard Barnes's remains to his estranged wife, Asa Ellerup. A hair found with another victim's remains linked to their daughter, Victoria. The updated indictment included new details of the lengths investigators went to collect that DNA evidence. In May of 2023, undercover agents trailed Victoria Hewerman on a Long Island Railroad train, observing her drinking from a gold can seen here. They then retrieved that can from a trash bin for analysis. Brainard Barnes's daughter, Nicolette, speaking publicly for the first time since her mother disappeared when she was just seven years old. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all charges and is still being held without bail. His next court appearance is scheduled for next month. Authorities continue to investigate the unsolved deaths of at least six other victims found near Gilgo Beach. Diane. Stephanie Ramos, thank you. Let's bring in host and legal analyst at the Law and Crime Network, Terry Austin, for more on this. Terry, thanks for coming on. You know, earlier on GMA, the lead prosecutor in the Gilgo Beach murders case spoke to George Stephanopoulos about new technology that they're using in this investigation. I want to play that for you. The DNA evidence that actually comes from the, killer, from the killer's ex-wife. Uh, his defense attorney says this DNA is problematic. Well, it's cutting edge. Uh, the, uh, the DNA itself was extracted from the hair back in 2010, uh, and at that time there, were, there was no method to obtain nuclear DNA profile from hair. Uh, that has since changed, uh, so we're on the cutting edge with regard to using this DNA analysis to obtain that. So how important is this cutting edge technology in a case like this, and what kind of impact could it ultimately have here? Well, it's going to allow the investigators to determine in many cases, not just this case, who might have been involved. They can get DNA from family members and trace it back if it's in a database to an individual who might have committed that crime. So I think we're going to see other cases where we have particularly serial killers and there is any DNA and it could be traced back to a family member. You heard the talk about the daughter and the information they received from her DNA, tracing it back to him. I think it's extremely important that they are able, as time goes on, to do more and more with this DNA evidence. Terry, Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all the charges here. He's being held without bail. So what's next in this case? Well, you know, Diane, everyone obviously deserves a defense, including someone who has been accused of such horrendous crimes. I think what the defense team is doing is the exact same thing the prosecution is doing, which is lining up any evidence that could possibly help the client. The fact that he's never been arrested before, the fact that he is an upstanding person in the community, they are going to try to make those arguments. Obviously, they don't have to put on a case at all in a murder case. The prosecution stands with that burden of proof. But I think the defense is going to try to appeal ultimately when this comes to trial that their client had nothing to do with it. They don't have his exact DNA. That is something they'll probably try to argue and that he had nothing to do with these crimes. We'll see what happens. We still have a very long way to go.
And before I let you go, Terry, Alec Murdoch was also in court yesterday. A judge laid the ground rules for his upcoming hearing as he pushes for a new murder trial. So what do you make of those rules that the judge laid out? And what are you watching for in this case? Well, I think this judge is excellent. She made sure that she limited the hearing, and that makes sense. This is a hearing to determine whether or not there's going to be a new trial, and the standard there is very high. Not only has there have to be jury tampering, but there has to also be prejudice, and she's limited the evidence to just listening to Becky Hill, the individual involved here, listening to the jurors. She doesn't want to hear about any book deals. She doesn't want to hear about anything else Becky Hill might have done. And I think it's a good ruling. So when this hearing does appear, I think we're going to see a quick ruling. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a very difficult burden to show that there was prejudice. So I'm not sure what's going to happen, but it sounds like the judge is going to let this trial stand on its own unless she finds that there was prejudice. And so far, we just have that one affidavit from a juror. So we'll see what happens. All right, host and legal analyst Terry Austin, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Coming up, new findings on cancer and young adults. Why the American Cancer Society says cases in one age group are rising and how to lower your risk. Also ahead, screen time and sensory issues in children. Dr. Patel digs into a new study with tips on how much time is too much and how to monitor it all. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. There is a monster in me. Friday night on ABC. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back. The American Cancer Society has just released startling new findings about cancer rates in people under 50. The Society's annual report says while overall cancer deaths are de decreasing, cancer diagnoses in young people are increasing. American Cancer Society Chief Scientific Officer Dr. William Dayhut spoke to Robin Roberts earlier on GMA. Take a look. For this year, there'll be over 2 million people that will be diagnosed with cancer for the first time. That's the first time we've ever been over that number. And we're seeing some cancer trends that I think are really important for people to hear about. We're seeing a shift in the demographics. It used to be that, that people over the age of 65 had the greater proportion of cancer. They still do, but things are changing. And now it looks like that people actually under the age of 55 are seeing an increase in their cancer incidence, more likely to be diagnosed than they were before. And we're seeing in colorectal cancer, is one cancer that's we really see the numbers changing. Back in the 1990s, colorectal cancer was the fourth leading cause of death mm -hmm. of men and women with cancer. But now it's number two in, in women and number one in men. 
and we're still seeing cancer disparities. You know, sadly, too many black women, too many black men are dying from cancer, many more than their white comrades. And we're also seeing it in, in a cancer called endometrial cancer, where if you're a black yeah. woman, you're two times more likely to die from the disease as a white I woman. Get now, when asked why he thinks these cancer diagnoses in younger people are increasing, Dr. Dayhut says that it's something external to the patient, meaning not genetics, but rather diet, obesity, or in utero effects. As for the good news, rates of lung, prostate, and cervical cancers are decreasing due to decrease in smoking, emphasis on screenings, the HPV vaccine, and improvements in treatment. And now it's time for Patel It Like It Is, where Dr. Lok Patel shares health advice on the topics that matter most to you. Today we're talking about screen time sensory issues for toddlers. Here's Dr. Patel with what parents should know. Can too much screen time in toddlers cause sensory issues? In a recent study in JAMA Pediatrics, researchers found that children who were 12 months old who were watching television or DVDs were twice as likely to develop sensory processing issues when they were three years old. Did you say DVDs? Yeah, that survey data was collected before 2014. Imagine how many more screens are around now, 10 years later. But back to the findings. Sensory processing issues refer to challenges adapting to sensations such as bright lights and loud noises. And atypical sensory processing can occur with medical diagnoses such as ADHD and autism. And it's important to note that this study just showed a link. It did not say that screen time is the sole culprit. But experts agree that screen time in young children should be limited because too much of it can cause delays in language development, problem solving skills, behavioral issues, and honestly, who knows what else? Because as some put it, our digital world feels like a massive, uncontrolled experiment on children and their developing brains. Here are some guidelines according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. For kids aged 18 months and younger, avoid screens. Although we can make an exception for some video calls with family. Kids 18 to 24 months, only high quality programming with a parent or caregiver also watching. And kids aged two to five years, limit non-educational screen time to just one hour a day. And look, no one is trying to demonize screens or shame parents. I'm also the parent of a young child. We're tired, we're burned out. We are just emerging from a pandemic and sometimes we need a break. But try to keep it under control and age appropriate. Just remember children need to experience the real world too. And Dr. Alok Patel joins me now for more on this. Dr. Patel, what counts as screen time here? When my kids talk to their grandparents on a screen, do I have to factor that into their daily limits? And what do you say to parents who say cutting out screen time means they get no break, they can't get anything done, and then they're more stressed and worse parents as a result? Asking for a friend. Oh my gosh, I can identify with your words because screens are literally everywhere. You know, the first thing I want to address is your, your first point, that it's okay to use screens for kids to be connecting with loved ones and relatives. But we have to remind parents that this really does feel like uncharted territory. And we know that nothing replaces actual live human interactions and activities and going outside to feed language development, learning, creativity, and all these facets. And you know, one important thing with this previous study with atypical sensory processing is some of the bad news regarding screens really does show a link, not necessarily causality. So in other words, Parents can offset some of these issues with screen time by getting their kids real interactions. But remember, we have studies linking screen time in toddlers to delays in language development, attention spans, problem solving skills, poor sleep, weight gain, even poor academic performance. There's a 2019 JAMA article showing a link between toddlers and screen time and then developmental milestones later. And that was 2019 before our screen filled pandemic. So what exactly is high quality programming and what are best practices for parents or caregivers who want to co-watch as you describe it? I really feel like high quality programming is a marketing term. So parents should be wary when they go online or you go to a streaming service and you see these buzzwords like educational programming for toddlers, high quality programming. I wanna quote UNICEF in saying that babies need humans, not screens, because nothing really replaces Unfortunately, I should say this boredom and sitting down to fuel curiosity and creativity. Diane, you remember when we were kids not long ago when you're going to a dinner party or a road trip or on the plane? We didn't have devices. You had to sit down and figure out what you were going to do to entertain yourself. 
And so reiterating those AAP guidelines for parents under 18 months, we really want to keep screens away, except for video calls, 18 to 24 months. Make it those that programming that actually can fuel some type of conversation between you and your child, your toddler. You can ask questions about the screen, two to five, one hour per day, three hours on the weekends, which actually seems like a lot. And kids six and above start to teach them good digital habits. Remember, kids learn best from humans in real time, and we want to make sure we focus and captivate on that. So any tips for weaning those older kids from their screens? You know, creating a family media plan, something that everyone is on the same page, is a really good first step. This can include things like screen screen free zones and times so that kids have an expectation of when screens are not allowed. You can use lock screen reminders, be a good role model, make sure that you are also practicing you know, avoiding screens, stay engaged with your kids and talk to them, interact with them when they're not using screens and make sure we're teaching all older kids, adolescents and teens, good digital citizenship. By that, I mean, knowing how they can protect their own privacy, how they can practice kindness and empathy online as well. These are all really great tips. And also, Diane, here's a fun one that I just learned. Turn off autoplay on all streaming services. So once that little show is over, your young ones don't see the next show pop up and say, oh my gosh, I want another one. That's not good. That's that, even bad for us. That is a great tip for everyone in my family. Um, and Dr. Patel, before I let you go, I want to ask you about the new research showing a link between fruit juice and weight gain in kids. This new JAMA Pediatrics Analysis is looking at more than a dozen studies and, and talking about a positive association between drinking 100% fruit juice and elevated BMI. So what's your big takeaway from this study? My big takeaway is to, for parents out there to not fall for what you see on some of these labels where it says things like all natural fruit juice are filled with vitamins and minerals and get the perception that these are healthy. Fruit juices can often be loaded with sugar without the actual filling effects of fiber. So kids could actually eat seven apples worth of sugar, when in reality, what kid is actually gonna eat one apple and then want six more? Now this study, as you mentioned, is a meta-analysis. So it looks at about 42 studies and they found a positive association with one day of, with having one serving of 100% fruit juice a day with weight gain. We already know that fruit juice is associated with issues like diabetes, obesity, and dental disease. And a recent survey showed that about 50% of kids get a serving of 100% fruit juice each day. So definitely not only more research is needed, but a, a broader conversation with parents about really limiting fruit juice. And, Way and too much sugar even the one the that says, of eating real. And that's even the one that says no sugar added. Absolutely, because guess what? There is sugar found naturally in fruits, and if you strip the fiber and pulverize it all down into a fruit juice, you can get as much sugar as a soda. Wow. All right, Dr. Patel, always great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Patel is taking your questions. Leave a message on our Instagram feed at ABC News Live, and he might answer your question right here on Friday. Meanwhile, the Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, is currently recovering in hospital after abdominal surgery. Kensington Palace says that the royal underwent a planned abdominal surgery this week and that the condition was non-cancerous. The palace says in a statement that the princess, quote, hopes that the public will understand her desire to maintain as much normality for her children as possible and her wish that her personal medical information remains private. She's expected to be in the hospital for 10 to 14 days and is unlikely to return to her official duties until after Easter. Coming up, investigative journalist Mariana Van Zeller is here to talk season four of Traffic, what it's like to infiltrate black markets and what you can expect in tonight's first episode. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families trunk. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir.
Moore, Deborah Roberts. The all-new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. You couldn't meet a couple with more going for them, but... Am I ever gonna love again? There's a time when love becomes betrayal, and a time when betrayal becomes murder. Bad Romance, the all-new 2020 limited series, premiering Monday night on ABC. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Award-winning investigative journalist Mariana Van Zeller is shining a light on black markets, human trafficking, hitmen, and more in the new season of Trafficked from Nat Geo. Van Zeller takes us inside some of the most dangerous black markets in the world, talking with the people behind illegal trafficking networks and getting up close and personal with the merchandise. We saw you yesterday. You were making the drugs. Are you here to give it so they transport it, or do you actually transport the drugs too? Oh, in this car? Packed as if it's a suitcase? Wow. It's heavy. Very heavy, huh? How much is this? 10 kilos, 10 kilos, 10 kilos. I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the house. Season four of Traffic covers everything from the trade in body parts and hired assassins to the smuggling of brides. And Mariana Van Zeller joins me now for more on that. Mariana, the access is unbelievable, what you're discovering here. Thank you so much for coming on. You infiltrate all these different trafficking networks. So what is, what is it like getting so close to the sources of some of these networks and, and seeing how, for example, they're handling drugs in their trafficking? Yeah, it's not easy. I'd say that it's the hardest part of my job always. My job at my, my team is that we spend months, sometimes even years, trying to get access to these groups. Uh, and there's, you know, we've gotten used to getting no a lot of times. I'd say for every one yes, we get dozens, if not hundreds of no's. But at the end of the day, I think we've gotten unprecedented access for many reasons. One of which is the fact that whoever I speak to, I always tell them I'm here with empathy. I'm here to understand you with curiosity. I'm not here to judge. And I think that sort of, you know, uh, very human characteristic of wanting to be understood goes a long way and sort of helps people want to talk to me. Now, in the episode premiering tonight, you tracked down an assassin in your hometown of L.A., yeah. and then you head to South Africa. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was a chilling, chilling episode. I think we had some of the most uh, sort of scariest scenes uh, in that episode. It's hitmen. We think it's a Hollywood thing paid assassins. We don't think they actually exist, but they do. You know, over 3,000 people die every year at the hands of assassins. And so we really wanted to investigate this and try to figure out who is it, who are, be who are these assassins, why do they do what they do. And the first interview we did was actually uh, just 15 minutes from my own home in Los Angeles. And we came face to face with a hired assassin. And yeah, it was, I think, sort of very chilling and unsettling in many ways. This season, you're also covering sextortion scams and human trafficking. What surprised you most about what you discovered throughout the course of shooting this season? This is actually my favorite season so far. I think it's the best we've done yet. Uh, we've covered we covered some really hard uh, but relevant issues like illegal immigration and sextortion, which is affecting our teens, and senior scams, which is affecting all our senior, a lot of our senior citizens. So I think what shocked 
shocked me more was just how prevalent these black markets are, how they're all around us, and how really they exist because of failures in our governments, in our societies, because without these failures, you know, if we had a health insurance, a health system that worked in this country, we wouldn't have 20 million Americans having to buy their prescriptions from the black markets. If we didn't have a broken immigration system, we wouldn't have thousands of people dying, you know, every day trying to make their way into the United States. So it's all about the, the existence of these black markets because we are failing American citizens. So let's follow that train. What do you hope to come from your work? What do you want people and maybe even government leaders watching this mm -hmm. to take away from it? Yeah. I hope there's awareness uh, to these issues. As journalists, that's what you always want, right? It's awareness, seeking the truth of what's happening in these very secretive and dark corners of the world that people don't usually get access to. So we have a unique opportunity to show people what's happening here. But at the end of the day, I also think it's important to have a connection. We have. We give our viewers the opportunity to, you know, maybe one hour a day at night, turn on their televisions and watch what is happening to people far away in other parts of the world. And we help them establish these human connections and also topics that are incredibly relevant to them. These black markets affect us on a daily life, whether we know it or not. Well, your work is brilliant and it takes a lot of courage. So thank you for doing it and thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, Diana. And Trafficked Underworlds with Mariana Van Zeller premieres today on National Geographic and streaming the next day on Hulu. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt someone's going to get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the no, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I 5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24 7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all new 2020. Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, former President Trump is expected back in court in his New York defamation trial. The case will determine how much he has to pay for defaming E. Jean Carroll. What's at stake for Trump as Carroll takes the stand? A deadly winter weather emergency, snow and ice are creating slick conditions on the road, sending buses and trucks sliding out of control. Thousands of flights are also canceled. The latest on the conditions, plus the new bitter cold blast on the way. And the viral social media star bringing joy through the library. Michael Treats joins me to talk about his passion for books and making sure the library is a safe space for all. But we begin with former President Trump back in court for his defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Carroll. Trump was already found liable for sexually assaulting Carroll in the 90s, then defaming her in 2022. Now she's expected to take the stand to make the case that he also defamed her in 2019 
and should pay additional damages. Let's bring in senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky outside the court in Manhattan for more. Aaron, the judge told the jury that this trial is not a do-over and that they have to accept as true that Trump forcibly sexually assaulted Carol and then defamed her when he denied it and mocked her. So what do we know about the jurors and what exactly they're being asked to decide here? The jurors are being asked to decide how much, if any, damages former President Trump should pay to E. Jean Carroll. He paid her, or the jury last time, awarded her $5 million. This time, she's asking for at least $10 million because her attorney said former President Trump has not stopped defaming her. Even when he was in court yesterday, her attorney said he posted 22 times on social media while sitting in court disparaging E. Jean Carroll. And so she is going to take the stand today in just a few minutes, Diane, to describe how she says her life was affected when the president of the United States in 2019 called her a liar, said she had a political motivation, and in the words of her attorney, unleashed his supporters on Carroll, which his attorney says just meant people said mean things about her on Twitter. Yeah, so let's pull on that argument, because Trump's attorneys say Carol's looking for a windfall of cash over a series of mean tweets from Twitter trolls. They say this trial is straight out of a banana republic. How's that argument landing in court? You know, we'll, we'll see how it lands with, with the jury, uh, because, Diane, to, to former President Trump, this trial's about two defamatory statements that Trump made in June of 2019 when he denied her rape claim. And, and anything that resulted has nothing to do with Trump. Just the two statements. And, and Trump, his attorney says, cannot be held liable for the mean commentary of others. But to Carol, uh, her attorneys say this went, you know, just beyond a couple of mean tweets. This upended her life, ruined a reputation uh, as an advice columnist that she spent decades building and forced her to, to sleep beside a shotgun she inherited uh, from her father uh, that she then bought ammunition for because uh, it was so scary what people were threatening to do and what people were saying about her. And so they're imploring the jury to make Trump stop, to make him pay. All right, senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky, thank you. Former President Trump is sharpening his attacks on Nikki Haley as polls show the former U.N. ambassador trailing him by just single digits in New Hampshire. Less than a week until the first in the nation primary there, Haley is betting big on New Hampshire after securing the support of the state's governor. And after a stop in South Carolina, Ron DeSantis is also now making his case directly to New Hampshire voters. ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest from New Hampshire with that first primary just six days away. Donald Trump going straight from a Manhattan courtroom to the campaign trail, touching down in the Granite State for a rally. Get out and vote and make sure we win by big margins. The bigger the margin, the bigger the mandate that we have, the stronger we're going to be. The former president, fresh off his resounding victory in the Iowa caucuses, going after his biggest opponent in the New Hampshire primary, Nikki Haley. I worked with her for a long time, and she was OK. Not great. She was not great. She's not tough enough to deal with these people. I will tell you that. She's not tough enough. Polls show Haley trailing Trump by single digits. Dave Sweeney, a retired tech worker from Atkinson, said he's torn between Trump and Haley. What can Trump say today to win you over? Well, if he stops obsessing with the past and starts laying out a vision for the future for this country. Haley is betting big on this state after a disappointing third place finish in Iowa. We came out strong. Now we want to finish New Hampshire and come out even stronger. The former South Carolina governor who faced criticism for failing to mention the word slavery when asked about the cause of the Civil War, rejecting the suggestion that being a woman of color may hurt her chances of becoming the nominee. We're not a racist country. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis edged out Haley in the caucuses, heading directly to her home state of South Carolina, before appearing in a town hall in New Hampshire, making his case to voters. She does not have the ability to build the type of coalition that you need to win a Republican primary period, much less take on Donald Trump.
DeSantis is trailing Nikki Haley here in New Hampshire. He was forced to cancel one of his events due to road conditions and weather. As for Nikki Haley, her campaign releasing a statement saying that America has always had racism but has never been a racist country. Haley says she will not agree to debate unless the former president agrees to do the same. Trump has provided no indication that he plans to take the debate stage. So the ABC News WMUR debate scheduled for tomorrow night has been canceled with the primary just six days away, Diane. All right, senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And ABC's Zoreen Shaw joins me now from Manchester, New Hampshire, with more. Zoreen, with Trump back in court today in New York, what are voters in New Hampshire saying about his legal issues? Well, Diane, he was here last night. He spoke to a very big group. And look, it does not change their impression of Donald Trump. In fact, it makes them double down. Even Trump last night here, he connected his win on the trail to his trials. He said if he hadn't been indicted so many times, the race in Iowa would have been much closer. He has used his legal troubles to galvanize support, and it really impacts voters. Take a listen. I think this is American, and uh, until you're proven guilty, you know, you're innocent. I, I don't think they'll uh, convict them at all. I just think the whole thing is to ruin this election for him. Okay, so one person that we don't hear talk about Trump's legal issues, the current president. I have not heard, even heard Biden's campaign approach this issue. The Democratic National Committee stays away from it. But it's interesting, it's going to be interesting to see how long that lasts, because in all indications, they all point to a, a Biden-Trump rematch at this point. So how are Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley approaching the New Hampshire primary? How are they trying to close this gap with Trump? Yeah, it's, it's going to be it's going to be tough, especially for DeSantis in this state. He was at a town hall last night. He stressed that if Trump is the nominee, the election then revolves around his legal issues. DeSantis is trailing behind Trump substantially in all the New Hampshire polls, but Haley is not. She is very close to him. Several former Chris Christie supporters, in fact, were at her event last night. She appears to have picked up some of his support post his dropout. But the real question, look, it's, it's if Haley wins the state, what is the path ahead for her? It is going to be tough, especially because Trump, he changed some of the rules in those future states like Nevada, California, to potentially benefit him. All right, Zoreen Shah in New Hampshire, thank you. And 26 states from North Dakota to Florida are under wind chill alerts today. The snow and ice forced more than 2,000 flight cancellations on Tuesday, nearly 800 already today. Trevor Ald is at LaGuardia Airport here in New York with the latest. More than 100 million Americans on alert as brutal wind chills, dangerous snow and ice conditions blast the country. Tennessee under a state of emergency as officials say six people have died due to the winter storm. Arctic air and record lows creating havoc on the streets. Oh God. In Philadelphia, a bus sliding down this icy road, crashing into a fire hydrant. And in Alabama, this truck swerving on I-65 before jackknifing into the guardrail. Even this parked vehicle sliding down a slick driveway all on its own. Freezing temperatures leading to increased calls to plumbers. Watch as this homeowner in Allen, Texas, checks on the pipes for his pool. The filter exploding with icy shards flying into the air just as he walks away. And a pipe burst at this Chicago restaurant, completely flooding the floor, even spilling to the outside for the water to freeze again. It's just pain. It's just, uh, you're not, not expected. Experts now advising residents to shut off their water. The severe weather also downing power lines across the country, leaving thousands without power. We're a little concerned. We're bundled up and trying to stay warm. And in the sky, more than 2,000 flights canceled nationwide Tuesday, creating a travel nightmare for passengers like Regina Nelson Fambro. And it's a domino effect. So that made for an extremely long day to meet two TSA issues and one weather delay. And there's already been about 800 flight cancellations so far today. It's something I can definitely relate to. I tried to fly to Buffalo last night for this winter storm coverage. I tried two different flights with two different airlines at two different airports. And here I am reporting from LaGuardia. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt at LaGuardia. Thank you, Trevor. And ABC News meteorologist Mar Theodore is tracking that new storm system and the freezing temperatures settling in across the country. Samara, what are we in for? 
we are in for another shot of reinforcing cold air. So after we get to, through today's cold air, take a look at this. Over the next three days, a lot more cities, especially in the Northeast, are going to be feeling the chill. New York City feeling like nine degrees Sunday morning. Memphis, Saturday, feeling like a degree below zero. Even Chicago just as cold there. Now, we're also tracking this lake effect snow. They have not been able to catch a break. They've seen over 40 inches of snow this past weekend in cities like Buffalo, uh, Watertown. They are in for potentially another four feet of snow as the lake effect snow machine keeps going at least through Thursday. And then we're tracking our next storm entering through the northwest. States like Oregon under ice storm warnings from Portland into Eugene. They could see up to an inch of ice accretions throughout the state. We have winter storm warnings throughout the plains and even an avalanche warning in parts of Colorado there. They've seen a ton of snow and they're in for more. They could see one to two feet of snow along the coastline from Seattle down to Medford, from San Francisco to Los Angeles, anywhere from two to six inches of rain. Diane? ABC News meteorologist Samara Theodore, thank you. And hostages held in Gaza are getting access to medicine after Israel and Hamas agreed to a deal. It's the first agreement between the two sides since the week-long ceasefire broke down in November and comes amid rising tensions in the region. Meanwhile, Ukraine is defending against an onslaught of Russian drone attacks. A new president is taking office in Guatemala, and Ecuador is fighting back against what the government calls terrorist groups. Our foreign correspondents have the latest headlines from around the world. I'm Matt Gutman in Jerusalem, where we've seen a diplomatic blitz of sorts over the past couple of days. A deal between Israel and Hamas facilitated by Egypt and Qatar has been reached to allow much-needed medication to go into the 100-plus hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza. That is the White House announcing intense and serious talks over the next round of a hostage release have now begun. They are underway. We've also seen a battle royale of sorts in the region as well. The Houthis in Yemen, that Iran-backed proxy firing a missile on another ship traveling in the Red Sea. The U.S. saying airstrikes destroyed four anti-ship missiles ready to be launched by the Houthis also in the past 24 hours. That as Iran's elite revolutionary guard saying that they launched ballistic missiles against three separate countries in the span of 24 hours against Syria, Iraq, and Pakistan. Uh, reported civilian deaths in all of those countries. That is Israel and Lebanon. Uh, the Hezbollah-backed proxy there continue to fight along the border. I'm Tom Sufi Burridge in Kiev, Ukraine, as President Zelensky appeals to the West and says it needs to continue supporting Ukraine to stop Russian President Putin creating more wars in the future. The Russian president himself now claiming Russian forces have the initiative in the war here. What's certainly true, we've seen it, is that Russian forces have way more firepower on the battlefield. We filmed with a Ukrainian artillery unit, those units now running low on ammunition. And we visited hospitals in eastern Ukraine where Ukrainian casualties are mounting. Soldiers and doctors appealing to members of Congress via us to continue supporting Ukraine, saying if American aid does not arrive soon, more Ukrainian lives will be lost and it risks the war here moving in a more significant way in Russia's direction. I'm Matt Rivers in Mexico City. A new president taking office in Guatemala wouldn't seem to make headlines, but given what we've seen there over the past several months, it is extremely noteworthy. Bernardo Arevalo taking office this week after repeated attempts since his win back in August by the oftentimes corrupt political elite in that country to prevent him from doing so, doing everything from suspending his political party to threatening arrest and prosecution of political allies up until Inauguration Day when old guard members of Guatemala's Congress use these arcane rules to try and prevent the inauguration from happening, but as we've seen so often over the last couple of months, indigenous groups coming out to protest in public in force, met also by support from the international community who did everything they could to, 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 to decry any anti-democratic actions in Guatemala. It means Arevalo did take office this week. That's a big win for democracy in Central America, even though he faces myriad challenges in governing. And Matt, Ecuador is in a state of emergency after violence broke out across that country. What's the latest there? Ecuador used to be one of the safest countries in South America, but we have seen organized crime, drug-fueled violence explode in that country over the past several years, none more so than last week when we saw organized attacks by some 22 different organized crime groups across the country, the most dramatic of which a armed group taking over a state-run TV station there. As a result, a state of emergency in the country with the president taking the extraordinary step of declaring 
internal armed conflict. That's an official designation in Ecuador that's allowed the president to put the army onto the streets and crucially into the country's prison where so much of this organized crime activity is organized out of. How this plays out, will the army and the government be able to take the upper hand against these organized crime groups? We're going to have to wait and see. This is a country we're going to be watching very closely, Diane, over the coming weeks and months. All right, Matt Rivers, Tom Sufi Burridge, Matt Gutman, thank you all. Coming up, Alexis Christophorus has your business headlines. Hey guys, hidden junk fees? No more how the Biden administration is trying to tackle and slash bank overdraft fees, plus the parent company of Burger King buying out its biggest franchisee in the U.S. and plans to renovate hundreds of stores. We're talking your money, coming up next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war, after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. The White House is trying to tackle and slash bank overdraft fees with a new proposal. This is Burger King Owners is set to buy out its biggest franchisee in the U.S. ABC's business reporter Alexis Christophers has more on that and your other business headlines. Alexis, what are you watching today? Lots to dig into today, Diane. We're going to start with holiday shopping because it turned out to be even better than expected in December. The Commerce Department says retail sales jumped 0.6% last month. That says that strong job market continued to fuel spending. So Americans spent at car dealerships, clothing stores, and online last month while sales at department stores jumped 3%, the most of any category. Analysts say these numbers suggest that consumers can continue to drive economic growth in the new year. President Biden's trying to slash bank overdraft fees that millions of Americans pay when they try to spend more money than they have in their checking accounts. Many banks charge as much as $35 for every transaction when you overdraft on your account. Well, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is proposing new rules that would cut those fees to as low as three bucks. It says that will save consumers three and a half billion dollars every year. Now, these rules still need to be finalized. They'll likely go into effect next year, but some big banks like City, Bank of America, and Capital One have already lowered or eliminated their overdraft charges. So you want to double check with your bank to see if your money is in an account with the lowest available fees. And the next time you make a purchase through the Apple App Store, you may have something you've never had before, a choice when it comes to how you pay. So starting this week, Apple is allowing developers to add links inside their apps that bring customers to an outside website where they can then input their credit card information. Remember, in the past, Apple developers could only use Apple's billing system, which, by the way, took a 15 to 30 percent cut, and they couldn't tell users that prices could be cheaper on the web. This change comes after the Supreme Court refused to hear Apple's appeals stemming from Epic Games' legal challenge to its App Store. 
And your local Burger King might be getting a makeover. It's all part of the fast food giant's plan to buy its biggest franchisee, Carol's, for $1 billion. As part of this deal, Burger King's parent company promises to pump $500 million into remodeling about 600 BK locations by 2028. Something to look forward to with your Whopper. All right, <laughs> Alexis Christophorus, thank you. You're welcome. And if you have any finance questions for Alexis, just leave a message on our Instagram feed. She might answer your question right here on Thursday. Coming up, meet the viral librarian spreading joy through books, how he became an internet sensation and his advice for those dealing with internet bullies. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Iowa on the 2024 campaign trail, I'm Mary Alice Parks. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. A new social media star is spreading joy through his love of books and his favorite place, the library. Michael Threats has over 12 million likes on TikTok for his inspirational and positive messages about reading and his wish to make libraries an inclusive and fun place for everyone. And Michael's joining me now for more on that. Michael, thanks so much for being here. You know, not everyone would expect to go viral on social media for talking about the library. So why do you think your message is resonating with so many people? That's a great question. You know, I never sought out to go viral. I just was trying to push library cards, push library books, remind people of libraries as my cat makes an appearance knowing that we're talking about the library. You can't be a librarian without a library cat. Um, and I just think that I just try to be as genuine and authentic as possible and just show people that the library is for everyone. Everyone belongs in libraries. And I just love them so much that I think that shines through and people just are seeing like how much, how powerful their local library is, how the best, the best card in your wallet is indeed a library card. What's the cat's name? He wants to be part of the interview, so we want him included too. <laughs> she does. Her name is Kissing Cat Barlow. She's named after the Holes character by Lewis Sacker. <laughs> of course she is. Um, so Michael, you say the library actually helped you with your mental health struggles. Can you tell me more about that? Yes, growing growing up, I was a very shy, shy library kid, very reserved, um, very quiet. And books were my very first friends, reading Beverly Cleary, Henry Huggins, Ramon and Beezus, reading Lewis Sacker's Sideways Stories from Wayside School, reading the Chronicles of Narnia, being a homeschool kid, going to the library every single day, being educated by my mom, having my dad instill a love of reading in me. Um, it just, it just, it was always my safe place, a place that I knew I could be myself where I felt like I was the me that I'm supposed to be. 
Now, you faced some social media backlash recently with someone calling you a series of names, weird, among other things. But you found a way to respond with kindness. Why did you react that way? I reacted that way because I very recently became aware of how many kids watch the videos that I make, which always shocks me. I'm always shocked whenever people say, like, oh, me and my kids watch your videos. We love the library. The the and library so knowing that they may the have seen those um, awful comments, the I wanted to make day, the video showing fired, kindness, showing empathy, and reminding and people of who they are. And even the other day, a kid Japan, came into the library and said, hey, do you have any tips for young content creators? And I don't want any young kids trying to make videos on social media to face what I had to face. So I wanted to remind them how powerful their voice is, how powerful kindness and empathy are. And I just wanted to give them the best chance to become the best human being that they are and show them how loved they are by libraries, library people, and all sorts of people across the world. And you have to imagine some, some of those kids, and maybe even adults watching, are people who sometimes have trouble standing up for themselves in tough situations. So. What do you hope people take away from your, your posts and your message? I hope people remember that they will always have a space in the library. You don't have to come to the library every single day to be to be a library user. Um, the library is always going to be there for you. If it's tomorrow, if it's 10 years from now, we're ready for you to come through those doors whenever you're ready. And I hope that people remember that the library is the place where they don't have to feel shame. They don't have to feel embarrassment. They have a friend in books, in the library, in library workers. And I hope they never forget how valued they are by library people and more importantly valued by the world for the genuine human being that they are. Once a library kid, always a library kid. The library is always going to be here for each and every one of you. All right, Michael Three, it's great to have you. Thanks for coming on. Thank you so much for having me. And you can find more feel-good stories at goodmorningamerica.com. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt someone's going to get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at Portland, Maine on this Wednesday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. 26 states from North Dakota to Florida are under wind chill alerts today. The snow and ice forced more than 2,000 flight cancellations on Tuesday and nearly 800 already today. Parts of Tennessee have seen twice their annual snowfall average, and more snow is expected in the Northeast this Friday. President Biden is set to host congressional leaders at the White House today to discuss funding for Ukraine, Israel, and border security. The $106 billion request has been stalled in Congress for months as Republicans demand major changes in immigration policy. The administration is warning that aid for Ukraine is running out and that further delay will help Vladimir Putin on the battlefield. And Costco is trying a new way to crack down on membership sharing. According to USA Today, the retail giant is testing out devices at store entrances where customers would scan their membership cards. This would keep non-members out and end the practice of having to show your card and photo ID at checkout. 
Meanwhile, the judge is laying ground rules as Alec Murdoch pushes for a new murder trial. In 13 days, the disgraced attorney is expected back in court for a three-day hearing to determine if he gets a new trial for the murders of his wife and son. Now the judge says the convicted killer won't be allowed to testify about his claims that the court clerk in his trial tampered with the jury. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest. The stage now set for Alec Murdoch's push for a retrial. After a tense hearing, the convicted murderer learning who will and won't be allowed to testify in an upcoming hearing regarding his claims that court clerk Becky Hill tampered with the jury during his trial. Are we entitled to evidentiary hearing? The law is crystal clear that we are. The disgraced lawyer who was found guilty of killing his wife and son sitting quietly watching as the judge decided that the only witnesses that can be questioned will be the 12 jurors who decided his fate and Hill herself who read their verdict. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Murdoch's legal team accusing Hill of pushing the jury to make a quick decision to secure for herself a book deal and media appearances that would not happen in the event of a mistrial. Hill denying those allegations, but later admitting to plagiarizing part of her book about the trial, which has since been pulled for purchase. Motive, selling books. But the judge limiting what questions Murdoch's defense team can ask Hill when she takes the stand. Because this is not the trial of Ms. Hill. It is about her contact, if any, with the juror and what she said. And let's not forget these jurors already gave six weeks of their time during this trial. The judge planning only one day to question them to limit them having to miss even more work. Court clerk Becky Hill will need to be available all three days. Meanwhile, state investigators now confirming they have opened two investigations into her behavior. Diane. Eva Pilgrim, thanks for that. And prosecutors in the Gilgo Beach murders case say they have new evidence linking suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman to the killings. This is Hewerman pleaded not guilty to a fourth murder charge. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has the latest. Suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman indicted in the death of a fourth woman found murdered near Gilgo Beach in Long Island. We've charged the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes to add to the, uh, to the already charged murders. Maureen Brainard Barnes' remains were found in 2010, along with three other women known as the Gilgo Four. Last July, Hewerman was arrested and charged with the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. In a new filing, prosecutors also say they have new DNA evidence connecting Hewerman to the murders, linking a hair found on a belt buckle used to restrain Ms. Brainard Barnes's remains to his estranged wife, Asa Ellerup. A hair found with another victim's remains linked to their daughter, Victoria. The updated indictment included new details of the lengths investigators went to collect that DNA evidence. In May of 2023, undercover agents trailed Victoria Hewerman on a Long Island Railroad train, observing her drinking from a gold can seen here. They then retrieved that can from a trash bin for analysis. Brainard Barnes's daughter, Nicolette, speaking publicly for the first time since her mother disappeared when she was just seven years old. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all charges and is still being held without bail. His next court appearance is scheduled for next month. Authorities continue to investigate the unsolved deaths of at least six other victims found near Gilgo Beach. Diane. Stephanie Ramos, thank you. Let's bring in host and legal analyst at the Law and Crime Network, Terry Austin, for more on this. Terry, thanks for coming on. You know, earlier on GMA, the lead prosecutor in the Gilgo Beach murders case spoke to George Stephanopoulos about new technology that they're using in this investigation. I want to play that for you. The DNA evidence, it actually comes from the, killer, from the killer's ex-wife. Uh, his defense attorney says this DNA is problematic. Well, it's cutting edge. Uh, the uh, the DNA itself was extracted from the hair back in 2010, uh, and at that time there were there was no method to obtain nuclear DNA profile from hair. Uh, that has since changed. Uh, so we're on the cutting edge with regard to using this DNA analysis to obtain this. So, how important is this cutting edge technology in a case like this, and what kind of impact could it ultimately have here? Well, it's going to allow the investigators to determine in many cases, not just this case, 
who might have been involved. They can get DNA from family members and trace it back if it's in a database to an individual who might have committed that crime. So I think we're going to see other cases where we have particularly serial killers and there is any DNA and it could be traced back to a family member. You heard the talk about the daughter and the information they received from her DNA, tracing it back to him. I think it's extremely important that they are able, as time goes on, to do more and more with this DNA evidence. Terry Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all the charges here. He's being held without bail. So what's next in this case? Well, you know, Diane, everyone obviously deserves a defense, including someone who has been accused of such horrendous crimes. I think what the defense team is doing is the exact same thing the prosecution is doing, which is lining up any evidence that could possibly help the client. The fact that he's never been arrested before, the fact that he is an upstanding person in the community, they are going to try to make those arguments. Obviously, they don't have to put on a case at all in a murder case. The prosecution stands with that burden of proof. But I think the defense is going to try to appeal ultimately when this comes to trial that their client had nothing to do with it. They don't have his exact DNA. That is something they'll probably try to argue and that he had nothing to do with these crimes. We'll see what happens. We still have a very long way to go. And before I let you go, Terry, Alec Murdoch was also in court yesterday. A judge laid the ground rules for his upcoming hearing as he pushes for a new murder trial. So what do you make of those rules that the judge laid out? And what are you watching for in this case? Well, I think this judge is excellent. She made sure that she limited the hearing, and that makes sense. This is a hearing to determine whether or not there's going to be a new trial, and the standard there is very high. Not only has there have to be jury tampering, but there has to also be prejudice, and she's limited the evidence to just listening to Becky Hill, the individual involved here, listening to the jurors. She doesn't want to hear about any book deals. She doesn't want to hear about anything else Becky Hill might have done. And I think it's a good ruling. So when this hearing does appear, I think we're going to see a quick ruling. Ultimately, at the end of the day, it's a very difficult burden to show that there was prejudice. So I'm not sure what's going to happen, but it sounds like the judge is going to let this trial stand on its own unless she finds that there was prejudice. And so far, we just have that one affidavit from a juror. So we'll see what happens. All right, host and legal analyst Terry Austin, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Coming up, new findings on cancer and young adults, why the American Cancer Society says cases in one age group are rising and how to lower your risk. Also ahead, screen time and sensory issues in children. Dr. Patel digs into a new study with tips on how much time is too much and how to monitor it all. America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back. The American Cancer Society has just released startling new findings about cancer rates in people under 50. The Society's annual report says while overall cancer deaths are de decreasing, cancer diagnoses in young people are increasing. American Cancer Society Chief Scientific Officer Dr. William Dayhut spoke to Robin Roberts earlier on GMA. Take a look. For this year, there'll be over 2 million people that will be diagnosed with cancer for the first time. That's the first time we've ever been over that number. And we're seeing some cancer trends that I think are really important for people to hear about. 
we're seeing a shift in the demographics. It used to be that that people over the age of 65 had a greater proportion of cancer. They still do, but things are changing. And now it looks like that people actually under the age of 55 are seeing an increase in their cancer incidence, more likely to be diagnosed than they were before. And we're seeing in colorectal cancer is one cancer that we really see the numbers changing. Back in the 1990s, colorectal cancer was the fourth leading cause of death mm -hmm. of men and women with cancer. But now it's number two. In, in women and number one in men. And we're still seeing cancer disparities. You know, sadly, too many black women, too many black men are dying from cancer, many more than their white comrades. And we're also seeing it in, in a cancer called endometrial cancer, where if you're a black woman, you're two times more likely to die from the disease as a white woman. Now, when asked why he thinks these cancer diagnoses in younger people are increasing, Dr. Dayhut says that it's something external to the patient, meaning not genetics, but rather diet, obesity, or in utero effects. As for the good news, rates of lung, prostate, and cervical cancers are decreasing due to decrease in smoking, emphasis on screenings, the HPV vaccine, and improvements in treatment. And now it's time for Patel It Like It Is, where Dr. Lok Patel shares health advice on the topics that matter most to you. Today we're talking about screen time sensory issues for toddlers. Here's Dr. Patel with what parents should know. Can too much screen time in toddlers cause sensory issues? In a recent study in JAMA Pediatrics, researchers found that children who were 12 months old who were watching television or DVDs were twice as likely to develop sensory processing issues when they were three years old. Did you say DVDs? Yeah, that survey data was collected before 2014. Imagine how many more screens are around now, 10 years later. But back to the findings. Sensory processing issues refer to challenges adapting to sensations such as bright lights and loud noises. And atypical sensory processing can occur with medical diagnoses such as ADHD and autism. And it's important to note that this study just showed a link. It did not say that screen time is the sole culprit. But experts agree that screen time in young children should be limited because too much of it can cause delays in language development, problem solving skills, behavioral issues, and honestly, who knows what else? Because as some put it, our digital world feels like a massive, uncontrolled experiment on children and their developing brains. Here are some guidelines according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. For kids age 18 months and younger, avoid screens. Although we can make an exception for some video calls with family. Kids 18 to 24 months, only high quality programming with a parent or caregiver also watching. And kids age two to five years, limit non-educational screen time to just one hour a day. And look, no one is trying to demonize screens or shame parents. I'm also the parent of a young child. We're tired, we're burned out. We are just emerging from a pandemic and sometimes we need a break. But try to keep it under control and age appropriate. Just remember children need to experience the real world too. And Dr. Alok Patel joins me now for more on this. Dr. Patel, what counts as screen time here? When my kids talk to their grandparents on a screen, do I have to factor that into their daily limits? And what do you say to parents who say cutting out screen time means they get no break, they can't get anything done, and then they're more stressed and worse parents as a result? Asking for a friend. Oh my gosh, I can identify with your words because screens are literally everywhere. You know, the first thing I want to address is your, your first point, that it's okay to use screens for kids to be connecting with loved ones and relatives. But we have to remind parents that this really does feel like uncharted territory. And we know that nothing replaces actual live human interactions and activities and going outside to feed language development, learning, creativity, and all these facets. And you know, one important thing with this previous study with atypical sensory processing is some of the bad news regarding screens really does show a link, not necessary causality. So in other words, parents can offset some of these issues with screen time by getting their kids real interactions. But remember, we have studies linking screen time in toddlers to delays in language development, attention spans, problem solving skills, poor sleep, weight gain, even poor academic performance. There's a 2019 JAMA article showing a link between toddlers and screen time and then developmental milestones later. And that was 2019 before our screen filled pandemic. So what exactly is high quality programming and what are best practices for parents or caregivers who want to co-watch as you describe it? 
I really feel like high quality programming is a marketing term. So parents should be wary when they go online or you go to a streaming service and you see these buzzwords like educational programming for toddlers, high quality programming. I wanna quote UNICEF in saying that babies need humans, not screens, because nothing really replaces Unfortunately, I should say this boredom and sitting down to fuel curiosity and creativity. Diane, you remember when we were kids not long ago when you're going to a dinner party or a road trip or on the plane? We didn't have devices. You had to sit down and figure out what you were going to do to entertain yourself. And so we're reiterating those AAP guidelines for parents under 18 months. We really want to keep screens away, except for video calls, 18 to 24 months. Make it those that programming that actually can fuel some type of conversation between you and your child, your toddler. You can ask questions about the screen, two to five, one hour per day, three hours on the weekends, which actually seems like a lot. And kids six and above start to teach them good digital habits. Remember, kids learn best from humans in real time, and we want to make sure we focus and captivate on that. So any tips for weaning those older kids from their screens? You know, creating a family media plan, something that everyone is on the same page, is a really good first step. This can include things like screen screen free zones and times so that kids have an expectation of when screens are not allowed. You can use lock screen reminders, be a good role model, make sure that you are also practicing you know, avoiding screens, stay engaged with your kids and talk to them, interact with them when they're not using screens and make sure we're teaching all older kids, adolescents and teens, good digital citizenship. By that, I mean, knowing how they can protect their own privacy, how they can practice kindness and empathy online as well. These are all really great tips. And also, Diane, here's a fun one that I just learned. Turn off autoplay on all streaming services. So once that little show is over, your young ones don't see the next show pop up and say, oh my gosh, I want another one. That's not good. That's that, even bad for us. That is a great tip for everyone in my family. Um, and Dr. Patel, before I let you go, I want to ask you about the new research showing a link between fruit juice and weight gain in kids. This new JAMA Pediatrics Analysis is looking at more than a dozen studies and, and talking about a positive association between drinking 100% fruit juice and elevated BMI. So what's your big takeaway from this study? My big takeaway is to for parents out there to not fall for what you see on some of these labels where it says things like all natural fruit juice are filled with vitamins and minerals and get the perception that these are healthy. Fruit juices can often be loaded with sugar without the actual filling effects of fiber. So kids could actually eat seven apples worth of sugar, when in reality, what kid is actually gonna eat one apple and then want six more? Now this study, as you mentioned, is a meta-analysis. So it looks at about 42 studies and they found a positive association with one day, of, with having one serving of 100% fruit juice a day with weight gain. We already know that fruit juice is associated with issues like diabetes, obesity, and dental disease. And a recent survey showed that about 50% of kids get a serving of 100% fruit juice each day. So definitely not only more research is needed, but a, a broader conversation with parents about really limiting fruit juice. And, Way and too much sugar even the one the that says, of eating real. And that's even the one that says no sugar added. Absolutely, because guess what? There is sugar found naturally in fruits, and if you strip the fiber and pulverize it all down into a fruit juice, you can get as much sugar as a soda. Wow. All right, Dr. Patel, always great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Patel is taking your questions. Leave a message on our Instagram feed at ABC News Live, and he might answer your question right here on Friday. Meanwhile, the Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, is currently recovering in hospital after abdominal surgery. Kensington Palace says that the royal underwent a planned abdominal surgery this week and that the condition was non-cancerous. The palace says in a statement that the princess, quote, hopes that the public will understand her desire to maintain as much normality for her children as possible and her wish that her personal medical information remains private. She's expected to be in the hospital for 10 to 14 days and is unlikely to return to her official duties until after Easter. Coming up, investigative journalist Mariana Van Zeller is here to talk season four of Trafficked, what it's like to infiltrate black markets and what you can expect in tonight's first episode. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. Tonight, the
the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting in Moscow, Idaho, I'm Kana Whitworth. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. Award-winning investigative journalist Mariana Van Zeller is shining a light on black markets, human trafficking, hitmen, and more in the new season of Trafficked from Nat Geo. Van Zeller takes us inside some of the most dangerous black markets in the world, talking with the people behind illegal trafficking networks and getting up close and personal with the merchandise. We saw you yesterday. You were making the drugs. Are you here to give it so they transport it, or do you actually transport the drugs too? Oh, in this car? Packed as if it's a suitcase? Wow. It's heavy. Very heavy, huh? How much is this? 30 kilo, 30 kilo, 10 kilo. Juge Marat from the Arad in Jew, Jew, on the Juge Marat, Juge Tarat from the. Season four of Traffic covers everything from the trade in body parts and hired assassins to the smuggling of brides. And Mariana Van Zeller joins me now for more on that. Mariana, the access is unbelievable, what you're discovering here. Thank you so much for coming on. You infiltrate all these different trafficking networks. So what is, what is it like getting so close to the sources of some of these networks and, and seeing how, for example, they're handling drugs in their trafficking? Yeah, it's not easy. I'd say that it's the hardest part of my job always. My job at my, my team is that we spend months, sometimes even years, trying to get access to these groups. Uh, and there's, you know, we've gotten used to getting no a lot of times. I'd say for every one yes, we get dozens, if not hundreds of no's. But at the end of the day, I think we've gotten unprecedented access for many reasons. One of which is the fact that whoever I speak to, I always tell them I'm here with empathy. I'm here to understand you with curiosity. I'm not here to judge. And I think that sort of, you know, a very human characteristic of wanting to be understood goes a long way and sort of helps people want to talk to me. Now, in the episode premiering tonight, you tracked down an assassin in your hometown of L.A., yeah. and then you head to South Africa. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was a chilling, chilling episode. I think we had some of the most uh, sort of scariest scenes uh, in that episode. It's hitmen. We think it's a Hollywood thing, paid assassins. We don't think they actually exist, but they do. You know, over 3,000 people die every year at the hands of assassins. And so we really wanted to investigate this and try to figure out who is it, who are, be who are these assassins, why do they do what they do. And the first interview we did was actually uh, just 15 minutes from my own home in Los Angeles. And we came face to face with a hired assassin. And yeah, it was, I think, sort of very chilling and unsettling in many ways. This season, you're also covering sextortion scams and human trafficking. What surprised you most about what you discovered throughout the course of shooting this season? This is actually my favorite season so far. I think it's the best we've done yet. Uh, we've covered we covered some really hard uh, but relevant issues like illegal immigration and sextortion, which is affecting our teens, and senior scams, which is affecting all our senior, a lot of our senior citizens. So I think what shocked 
shocked me more was just how prevalent these black markets are, how they are all around us, and how really they exist because of failures in our governments, in our societies. Because without these failures, you know, if we had a health insurance, a health system that worked in this country, we wouldn't have 20 million Americans having to buy their prescriptions from the black markets. If we didn't have a broken immigration system, we wouldn't have thousands of people dying, you know, every day trying to make their way into the United States. So it's all about. The, the existence of these black markets because we are failing American citizens. So let's follow that train. What do you hope to come from your work? What do you want people and maybe even government leaders watching this mm -hmm. to take away from it? Yeah. I hope there's awareness uh, to these issues. As journalists, that's what you always want, right? It's awareness, seeking the truth of what's happening in these very secretive and dark corners of the world that people don't usually get access to. So we have a unique opportunity to show people what's happening here. But at the end of the day, I also think it's important to have a connection. We have we give our viewers the opportunity to, you know, maybe one hour a day at night, turn on their televisions and watch what is happening to people far away in other parts of the world. And we help them establish these human connections and also topics that are incredibly relevant to them. These black markets affect us on a daily life, whether we know it or not. Well, your work is brilliant and it takes a lot of courage. So thank you for doing it and thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, Diana. And Trafficked Underworlds with Mariana Van Zeller premieres today on National Geographic and streaming the next day on Hulu. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the FBI, I'm Pierre Thomas. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. I'm Diane Macedo. Let's get straight to our top story. Former President Trump is back in court for his defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Carroll. 
Trump was already found liable for sexually assaulting Carol in the 90s, then defaming her in 2022. Now she's taking the stand to make the case that he also defamed her in 2019 and should pay additional damages. Let's bring in investigative reporter Olivia Rubin outside court in Manhattan for more. Olivia, Carol's testifying now. So what's the latest from inside court? Diane Carroll is on the stand right now and has been for about 45 minutes and she really came in swinging. I want to read to you one of the first things out of her mouth that she said after saying her name was that Donald Trump assaulted me and lied about it and continues to lie and I'm here to get my reputation back and I just cannot sort of state enough the fact that Donald Trump is in the room at the defense table while Carol is testifying that he assaulted her her, and he is very clearly not happy with the testimony that he is hearing. He is sitting at the table. He is shaking his head. He is scoffing. He is laughing. He is speaking with his attorneys. He is writing notes. He is hanging on essentially every single word. And remember, he can't say anything in the position that he is in right now. He is not the one on the witness stand. So he just has to sort of sit there and listen to what is at times a brutal line of questioning of E. Jean Carroll talking about the assault against him. But it is also important to note, Diane, that the question of the assault is not on the table at this trial. It has already been ruled as fact that Donald Trump assaulted E. Jean Carroll, and that is something that the jury has been reminded of by the judge, again, while Donald Trump is in the room listening to all of this. Now, Trump's attorney also had a tense exchange with the judge today as things got started. What happened there? The same way yesterday started, Diane. Today, Trump's attorney Alina Haba again asked the judge to not have court tomorrow because Donald Trump will be in Florida to attend the funeral of his mother-in-law. And again, Donald Trump is not required to be here at this trial, but his attorney asked for a continuance so that he does not have to choose and do both. And it's a line of uh, an ask that the judge does not like to hear again. And yet again, Donald Trump's attorney and his uh, the judge on the case got into an argument right there in the court room with at one point Trump's attorney saying don't speak to me like that I don't like the way you're speaking to me and I won't speak to you that way and the uh, judge essentially telling her to sit down so very tense between the two parties all right investigative reporter Olivia Rubin thank you President Trump, meanwhile, is sharpening his attacks on Nikki Haley as polls show the former U.N. ambassador trailing him by just single digits in New Hampshire. Less than a week until the first in the nation primary there, Haley is betting big on New Hampshire after securing support from the state's governor. And after a stop in South Carolina, Ron DeSantis is also now making his case directly to New Hampshire voters. ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest from New Hampshire with that first primary just six days away. Donald Trump going straight from a Manhattan courtroom to the campaign trail, touching down in the Granite State for a rally. Get out and vote and make sure we win by big margins. The bigger the margin, the bigger the mandate that we have, the stronger we're going to be. The former president fresh off his resounding victory in the Iowa caucuses, going after his biggest opponent in the New Hampshire primary, Nikki Haley. I worked with her for a long time, and she was okay, not great. She was not great. She's not tough enough to deal with these people. I will tell you that. She's not tough enough. Polls show Haley trailing Trump by single digits. Dave Sweeney, a retired tech worker from Atkinson, said he's torn between Trump and Haley. What can Trump say today to win you over? Well, if he stops obsessing with the past and starts laying out a vision for the future of this country. Haley is betting big on this state after a disappointing third place finish in Iowa. We came out strong. Now we want to finish New Hampshire and come out even stronger. The former South Carolina governor who faced criticism for failing to mention the word slavery when asked about the cause of the Civil War, rejecting the suggestion that being a woman of color may hurt her chances of becoming the nominee. We're not a racist country. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis edged out Haley in the caucuses, heading directly to her home state of South Carolina, before appearing in a town hall in New Hampshire, making his case to voters. She does not have the ability to build the type of coalition that you need to win a Republican primary period, much less take on Donald Trump. 
Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper joins me now from New Hampshire. Avery, polls show Haley trailing Trump in New Hampshire by just single digits. So how critical is this primary for her? Uh, well, the expectations for Haley are very high here in the state of New Hampshire, where she's within striking distance of uh, former President Trump. And it's really important to note the dynamics here in the state of New Hampshire. It is an open primary, which means that uh, independent voters can uh, also vote in the primary alongside Republicans. And that's where Nikki Haley is hoping to run up the score. Uh, but the outlook for her gets a little tricky when you look beyond New Hampshire in South Carolina. It's possible for her to have a strong showing. That is her home state. Uh, but after that, uh, she's really looking at an electorate that uh, still sees the former President Trump as very popular, as somebody that they want to be the nominee. So uh, the question is if she has a viable path to the nomination. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis is coming off a second place finish in Iowa, but it was a distant second, Avery. So how does that change his strategy moving forward? And what's at stake for him next week? Right. Uh, Ron DeSantis went all in on Iowa. He visited all 99 states. He had establishment support. Uh, the outlook for him in a place like New Hampshire is very different. He is polling within uh, the single digits here in New Hampshire and in South Carolina. And so uh, he is trying uh, his darndest to get his uh, agenda out there, get to know some voters ahead of this uh, race here in New Hampshire. Uh, but again, uh, the question similar to Nikki Haley is uh, if he's going to be able to find a viable path uh, to the nomination. And there's lots of folks who are asking that question today. Now, Trump won Iowa by a wide margin. So how long can DeSantis and Haley hang on if he has another big win in New Hampshire? Uh, well, it seems as though they're trying to hold on as long as they can. I think uh, it's going to become an issue of confidence, right? Uh, with a 30-point lead like that, uh, a strong second finish does not necessarily get them uh, any additional momentum. And then it's also going to be about the confidence of the donors. Uh, folks are going to stop uh, giving to their campaigns if uh, they don't believe that they have uh, what it takes to become the nominee. And so it's going to be an uphill battle for the both of them. All right. Deputy Political Director Avery Harper in New Hampshire, thank you. And top lawmakers are set to meet with President Biden at the White House today to try to reach an agreement on an urgent aid for Ukraine and Israel as well as security at the southern border. Sources tell ABC News that Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, House Speaker Mike Johnson, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer were all invited by the president. ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now on Capitol Hill along with ABC News senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce for more. Uh, quite a list of names there, Mary. The negotiations over this aid and border security have been going on for months now. So what's the president hoping to get out of this meeting today? Well, look, I think the big sticking points at this point are where are they going to be able to find some compromise on the issue of immigration? Look, Republicans are pushing for the president to curb his parole authority. That is the president's ability to determine which groups are able to, to come into the country to stay here and work while their uh, asylum is being processed. Republicans are also looking for just broader reforms to who can come and seek asylum in the country. President Biden has said he is willing to compromise on some of these issues. The question is exactly where the president is willing to compromise, how far is he willing to go on this? And remember, all of this, of course, is wrapped up in that critical additional funding, billions of dollars in funding to fight the war in Ukraine and the war in the Middle East. And there's a real clock on this. The last payment that went out to, to help Ukraine went out about three weeks ago. The White House has been very stark in their warnings that without additional help from the U.S., Ukraine could very much face the prospect of possibly losing this war. So this is critical. The clock is ticking. It is something the president feels urgently needs Needs to be acted on. The question is just, as always, the devil in the details. Where are we finally going to see some compromise here, Diane? Now, Jay, Speaker Johnson is facing backlash over from his own party over his willingness to compromise on a deal to avert a government shutdown. Could that affect the negotiations today? And is Johnson risking his speakership if he reaches too far across the aisle? Well, hardline conservatives have said they do not like that funding deal that Speaker Johnson struck with Chuck Schumer in the Senate to avert a shutdown, a deal that they've still got to get passed, as you said, by the end of this week, or at least a temporary measure to avert a shutdown. Um, hardline conservatives here in the House would like border components to be included into the temporary funding measure that Johnson struck with Schumer over the weekend to kick the can down the road, keep the government funded into March. But those provisions are not included right now, and we don't get a sense that they're going to 
to be added in. So that's just one more thing that hardliners here in the House Republican Conference are going to be upset with Speaker Johnson about. Now, those same hardliners have said that they're holding Johnson to a different kind of measuring stick than they held Kevin McCarthy, because Kevin McCarthy was in leadership a lot longer than Mike Johnson has been on the job as Speaker of the House. Nonetheless, they are certainly not happy right now, Diane, and they are putting pressure on Johnson's right flank as he enters into this meeting to try to broker some kind of a deal with the president. Mary, immigration is a big part of today's negotiations. Republicans have hammered President Biden for his handling of the migrant crisis. How critical is this agreement to his reelection campaign? It's huge. Look, we know that this is one of those issues that is top of mind for many voters and an issue where the president is really struggling. I mean, our latest polling shows just 18 percent of Americans approve of the president's handling of this issue. The White House is well aware of this. The president's reelection campaign is well aware of this. I think it's part of the reason that the president was willing to tie some immigration reforms to this uh, other funding for Ukraine in the Middle East in the first place. The president knows he has to show voters that he is willing to act on this. And remember, it comes as he is facing a lot of criticism criticism, even from some Democrats uh, who argued that the president and this administration haven't dealt with this issue with enough urgency. Now, the White House counters that by noting that, look, they've put out a security package that includes some $15 billion in immigration reforms. Republicans, they say, have failed to act on this. They note that the president's one of his first do uh, acts when he came into office was to put forth an immigration reform package. Again, Republicans failed to take that up. So they are quick to point the finger across the aisle on this as well, Diane. All right, Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce, Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you both. And Buckingham Palace has announced King Charles III will undergo a corrective procedure for an enlarged prostate next week. This is Kensington Palace, says the Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, is currently recovering in the hospital after abdominal surgery. ABC News foreign correspondent James Longman joins me now with more on that. Uh, James, what's the latest on King Charles's condition? Yeah, Diane, these are statements that we only got in the last uh, few hours or so. It sounds like King Charles has had this issue for some time and he's now going to the hospital to get it looked at. Uh, the statement reads, in common with thousands of men each year, the king has sought treatment for an enlarged prostate. His majesty's condition is benign and he'll attend hospital next week for a corrective procedure. So the palace is using this as an opportunity to raise awareness of an issue that a lot of men uh, face. He is in pretty good health. I think when he was younger, he had a number of sports injuries, fell off his horse playing pole. Uh, and he had a hernia uh, operation a few years ago too. But look, his parents were very long-lived uh, and I'm sure that once this procedure uh, goes ahead next week, we'll get an update from the palace then. Diane? And what about the princess, Jane? What do we know about how she's doing? Yeah, a curious uh, communication strategy there, releasing both of these statements just within a few hours of each other. This one has uh, prompted rather a lot more interest just because of the amount of time she's now going to have to stay in the hospital. We're told that yesterday she underwent an abdominal uh, su surgery on her abdomen. Uh, it went well. We're told it is not cancerous, but we don't have any other details. She's going to have to spend at least f uh, 10 days, possibly 14 days in the hospital before she goes home uh, to Windsor. She lives in a cottage on the estate there with William and, and the three children. In a statement, she said she hopes that the public will understand her desire to maintain as much normality for her children as possible and that her personal medical information remain private. Her uh, duties are now going to be cancelled uh, as long as uh, until Easter, uh, and as, um, William as well is going to have to take a, a little bit of a step back as well. She apologised to the charities and the other organisations that she was due to visit uh, for that uh, look they both carry quite a lot of responsibility on behalf of the crown on behalf of Charles going to visit uh, organizations and charities so uh, it's a sort of a significant step back for them for the next uh, few weeks but she like Charles is very healthy she's fit and active she likes to be up and about so I'm sure when she is uh, she'll be up uh, as soon as she possibly can be Dan all right foreign correspondent James Longman thank you James and we're learning new details about the fatal New York City subway chokehold case. A judge has denied former Marine Daniel Penny's request to dismiss the involuntary manslaughter charges against him. Penny's lawyers argue the victim, Jordan Neely, was, quote, insanely threatening at the time of the incident. Prosecutors say Penny kept Neely in a chokehold for six minutes, well past the point when he stopped purposeful movement. The medical examiner later determined Neely was killed by the chokehold and ruled his death a homicide. Penny has pleaded not guilty to the charges and is due back in court on March 20th. 
Coming up, snow and ice are creating slick conditions on the road, sending buses and trucks sliding out of control. Thousands of flights are also canceled. We have the latest on the conditions, plus the new bitter cold blast on the way. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. 26 states from North Dakota to Florida are under wind chill alerts today. The snow and ice forced more than 2,000 flight cancellations on Tuesday and at least 900 already today. Trevor Alt is at LaGuardia Airport here in New York with the latest. More than 100 million Americans on alert as brutal wind chills, dangerous snow and ice conditions blast the country. Tennessee under a state of emergency as officials say six people have died due to the winter storm. Arctic air and record lows creating havoc on the streets. Oh God. In Philadelphia, a bus sliding down this icy road crashing into a fire hydrant. And in Alabama, this truck swerving on I-65 before jackknifing into the guardrail. Even this parked vehicle sliding down a slick driveway all on its own. Freezing temperatures leading to increased calls to plumbers. Watch as this homeowner in Allen, Texas, checks on the pipes for his pool. The filter exploding with icy shards flying into the air just as he walks away. And a pipe burst at this Chicago restaurant, completely flooding the floor, even spilling to the outside for the water to freeze again. It's just pain. It's just, uh, you're not, not expected. Experts now advising residents to shut off their water. The severe weather also downing power lines across the country, leaving thousands without power. We're a little concerned. We're bundled up and trying to stay warm. And in the sky, more than 2,000 flights canceled nationwide Tuesday, creating a travel nightmare for passengers like Regina Nelson Fambro. And it's a domino effect. So that made for an extremely long day to meet two TSA issues and one weather delay. And there's already been about 800 flight cancellations so far today. It's something I can definitely relate to. I tried to fly to Buffalo last night for this winter storm coverage. I tried two different flights with two different airlines at two different airports. And here I am reporting from LaGuardia. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt at LaGuardia. Thank you. And ABC News meteorologist from our theater is tracking that new storm system and those brutal temperatures settling in across the country. Samara, what are we in for? 
we are in for another shot of reinforcing cold air. So after we get to, through today's cold air, take a look at this. Over the next three days, a lot more cities, especially in the Northeast, are going to be feeling the chill. New York City feeling like nine degrees Sunday morning. Memphis, Saturday, feeling like a degree below zero. Even Chicago just as cold there. Now, we're also tracking this lake effect snow. They have not been able to catch a break. They've seen over 40 inches of snow this past weekend in cities like Buffalo, uh, Watertown. They are in for potentially another four feet of snow as the lake effect snow machine keeps going at least through Thursday. And then we're tracking our next storm entering through the Northwest. States like Oregon under ice storm warnings from Portland into Eugene. They could see up to an inch of ice accretions throughout the state. We have winter storm warnings throughout the plains and even an avalanche warning in parts of Colorado there. They've seen a ton of snow and they're in for more. They could see one to two feet of snow along the coastline from Seattle down to Medford, from San Francisco to Los Angeles, anywhere from two to six inches of rain. Diane? ABC News meteorologist Samara Theodore, thank you. Coming up, is Eagle star Jason Kelsey flying off into retirement? What he and his brother Travis are sharing on their new podcast about what's next. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt someone's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. I'm Gio Benitez at Dallas-Fort Worth International Airport. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. The 35th Annual GLAAD Media Awards nominations are out. The awards highlight programming with fair and inclusive representations of LGBTQ people and issues. And we're proud to say ABC News is nominated for six awards in outstanding journalism, including ABC News Live's Pride Across America special, which included five hours of live coverage from some of the nation's biggest pride marches. The GLAAD Media Awards will be held on Thursday, March 14th in Los Angeles and Saturday, May 11th in New York. Jason Kelsey is speaking out about reports that he's retiring. The seven-time pro bowler spent all 13 of his seasons in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles. Now in their new podcast episode, he tells his brother Travis that he doesn't know what's next, uh, what next year is going to look like, and that he's not ready to make an official announcement. ABC's Will Reeve has the latest. Reports Jason Kelsey is saying goodbye to the game he loves. When he says he's done, it's just going to be because he's tired of playing, yeah. because he's still at the top of yeah, his he's... profession. The future Hall of Famer reportedly telling his Philadelphia Eagles teammates after their Monday night playoff loss that he's retiring after 13 seasons. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. But this morning on the latest episode of the New Heights podcast, 
Kelsey telling brother Travis it was too soon to make an official announcement. I don't think that it would be uh, respectful or even accurate uh, to be able to do that right after a game like that. Yeah. The 36-year-old Kelsey was the best center of his generation, selected to seven Pro Bowls, six All-Pro teams, and winning a Super Bowl. But his notoriety far exceeding the norm for an offensive lineman. His outsized personality regularly making headlines on new heights. The popular podcast he hosts with brother Travis. You were People Magazine's finalist for Sexiest Man Alive. And um, unfortunately, would you come in like second? According to people, but if you ask Twitter, I was first. One of the greatest Eagles players ever. He's a man amongst the people. I used to joke around with him. Whenever you retire, we always have a job for you. He was a force at the front of the Eagles' signature play, the Brotherly Shove. Brotherly Shove again. Touchdown, Philadelphia. And known for that brotherly love with brother Travis, who said he chose his number 87 with the Chiefs to honor the year his big brother was born. You're the only reason why I wear 87 anyway. <laughs> Never told you that, man. You started the legacy. The two playing each other in last year's Super Bowl. In November, on the eve of what would end up being the final time Jason and Travis faced each other in the NFL, it's, it's their mom really Donna reflecting on what a trip it's all been. Do How does the dream of what you might have had for your boys growing up compare to the reality that they're living now? Oh, this far surpasses anything I could have imagined. Jason's wife Kylie, the mother of their three daughters, looking forward to the next chapter. I would love for Jason to retire. I always say I would love for him to retire when he can still get down on the floor and play with the girls. Fly, eagle, fly. Jason himself looking forward to what's next in the Amazon Prime documentary, Kelsey. At every meaningful part of my life, I've had people there to reaffirm me, whether it's my parents, whether it's my family members, or it's whole city. They've been there. ABC's Will Reeve, thanks for that. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News, America's number one news source. Hi, I'm
I'm Diane Macedo. Today on ABC News Live First, former President Trump is expected back in court in his New York defamation trial. The case will determine how much he has to pay for defaming E. Jean Carroll. What's at stake for Trump as Carroll takes the stand? A deadly winter weather emergency, snow and ice are creating slick conditions on the road, sending buses and trucks sliding out of control. Thousands of flights are also canceled. The latest on the conditions, plus the new bitter cold blast on the way. And the viral social media star bringing joy through the library. Michael Treats joins me to talk about his passion for books and making sure the library is a safe space for all. We begin with former President Trump back in court for his defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Carroll. Trump was already found liable for sexually assaulting Carroll in the 90s, then defaming her in 2022. Now she's expected to take the stand to make the case that he also defamed her in 2019 and should pay additional damages. Let's bring in investigative reporter Olivia Rubin outside court in Manhattan for more. Olivia, Carroll's testifying now. So what's the latest from inside court? Diane Carroll is on the stand right now and has been for about 45 minutes and she really came in swinging. I want to read to you one of the first things out of her mouth that she said after saying her name was that Donald Trump assaulted me and lied about it and continues to lie and I'm here to get my reputation back and I just cannot sort of state enough the fact that Donald Trump is in the room at the defense table while Carroll is testifying that he assaulted her and he is very clearly not happy with the testimony that he is hearing. He is sitting at the table. He is shaking his head. He is scoffing. He is laughing. He is speaking with his attorneys. He is writing notes. He is hanging on essentially every single word. And remember, he can't say anything in the position that he is in right now. He is not the one on the witness stand. So he just has to sort of sit there and listen to what is at times a brutal line of questioning of E. Jean Carroll talking about the assault against him. But but it is also important to note, Diane, that the question of the assault is not on the table at this trial. It has already been ruled as fact that Donald Trump assaulted E. Jean Carroll, and that is something that the jury has been reminded of by the judge, again, while Donald Trump is in the room listening to all of this. Now, Trump's attorney also had a tense exchange with the judge today as things got started. What happened there? The same way yesterday started, Diane. Today, Trump's attorney Alina Haba again asked the judge to not have court tomorrow because Donald Trump will be in Florida to attend the funeral of his mother-in-law. And again, Donald Trump is not required to be here at this trial, but his attorney asked for a continuance so that he does not have to choose and do both. And it's a line of uh, an ask that the judge does not like to hear again. And yet again, Donald Trump's attorney and his uh, the judge on the case got into an argument right there in the court room with at one point Trump's attorney saying don't speak to me like that I don't like the way you're speaking to me and I won't speak to you that way and the uh, judge essentially telling her to sit down so very tense between the two parties all right investigative reporter Olivia Rubin thank you Trump is sharpening his attacks on Nikki Haley as polls show the former U.N. ambassador trailing him by just single digits in New Hampshire. Less than a week until the first in the nation primary there, Haley is betting big on New Hampshire after securing the support of the state's governor. And after a stop in South Carolina, Ron DeSantis is also now making his case directly to New Hampshire voters. ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest from New Hampshire with that first primary just six days away. Donald Trump going straight from a Manhattan courtroom to the campaign trail, touching down in the Granite State for a rally. Get out and vote and make sure we win by big margins. The bigger the margin, the bigger the mandate that we have, the stronger we're going to be. The former president fresh off his resounding victory in the Iowa caucuses, going after his biggest opponent in the New Hampshire primary, Nikki Haley. I worked with her for a long time and she was okay, not great. She was not great. She's not tough enough to deal with these people. I will tell you that. She's not tough enough. Polls show Haley trailing Trump by single digits. Dave Sweeney, a retired tech worker from Atkinson, said he's torn between Trump and Haley. What can Trump say today to win you over? Well, if he stops obsessing with the past and starts laying out a vision for the future of this country. Haley 
is betting big on this state after a disappointing third place finish in Iowa. We came out strong. Now we want to finish New Hampshire and come out even stronger. The former South Carolina governor who faced criticism for failing to mention the word slavery when asked about the cause of the Civil War, rejecting the suggestion that being a woman of color may hurt her chances of becoming the nominee. We're not a racist country. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis edged out Haley in the caucuses, heading directly to her home state of South Carolina before appearing in a town hall in New Hampshire, making his case to voters. She does not have the ability to build the type of coalition that you need to win a Republican primary period, much less take on Donald Trump. DeSantis is trailing Nikki Haley here in New Hampshire. He was forced to cancel one of his events due to road conditions and weather. As for Nikki Haley, her campaign releasing a statement saying that America has always had racism but has never been a racist country. Haley says she will not agree to debate unless the former president agrees to do the same. Trump has provided no indication that he plans to take the debate stage. So the ABC News WMUR debate scheduled for tomorrow night has been canceled with the primary just six days away, Diane. All right, Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And ABC's Zoreen Shah joins me now from Manchester, New Hampshire, with more. Zoreen, with Trump back in court today in New York, what are voters in New Hampshire saying about his legal issues? Well, Diane, he was here last night. He spoke to a very big group. And look, it does not change their impression of Donald Trump. In fact, it makes them double down. Even Trump last night here, he connected his win on the trail to his trials. He said if he hadn't been indicted so many times, the race in Iowa would have been much closer. He has used his legal troubles to galvanize support, and it really impacts voters. Take a listen. I think this is American, and uh, until you're proven guilty, you know, you're innocent. I, I don't think they'll uh, convict them at all. I just think the whole thing is to ruin this election for him. Okay, so one person that we don't hear talk about Trump's legal issues, the current president. I have not heard, even heard Biden's campaign approach this issue. The Democratic National Committee stays away from it. But it's interesting, it's going to be interesting to see how long that lasts. Because in all indications, they all point to a, a Biden-Trump rematch at this point. So how are Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley approaching the New Hampshire primary? How are they trying to close this gap with Trump? Yeah, it's, it's going to be it's going to be tough, especially for DeSantis in this state. He was at a town hall last night. He stressed that if Trump is the nominee, the election then revolves around his legal issues. DeSantis is trailing behind Trump substantially in all the New Hampshire polls, but Haley is not. She is very close to him. Several former Chris Christie supporters, in fact, were at her event last night. She appears to have picked up some of his support post his dropout. But the real question, look, it's, it's if Haley wins this state, what is the path ahead for her? It is going to be tough, especially because Trump, he changed some of the rules in those future states like Nevada, California, to potentially benefit him. All right, Zoreen Shah in New Hampshire, thank you. And 26 states from North Dakota to Florida are under wind chill alerts today. The snow and ice forced more than 2,000 flight cancellations on Tuesday, nearly 800 already today. Trevor Alt is at LaGuardia Airport here in New York with the latest. More than 100 million Americans on alert as brutal wind chills, dangerous snow and ice conditions blast the country. Tennessee under a state of emergency as officials say six people have died due to the winter storm. Arctic air and record lows creating havoc on the streets. Oh God. In Philadelphia, a bus sliding down this icy road, crashing into a fire hydrant. And in Alabama, this truck swerving on I-65 before jackknifing into the guardrail. Even this parked vehicle sliding down a slick driveway all on its own. Freezing temperatures leading to increased calls to plumbers. Watch as this homeowner in Allen, Texas, checks on the pipes for his pool. The filter exploding with icy shards flying into the air just as he walks away. And a pipe burst at this Chicago restaurant, completely flooding the floor, even spilling to the outside for the water to freeze again. It's just pain. It's just, uh, not, not expected. Experts now advising residents to shut off their water. The severe weather also downing power lines across the country, leaving thousands without power. We're a little concerned. We're bundled up and trying to stay warm. And in the sky, more than 2,000 flights canceled nationwide Tuesday, creating a travel nightmare for passengers like Regina Nelson Fambro. And it's a domino effect. 
So that made for an extremely long day to meet two TSA issues and one weather delay. And there's already been about 800 flight cancellations so far today. It's something I can definitely relate to. I tried to fly to Buffalo last night for this winter storm coverage. I tried two different flights with two different airlines at two different airports. And here I am reporting from LaGuardia. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt at LaGuardia. Thank you, Trevor. And ABC News meteorologist Mar Theodore is tracking that new storm system and the freezing temperatures settling in across the country. Samara, what are we in for? We are in for another shot of reinforcing cold air. So after we get to, through today's cold air, take a look at this. Over the next three days, a lot more cities, especially in the Northeast, are going to be feeling the chill. New York City feeling like nine degrees Sunday morning. Memphis, Saturday, feeling like a degree below zero. Even Chicago just as cold there. Now, we're also tracking this lake effect snow. They have not been able to catch a break. They've seen over 40 inches of snow this past weekend in cities like Buffalo, uh, Watertown. They are in for potentially another four feet of snow as the lake effect snow machine keeps going at least through Thursday. And then we're tracking our next storm entering through the Northwest. States like Oregon under ice storm warnings from Portland into Eugene. They could see up to an inch of ice accretions throughout the state. We have winter storm warnings throughout the plains and even an avalanche warning in parts of Colorado there. They've seen a ton of snow and they're in for more. They could see one to two feet of snow along the coastline from Seattle down to Medford, from San Francisco to Los Angeles, anywhere from two to six inches of rain. Diane? ABC News meteorologist Samara Theodore, thank you. And hostages held in Gaza are getting access to medicine after Israel and Hamas agreed to a deal. It's the first agreement between the two sides since the week-long ceasefire broke down in November and comes amid rising tensions in the region. Meanwhile, Ukraine is defending against an onslaught of Russian drone attacks. A new president is taking office in Guatemala and Ecuador is fighting back against what the government calls terrorist groups. Our foreign correspondents have the latest headlines from around the world. I'm at Gutman in Jerusalem, where we've seen a diplomatic blitz of sorts over the past couple of days. A deal between Israel and Hamas facilitated by Egypt and Qatar has been reached to allow much-needed medication to go into the 100-plus hostages being held by Hamas in Gaza. That is the White House announcing intense and serious talks over the next round of a hostage release have now begun. They are underway. We've also seen a battle royale of sorts in the region as well. The Houthis in Yemen, that Iran-backed proxy firing a missile on another ship traveling in the Red Sea. The U.S. saying airstrikes destroyed four anti-ship missiles ready to be launched by the Houthis also in the past 24 hours. That as Iran's elite revolutionary guard saying that they launched ballistic missiles against three separate countries in the span of 24 hours against Syria, Iraq and Pakistan. Uh, reported civilian deaths in all of those countries. That is Israel and Lebanon. Uh, the Hezbollah-backed proxy there continue to fight along the border. I'm Tom Sufi Burridge in Kiev, Ukraine, as President Zelensky appeals to the West and says it needs to continue supporting Ukraine to stop Russian President Putin creating more wars in the future. The Russian president himself now claiming Russian forces have the initiative in the war here. What's certainly true, and we've seen it, is that Russian forces have way more firepower on the battlefield. We filmed with a Ukrainian artillery unit, those units now running low on ammunition. And we visited hospitals in eastern Ukraine where Ukrainian casualties are mounting. Soldiers and doctors appealing to members of Congress via us to continue supporting Ukraine, saying if American aid does not arrive soon, more Ukrainian lives will be lost and it risks the war here moving in a more significant way in Russia's direction. I'm Matt Rivers in Mexico City. A new president taking office in Guatemala wouldn't seem to make headlines, but given what we've seen there over the past several months, it is extremely noteworthy. Bernardo Arevalo taking office this week after repeated attempts since his win back in August by the oftentimes corrupt political elite in that country to prevent him from doing so, doing everything from suspending his political party to threatening arrest and prosecution of political allies up until Inauguration Day when old guard members of Guatemala's Congress use these arcane rules to try and prevent the inauguration 
separation from happening. But as we've seen so often over the last couple of months, indigenous groups coming out to protest in public in force, met also by support from the international community who did everything they could to, 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 to decry any anti-democratic actions in Guatemala. It means Arevalo did take office this week. That's a big win for democracy in Central America, even though he faces myriad challenges in governing. And Matt, Ecuador is in a state of emergency after violence broke out across that country. What's the latest there? Ecuador used to be one of the safest countries in South America, but we have seen organized crime, drug-fueled violence explode in that country over the past several years, none more so than last week when we saw organized attacks by some 22 different organized crime groups across the country, the most dramatic of which a armed group taking over a state-run TV station there. As a result, a state of emergency in the country with the president taking the extraordinary step of declaring internal armed conflict. That's an official designation in Ecuador that's allowed the president to put the armed Army onto the streets and crucially into the country's prison where so much of this organized crime activity is organized out of how this plays out will the army and the government be able to take the upper hand against these organized crime groups we're gonna have to wait and see this is a country we're gonna be watching very closely Diane over the coming weeks and months all right Matt Rivers Tom Sufi Burridge Matt Gutman thank you all coming up Alexis Christophorus has your business headlines Hey guys, hidden junk fees? No more how the Biden administration's trying to tackle and slash bank overdraft fees. Plus, the parent company of Burger King buying out its biggest franchisee in the U.S. and plans to renovate hundreds of stores. We're talking your money, coming up next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 store. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News, America's number one news source. Welcome back. The White House is trying to tackle and slash bank overdraft fees with a new proposal. This is Burger King Owners is set to buy out its biggest franchisee in the U.S. ABC's business report Alexis Christophorus has more on that and your other business headlines. Alexis, what are you watching today? Lots to dig into today, Diane. We're going to start with holiday shopping because it turned out to be even better than expected in December. The Commerce Department says retail sales jumped 0.6% last month. That says that strong job market continued to fuel spending. So Americans spent at car dealerships, clothing stores, and online last month, while sales at department stores jumped 3%, the most of any category. Analysts say these numbers suggest that consumers can continue to drive economic growth in the new year.
President Biden's trying to slash bank overdraft fees that millions of Americans pay when they try to spend more money than they have in their checking accounts. Many banks charge as much as $35 for every transaction when you overdraft on your account. Well, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is proposing new rules that would cut those fees to as low as three bucks. It says that will save consumers three and a half billion dollars every year. Now, these rules still need to be finalized. They'll likely go into effect next year. But some big banks like Citi, Bank of America, and Capital One have already lowered or eliminated their overdraft charges. So you want to double check with your bank to see if your money is in an account with the lowest available fees. And the next time you make a purchase through the Apple App Store, you may have something you've never had before, a choice when it comes to how you pay. So starting this week, Apple is allowing developers to add links inside their apps that bring customers to an outside website where they can then input their credit card information. Remember, in the past, Apple developers could only use Apple's billing system, which, by the way, took a 15 to 30 percent cut, and they couldn't tell users that prices could be cheaper on the web. This change comes after the Supreme Court refused to hear Apple's appeals stemming from Epic Games' legal challenge to its app store. And your local Burger King might be getting a makeover. It's all part of the fast food giant's plan to buy its biggest franchisee, Carol's, for $1 billion. As part of this deal, Burger King's parent company promises to pump $500 million into remodeling about 600 BK locations by 2028. Something to look forward to with your Whopper. All right, Alexis <laughs> Christophers, thank you. You're welcome. And if you have any finance questions for Alexis, just leave a message on our Instagram feed. She might answer your question right here on Thursday. Coming up, meet the viral librarian spreading joy through books, how he became an internet sensation and his advice for those dealing with internet bullies. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. A new social media star is spreading joy through his love of books and his favorite place, the library. Michael Threats has over 12 million likes on TikTok for his inspirational and positive messages about reading and his wish to make libraries an inclusive and fun place for everyone. And Michael's joining me now for more on that. Michael, thanks so much for being here. You know, not everyone would expect to go viral on social media for talking about the library. So why do you think your message is resonating with so many people? That's a great question. You know, I never sought out to go viral. I just was trying to push library cards, push library books, 
remind people of library does my cat makes an appearance knowing that we're talking about the library it can't be a librarian without a library cat um, and i just think that i just try to be as genuine as authentic as possible and just show people that the library is for everyone everyone belongs in libraries and i just love them so much that i think that shines through and people just are seeing like how much how powerful their local library is how the best the best card in your wallet is indeed a library card What's the cat's name? He wants to be part of the interview, so we want him included, too. <laughs> she does. Her name is Kissing Cat Barlow. She's named after the host character by Lewis Sacker. <laughs> of course she is. Um, so, Michael, you say the library actually helped you with your mental health struggles. Can you tell me more about that? Yes, growing growing up, I was a very shy, shy library kid, very reserved, um, very quiet. And books were my very first friends, reading Beverly Cleary, Henry Huggins, Ramona and Beezus, reading Lewis Sacker's Sideways Stories from Wayside School, reading the Chronicles of Narnia, being a homeschool kid, going to the library every single day, being educated by my mom, having my dad instill a love of reading in me. Um, it just, it just, it was always my safe place, a place that I knew I could be myself where I felt like I was the me that I'm supposed to be. Now, you faced some social media backlash recently with someone calling you a series of names, weird, among other things, but you found a way to respond with kindness. Why did you react that way? I reacted that way because I very recently became aware of how many kids watch the videos that I make, which always shocks me. I'm always shocked whenever people say like, oh, me and my kids watch your videos. We love the library. The the and library, so knowing that they may the have seen those um, awful comments, I wanted to make a video fired, showing kindness, showing empathy, and reminding people of who they are. And even the other day, a, a kid came into the library and said, hey, do you have any tips for young content creators? And I don't want any young kids trying to make videos on social media to face what I had to face. So I wanted to remind them how powerful their voice is, how powerful kindness and empathy are. And I just wanted to give them the best chance to become the best human being that they are and show them how loved they are by libraries, library people, and all sorts of people across the world. And you have to imagine some, some of those kids, and maybe even adults watching, are people who sometimes have trouble standing up for themselves in tough situations. So. What do you hope people take away from your your posts and your message? I hope people remember that they will always have a space in the library. You don't have to come to the library every single day to be to be a library user. Um, the library is always going to be there for you. If it's tomorrow, if it's 10 years from now, we're ready for you to come through those doors whenever you're ready. And I hope that people remember that the library is the place where they don't have to feel shame. They don't have to feel embarrassment. They have a friend in books, in the library, in library workers. And I hope they never forget how valued they are by library people and more importantly, valued by the world for the genuine human being that they are once a library kid always a library kid the library is always going to be here for each and every one of you all right michael three it's great to have you thanks for coming on thank you so much for having me and you can find more feel-good stories at goodmorningamerica.com thanks for streaming with us i'm diane macedo abc news live is here for you anytime with the latest news context and analysis we'll be right back Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. He told me, I've killed before, and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today, we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir. 
Driver, Deborah Roberts. The all-new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from San Francisco, I'm Selena Way. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Diane Macedo, let's get straight to our top story. Former President Trump is back in court for his defamation trial involving writer E. Jean Carroll. Trump was already found liable for sexually assaulting Carroll in the 90s, then defaming her in 2022. Now she's taking the stand to make the case that he also defamed her in 2019 and should pay additional damages. Let's bring in senior investigative correspondent Aaron Kaczurski outside court in Manhattan for more. Erin, Carroll is on the stand right now, and she says former President Trump, quote, ended the world that I had been living in. What stands out to you from her testimony so far, and what's it like inside court? E. Jean Carroll has said she has paid as dearly as anyone could pay because of Donald Trump's defamatory statements about her after she accused him in a book excerpt that was published by New York Magazine in June of 2019 of raping her in a department store dressing room. As you noted, Diane, a prior trial established the sexual assault occurred and the statements Trump made were defamatory. And there were additional statements that Trump said that E. Jean Carroll is now seeking to collect damages for. And she said those statements continue even today. She said sometimes she gets scores and scores, hundreds even, of derogatory, incendiary, and disparaging messages uh, about her appearance, about whether she lied, about whether she had a political motivation. All of that, she said, echoes the original comments from Trump back in 2019. As she's testifying, former President Trump is within earshot of the jury, uh, saying that she's not telling the truth, uh, questioning her memory, so much so that during a break, the judge instructed the former president to keep his voice down when conferring with attorneys so that the jury doesn't hear his side commentary. Aaron, could there be legal ramifications for that? Probably not. You know, the, the, the judge is going to at least start with a warning. Uh, but it is clearly tense. At one point, the judge instructed uh, Trump's defense attorney, Alina Haba, to just sit down after she was making uh, repeated requests for an adjournment of the case. Uh, Haba shot back, I don't like being spoken to that way. Uh, the judge reminded her that he makes the rules in the court. At one point, when she failed to stand up to make an objection, the judge admonished her to stand because that's what you do in this court and every other court in this building. Uh, it can be tense. And at one point, Trump was overheard uh, saying of the judge, he's a nasty man. Definitely sounds like a heated day in court today. Senior investigative correspondent Eric Katursky, thank you. And ABC News Live is getting an exclusive look at the migrant crisis here in New York City. New York Governor Kathy Hochul is requesting more than $2 billion to provide housing and health care to roughly 70,000 migrants, many of whom were sent by bus from Texas. Armave Villal takes us inside a New York City migrant shelter that houses mothers and their children, where officials say they can't keep up with demand. We're, we're at capacity for everyone. We really don't have any room at all. We might have one room every now and again. These families came to us and continue to come with the T-shirt on their back and the flip-flops on their feet. They're not ready for snow. They don't have winter jackets. Migrant crossings at the U.S. southern border hit a record high last month.
President Trump, meanwhile, is sharpening his attacks on Nikki Haley as polls show the former U.N. ambassador trailing him by just single digits in New Hampshire. Less than a week until the first in the nation primary there, Haley is betting big on New Hampshire after securing support from the state's governor. And after a stop in South Carolina, Ron DeSantis is also now making his case directly to New Hampshire voters. ABC News senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott has the latest from New Hampshire with that first primary just six days away. Donald Trump going straight from a Manhattan courtroom to the campaign trail, touching down in the Granite State for a rally. Get out and vote and make sure we win by big margins. The bigger the margin, the bigger the mandate that we have, the stronger we're going to be. The former president fresh off his resounding victory in the Iowa caucuses, going after his biggest opponent in the New Hampshire primary, Nikki Haley. I worked with her for a long time, and she was okay, not great. She was not great. She's not tough enough to deal with these people. I will tell you that. She's not tough enough. Polls show Haley trailing Trump by single digits. Dave Sweeney, a retired tech worker from Atkinson, said he's torn between Trump and Haley. What can Trump say today to win you over? Well, if he stops obsessing with the past and starts laying out a vision for the future of this country. Haley is betting big on this state after a disappointing third place finish in Iowa. We came out strong. Now we want to finish New Hampshire and come out even stronger. The former South Carolina governor who faced criticism for failing to mention the word slavery when asked about the cause of the Civil War, rejecting the suggestion that being a woman of color may hurt her chances of becoming the nominee. We're not a racist country. We've never been a racist country. Our goal is to make sure that today is better than yesterday. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis edged out Haley in the caucuses, heading directly to her home state of South Carolina, before appearing in a town hall in New Hampshire, making his case to voters. She does not have the ability to build the type of coalition that you need to win a Republican primary period, much less take on Donald Trump. Senior Congressional Correspondent Rachel Scott, thank you. And ABC News Deputy Political Director Avery Harper joins me now from New Hampshire. Avery, polls show Haley trailing Trump in New Hampshire by just single digits. So how critical is this primary for her? Uh, well, the expectations for Haley are very high here in the state of New Hampshire, where she's within striking distance of uh, former President Trump. And it's really important to note the dynamics here in the state of New Hampshire. It is an open primary, which means that uh, independent voters can uh, also vote in the primary alongside Republicans. And that's where Nikki Haley is hoping to run up the score. Uh, but the outlook for her gets a little tricky when you look beyond New Hampshire in South Carolina. It's possible for her to have a strong showing. That is her home state. Uh, but after that, uh, she's really looking at an electorate that uh, still sees the former President Trump as very popular, as somebody that they want to be the nominee. So uh, the question is if she has a viable path to the nomination. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis is coming off a second place finish in Iowa, but it was a distant second, Avery. So how does that change his strategy moving forward? And what's at stake for him next week? Right. Uh, Ron DeSantis went all in on Iowa. He visited all 99 states. He had establishment support. Uh, the outlook for him in a place like New Hampshire is very different. He is polling within uh, the single digits here in New Hampshire and in South Carolina. And so uh, he is trying uh, his darndest to get his uh, agenda out there, get to know some voters ahead of this uh, race here in New Hampshire. Uh, but again, uh, the question similar to Nikki Haley is uh, if he's going to be able to find a viable path uh, to the nomination. And there's lots of folks who are asking that question today. Now, Trump won Iowa by a wide margin. So how long can DeSantis and Haley hang on if he has another big win in New Hampshire? Uh, well, it seems as though they're trying to hold on as long as they can. I think uh, it's going to become an issue of confidence, right? Uh, with a 30-point lead like that, uh, a strong second finish does not necessarily get them uh, any additional momentum. And then it's also going to be about the confidence of the donors. Uh, folks are going to stop uh, giving to their campaigns if uh, they don't believe that they have uh, what it takes to become the nominee. And so it's going to be an uphill battle for the both of them. All right, Deputy Political Director Avery Harper in New Hampshire, thank you. And top, law top lawmakers are set to meet with President Biden at the White House today to try to reach an agreement on an urgent aid for Ukraine and Israel as well as security at the southern border. Sources tell ABC News that Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, House Speaker Mike Johnson, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer were all invited by the president ABC's Jay O'Brien joins me now on Capitol Hill, along with ABC News senior White House correspondent Mary Bruce for more. Uh, quite a list of names there, Mary. The negotiations 
over this aid and border security have been going on for months now. So what's the president hoping to get out of this meeting today? Well, look, I think the big sticking points at this point are where are they going to be able to find some compromise on the issue of immigration? Look, Republicans are pushing for the president to curb his parole authority. That is the president's ability to determine which groups are able to, to come into the country to stay here and work while their uh, asylum is being processed. Republicans are also looking for just broader reforms to who can come and seek asylum in the country. President Biden has said he is willing to compromise on some of these issues. The question is exactly where the president is willing to compromise, how far is he willing to go on this? And remember, all of this, of course, is wrapped up in that critical additional funding, billions of dollars in funding to fight the war in Ukraine and the war in the Middle East. And there's a real clock on this. The last payment that went out to, to help Ukraine went out about three weeks ago. The White House has been very stark in their warnings that without additional help from the U.S., Ukraine could very much face the prospect of possibly losing this war. So this is critical. The clock is ticking. It is something the president feels urgently needs Needs to be acted on. The question is just, as always, the devil in the details. Where are we finally going to see some compromise here, Diane? Now, Jay, Speaker Johnson is facing backlash over from his own party over his willingness to compromise on a deal to avert a government shutdown. Could that affect the negotiations today? And is Johnson risking his speakership if he reaches too far across the aisle? Well, hardline conservatives have said they do not like that funding deal that Speaker Johnson struck with Chuck Schumer in the Senate to avert a shutdown, a deal that they've still got to get passed, as you said, by the end of this week, or at least a temporary measure to avert a shutdown. Um, hardline conservatives here in the House would like border components to be included into the temporary funding measure that Johnson struck with Schumer over the weekend to kick the can down the road, keep the government funded into March. But those provisions are not included right now, and we don't get a sense that they're going to be added in. So that's just one more thing that hardliners here in the House Republican Conference are going to be upset with Speaker Johnson about. Now, those same hardliners have said that they're holding Johnson to a different kind of measuring stick than they held Kevin McCarthy, because Kevin McCarthy was in leadership a lot longer than Mike Johnson has been on the job as Speaker of the House. Nonetheless, they are certainly not happy right now, Diane, and they are putting pressure on Johnson's right flank as he enters into this meeting to try to broker some kind of a deal with the president. Mary, immigration is a big part of today's negotiations. Republicans have hammered President Biden for his handling of the migrant crisis. How critical is this agreement to his reelection campaign? It's huge. Look, we know that this is one of those issues that is top of mind for many voters and an issue where the president is really struggling. I mean, our latest polling shows just 18 percent of Americans approve of the president's handling of this issue. The White House is well aware of this. The president's reelection campaign is well aware of this. I think it's part of the reason that the president was willing to tie some immigration reforms to this uh, other funding for Ukraine in the Middle East in the first place. The president knows he has to show voters that he is willing to act on this. And remember, it comes as he is facing a lot of criticism criticism, even from some Democrats uh, who argue that the president and this administration haven't dealt with this issue with enough urgency. Now, the White House counters that by noting that, look, they've put out a security package that includes some $15 billion in immigration reforms. Republicans, they say, have failed to act on this. They note that the president's one of his first do uh, acts when he came into office was to put forth an immigration reform package. Again, Republicans failed to take that up. So they are quick to point the finger across the aisle on this as well, Diane. All right, Chief White House Correspondent Mary Bruce, Jay O'Brien on Capitol Hill. Thank you both. And Buckingham Palace has announced King Charles III will undergo a corrective procedure for an enlarged prostate next week. This is Kensington Palace, says the Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, is currently recovering in the hospital after abdominal surgery. ABC News foreign correspondent James Longman joins me now with more on that. Uh, James, what's the latest on King Charles's condition? Yeah, Diane, these are statements that we only got in the last uh, few hours or so. It sounds like King Charles has had this issue for some time and he's now going to the hospital to get it looked at. Uh, the statement reads, in common with thousands of men each year, the king has sought treatment for an enlarged prostate. His majesty's condition is benign and he'll attend hospital next week for a corrective procedure. So the palace is using this as an opportunity to raise awareness of an issue that a lot of men uh, face. He is in pretty good health. I think when he was younger, he had a n number of sports injuries, fell off his horse playing pole. Uh, and he had a hernia uh, operation a few years ago too. But look, his parents were very long-lived uh, and I'm sure that once this procedure uh, goes ahead next week, we'll get an update from the palace then. Diane? And what about the princess, Jane? What do we know about how she's doing? 
Yeah, a curious uh, communication strategy there, releasing both of these statements just within a few hours of each other. This one has uh, prompted rather a lot more interest just because of the amount of time she's now going to have to stay in the hospital. We're told that yesterday she underwent an abdominal uh, uh, surgery on her abdomen. Uh, it went well. We're told it is not cancerous, but we don't have any other details. She's going to have to spend at least f uh, 10 days, possibly 14 days in the hospital before she goes home uh, to Windsor. She lives in a cottage on the estate there with William and, and the three children. In a statement, she said she hopes that the public will understand her desire to maintain as much normality for her children as possible and that her personal medical information remain private. Her uh, duties are now going to be cancelled uh, as long as uh, until Easter uh, and as, um, William as well is going to have to take a, a little bit of a step back as well. She apologised to the charities and the other organizations that she was due to visit uh, for that uh, look they both carry quite a lot of responsibility on behalf of the crown on behalf of Charles going to visit uh, organizations and charities so uh, it's a sort of a significant step back for them for the next uh, few weeks but she like Charles is very healthy she's fit and active she likes to be up and about so I'm sure when she is uh, she'll be up uh, as soon as she possibly can be Dan all right foreign correspondent James Longman thank you James and we're learning new details about the fatal New York City subway chokehold case. A judge has denied former Marine Daniel Penny's request to dismiss the involuntary manslaughter charges against him. Penny's lawyers argue the victim, Jordan Neely, was, quote, insanely threatening at the time of the incident. Prosecutors say Penny kept Neely in a chokehold for six minutes, well past the point when he stopped purposeful movement. The medical examiner later determined Neely was killed by the chokehold and ruled his death a homicide. Penny has pleaded not guilty to the charges and is due back in court on March 20th. Coming up, snow and ice are creating slick conditions on the road, sending buses and trucks sliding out of control. Thousands of flights are also canceled. We have the latest on the conditions, plus the new bitter cold blast on the way. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. 26 states from North Dakota to Florida are under wind chill alerts today. The snow and ice forced more than 2,000 flight cancellations on Tuesday and at least 900 already today. Trevor Alt is at LaGuardia Airport here in New York with the latest. More than 100 million Americans on alert as brutal wind chills, dangerous snow and ice conditions blast the country. Tennessee under a state of emergency as officials say six people have died due to the winter storm. Arctic air and record lows creating havoc on the streets. Oh God. 
Philadelphia, a bus sliding down this icy road, crashing into a fire hydrant. And in Alabama, this truck swerving on I-65 before jackknifing into the guardrail. Even this parked vehicle sliding down a slick driveway all on its own. Freezing temperatures leading to increased calls to plumbers. Watch as this homeowner in Allen, Texas, checks on the pipes for his pool. The filter exploding with icy shards flying into the air just as he walks away. And a pipe burst at this Chicago restaurant, completely flooding the floor, even spilling to the outside for the water to freeze again. It's just pain. It's just, uh, you're not, not expected. Experts now advising residents to shut off their water. The severe weather also downing power lines across the country, leaving thousands without power. We're a little concerned. We're bundled up and trying to stay warm. And in the sky, more than 2,000 flights canceled nationwide Tuesday, creating a travel nightmare for passengers like Regina Nelson Fambro. And it's a domino effect. So that made for an extremely long day to meet two TSA issues and one weather delay. And there's already been about 800 flight cancellations so far today. It's something I can definitely relate to. I tried to fly to Buffalo last night for this winter storm coverage. I tried two different flights with two different airlines at two different airports. And here I am reporting from LaGuardia. Diane. All right, Trevor Alt at LaGuardia. Thank you. And ABC News meteorologist from our theater is tracking that new storm system and those brutal temperatures settling in across the country. Samara, what are we in for? We are in for another shot of reinforcing cold air. So after we get to, through today's cold air, take a look at this. Over the next three days, a lot more cities, especially in the Northeast, are going to be feeling the chill. New York City feeling like nine degrees Sunday morning. Memphis, Saturday, feeling like a degree below zero. Even Chicago just as cold there. Now, we're also tracking this lake effect snow. They have not been able to catch a break. They've seen over 40 inches of snow this past weekend in cities like Buffalo, uh, Watertown. They are in for potentially another four feet of snow as the lake effect snow machine keeps going at least through Thursday and then we're tracking our next storm entering through the northwest states like Oregon under ice storm warnings from Portland into Eugene they could see up to an inch of ice accretions throughout the state we have winter storm warnings throughout the plains and even an avalanche warning in parts of Colorado there they've seen a ton of snow and they're in for more they could see one to two feet of snow along the coastline from Seattle down to Medford from San Francisco to Los Angeles anywhere from two to six inches of rain Diane ABC News meteorologist Samara Theodore, thank you. Coming up, is Eagle star Jason Kelsey flying off into retirement? What he and his brother Travis are sharing on their new podcast about what's next. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow awards and see why the new york times calls it a news podcast worth listening to start here abc news make it your daily first listen now that's a part of the story i bet you didn't see coming wherever you get your podcasts start here from America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. Reporting from the iconic Hollywood sign, I'm Jacqueline Lee. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Welcome back. The 35th annual GLAAD Media Awards nominations are out. The awards highlight programming with fair and inclusive representations of LGBTQ people and issues. And we're proud to say ABC News is nominated for six awards in outstanding journalism, including ABC News Live's Pride Across America special, which included five hours of live coverage from some of the nation's biggest pride marches. The GLAAD Media Awards will be held on Thursday, March 14th in Los Angeles and Saturday, May 11th in New York. Jason Kelsey is speaking out about reports that he's retiring. The seven-time pro bowler spent all 13 of his seasons in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles. Now in their new podcast episode, he tells his brother Travis that he doesn't know what's next, uh, what next year is going to look like, and that he's not ready to make an official announcement. ABC's Will Reeve has the latest. Reports Jason Kelsey is saying goodbye to the game he loves. When he says he's done, it's just going to be because he's tired of playing yeah. because he's still at the top of yeah, his profession. The future Hall of Famer reportedly telling his Philadelphia Eagles teammates after their Monday night playoff loss that he's retiring after 13 seasons. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. But this morning on the latest episode of the New Heights podcast, Kelsey telling brother Travis it was too soon to make an official announcement. I don't think that it would be uh, respectful or even accurate uh, to be able to do that right after a game like that. Yeah. The 36-year-old Kelsey was the best center of his generation, selected to seven Pro Bowls, six All-Pro teams, and winning a Super Bowl but his notoriety far exceeding the norm for an offensive lineman. You love the Eagles, let me get a hell yeah! His outsized personality regularly making headlines on new heights. The popular podcast he hosts with brother Travis. You were People Magazine's finalist for Sexiest Man Alive, and um, unfortunately, would you come in like second? According to People, but... If you ask Twitter, I think that was first. One of the greatest Eagles players ever. He's a man amongst the people. I used to joke around with him, whenever you retire, we always have a job for you. He was a force at the front of the Eagles' oh, signature play, the Brotherly Shove. Brotherly Shove again. Touchdown, Philadelphia. And known for that brotherly love with brother Travis, who said he chose his number 87 with the Chiefs to honor the year his big brother was born. You're the only reason why I wear 87 anyway. <laughs> Never told you that, man. You started the legacy. The two playing each other in last year's Super Bowl. In November, on the eve of what would end up being the final time Jason and Travis faced each other in the NFL, it's, it's their mom really Donna reflecting on what a trip it's all been. How does the dream of what you might have had for your boys growing up compare to the reality that they're living now? Oh, this far surpasses anything I could have imagined. Jason's wife Kylie, the mother of their three daughters, looking forward to the next chapter. I would love for Jason to retire. I always say I would love for him to retire when he can still get down on the floor and play with the girls. Fly, eagle, fly. Jason himself looking forward to what's next in the Amazon Prime documentary, Kelsey. At every meaningful part of my life, I've had people there to reaffirm me, whether it's my parents, whether it's my family members, or it's whole city. They've been there. ABC's Will Reeve, thanks for that. And thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services, the ABC News app, and of course on abcnews.com. The news never stops. We'll be right back. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's going to get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries? In the car. I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu.
first thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Welcome back to ABC News Live First. Thanks for streaming with us. You're looking at Portland, Maine on this Wednesday, and we have a lot of news to get to. Here's the rundown right now. 26 states from North Dakota to Florida are under wind chill alerts today. The snow and ice forced more than 2,000 flight cancellations on Tuesday and nearly 800 already today. Parts of Tennessee have seen twice their annual snowfall average, and more snow is expected in the Northeast this Friday. President Biden is set to host congressional leaders at the White House today to discuss funding for Ukraine, Israel, and border security. The $106 billion request has been stalled in Congress for months as Republicans demand major changes in immigration policy. The administration is warning that aid for Ukraine is running out and that further delay will help Vladimir Putin on the battlefield. And Costco is trying a new way to crack down on membership sharing. According to USA Today, the retail giant is testing out devices at store entrances where customers would scan their membership cards. This would keep non-members out and end the practice of having to show your card and photo ID at checkout. Meanwhile, the judge is laying ground rules as Alec Murdoch pushes for a new murder trial. In 13 days, the disgraced attorney is expected back in court for a three-day hearing to determine if he gets a new trial for the murders of his wife and son. Now the judge says the convicted killer won't be allowed to testify about his claims that the court clerk in his trial tampered with the jury. ABC's Eva Pilgrim has the latest. The stage now set for Alec Murdoch's push for a retrial. After a tense hearing, the convicted murderer learning who will and won't be allowed to testify in an upcoming hearing regarding his claims that court clerk Becky Hill tampered with the jury during his trial. Are we entitled to evidentiary hearing? The law is crystal clear that we are. The disgraced lawyer who was found guilty of killing his wife and son sitting quietly watching as the judge decided that the only witnesses that can be questioned will be the 12 jurors who decided his fate and Hill herself who read their verdict. Guilty, guilty, guilty. Murdoch's legal team accusing Hill of pushing the jury to make a quick decision to secure for herself a book deal and media appearances that would not happen in the event of a mistrial. Hill denying those allegations, but later admitting to plagiarizing part of her book about the trial, which has since been pulled for purchase. Motive, selling books. But the judge limiting what questions Murdoch's defense team can ask Hill when she takes the stand. Because this is not the trial of Ms. Hill. It is about her contact, if any, with the juror and what she said. And let's not forget these jurors already gave six weeks of their time during this trial. The judge planning only one day to question them to limit them having to miss even more work. Court clerk Becky Hill will need to be available all three days. Meanwhile, state investigators now confirming they have opened two investigations into her behavior. Diane. Eva Pilgrim, thanks for that. And prosecutors in the Gilgo Beach murders case say they have new evidence linking suspected serial killer Rex Huerman to the killings. This is Huerman pleaded not guilty to a fourth murder charge. ABC's Stephanie Ramos has the latest. Suspected serial killer Rex Huerman indicted in the death of a fourth woman found murdered near Gilgo Beach in Long Island. We've charged the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes to add to the, uh, to the already charged murders. Maureen Brainard Barnes' remains were found in 2010, along with three other women known as the Gilgo Four. Last July, Hewerman was arrested and charged with the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. 
In a new filing, prosecutors also say they have new DNA evidence connecting Kewerman to the murders, linking a hair found on a belt buckle used to restrain Miss Brainard Barnes' remains to his estranged wife, Asa Ellera. A hair found with another victim's remains linked to their daughter, Victoria. The updated indictment included new details of the lengths investigators went to collect that DNA evidence. In May of 2023, undercover agents trailed Victoria Hewerman on a Long Island Railroad train, observing her drinking from a gold can seen here. They then retrieved that can from a trash bin for analysis. Brainard Barnes's daughter, Nicolette, speaking publicly for the first time since her mother disappeared when she was just seven years old. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all charges and is still being held without bail. His next court appearance is scheduled for next month. Authorities continue to investigate the unsolved deaths of at least six other victims found near Gilgo Beach. Diane. Stephanie Ramos, thank you. Let's bring in host and legal analyst at the Law and Crime Network, Terry Austin, for more on this. Terry, thanks for coming on. You know, earlier on GMA, the lead prosecutor in the Gilgo Beach murders case spoke to George Stephanopoulos about new technology that they're using in this investigation. I want to play that for you. The DNA evidence, it actually comes from the, killer, from the killer's ex-wife. Uh, his defense attorney says this DNA is problematic. Well, it's cutting edge. Uh, the uh, the DNA itself was extracted from the hair back in 2010, uh, and at that time there were there was no method to obtain nuclear DNA profile from hair. Uh, that has since changed. Uh, so we're on the cutting edge with regard to using this DNA analysis to obtain this. So, how important is this cutting edge technology in a case like this, and what kind of impact could it ultimately have here? Well, it's going to allow the investigators to determine in many cases, not just this case, who might have been involved. They can get DNA from family members and trace it back if it's in a database to an individual who might have committed that crime. So I think we're going to see other cases where we have particularly serial killers and there is any DNA and it could be traced back to a family member. You heard the talk about the daughter and the information they received from her DNA, tracing it back to him. I think it's extremely important that they are able, as time goes on, to do more and more with this DNA evidence. Terry, Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all the charges here. He's being held without bail. So what's next in this case? Well, you know, Diane, everyone obviously deserves a defense, including someone who has been accused of such horrendous crimes. I think what the defense team is doing is the exact same thing the prosecution is doing, which is lining up any evidence that could possibly help the client. The fact that he's never been arrested before, the fact that he is an upstanding person in the community, they are going to try to make those arguments. Obviously, they don't have to put on a case at all. In a murder case, the prosecution stands with that burden of proof. But I think the defense is going to try to appeal ultimately when this comes to trial that their client had nothing to do with it. They don't have his exact DNA. That is something they'll probably try to argue and that he had nothing to do with these crimes. We'll see what happens. We still have a very long way to go. And before I let you go, Terry, Alec Murdoch was also in court yesterday. A judge laid the ground rules for his upcoming hearing as he pushes for a new murder trial. So what do you make of those rules that the judge laid out? And what are you watching for in this case? Well, I think this judge is excellent. She made sure that she limited the hearing, and that makes sense. This is a hearing to determine whether or not there's going to be a new trial, and the standard there is very high. Not only has there have to be jury tampering, but there has to also be prejudice, and she's limited the evidence to just listening to Becky Hill, the individual involved here, listening to the jurors. She doesn't want to hear about any book deals. She doesn't want to hear about anything else Becky Hill might have done and I think it's a good ruling so when this hearing does appear I think we're going to see a quick ruling ultimately at the end of the day it's a very difficult burden to show that there was prejudice so I'm not sure what's going to happen but it sounds like the judge is going to let this trial stand on its own unless she finds that there was prejudice and so far we just have that one affidavit from a juror so we'll see what happens. 
All right, host and legal analyst Terry Austin, thank you. Thanks, Diane. Coming up, new findings on cancer and young adults, why the American Cancer Society says cases in one age group are rising and how to lower your risk. Also ahead, screen time and sensory issues in children. Dr. Patel digs into a new study with tips on how much time is too much and how to monitor it all. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Welcome back. The American Cancer Society has just released startling new findings about cancer rates in people under 50. The Society's annual report says while overall cancer deaths are de decreasing, cancer diagnoses in young people are increasing. American Cancer Society Chief Scientific Officer Dr. William Dayhut spoke to Robin Roberts earlier on GMA. Take a look. For this year, there'll be over 2 million people that will be diagnosed with cancer for the first time. That's the first time we've ever been over that number. And we're seeing some cancer trends that I think are really important for people to hear about. We're seeing a shift in the demographics. It used to be that, that people over the age of 65 had the greater proportion of cancer. They still do, but things are changing. And now it looks like that people actually under the age of 55 are seeing an increase in their cancer incidence, more likely to be diagnosed than they were before. And we're seeing in colorectal cancer is one cancer that we really see the numbers changing. Back in the 1990s, colorectal cancer was the fourth leading cause of death mm -hmm. of men and women with cancer. But now it's number two in, in women and number one in men. And we're still seeing cancer disparities. You know, sadly, too many black women, too many black men are dying from cancer, many more than their white comrades. And we're also seeing it in, in a cancer called endometrial cancer, where if you're a black woman, you're two times more likely to die from the disease as a white woman. Now, when asked why he thinks these cancer diagnoses in younger people are increasing, Dr. Dayhut says that it's something external to the patient, meaning not genetics, but rather diet, obesity, or in utero effects. As for the good news, rates of lung, prostate, and cervical cancers are decreasing due to decrease in smoking, emphasis on screenings, the HPV vaccine, and improvements in treatment. And now it's time for Patel It Like It Is, where Dr. Alok Patel shares health advice on the topics that matter most to you. Today we're talking about screen time sensory issues for toddlers. Here's Dr. Patel with what parents should know. 
Can too much screen time in toddlers cause sensory issues? In a recent study in JAMA Pediatrics, researchers found that children who were 12 months old who were watching television or DVDs were twice as likely to develop sensory processing issues when they were three years old. Did you say DVDs? Yeah, that survey data was collected before 2014. Imagine how many more screens are around now, 10 years later. But back to the findings. Sensory processing issues refer to challenges adapting to sensations such as bright lights and loud noises. And atypical sensory processing can occur with medical diagnoses such as ADHD and autism. And it's important to note that this study just showed a link. It did not say that screen time is the sole culprit. But experts agree that screen time in young children should be limited because too much of it can cause delays in language development, problem solving skills, behavioral issues, and honestly, who knows what else? Because as some put it, our digital world feels like a massive, uncontrolled experiment on children and their developing brains. Here are some guidelines according to the American Academy of Pediatrics. For kids age 18 months and younger, avoid screens. Although we can make an exception for some video calls with family. Kids 18 to 24 months, only high quality programming with a parent or caregiver also watching. And kids age two to five years, limit non-educational screen time to just one hour a day. And look, no one is trying to demonize screens or shame parents. I'm also the parent of a young child. We're tired, we're burned out. We are just emerging from a pandemic and sometimes we need a break. But try to keep it under control and age appropriate. Just remember children need to experience the real world too. And Dr. Alok Patel joins me now for more on this. Dr. Patel, what counts as screen time here? When my kids talk to their grandparents on a screen, do I have to factor that into their daily limits? And what do you say to parents who say cutting out screen time means they get no break, they can't get anything done, and then they're more stressed and worse parents as a result? Asking for a friend. Oh my gosh, I can identify with your words because screens are literally everywhere. You know, the first thing I wanna address is your, your first point that it's okay to use screens for kids to be connecting with loved ones and relatives. But we have to remind parents that this really does feel like uncharted territory. And we know that nothing replaces actual live human interactions and activities and going outside to feed language development, learning, creativity, and all these facets. And you know, one important thing with this previous study with atypical sensory processing is some of the bad news regarding screens really does show a link, not necessary causality. So in other words, parents can offset some of these issues with screen time by getting their kids real interactions. But remember, we have studies linking screen time in toddlers to delays in language development, attention spans, problem solving skills, poor sleep, weight gain, even poor academic performance. There's a 2019 JAMA article showing a link between toddlers and screen time and then developmental milestones later. And that was 2019 before our screen filled pandemic. So what exactly is high quality programming and what are best practices for parents or caregivers who want to co-watch as you describe it? I really feel like high quality programming is a marketing term. So parents should be wary when they go online or you go to a streaming service and you see these buzzwords like educational programming for toddlers, high quality programming. I wanna quote UNICEF in saying that babies need humans, not screens, because nothing really replaces Unfortunately, I should say this boredom and sitting down to fuel curiosity and creativity. Diane, you remember when we were kids not long ago when you're going to a dinner party or a road trip or on the plane, we didn't have devices. You had to sit down and figure out what you were going to do to entertain yourself. And so we're reiterating those AAP guidelines for parents under 18 months. We really want to keep screens away except for video calls, 18 to 24 months. Make it those that programming that actually can fuel some type of conversation between you and your child, your toddler. You can ask questions about the screen two to five, one hour per day, three hours on the weekends, which actually seems like a lot. And kids six and above start to teach them good digital habits. Remember, kids learn best from humans in real time, and we want to make sure we focus and captivate on that. So any tips for weaning those older kids from their screens? You know, creating a family media plan, something that everyone is on the same page is a really good first step. This can include things like screen, screen free zones and times so that kids have an expectation of when screens are not allowed. You can use lock screen reminders, be a good role model, make sure that you are also practicing you know, avoiding screens, stay engaged with your kids and talk to them, interact with them when they're not using screens and make sure we're teaching all older kids, adolescents and teens, good digital citizenship. By that, I mean, knowing how they can protect their own privacy, 
how they can practice kindness and empathy online as well. These are all really great tips. And also, Diane, here's a fun one that I just learned. Turn off autoplay on all streaming services. So once that little show is over, your young ones don't see the next show pop up and say, oh my gosh, I want another one. That's not good. That's that, even bad for us. That is a great tip for everyone in my family. Um, and Dr. Patel, before I let you go, I want to ask you about the new research showing a link between fruit juice and weight gain in kids. This new JAMA Pediatrics Analysis is looking at more than a dozen studies and, and talking about a positive association between drinking 100% fruit juice and elevated BMI. So what's your big takeaway from this study? My big takeaway is to, for parents out there to not fall for what you see on some of these labels where it says things like all natural fruit juice are filled with vitamins and minerals and get the perception that these are healthy. Fruit juices can often be loaded with sugar without the actual filling effects of fiber. So kids could actually eat seven apples worth of sugar, when in reality, what kid is actually gonna eat one apple and then want six more? Now this study, as you mentioned, is a meta-analysis. So it looks at about 42 studies and they found a positive association with one day, of, with having one serving of 100% fruit juice a day with weight gain. We already know that fruit juice is associated with issues like diabetes, obesity, and dental disease. And a recent survey showed that about 50% of kids get a serving of 100% fruit juice each day. So definitely not only more research is needed, but a, a broader conversation with parents about really limiting fruit juice. And Way and too much sugar even the without one the benefits that says, of eating real. And that's even the one that says no sugar added. Absolutely, because guess what? There is sugar found naturally in fruits, and if you strip the fiber and pulverize it all down into a fruit juice, you can get as much sugar as a soda. Wow. All right, Dr. Patel, always great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. And Dr. Patel is taking your questions. Leave a message on our Instagram feed at ABC News Live, and he might answer your question right here on Friday. Meanwhile, the Princess of Wales, Kate Middleton, is currently recovering in hospital after abdominal surgery. Kensington Palace says that the royal underwent a planned abdominal surgery this week and that the condition was non-cancerous. The palace says in a statement that the princess, quote, hopes that the public will understand her desire to maintain as much normality for her children as possible and her wish that her personal medical information remains private. She's expected to be in the hospital for 10 to 14 days and is unlikely to return to her official duties until after Easter. Coming up, investigative journalist Mariana Van Zeller is here to talk season four of Traffic, what it's like to infiltrate black markets and what you can expect in tonight's first episode. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here. And we got gotcha. you. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Reporting from the Federal District Courthouse in Washington, D.C., I'm Terry Moran. Wherever the news is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live.
Welcome back. Award-winning investigative journalist Mariana Van Zeller is shining a light on black markets, human trafficking, hitmen, and more in the new season of Trafficked from Nat Geo. Van Zeller takes us inside some of the most dangerous black markets in the world, talking with the people behind illegal trafficking networks and getting up close and personal with the merchandise. We saw you yesterday, you were making the drugs. Are you here to give it so they transport it, or do you actually transport the drugs too? Oh, in this car? Packed as if it's a suitcase? Wow, it's heavy. Very heavy, huh? How much is this? 30 kilo, 30 kilo, 60 kilo. Season four of Traffic covers everything from the trade in body parts and hired assassins to the smuggling of brides. And Mariana Van Zeller joins me now for more on that. Mariana, the access is unbelievable, what you're discovering here. Thank you so much for coming on. You infiltrate all these different trafficking networks. So what is, what is it like getting so close to the sources of some of these network and, and seeing how, for example, they're handling drugs in their trafficking. Yeah, it's not easy. I'd say that it's the hardest part of my job always. My job at my, my team is that we spend months, sometimes even years, trying to get access to these groups. Uh, and there's, you know, we've gotten used to getting no a lot of times. I'd say for every one yes, we get dozens, if not hundreds of no's. But at the end of the day, I think we've gotten unprecedented access for many reasons. One of which is the fact that whoever I speak to, I always tell them I'm here with empathy. I'm here to understand you with curiosity. I'm not here to judge. And I think that sort of, you know, a very human characteristic of wanting to be understood goes a long way and sort of helps people want to talk to me. Now, in the episode premiering tonight, you tracked down an assassin in your hometown of L.A., yeah. and then you head to South Africa. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, it was a chilling, chilling episode. I think we had some of the most uh, sort of scariest scenes uh, in that episode. It's hitmen. We think it's a Hollywood thing paid assassins. We don't think they actually exist, but they do. You know, over 3,000 people die every year at the hands of assassins. And so we really wanted to investigate this and try to figure out who is it, who are be who are these assassins, why do they do what they do. And the first interview we did was actually uh, just 15 minutes from my own home in Los Angeles. And we came face to face with the hired assassin. And yeah, it was, I think, sort of very chilling and unsettling in many ways. This season, you're also covering sextortion scams and human trafficking. What surprised you most about what you discovered throughout the course of shooting this season? This is actually my favorite season so far. I think it's the best we've done yet. Uh, we've covered we covered some really hard uh, but relevant issues like illegal immigration and sextortion, which is affecting our teens, and senior scams, which is affecting all our senior a lot of our senior citizens. So I think what shocked to me more was just how prevalent these black markets are, how they're all around us, and how really they exist because of failures in our governments, in our societies, because without these failures, you know, if we had a health insure, a health system that worked in this country, we wouldn't have 20 million Americans having to buy their prescriptions from the black markets. If we didn't have a broken immigration system, we wouldn't have thousands of people dying, you know, every day trying to make their way into the United States. So it's all about the, the existence of these black markets because we are failing American citizens. So let's follow that train. What do you hope to come from your work? What do you want people and maybe even government leaders watching this mm -hmm. to take away from it? Yeah. I hope there's awareness uh, to these issues. As journalists, that's what you always want, right? It's awareness, seeking the truth of what's happening in these very secretive and dark corners of the world that people don't usually get access to. So we have a unique opportunity to show people what's happening here. But at the end of the day, I also think it's important to have a connection. We have. We give our viewers the opportunity to, you know, maybe one hour a day at night, turn on their televisions and watch what is happening to people far away in other parts of the world. And we help them establish these human connections and also topics that are incredibly relevant to them. These black markets affect us on a daily life, whether we know it or not. Well, your work is brilliant and it takes a lot of courage. So thank you for doing it and thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me, Diana. And Trafficked Underworlds with Mariana Van Zeller premieres today on National Geographic and streaming the next day on Hulu. Thank you for streaming with us. I'm Diane Macedo. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live.
the crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, clashing in the courtroom, the judge snaps and orders Donald Trump's lawyers to sit down after complaining at the former president's defamation trial. We are outside court with the showdown. Plus, border bill talks and funding for Ukraine. Could we actually see bipartisanship in an election year? We're live on the Hill as the president invites congressional leaders to the White House. And if you haven't noticed, it's really freaking cold outside. 100 million people on alert for dangerously low temps with parts of Texas setting new lows around 10 degrees. Our forecast, no matter where you live. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, off the campaign trail and in court for trial. Donald Trump once again before a judge, this time in New York City for his civil defamation trial. The former president's case will determine whether he will have to pay former Elle magazine columnist E. Jean Carroll even more cash for defaming her in 2019 when he denied her allegations of sexual abuse. Carroll taking the stand today, detailing the assault saying, quote, I'm here because Donald Trump assaulted me. The former president seated just feet away from her during that testimony. Leading us off this hour, ABC News investigative reporter and producer Olivia Rubin. She is outside Manhattan federal court right there. So, Olivia, what more did we hear from Carol in court today? Well, Kara, what Carol is testifying to on the stand most of the uh, late morning is the fallout from the statements that Donald Trump posted about her. And what she is detailing on the stand are the threats, the barrage of emails, of posts, of messages, of calls that she said she received relentlessly threatening her life. It is at times very emotional testimony for Carol. She actually got choked up on the stand multiple times saying, you know, I'm sorry the people in the room have to see this as her attorney is displaying post after post and email after email threatening E. Jean Carroll's life. And she is telling the jury how it made her feel. She said she felt horrible. Her brain froze. She was scared for her life. And she did not really know what to do. And again, cannot emphasize enough, Kira, Donald Trump is in the room as she is testifying to this. He is reading every single threat as it comes up on the screen in front of him. You can see him leaning forward, reading the words on the screen and taking it in. But uh, most of the time, he does appear sort of stone-faced. He doesn't seem phased by the threats that are on the screen in front of him. 
And actually, at times, he's still sort of scoffing at her testimony. He's almost laughing some of her testimony off in disbelief as she's describing it. Because remember, what her attorneys say, Kira, is that these threats were a result of Donald Trump's statements, and they are trying to factor it in to how much she should have to, he should have to pay, excuse me, to E. Jean Carroll, Kira. Yeah, and you know what? He doesn't even have to be there. He's not legally required to attend this trial in person, but he always loves his show and he loves to intimidate whomever he can in situations like this. But what's interesting, his attorney is the one that causes uh, the judge to snap at her today. So a little little side drama. What happened? There has been no shortage of side drama, I would say, between Donald Trump's attorney and the judge, Lewis Kaplan, who appears to be growing increasingly frustrated with the repeated uh, motions, objections that he has already ruled on, that she keeps raising. But it, Donald Trump's attorney, Alina Haba, also appears frustrated with Lewis Kaplan and his rulings and the way that he is sort of conducting himself with regards to her uh, in terms of the trial. But it is also Donald Trump who at times appears to have frustrated E. Jean Carroll's team. They actually stood up before the last break and said that Donald Trump's conferring with his lawyers was so loud that they could hear it. And if they could hear it, couldn't the jury, too, hear what he is whispering to his lawyers? And I will say, Donald Trump is being audible in this courtroom. He is being very, uh, you know, reactive to her statements. He is speaking with his lawyers. I'm seated four, you know, rows behind him. And I can sort of hear him. I can by no means make out what he's saying. But very clear that he has something to say in response to what E. Jean Carroll is testifying. And the judge did remind him to please mindfully keep his voice down if he is going to be speaking with his attorney so that the jury cannot hear it, Kira. All right, Olivia Rubin, we'll follow it with you. Thank you. Also happening today, a conversation for more cash at the White House. President Biden hosting top congressional leaders about the ongoing standoff over his national security package, including funding for Ukraine, Israel, and the southern border. Our Jay O'Brien following this meeting closely from Capitol Hill. So we're just hours away from the meeting uh, and when it begins, right? So let's talk about who exactly is going to be there and what both sides are trying to accomplish by today. Yeah, we call this the big four, Kira, in terms of who's going to be in the room. So it's the top Republicans and Democrats in both chambers. Speaker Mike Johnson, Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader in the House, and then in the Senate side, Mitch McConnell, the top Republican there, and then Chuck Schumer, the majority leader there, top Democrat as well. So that's who's meeting with President Biden later this afternoon. President Biden wants to get them all in a room to talk about that $100 billion-plus supplemental aid package, remember, that includes money for Ukraine, money for Israel and what Republicans have said they want to include in that package being substantive immigration policy changes. But what those policy changes look like is what we believe is going to be very much one of the key points in these discussions at the White House today because there have been ongoing negotiations in the Senate, but it's unclear what they've come to and it's unclear what could get out of the Senate and get through the House. Here's Speaker Mike Johnson earlier talking about what he wants out of these talks. We're not playing politics with this. We're demanding real, transformative policy change because that's what the American people need and deserve and that they're demanding as well. House Republicans are standing on that line. I will tell the president that today. So it's interesting when it comes to what Johnson wants because House Republicans have said they want stricter border security measures, but he's also walked away from this idea that he wants substantive changes to U.S. immigration law or at least indicated that's not necessarily a priority for Johnson the way it is for Senate Republicans. So if everybody in Congress, even if every Republican get, can get behind something, is an open question, let alone can they strike a deal with Democrats and with the president. So House Speaker Mike Johnson is getting a lot of backlash from within his own party. You've talked about that over his willingness to compromise on a deal to avert a government shutdown. We saw something similar happen with Kevin McCarthy. So I have to ask, is there any concern now about Johnson's speakership maybe being at risk? Well, the new pressure he's under, remember, is because he's doing 
exactly what McCarthy got ousted for doing, which is doing another temporary government funding measure that keeps the federal government open after the deadline in which funding for some parts of the government would expire, which is this Friday at midnight. His plan kicks the can down the road into March, gives Congress even more time to fully fund the government, which is what Johnson did la late last year and what McCarthy did last year that led to his ouster. And so while there are hardline Republicans who are deeply concerned about that and deeply not in favor of this deal that Johnson struck for this temporary measure and the broader government funding deal that he struck with uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer. They've also said that they're holding Johnson, interestingly enough, Kira, to a different measuring stick than they held McCarthy. I've heard hardline Republicans say to me that because Johnson has not been in leadership for as long as McCarthy was in leadership, for example, that they're holding him to a different yardstick that they measured Kevin McCarthy's response. So while you have hardliners talking about their anger about this deal that Johnson has struck with Senate Democrats and this temporary government funding measure. We haven't heard any meaningful talk about coming for his job yet. All right, Jay O'Brien up on the Hill for us. Jay, thank you. And brutal cold is affecting most of the country, with even cities like Tampa, Florida, seeing wind chills in the 30s this morning. This wild lake effect snow is pounding western New York with even more snow after the past weekend storm. The Pacific Northwest also just getting lashed by more snow and ice. And our meteorologist, Melissa Griffin, is following it all for us. All right, what are you looking at in particular right now? Well, Kara, if you can believe it, after all that snow and ice that fell across the Northeast, we're tracking yet another cross-country storm. So that's what I want to start off with because we have eight states on alert now across the Pacific Northwest. Like you mentioned, ice storm warnings there for parts of Washington and Oregon. They woke up to some of their plants and roadways covered with ice and blizzard warnings for parts of Montana. The avalanche warning, avalanche danger very high as this storm makes its way across parts of the central and northern Rockies. You can see there that snow developing really heavy in some of these spots by this evening and that all pushes into the plains as we head into the day on Thursday. Now this batch of snow, this storm will combine with another storm that's going to be developing parts of the Ohio Valley and bring more snow for places like Ohio, Pennsylvania and of course the Northeast. We're looking at DC up through New York. This is Friday at noon so this is more of a daytime event throughout the day on Friday. Not the best day to be traveling in the Northeast. Looking at a one to three inches or so. So not a major event but still going to bring those slick roads on top top of the snow and ice we just saw earlier in the week. Now we're talking about that cold, so much of the country seeing that brutal cold. It's going to moderate a bit as we head into today and tomorrow, but yet another reinforcing shot of cold air coming to the same spots, really focused on the Midwest and Northeast. So look at this, by Saturday morning, it feels like negative 24 again in Kansas City, negative 14 in Chicago, and it's behind that storm for the weekend. A place like New York will see wind chills in the single digits, Kara, all weekend long. Wow. All right. A lot to talk about. Thanks, Melissa. Meanwhile, avalanche warnings are still in effect, this time in Colorado through tomorrow night as a new storm there is moving into the Rockies. Heavy snow and strong winds have already created dangerous avalanche conditions. And our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all from Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Hey, Kira. Well, I know you wanted more snow than what you got there in New York City and D.C. Uh, you got to come out to Steamboat. We're, we're getting crushed right now. The last 16 days, over six feet of snow has fallen here. Probably get at least another foot, if not two, over the next two days. But that's led to serious avalanche danger. We're at level four of five right now. So that means that nobody really should be going in the back country, even at ski resorts like this, where the snow cats are out. They're doing their best to work hard to groom and stabilize the snow in bounds and on some of the steeper terrain the ski patrol guys are out there uh, you know throwing explosives into some of that snowpack trying to release it trying to stabilize it there and they do that not just at the ski resorts they do it along the highways as well because we had a big slide at Berthoud Pass which connects Winter Park to Denver that as of this morning was still closed uh, so they're trying to prevent action like that happening and with all this snow coming in Colorado again uh, the CDOT's going to be working hard to try to stabilize that some of that snowpack. So pretty dangerous here over the next 24 hours. This snow is all heading east into your cold air. So it looks like another pulse of snow is coming for the northeastern quadrant of the country come tomorrow night into Friday. So you'll get a little bit more. Kira. All right, we're getting ready for it. Rob, thanks so much. Also developing right now, the royal family hit with a double health scare. King Charles set to have a corrective procedure next week to treat an enlarged prostate, while Kate Middleton just had abdominal surgery. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, has been following both cases. 
Yeah, hi, Kira. It emerged today that Catherine, Princess of Wales, was admitted yesterday to the hospital for abdominal surgery. And I think one of the reasons why it's garnered a little bit of attention is because of the amount of time uh, the statement from Kensington Palace says she is going to have to remain in the hospital up to 14 days. And then after that, she'll go back home to Windsor. She and her family live uh, in a cottage on the Windsor estate. She'll remain there resting until at least uh, Easter. So she will be out of the public eye for quite some time. We don't know uh, what the nature of this surgery surgery was, so I think it's not particularly helpful to speculate, uh, but one imagines it was reasonably serious given the amount of time she's going to need to rest. Uh, the statement, though, that was released by Kensington Palace says that she hopes that the public will understand her desire to maintain as much normality for her children as possible and that her personal medical information uh, remain private. The statement went on to apologise to uh, the charities, the organisations that the, the Princess was due to visit. Of course, in her role as Princess of Wales, she visits a huge number of organisations, uh, a number of the all those events are going to have to get either cancelled or postponed. William is also going to have to scale back a number of his uh, appearances to look after their children, of course, and to make sure that, that Kate uh, is OK. I think this is a fairly big deal for the family at large because the, these are two people who bear a lot of responsibility for uh, kind of carrying out these events on behalf uh, of King Charles. But, look, Catherine is a very fit and active woman. She likes to be up and about as soon as she, she can be, as soon as she feels she wants to be. I'm, I'm sure we'll see her. I'm sure we'll see her out and about very soon. Kira? All right, James Longman from London there for us. James, thanks. Coming up, it's been a murder case marked by secrecy. Now lawyers for accused Idaho college killer Brian Coburger want a motion to be made public. We'll explain why next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fort, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live, streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir. Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, prosecutors in the Gilgo Beach murders case say that they have new evidence linking suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman to even more murders as Hewerman pleads not guilty to a fourth murder charge. Our Stephanie Ramos is following the case. Suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman indicted in the death of a fourth woman found murdered near Gilgo Beach in Long Island. We've charged the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes to add to the, uh, to the already charged murders. Maureen Brainard Barnes' remains were found in 2010, along with three other women known as the Gilgo Four. Last July, Hewerman was arrested and charged with the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. In a new filing, prosecutors also say they have new DNA evidence connecting Hewerman to the murders, linking a hair 
found on a belt buckle used to restrain Ms. Brainard Barnes's remains to his estranged wife, Asa Ellerup. A hair found with another victim's remains linked to their daughter, Victoria. The updated indictment included new details of the lengths investigators went to collect that DNA evidence. In May of 2023, undercover agents trailed Victoria Hewerman on a Long Island Railroad train, observing her drinking from a gold can seen here. They then retrieved that can from a trash bin for analysis. Brainard Barnes's daughter, Nicolette, speaking publicly for the first time since her mother disappeared when she was just seven years old. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all charges and is still being held without bail. His next court appearance is scheduled for next month. Authorities continue to investigate the unsolved deaths of at least six other victims found near Gilgo Beach. Kira. All right, Stephanie Ramos, thanks so much. Well, it's a capital murder case that has been marked by secrecy and media restrictions. Now a lawyer for accused Idaho killer, Brian Koberger, is asking the judge to reconsider his decision to deny a motion to toss out the charges he faces. But that request to consider was made under seal due to a strict gag order that was in place. And the defense is now asking that the contents of that motion to reconsider be made public. Koberger's defense has previously made two different attempts to get the indictment against him dismissed, the judge denying both requests in mid-December. Our legal contributor, defense attorney, and host of Long Crime Network, Brian Buckmeyer, joining me now. Let's talk about the strategy here, Brian. Why ask for the contents of this motion to be made public? Kira, so I'm only reading the tea leaves here, but in my opinion, uh, as a former public defender, and, and Brian Koberger is being represented by a public defender as well, is the media and the information against Brian Koberger is in many ways just negative towards him. I think this is a way of trying to get some of that information out in a positive right, try to push back, so to speak, on the court of public opinion and maybe have a more even view of this case because ultimately, there's not gonna be a plea deal in this case. It's gonna go to trial. And when you're picking your jury, you want them to hear some beneficial information about your client in your case before they potentially get selected. So how realistic is this request from the Koberger team? I mean, can we actually expect to see this happen and see what's in these filings? So Kira, the specific request is just for the defense's motion to reconsider and to uh, dismiss the indictment to potentially have an interlocutory, meaning uh, a kind of pause on the proceedings where they go and appeal to a higher court or a potential stay. They also want the prosecution's response to that motion to come out. Now, typically a motion of this nature is heavily in the legal aspect and kind of light on the factual portions. They're not really talking about, well, this evidence and this evidence proves that Brian Koberger is guilty or not guilty. They're really talking about procedurally uh, why this indictment should be dismissed. And so for that purpose, I think it could come in, there could be a good chance. And that's what they're arguing to say, this is a lot different than the restrictions on the grand jury, which is very fact intensive, very evidence intensive. And it's understandable why the gag order may exist for that. But we could see a procedural argument, that being the motion to dismiss, come out. It's just up to the judge and their interpretation of their own gag order, as well as Idaho law in restricting information to the public. All right. Well, we'll follow it, Brian. Appreciate you. Thank you. And coming up, the DOJ is set to release its investigation into the police response to the Uvalde mass school shooting. What we know when we return. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me.
America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's going to get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. I'm Wade Johnson, reporting from Maui. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Some other top headlines we're tracking for you this hour. The Department of Justice set to release a major report on the response to the Uvalde school shooting back in 2022. The critical incident review will provide a comprehensive look at how police responded to that shooting that left 19 kids and two teachers dead. Local and state officials have been sharply criticized that response at Robb Elementary School when it took over an hour for any of the 400 responding officers to actually confront the shooter. The FAA says that 40 Boeing 737 MAX 9 planes have been inspected. The agency plans to thoroughly review data now from those planes before it approves final inspection protocols. This comes just days after a door blew off that Alaska Airlines plane mid-flight. FAA says nearly 200 MAX 9 planes will remain grounded until further tests can be done. And a Costco crackdown. According to USA Today, the retail giant is testing out ways to make sure the person entering the store is actually a member and not just someone borrowing your card or a friend's card. Costco is testing devices where customers would scan their membership cards on the way in to prevent any illegal entry. But don't worry, a hot dog and drink will still only cost a buck fifty. Jason Kelsey speaking out now about reports that he's retiring. The seven-time pro bowler spent all 13 of his seasons in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles. And now in a new podcast episode, he's telling his brother Travis that he doesn't know what next year is going to look like. And he's not ready to make an official announcement. Will Reeve has all the scoop. Reports Jason Kelsey is saying goodbye to the game he loves. When he says he's done, it's just going to be because he's tired of playing yeah. because he's still at the top of yeah, his he's... profession. The future Hall of Famer reportedly telling his Philadelphia Eagles teammates after their Monday night playoff loss that he's retiring after 13 seasons. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. But this morning on the latest episode of the New Heights podcast, Kelsey telling brother Travis it was too soon to make an official announcement. I don't think that it would be uh, respectful or even accurate uh, to be able to do that right after a game like that. Yeah. The 36-year-old Kelsey was the best center of his generation, selected to seven Pro Bowls, six All-Pro teams, and winning a Super Bowl but his notoriety far exceeding the norm for an offensive lineman. His outsized personality regularly making headlines on New Heights, the popular podcast he hosts with brother Travis. You were People Magazine's finalist for Sexiest Man Alive, and um, unfortunately, would you come in like second? According to People, but... If you ask Twitter, I think that was first. One of the greatest Eagles players ever. He's a man amongst the people. I used to joke around with him, whenever you retire, we always have a job for you. He was a force at the front of the Eagles' signature play, the brotherly shove. Brotherly shove again. Touchdown, Philadelphia. And known for that brotherly love with brother Travis, who said he chose his number 87 with the Chiefs to honor the year his big brother was born. You're the only reason why we 87 anyway. <laughs> Never told you that, man. You started the legacy. The two playing each other in last year's Super Bowl. 
In November, on the eve of what would end up being the final time Jason and Travis faced each other in the NFL, it's, it's their mom really Donna reflecting on what a trip it's all been. How does the dream of what you might have had for your boys growing up compare to the reality that they're living now? Oh, this far surpasses anything I could have imagined. Jason's wife Kylie, the mother of their three daughters, looking forward to the next chapter. I would love for Jason to retire. I always say I would love for him to retire when he can still get down on the floor and play with the girls. Fly, eagle, fly. Jason himself looking forward to what's next in the Amazon Prime documentary, Kelsey. At every meaningful part of my life, I've had people there to reaffirm me, whether it's my parents, whether it's my family members, or this whole city. They've been there. How can you not love those boys? Will Reeve, thank you so much. And thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, neither do we. We have a lot more on the other side. We'll be right back. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching? Watching Saturdays on ABC News Live. What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. What's good to watch, Reed? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good Morning America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here. And we got you. ABC News, America's number one news source. ABC News Live clashing in the courtroom. The judge snaps and orders Donald Trump's lawyers to sit down after complaining at the former president's defamation trial. We are outside court with the showdown. Plus, border bill talks and funding for Ukraine. Could we actually see bipartisanship in an election year? We're live on the Hill as the president invites congressional leaders to the White House. And if you haven't noticed, it's really freaking cold outside. 100 million people on alert for dangerously low temps with parts of Texas setting new lows around 10 degrees. Our forecast, no matter where you live. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, off the campaign trail and in court for trial. Donald Trump once again before a judge, this time in New York City for his civil defamation trial. The former president's case will determine whether he will have to pay former Elle magazine columnist E. Jean Carroll even more cash for defaming her in 2019 when he denied her allegations of sexual abuse. Carroll taking the stand today, detailing the assault, saying, quote, I'm here because Donald Trump assaulted me. The former president seated just feet away from her during that testimony. Leading us off this hour, ABC News investigative reporter and producer Olivia Rubin. She is outside Manhattan federal court right there. So, Olivia... What more did we hear from Carol in court today? Well, Kara, what Carol is testifying to on the stand most of the uh, late morning is the fallout 
from the statements that Donald Trump posted about her and what she is detailing on the stand are the threats, the barrage of emails, of posts, of messages, of calls that she said she received relentlessly threatening her life. It is at times very emotional testimony for Carol. She actually got choked up on the stand multiple times saying, you know, I'm sorry the people in the room have to see this as her attorney is displaying post after post and email after email threatening E. Jean Carroll's life and she is telling the jury how it made her feel. She said she felt horrible, her brain froze, she was scared for her life. And she did not really know what to do. And again, cannot emphasize enough, Kira, Donald Trump is in the room as she is testifying to this. He is reading every single threat as it comes up on the screen in front of him. You can see him leaning forward, reading the words on the screen and taking it in. But uh, most of the time, he does appear sort of stone-faced. He doesn't seem phased by the threats that are on the screen in front of him. And actually, at times, he's still sort of scoffing at her testimony. He's almost laughing some of her testimony off in disbelief as she's describing it. Because remember, what her attorneys say, Kira, is that these threats were a result of Donald Trump's statements, and they are trying to factor it in to how much she should have to, he should have to pay, excuse me, to E. Jean Carroll, Kira. Yeah, and you know what? He doesn't even have to be there. He's not legally required to attend this trial in person, but he always loves his show and he loves to intimidate whomever he can in situations like this. But what's interesting, his attorney is the one that causes uh, the judge to snap at her today. So a little, little side drama. What happened? There has been no shortage of side drama, I would say, between Donald Trump's attorney and the judge, Lewis Kaplan, who appears to be growing increasingly frustrated with the repeated uh, motions, objections that he has already ruled on, that she keeps raising. But it, Donald Trump's attorney, Alina Haba, also appears frustrated with Lewis Kaplan and his rulings and the way that he is sort of conducting himself with regards to her uh, in terms of the trial. But it is also Donald Trump, who at times appears to have frustrated E. Jean Carroll's team. They actually stood up before the last break and said that Donald Trump's conferring with his lawyers was so loud that they could hear it. And if they could hear it, couldn't the jury too hear what he is whispering to his lawyers? And I will say, Donald Trump is being audible in this courtroom. He is being very, uh, you know, reactive to her statements. He is speaking with his lawyers. I'm seated for, you know, rows behind him. And I can sort of hear him. I can by no means make out what he's saying, but very clear that he has something to say in response to what E. Jean Carroll is testifying. And the judge did remind him to please mindfully keep his voice down if he is going to be speaking with his attorney so that the jury cannot hear it, Kira. All right, Olivia Rubin, we'll follow it with you. Thank you. Also happening today, a conversation for more cash at the White House. President Biden hosting top congressional leaders about the ongoing standoff over his national security package, including funding for Ukraine, Israel, and the southern border. Our Jay O'Brien following this meeting closely from Capitol Hill. So we're just hours away from the meeting uh, and when it begins, right? So let's talk about who exactly is going to be there and what both sides are trying to accomplish by today. Yeah, we call this the big four, Kira, in terms of who's going to be in the room. So it's the top Republicans and Democrats in both chambers. Speaker Mike Johnson, Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader in the House, and then in the Senate side, Mitch McConnell, the top Republican there, and then Chuck Schumer, the majority leader there, top Democrat as well. So that's who's meeting with President Biden later this afternoon. President Biden wants to get them all in a room to talk about that $100 billion-plus supplemental aid package, remember, that includes money for Ukraine, money for Israel and what Republicans have said they want to include in that package being substantive immigration policy changes. But what those policy changes look like is what we believe is going to be very much one of the key points in these discussions at the White House today because there have been ongoing negotiations in the Senate, but it's unclear what they've come to and it's unclear what could get out of the Senate and get through the House. Here's Speaker Mike Johnson earlier talking about what he wants out of these talks. We're not playing politics with this. We're demanding real, transformative policy change because that's what the American people need and deserve and that they're demanding as well. House Republicans are standing on that line. I will tell the president that today. 
So it's interesting when it comes to what Johnson wants, because House Republicans have said they want stricter border security measures. But he's also walked away from this idea that he wants substantive changes to U.S. immigration law, or at least indicated that's not necessarily a priority for Johnson the way it is for Senate Republicans. So if everybody in Congress, even if every Republican get, can get behind something, is an open question, let alone can they strike a deal with Democrats and with the president. So House Speaker Mike Johnson is getting a lot of backlash from within his own party. You've talked about that over his willingness to compromise on a deal to avert a government shutdown. We saw something similar happen with Kevin McCarthy. So I have to ask, is there any concern now about Johnson's speakership maybe being at risk? Well, the new pressure he's under, remember, is because he's doing exactly what McCarthy got ousted for doing, which is doing another temporary government funding measure that keeps the federal government open after the deadline in which funding for some parts of the government would expire, which is this Friday at midnight. His plan kicks the can down the road into March, gives Congress even more time to fully fund the government, which is what Johnson did la late last year and what McCarthy did last year that led to his ouster. And so while there are hardline Republicans who are deeply concerned about that and deeply not in favor of this deal that Johnson struck for this temporary measure and the broader government funding deal that he struck with uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer. They've also said that they're holding Johnson, interestingly enough, Kira, to a different measuring stick than they held McCarthy. I've heard hardline Republicans say to me that because Johnson has not been in leadership for as long as McCarthy was in leadership, for example, that they're holding him to a different yardstick that they measured Kevin McCarthy's response. So while you have hardliners talking about their anger about this deal that Johnson has struck with Senate Democrats and this temporary government funding measure, we haven't heard any meaningful talk about coming for his job yet. All right, Jay O'Brien up on the Hill for us. Jay, thank you. And brutal cold is affecting most of the country, with even cities like Tampa, Florida, seeing wind chills in the 30s this morning. This wild lake effect snow is pounding western New York with even more snow after the past weekend storm. The Pacific Northwest also just getting lashed by more snow and ice. And our meteorologist, Melissa Griffin, is following it all for us. All right, what are you looking at in particular right now? Well, Kara, if you can believe it, after all that snow and ice that fell across the Northeast, we're tracking yet another cross-country storm. So that's what I want to start off with because we have eight states on alert now across the Pacific Northwest. Like you mentioned, ice storm warnings there for parts of Washington and Oregon. They woke up to some of their plants and roadways covered with ice and blizzard warnings for parts of Montana. The avalanche warning, avalanche danger very high as this storm makes its way across parts of the central and northern Rockies. You can see there that snow developing really heavy in some of these spots by this evening, and that all pushes into the plains as we head into the day on Thursday. Now, this batch of snow, this storm, will combine with another storm that's going to be developing parts of the Ohio Valley and bring more snow for places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, and of course, the Northeast. We're looking at D.C. up through New York. This is Friday at noon, so this is more of a daytime event throughout the day on Friday. Not the best day to be traveling in the Northeast, looking at a one to three inches or so. So not a major event, but still going to bring those slick roads on top top of the snow and ice we just saw earlier in the week. Now we're talking about that cold, so much of the country seeing that brutal cold. It's going to moderate a bit as we head into today and tomorrow, but yet another reinforcing shot of cold air coming to the same spots, really focused on the Midwest and Northeast. So look at this, by Saturday morning, it feels like negative 24 again in Kansas City, negative 14 in Chicago, and it's behind that storm for the weekend. A place like New York will see wind chills in the single digits, Kara, all weekend long. Wow. All right. A lot to talk about. Thanks, Melissa. Meanwhile, avalanche warnings are still in effect, this time in Colorado through tomorrow night as a new storm there is moving into the Rockies. Heavy snow and strong winds have already created dangerous avalanche conditions. And our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all from Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Hey, Kira. Well, I know you wanted more snow than what you got there in New York City and D.C. Uh, you got to come out to Steamboat. We're getting crushed right now. The last 16 days, over six feet of snow has fallen here. Probably get at least another foot, if not two, over the next two days. But that's led to serious avalanche danger. We're at level four of five right now. So that means that nobody really should be going in the back country, even at ski resorts like this, where the snow cats are out. They're doing their best to work hard to 
groom and stabilize the snow in bounds. And on some of the steeper terrain, the ski patrol guys are out there, uh, you know, throwing explosives into some of that snowpack, trying to release it, trying to stabilize it there. And they do that not just at the ski resorts, they do it along the highways as well, because we had a big slide at Berthoud Pass, which connects Winter Park to Denver. That, as of this morning, was still closed. Uh, so they're trying to prevent action like that happening. And with all this snow coming in Colorado again, uh, the CDOT's going to be working hard to try to stabilize that, some of that snowpack. So pretty dangerous here over the next 24 hours. This snow is all heading east into your cold air. So it looks like another pulse of snow is coming for the northeastern quadrant of the country come tomorrow night into Friday. So you'll get a little bit more. Kira. All right, we're getting ready for it. Rob, thanks so much. Also developing right now, the royal family hit with a double health scare. King Charles set to have a corrective procedure next week to treat an enlarged prostate, while Kate Middleton just had abdominal surgery. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, has been following both cases. Yeah, hi, Kira. It emerged today that Catherine, Princess of Wales, was admitted yesterday to the hospital for abdominal surgery. And I think one of the reasons why it's gone a little bit of attention is because of the amount of time uh, the statement from Kensington Palace says she is going to have to remain in the hospital up to 14 days. And then after that, she'll go back home to Windsor. She and her family live uh, in a cottage on the Windsor estate. And she'll remain there resting until at least uh, Easter. So she will be out of the public eye for quite some time. We don't know uh, what the nature of this surgery surgery was, so I think it's not particularly helpful to speculate, uh, but one imagines it was reasonably serious given the amount of time she's going to need to rest. Uh, the statement, though, that was released by Kensington Palace says that she hopes that the public will understand her desire to maintain as much normality for her children as possible and that her personal medical information uh, remain private. The statement went on to apologise to uh, the charities, the organisations that the, the Princess was due to visit. Of course, in her role as Princess of Wales, she visits a huge number of organisations, uh, a number of the all those events are going to have to get either cancelled or postponed. William is also going to have to scale back a number of his uh, appearances to look after their children, of course, and to make sure that, that Kate uh, is OK. I think this is a fairly big deal for the family at large because the, these are two people who bear a lot of responsibility for uh, kind of carrying out these events on behalf uh, of King Charles. But look, Catherine is a very fit and active woman. She likes to be up and about as soon as she, she can be, as soon as she feels she wants to be. I'm, I'm sure we'll see her. I'm sure we'll see her out and about very soon. Kira. All right, James Longman from London there for us. James, thanks. Coming up, it's been a murder case marked by secrecy. Now lawyers for accused Idaho college killer Brian Koberger want a motion to be made public. We'll explain why next. This is ABC News Live. The crushing of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, prosecutors in the Gilgo Beach murders case say that they have new evidence linking suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman to even more murders as Hewerman pleads not guilty to a fourth murder charge. Our Stephanie Ramos is following the case.
Suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman indicted in the death of a fourth woman found murdered near Gilgo Beach in Long Island. We've charged the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes to add to the, uh, to the already charged murders. Maureen Brainard Barnes' remains were found in 2010, along with three other women known as the Gilgo Four. Last July, Hewerman was arrested and charged with the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. In a new filing, prosecutors also say they have new DNA evidence connecting Hewerman to the murders, linking a hair found on a belt buckle used to restrain Ms. Brainard Barnes' remains to his estranged wife, Asa Ellerup. A hair found with another victim's remains linked to their daughter, Victoria. The updated indictment included new details of the lengths investigators went to collect that DNA evidence. In May of 2023, undercover agents trailed Victoria Hewerman on a Long Island Railroad train, observing her drinking from a gold can seen here. They then retrieved that can from a trash bin for analysis. Brainard Barnes's daughter, Nicolette, speaking publicly for the first time since her mother disappeared when she was just seven years old. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all charges and is still being held without bail. His next court appearance is scheduled for next month. Authorities continue to investigate the unsolved deaths of at least six other victims found near Gilgo Beach. Kira. All right, Stephanie Ramos, thanks so much. Well, it's a capital murder case that has been marked by secrecy and media restrictions. Now a lawyer for accused Idaho killer, Brian Koberger, is asking the judge to reconsider his decision to deny a motion to toss out the charges he faces. But that request to consider was made under seal due to a strict gag order that was in place. And the defense is now asking that the contents of that motion to reconsider be made public. Koberger's defense has previously made two different attempts to get the indictment against him dismissed, the judge denying both requests in mid-December. Our legal contributor, defense attorney, and host of Long Crime Network, Brian Buckmeyer, joining me now. Let's talk about the strategy here, Brian. Why ask for the contents of this motion to be made public? Kira, so I'm only reading the tea leaves here, but in my opinion, uh, as a former public defender, and, and Brian Koberger is being represented by a public defender as well, is the media and the information against Brian Koberger is in many ways just negative towards him. I think this is a way of trying to get some of that information out in a positive right. Try to push back, so to speak, on the court of public opinion and maybe have a more even view of this case because ultimately, there's not going to be a plea deal in this case. It's going to go to trial. And when you're picking your jury, you want them to hear some beneficial information about your client in your case before they potentially get selected. So how realistic is this request from the Koberger team? I mean, can we actually expect to see this happen and see what's in these filings? So Kira, the specific request is just for the defense's motion to reconsider and to uh, dismiss the indictment to potentially have an interlocutory, meaning uh, a kind of pause on the proceedings where they go and appeal to a higher court or a potential stay. They also want the prosecution's response to that motion to come out. Now, typically a motion of this nature is heavily in the legal aspect and kind of light on the factual portions. They're not really talking about, well, this evidence and this evidence proves that Brian Koberger is guilty or not guilty. They're really talking about procedurally uh, why this indictment should be dismissed. And so for that purpose, I think it could come in, there could be a good chance. And that's what they're arguing. They say, this is a lot different than the restrictions on the grand jury, which is very fact intensive, very evidence intensive. And it's understandable why the gag order may exist for that. But we could see a procedural argument, that being the motion to dismiss, come out. It's just up to the judge and their interpretation of their own gag order, as well as Idaho law in restricting information to the public. All right. Well, we'll follow it, Brian. Appreciate you. Thank you. My and coming up, the DOJ is set to release its investigation into the police response to the Uvalde mass school shooting. What we know when we return. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's going to get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. 
Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. You're watching America's number one streaming news. Live reporting, breaking new exclusives. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shohei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league. A side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Reporting from the scene of the deadly medical center shooting here in Atlanta, I'm Steve Osinzami. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You are streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Some other top headlines we're tracking for you this hour. The Department of Justice set to release a major report on the response to the Uvalde school shooting back in 2022. The critical incident review will provide a comprehensive look at how police responded to that shooting that left 19 kids and two teachers dead. Local and state officials have been sharply criticized that response at Robb Elementary School when it took over an hour for any of the 400 responding officers to actually confront the shooter. The FAA says that 40 Boeing 737 MAX 9 planes have been inspected. The agency plans to thoroughly review data now from those planes before it approves final inspection protocols. This comes just days after a door blew off that Alaska Airlines plane mid-flight. FAA says nearly 200 MAX 9 planes will remain grounded until further tests can be done. And a Costco crackdown. According to USA Today, the retail giant is testing out ways to make sure the person entering the store is actually a member and not just someone borrowing your card or a friend's card. Costco is testing devices where customers would scan their membership cards on the way in to prevent any illegal entry. But don't worry, a hot dog and drink will still only cost a buck fifty. Jason Kelsey speaking out now about reports that he's retiring. The seven-time pro bowler spent all 13 of his seasons in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles. And now in a new podcast episode, he's telling his brother Travis that he doesn't know what next year is going to look like. And he's not ready to make an official announcement. Will Reeve has all the scoop. Reports Jason Kelsey is saying goodbye to the game he loves. When he says he's done, it's just going to be because he's tired of playing because yeah. he's still at the top of yeah, his he's... profession. The future Hall of Famer reportedly telling his Philadelphia Eagles teammates after their Monday night playoff loss that he's retiring after 13 seasons. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. But this morning on the latest episode of the New Heights podcast, Kelsey telling brother Travis it was too soon to make an official announcement. I don't think that it would be uh, respectful or even accurate uh, to be able to do that right after a game like that. Yeah. The 36-year-old Kelsey was the best center of his generation, selected to seven Pro Bowls, six All-Pro teams, and winning a Super Bowl but his notoriety far exceeding the norm for an offensive lineman. His outsized personality regularly making headlines on New Heights, the popular podcast he hosts with brother Travis. You were People Magazine's finalist for Sexiest Man Alive, and um, unfortunately, would you come in like second? According to People, but... If you ask Twitter, I was first. One of the greatest Eagles players ever. He's a man amongst the people. I used to joke around with him, whenever you retire, we always have a job for you. He was a force at the front of the Eagles' signature play, the Brotherly Shove. Brotherly Shove again. Touchdown, Philadelphia. And known for that brotherly love with brother Travis, who said he chose his number 87 with the Chiefs 
to honor the year his big brother was born. You're the only reason why we're 87 anyway. <laughs> Never told you that, man. You started the legacy. The two playing each other in last year's Super Bowl. In November, on the eve of what would end up being the final time Jason and Travis faced each other in the NFL, it's, it's their mom really Donna reflecting on what a trip it's all been. Do How does the dream of what you might have had for your boys growing up compare to the reality that they're living now? Oh, this far surpasses anything I could have imagined. Jason's wife Kylie, the mother of their three daughters, looking forward to the next chapter. I would love for Jason to retire. I always say I would love for him to retire when he can still get down on the floor and play with the girls. Fly, eagle, fly. Jason himself looking forward to what's next in the Amazon Prime documentary, Kelsey. At every meaningful part of my life, I've had people there to reaffirm me, whether it's my parents, whether it's my family members, or this whole city. They've been there. How can you not love those boys? Will Reeve, thank you so much. And thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, neither do we. We have a lot more on the other side. We'll be right back. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. Friday night. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's going to get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries? In the car. I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive. Now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter. And it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the front lines of the war in Israel, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, clashing in the courtroom, the judge snaps and orders Donald Trump's lawyer to sit down after her complaining at the former president's defamation trial. We're outside court with the showdown. Plus, the Biden administration relists Yemen's Houthi rebels as a terrorist organization. Will that put a stop to missile attacks on our ships in the Red Sea? And good news for families, Congress reaching a deal to expand the child tax credit, what it means for you and your money straight ahead. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, off the campaign trail and in court for trial, Donald Trump once again before a judge, this time in New York City for his civil defamation trial. The former president's trial will determine whether he will have to pay former Elle magazine columnist E. Jean Carroll even more cash for defaming her in 2019 when he denied her allegations of sexual abuse. Carroll taking the stand today detailing the assault, saying, quote, I'm here because Donald Trump assaulted me. The former president actually seated just feet away from her during that testimony. Our senior investigative correspondent, Eric Kentursky, is also there. He joins us outside Manhattan federal court right now. So, Aaron, the judge actually threatened to boot Trump from court. What happened? He did. Uh, former President Trump, as E. Jean Carroll has been testifying, is making some side commentary that her attorneys say is within earshot of the jury. 
In fact, when uh, Eugene Carroll uh, says things, he often shakes his head or, or mouths, that's not true, it's false. When a video of a statement Trump made that defamed Carroll uh, played for the jury, you know, he sort of uh, looked at them and said, it's, it's true. And, and, and the, the judge admonished Trump, saying he has a right to be present in the courtroom for his trial, but that right can be forfeited if he doesn't follow the rules. The judge had already told him to keep his voice down when conferring with his attorneys, not to make extraneous comments that could be heard by the jury. And the, the judge said, you know, I, I don't want to have to, you know, kick, kick you out. And Trump said back to him, I would love that. And the judge, Lewis Kaplan, said, I know you would because you just can't control yourself. As soon as we came back from lunch just now, the defense said the judge has showed general hostility toward Trump, asked the judge to recuse himself. Judge Kaplan responded with a single word, Kira, denied. <laughs> it's like just poking the bear every single time. So what more did we hear from Carol when she took the stand, Darren? She's been giving some rather anguished testimony about what she said her life was like after June 2019 when Trump defamed her for uh, denying that, that she had sexually assaulted and, 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 uh, uh, in, a, in a dressing room at Bergdorf Goodman. Uh, Carol said that that unleashed his followers to send her messages threatening sexual and physical violence. She said her, her life as she knew it uh, ended uh, and, and she has been telling the jury that she's struggled to get her reputation back since, but has mainly been living in fear for her safety. She explained how she got a pit bull, that she never let off the leash until Trump made those statements, uh, questioning her veracity and, and calling her a, you know, a political pawn. Now she has a pit bull patrolling her property in upstate New York. She said she sleeps with a shotgun in her bed that she inherited from her father and recently bought bullets for it. Wow. All right, Aaron, we'll uh, continue to follow uh, everything that's happening today, see if um, Trump can behave himself and remain in that courtroom. We'll keep checking in. Thank you. Also happening today, a conversation for more cash at the White House. President Biden hosting top congressional leaders about the ongoing standoff over his national security package, including funding for Ukraine, Israel, and the southern border. Our Jay O'Brien is following all of this in addition to that meeting from up there on Capitol Hill. So the four heavy hitters will be there at the White House. Something has, ha has to happen, right, Jay? I'm not necessarily sure that something may or may not happen only because of the potential impasses that we're already seeing come about from these lawmakers before they even head into this meeting. I'll give you a good example. So we know that ongoing immigration reform talks have been happening in the Senate for weeks. Senate Republicans and Democrats meeting with administration officials behind closed doors trying to figure out if there are any immigration policy changes they could agree on to tack into that larger $100 billion plan plus foreign aid package that funds Israel and funds Ukraine that the president has requested. Republicans, remember, have said they are not going to advance that package unless it has immigration policy changes in it. But we just heard Speaker of the House Mike Johnson earlier today say that he wants stricter border security measures, but was questionable as to what kind of immigration policy changes he wants. Republicans in the House, remember, have been consistent that they want hardline border security provisions, not just changes to immigration policy like changes to asylum and things of that nature. So exactly what transpires behind those closed doors today, Kira, is very much unclear. And also, don't forget, there's been tension between the White House and particularly between House Republicans. There's been this ongoing perception that the White House has kind of drawn this line and in a sense said to House Republicans, you know, play stupid games, win stupid prizes has been their message to House Republicans somewhat consistently. And so if everybody can get on the same page, it is something that remains to be seen. Well, House Speaker Mike Johnson is getting a lot of backlash, as you know, from his own party over all of this and just willingness to compromise on a deal to avert a government shutdown. So we saw something similar happen with Kevin McCarthy. What do you think? Could Johnson's speakership actually be at risk here with that? 
Well, I've talked to Republican hardliners who say that they are not happy about this spending deal in any way, shape, form, or function, particularly the House Freedom Caucus. They don't like the larger deal that Johnson struck with Schumer that would fully fund the government if it passes, and they certainly don't like the temporary stopgap funding measure that Johnson and the Senate needs to pass by the end of this week to avert a government shutdown and give them more time to fully fund the federal government. But those same hardliners have said that they hold Johnson to a different kind of measuring stick than they held Speaker McCarthy. And one of the reasonings they give is that they say that McCarthy was in House Republican leadership for years, whereas Mike Johnson has only been Speaker of the House for a matter of months, and until then he wasn't really in Republican leadership. So they're holding him to a different standard. So while they don't like the steps he's taking to fund the federal government and avert a shutdown, we have not heard any lawmakers say that that is a reason yet that they're going to come for Speaker Johnson's job. Although we ha did hear today from Marjorie Taylor Greene, who told reporters off camera that if, if people move to fund Ukraine, particularly Johnson, in any kind of deal with the White House, which is what he's going to the president to, to the White House and negotiate with the president earlier today, she believes that could be a move to potentially vacate Johnson from his job. So there's still that idea of motion to vacate out there in the ether, but no one's really going for it as we speak. All right, Dale Bryan, we'll still track it. Thank you. And just as they finish digging out from last week's snowstorm, western New York is getting hit with another round of lake effect snow. Today, at least three people have actually passed away in Erie County since those storms began, with travel bans and advisories, advisories rather in effect for a lot of the area now. Joining us once again, our affiliate reporter Michael Schwartz from WKBW. Well, you can't catch a break, Michael. <laughs> Let's talk about the conditions where you are right now. Yeah, Kira, this is round two of that lake effect snowstorm. We spoke on Sunday, excuse me, on Monday, just outside the Bills game that had to be postponed. Well, tonight, the Sabres postponed their game with the Chicago Blackhawks on the ice uh, to tomorrow night. Now, that is played indoors, but it just gives you a sense of how uh, dangerous the travel is right now. I want to show you the prime example of lake effect. If you could see on the lawn right there, you could actually see the blades of grass. But then you come here and the snow is about up to my ankles. Now, in the next 24 hours into Thursday morning, western New York and parts of the area south of the city of Buffalo could see another 10 inches. So this is an event of one to three feet of snow being dumped on the snow that already came here to western New York. Take a look at the roads right now. The issue, once again, with last weekend's lake effect storm is the visibility. Things flying everywhere. I will say the visibility is not as bad as it was that postponed the Bills game on Sunday, but it still can blind you at some times, especially in open areas, not uh, between the city buildings. The wind is whipping around not as intense, again, as the weekend, but it is serious, as you just mentioned, those deaths related to the lake effect snowstorm since last weekend and into today. I just spoke to the police commissioner here. He had to get crews to rescue someone on the highway. The Skyway, which is our main source uh, highway right downtown, has been closed in this lake effect snow. Uh, they just rescued a man who was stuck in his car since 6 a.m. He called our news station. Uh, they did get him, thankfully, but they are warning drivers, do not travel if you don't need to. Yeah, it makes sense, except those trucks out there uh, putting down uh, uh, ice or uh, sand and stuff on the roads, hopefully, uh, to make things a little easier for those that have to get out. Folks that have to work like you, Michael Schwartz, appreciate you uh, just covering the story for us. Well, for more on that lake effect snow and the freezing cold in the rest of the country, let's bring in our meteorologist, Melissa Griffin. She is also tracking where and when uh, all this uh, wintry weather is. So much winter weather, here. I mean, we have the lake effect snow in western New York. You saw all those images from Michael. That was just really crazy with how much snow they got over the weekend and now getting one to three feet additional on top of that. The other area for active weather is out here in the west. So we have ice storm warnings. Those will be expiring in parts of Washington and Oregon. Blizzard warnings in parts of Montana. And then, of course, those avalanche warnings there in the Colorado Rockies. But lots of snow moving apart across parts of the northern and central Rockies through tonight as that system blasts 
blast through into the plains as we head into the day tomorrow. So more snow for places like in Nebraska up through South Dakota. That system will then combine with a second system Thursday into Friday, bringing yet another round of heavy snow to parts of the Great Lakes and Ohio Valley and reaching a lot of the northeast areas that already saw snow just yesterday from D.C. to Philly to New York City. This is throughout the day on Friday. So yet another day of winter weather expected to end the week. I want to show you the snow forecast. Look at Buffalo here. That's where you're seeing the foot plus of snow through the day on Thursday. And then these are the areas that are going to see the snow Thursday into Friday. Three to six inches in parts of the Great Lakes and Kira, one to three inches from New York down through D.C. OK, Melissa, we're counting on you. Thank you. Coming up, a designation to deter more attacks on our ships in the Red Sea. Houthi rebels back on the global terrorist list, but will it make a difference? Former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Mick Mulroy with his take next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. So glad you're streaming with us, hoping to deter more attacks and protect our ships and cargo in the Red Sea. The Biden administration relisting Yemen's Houthi rebels as a global terrorist group now. The Iranian-backed group was designated as a terrorist organization back in January of 2021, but was quickly delisted by President Biden when he entered office in efforts to end Yemen's ongoing civil war. But will redesignating the Houthis as terrorists and a terrorist organization actually hold them accountable and end these attacks that we've been covering? Our chief national correspondent, Matt Gutman, is in Tel Aviv. Also, former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense Mick Mulroy joins us for this discussion as well. Mick, by redesignating the Houthis as terrorists, what's in it for us? I mean, can we go after them with more force? How does this change the rules? Kira, it's clear that their actions do uh, necessitate a designation as a terrorist group, but these are two different designations. So the foreign uh, terrorist organization designation that was placed on them by the previous administration carried more restrictions when it came to the ability to travel by their senior leadership. But it also really restricted any uh, contact with them, which the problem was that impeded humanitarian aid into Yemen. Uh, so that is why, and that was stated why, the current, current administration dropped that designation. The new designation is a, uh, a specially designated global terrorist. So it does have a lot of the same financial restrictions, but it doesn't, uh, it gives the ability of the president to carve out that humanitarian restriction, uh, which is very needed because 
21 million Yemenis rely on food aid. So that's what that's the difference between the two. So it does impose a lot of financial restrictions uh, and, and restrictions to financial markets on the Houthis, also known as Ansar Allah. But it really doesn't give us any special military action against them. But we're going to continue depleting their ability to, to shoot at uh, commercial traffic. So then what would those financial restrictions do and impact what we're seeing now? So, Kira, when it comes to the ability to use the banking system for groups to work with them that don't want to fall into those sanctions, uh, that really does restrict them. Now, the Houthis, I don't think, are going to care. They're still going to carry out these attacks, blatant attacks against unarmed civilian uh, vessels, and we're still going to need to de stop the flow from Iran and deplete them as they get set up. But this is going to push other groups uh, to not have anything to do with them, including uh, businesses, and they do rely on that for a lot of the weapons and stuff they purchase uh, uh, into Yemen for the Houthi government. All right, from the Houthis attacks to the hostages in Gaza, Matt, this is where I want to talk to you and this new deal uh, with Hamas to get medication to hostages in captivity. You know, it, it's it's broader than expected. So can you kind of break down what exactly this deal means and how, you know, both sides were able to negotiate a deal? It's been in the works, Kira, for weeks now. Uh, Israel started talking about getting aid and the Red Cross officials into wherever Hamas is holding these hostages a couple of months ago. Um, this deal was facilitated by Egypt and Qatar. Hamas and Israel do not have direct negotiations or talks or any interface. But it is much broader. We saw this tweet today from um, Abu Marzouk, who is one of the leaders of Hamas based in Doha, and he said that for every package of medicine that is sent into to Gaza designated for hostages. There will be 1,000 packages of medicine or packets or whatever, however they're packaged, designated for Palestinians. And at this point, we understand that there are now five truckloads of medicine bound for Gaza currently being, being inspected by the Israeli military. They're now going in. They're going to be dropped off at four hospitals throughout the Gaza Strip by the Red Cross. And from there, they'll be disseminated. Israel has wanted to make very sure that the medicine that it wanted to get to specific hostages actually gets them. I don't know the mechanisms at this point by which they're going to verify that, but somehow they expect that to be done. This is a pretty big um, achievement for Hamas at this point because it shows that they've managed to get something from these negotiations that benefits all Palestinians who so desperately need that kind of medicine right now in the Gaza Strip, Kira. All right, Matt Gutman, Mick, Roy, Mick uh, Mulroy, thank you both so much. Appreciate it. And a new proposal could expand the popular child tax credit back here in the U.S. Under the new proposal, families could actually get up to $2,000 a year per child by 2025. That new proposal comes after a 2021 pandemic-era tax benefit came to an end. To break it all down, our Elizabeth Schulze is here. So first of all, Elizabeth, let's just talk about what's in the new child tax credit proposal and then how is it different from the benefit we saw in 2021? Well, Kira, this is a plan that has been negotiated for months. And one thing that's unique about it is that it was proposed on a bipartisan basis. This was negotiated between Senator Ron Wyden, a Democrat, and Republican Congressman Jason Smith. And essentially what they're doing is they're trying to reinstate some of the expanded child tax credit that was put in place in 2021 and then expired. So as you say, they're going to increase the amount of the credit to $2,000 that would be fully refundable. Right now, about $1,600 of the dollars that you would get for per child are fully refundable by 2025. That could go up to 2000. So that is a significant difference when we're talking about money back in people's pockets. This would also make some other changes to the child tax credit, like adjusting it for inflation. That is so key for so many families as we've seen higher inflation. And the key goal here is to try to reinstate some of those benefits that really did have a big impact on American families, Kira. We're talking about the possibility of lifting as many as 16 million low-income children. You can see that number there on your screen bringing them uh, direct benefits, and then 400,000 kids could be lifted out of poverty because of this benefit. In exchange for that expanded you know, spending that would be coming from the child tax credit, there are biz ta uh, 
tax breaks for businesses in this plan, uh, small business tax reliefs, R&D tax credits, and that's a way to try to get at trying to see if there could be this bipartisan effort to actually pass this bill, uh, get it done, maybe even in time for the next tax year, Kira. So the 2021 child tax credit had huge impacts. You talked about it when it went down. Um, the Census Bureau reported that it lifted nearly 3 million kids out of poverty. So let's talk about what this policy could really mean for families. You know, and I think this is really important because we talk about these policies, whether they're coming out of government agencies or on Capitol Hill, and often it's so abstract. But this really was an example, Kira, of a federal policy that had a direct impact on so many American families. The fact that three million kids were lifted out of poverty when in 2021 they were able to get access to that expanded child tax credit. There was an immediate benefit from the government basically trying to put that, putting that in place. What we saw, and if you look at the chart, you can see that child poverty hit a record low almost overnight, 5.2%. But then look at that same chart. Right when that policy expired, it went back up to 12.4%, and it is likely going to have gone up again in 2023. So what that's telling you is that this policy did have an impact. I've talked to families who were getting that, that, that expanded credit, and one of the differences was they were getting it every month. A lot of them used it to cover day-to-day -day expenses, Kira, child care, groceries, diapers, things that they felt like they were struggling to pay for and that this gave them a little extra boost. Got it. Elizabeth Schulze, appreciate it. Thank you so much. Coming up, startling findings about cancer rates in people under 50. Dr. Alok Patel is here with what you need to know. point of politics. They're expecting us? This is our secret world we have. Do you think we're going to be safe? I don't know. This is my pen. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. These are assassinations that people are going to be murdered. There's really no telling what some of them will do. I did, I did, I did, I did, I did. Oh my God, oh. It's happening everywhere and anywhere. Wow. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. So many people start their day here. From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Marcus Moore covering the wildfires in Greece. Wherever the story is, we will take you there. You're streaming with ABC News Live. health alert right now involving cancer statistics. The American Cancer Society has released its annual report with some startling findings about cancer rates in people under 50 and the types of cancers that have become more prevalent. Our medical contributor, Dr. Alok Patel, joins us now for a look at this. So, Alok, let's talk about just some of the findings in the new report, um, the significance of those findings, and what stood out to you? Here, the big finding is the rising rates of cancer diagnoses in young individuals under the age of 50, specifically with colon and breast cancer. As we'll get into it, we don't really know the reasons. Some good news is that cancer deaths have gone down by over 30% since the early 90s. That's millions of lives saved. 
but still some cancer mortality or deaths from cancer has gone up with uterine cancer. And then some more good news is cancer rates for prostate, lung, and cervical cancer have gone down, but still we have a grave problem. According to the American Cancer Society, there's gonna be 2 million new cancer diagnoses this year. If you do the math, Kira, that is 10 cancer diagnoses by the time you and I are done talking right now. So I know you're not quite sure of the reasoning why we're seeing these these higher cancer stats with those under 50, but I mean, can you, from what you read, what you study, what you know as a doctor, is it what we're eating? Is it the air we're breathing? I, uh, you know, what, what could be leading to, to some of this? You know, your scientific thinking right now, Kira, is spot on because as we look at this data, and we look at the epidemiologic trends, one has to wonder what has really changed in this generation. And part of it is the environmental exposures that we all live with. Have things changed in childhood exposures as well? But one big, one big risk factor is also rising rates of chronic disease such as obesity and how that is contributing to what's happening with these riser cancer rates in young individuals. And an alarming reality is what's going to happen as we see rising rates of cancer in young individuals, when everyone gets a little bit older, are we gonna see more late stage cancer diagnoses as well and more illness? So as we talk about this, I mean, what are some things we can do um, to change our lifestyle, um, to, to try and avoid, you know, these, these high rates of cancers that we're seeing, whether it's prostate, lung, cervical, all the things that you mentioned. Um, yes, there are some numbers that are going down, but I mean, it's alarming that the younger population, usually you see the cancers happening as you get older, but this is younger folks. So there's got to be changes that we can make uh, just in our everyday lives. Absolutely. And if we look at lifestyle changes, even little things like exercising regularly, eating a whole food based diet, avoiding processed foods, minimizing how much alcohol and smoking that we're doing. These are part of the reasons why cancer rates for prostate, lung and cervical cancer have gone down, making sure that we're up to date with screening. We're checking with doctors for any new symptoms. The HPV vaccine has greatly reduced risks of cervical cancer, which is also really important and making sure that if you have a family history or you're high risk, that you were checking with your doctor. Great advice. Good to see you, Doc. Likewise. And thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, and neither do we. We have a lot more on the other side. Don't go far. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's going to get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live, America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7 straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here.
Today on ABC News Live, clashing in the courtroom, the judge snaps and orders Donald Trump's lawyers to sit down after complaining at the former president's defamation trial. We are outside court with the showdown. Plus, border bill talks and funding for Ukraine. Could we actually see bipartisanship in an election year? We're live on the Hill as the president invites congressional leaders to the White House. And if you haven't noticed, it's really freaking cold outside. 100 million people on alert for dangerously low temps with parts of Texas setting new lows around 10 degrees. Our forecast, no matter where you live. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Our top story this hour, off the campaign trail and in court for trial. Donald Trump once again before a judge, this time in New York City for his civil defamation trial. The former president's case will determine whether he will have to pay former Elle magazine columnist E. Jean Carroll even more cash for defaming her in 2019 when he denied her allegations of sexual abuse. Carroll taking the stand today, detailing the assault, saying, quote, I'm here because Donald Trump assaulted me. The former president seated just feet away from her during that testimony. Leading us off this hour, ABC News investigative reporter and producer Olivia Rubin. She is outside Manhattan federal court right there. So Olivia, what more did we hear from Carol in court today? Well, Kara, what Carol is testifying to on the stand most of the uh, late morning is the fallout from the statements that Donald Trump posted about her. And what she is detailing on the stand are the threats, the barrage of emails, of posts, of messages, of calls that she said she received relentlessly threatening her life. It is at times very emotional testimony for Carol. She actually got choked up on the stand multiple times saying, you know, I'm sorry the people in the room have to see this as her attorney is displaying post after post and email after email threatening E. Jean Carroll's life. And she is telling the jury how it made her feel. She said she felt horrible. Her brain froze. She was scared for her life. And she did not really know what to do. And again, cannot emphasize enough, Kira, Donald Trump is in the room as she is testifying to this. He is reading every single threat as it comes up on the screen in front of him. You can see him leaning forward, reading the words on the screen and taking it in. But uh, most of the time, he does appear sort of stone-faced. He doesn't seem phased by the threats that are on the screen in front of him. And actually, at times, he's still sort of scoffing at her testimony. He's almost laughing some of her testimony off in disbelief as she's describing it. Because remember, what her attorneys say, Kira, is that these threats were a result of Donald Trump's statements, and they are trying to factor it in to how much she should have to, he should have to pay, excuse me, to E. Jean Carroll, Kira. Yeah, and you know what? He doesn't even have to be there. He's not legally required to attend this trial in person, but he always loves to show and he loves to intimidate whomever he can in situations like this. But what's interesting, his attorney is the one that causes uh, the judge to snap at her today. So a little little side drama. What happened? There has been no shortage of side drama, I would say, between Donald Trump's attorney and the judge, Lewis Kaplan, who appears to be growing increasingly frustrated with the repeated uh, motions, objections that he has already ruled on, that she keeps raising. But it, Donald Trump's attorney, Alina Haba, also appears frustrated with Lewis Kaplan and his rulings and the way that he is sort of conducting himself with regards to her uh, in terms of the trial. But it is also Donald Trump, who at times appears to have frustrated E. Jean Carroll's team. They actually stood up before the last break and said that Donald Trump's conferring with his lawyers was so loud that they could hear it. And if they could hear it, couldn't the jury too hear what he is whispering to his lawyers? And I will say, Donald Trump is being audible in this courtroom. He is being very, uh, you know, reactive to her statements. He is speaking with his lawyers. I'm seated four, you know, rows behind him, and I can sort of hear him. I can by no means make out what he's saying, but very clear that he has something to say in response to what E. Jean Carroll is testifying. And the judge did remind him to please mindfully keep his voice down if he is going to be speaking with his attorney so that the jury cannot hear it, Kira. All right, Olivia Rubin, we'll follow it with you. Thank you.
Also happening today, a conversation for more cash at the White House. President Biden hosting top congressional leaders about the ongoing standoff over his national security package, including funding for Ukraine, Israel, and the southern border. Our Jay O'Brien following this meeting closely from Capitol Hill. So we're just hours away from the meeting uh, and when it begins, right? So let's talk about who exactly is going to be there and what both sides are trying to accomplish by today. Yeah, we call this the big four, Kira, in terms of who's going to be in the room. So it's the top Republicans and Democrats in both chambers. Speaker Mike Johnson, Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leader in the House, and then in the Senate side, Mitch McConnell, the top Republican there, and then Chuck Schumer, the majority leader there, top Democrat as well. So that's who's meeting with President Biden later this afternoon. President Biden wants to get them all in a room to talk about that $100 billion plus supplemental aid package, remember, that includes money for Ukraine, money for Israel, and what Republicans have said they want to include in that package being substantive immigration policy changes. But what those policy changes look like is what we believe is going to be very much one of the key points in these discussions at the White House today because there have been ongoing negotiations in the Senate, but it's unclear what they've come to, and it's unclear what could get out of the Senate and get through the House. Here's Speaker Mike Johnson earlier talking about what he wants out of these talks. We're not playing politics with this. We're demanding real, transformative policy change because that's what the American people need and deserve and that they're demanding as well. House Republicans are standing on that line. I will tell the president that today. So it's interesting when it comes to what Johnson wants because House Republicans have said they want stricter border security measures, but he's also walked away from this idea that he wants substantive changes to U.S. immigration law or at least indicated that's not necessarily a priority for Johnson the way it is for Senate Republicans. So if everybody in Congress, even if every Republican can get behind something, is an open question, let alone can they strike a deal with Democrats and with the president. So House Speaker Mike Johnson is getting a lot of backlash from within his own party. You've talked about that over his willingness to compromise on a deal to avert a government shutdown. We saw something similar happen with Kevin McCarthy. So I have to ask, is there any concern now about Johnson's speakership maybe being at risk? Well, the new pressure he's under, remember, is because he's doing exactly what McCarthy got ousted for doing, which is doing another temporary government funding measure that keeps the federal government open after the deadline in which funding for some parts of the government would expire, which is this Friday at midnight. His plan kicks the can down the road into March, gives Congress even more time to fully fund the government, which is what Johnson did late last year and what McCarthy did last year that led to his ouster. And so while there are hardline Republicans who are deeply concerned about that and deeply not in favor of this deal that Johnson struck for this temporary measure and the broader government funding deal that he struck with uh, Senate Majority Leader Schumer. They've also said that they're holding Johnson, interestingly enough, Kira, to a different measuring stick than they held McCarthy. I've heard hardline Republicans say to me that because Johnson has not been in leadership for as long as McCarthy was in leadership, for example, that they're holding him to a different yardstick that they measured Kevin McCarthy's response. So while you have hardliners talking about their anger about this deal that Johnson has struck with Senate Democrats and this temporary government funding measure, we haven't heard any meaningful talk about coming for his job yet. All right, Jay O'Brien up on the Hill for us. Jay, thank you. And brutal cold is affecting most of the country, with even cities like Tampa, Florida, seeing wind chills in the 30s this morning. This wild lake effect snow is pounding western New York with even more snow after the past weekend storm. The Pacific Northwest also just getting lashed by more snow and ice. And our meteorologist, Melissa Griffin, is following it all for us. All right, what are you looking at in particular right now? Well, Kara, if you can believe it, after all that snow and ice that fell across the Northeast, we're tracking yet another cross-country storm. So that's what I want to start off with because we have eight states on alert now across the Pacific Northwest. Like you mentioned, ice storm warnings there for parts of Washington and Oregon. They woke up to some of their plants and roadways covered with ice and blizzard warnings for parts of Montana. The avalanche warning, avalanche danger very high as this storm makes its way across parts of the central and northern Rockies. You can see there that snow developing really heavy in some of these spots. 
by this evening. And that all pushes into the plains as we head into the day on Thursday. Now, this batch of snow, this storm, will combine with another storm that's going to be developing parts of the Ohio Valley and bring more snow for places like Ohio, Pennsylvania, and of course, the Northeast. We're looking at D.C. up through New York. This is Friday at noon, so this is more of a daytime event throughout the day on Friday. Not the best day to be traveling in the Northeast, looking at a one to three inches or so. So not a major event, but still going to bring those slick roads on top of the snow and ice we just saw earlier in the week. Now we're talking about that cold, so much of the country seeing that brutal cold. It's going to moderate a bit as we head into today and tomorrow, but yet another reinforcing shot of cold air coming to the same spots, really focused on the Midwest and Northeast. So look at this, by Saturday morning, it feels like negative 24 again in Kansas City, negative 14 in Chicago, and it's behind that storm for the weekend. A place like New York will see wind chills in the single digits, Kara, all weekend long. Wow. All right. A lot to talk about. Thanks, Melissa. Meanwhile, avalanche warnings are still in effect, this time in Colorado through tomorrow night as a new storm there is moving into the Rockies. Heavy snow and strong winds have already created dangerous avalanche conditions. And our senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is tracking it all from Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Hey, Kira. Well, I know you wanted more snow than what you got there in New York City and D.C. Uh, you got to come out to Steamboat because we're getting crushed right now. The last 16 days, over six feet of snow has fallen here. Probably get at least another foot, if not two, over the next two days. But that's led to serious avalanche danger. We're at level four of five right now. So that means that nobody really should be going in the backcountry, even at ski resorts like this, where the snow cats are out. They're doing their best to work hard to groom and stabilize the snow inbounds. And on some of the steeper terrain, the ski patrol guys are out there, uh, you know, throwing explosives into some of that snowpack, trying to release it, trying to stabilize it there. And they do that not just at the ski resorts, they do it along the highways as well, because we had a big slide at Berthet Pass, which connects Winter Park to Denver. That, as of this morning, was still closed. Uh, so they're trying to prevent action like that happening. And with all this snow coming in Colorado again, uh, the CDOT's going to be working hard to try to stabilize that, some of that snowpack. So pretty dangerous here over the next 24 hours. This snow is all heading east into your cold air, so it looks like another pulse of snow is coming for the northeastern quadrant of the country come tomorrow night into Friday. So you'll get a little bit more. Kira? All right, we're getting ready for it. Rob, thanks so much. Also developing right now, the royal family hit with a double health scare. King Charles set to have a corrective procedure next week to treat an enlarged prostate, while Kate Middleton just had abdominal surgery. Our foreign correspondent, James Longman, has been following both cases. Yeah, I care. It emerged today that Catherine, Princess of Wales, was admitted yesterday to the hospital for abdominal surgery. And I think one of the reasons why it's garnered a little bit of attention is because of the amount of time uh, the statement from Kensington Palace says she is going to have to remain in the hospital up to 14 days. And then after that, she'll go back home to Windsor. She and her family live uh, in a cottage on the Windsor estate. She'll remain there resting until at least uh, Easter. So she will be out of the public eye for quite some time. We don't know uh, what the nature of this surgery surgery was, so I think it's not particularly helpful to speculate, uh, but one imagines it was reasonably serious given the amount of time she's going to need to rest. Uh, the statement, though, that was released by Kensington Palace says that she hopes that the public will understand her desire to maintain as much normality for her children as possible and that her personal medical information uh, remain private. The statement went on to apologise to uh, the charities, the organisations that the, the Princess was due to visit. Of course, in her role as Princess of Wales, she visits a huge number of organisations, uh, a number of all those events are going to have to get either cancelled or postponed. William is also going to have to scale back a number of his uh, appearances to look after their children, of course, and to make sure that, that Kate uh, is OK. I think this is a fairly big deal for the family at large because the, these are two people who bear a lot of responsibility for uh, kind of carrying out these events on behalf uh, of King Charles. But look, Catherine is a very fit and active woman. She likes to be up and about as soon as she, she can be, as soon as she feels she wants to be. I'm, I'm sure we'll see her. I'm sure we'll see her out and about very soon. Kira? All right, James Longman from London there for us. James, thanks. Coming up, it's been a murder case marked by secrecy. Now lawyers for accused Idaho college killer Brian Koberger want a motion to be made public. We'll explain why next.
Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. From America's number one news source comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for best news program in all of television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt someone's going to get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly? Do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. And that's why at Good Morning America, we're right here. And we got you. We got you. We got you. Glad you're streaming with us. Well, prosecutors in the Gilgo Beach murders they have new evidence linking suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman to even more murders as Hewerman pleads not guilty to a fourth murder charge. Our Stephanie Ramos is following the case. Suspected serial killer Rex Hewerman indicted in the death of a fourth woman found murdered near Gilgo Beach in Long Island. We've charged the murder of Maureen Brainerd Barnes to add to the, uh, to the already charged murders. Maureen Brainard Barnes' remains were found in 2010, along with three other women known as the Gilgo Four. Last July, Hewerman was arrested and charged with the murders of Melissa Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, and Amber Costello. In a new filing, prosecutors also say they have new DNA evidence connecting Hewerman to the murders, linking a hair found on a belt buckle used to restrain Ms. Brainard Barnes' remains to his estranged wife, Asa Ellerup, a hair found with another victim's remains linked to their daughter, Victoria. The updated indictment included new details of the lengths investigators went to collect that DNA evidence. In May of 2023, undercover agents trailed Victoria Hewerman on a Long Island Railroad train, observing her drinking from a gold can seen here. They then retrieved that can from a trash bin for analysis. Brainard Barnes' daughter, Nicolette, speaking publicly for the first time since her mother disappeared when she was just seven years old. While the loss of my mom has been extremely painful for me, the indictment by the grand jury has brought hope for justice for my mom and my family. Hewerman has pleaded not guilty to all charges and is still being held without bail. His next court appearance is scheduled for next month. Authorities continue to investigate the unsolved deaths of at least six other victims found near Gilgo Beach. Kira. All right, Stephanie Ramos, thanks so much. Well, it's a capital murder case that has been marked by secrecy and media restrictions. Now a lawyer for accused Idaho killer, Brian Koberger, is asking the judge to reconsider his decision to deny a motion to toss out the charges he faces. But that request to consider was made under seal due to a strict gag order that was in place. And the defense is now asking that the contents of that motion to reconsider be made public. Koberger's defense has previously made two different attempts to get the indictment against him dismissed, the judge denying both requests in mid-December. Our legal contributor, defense attorney and host of Long Crime Network, Brian Buckmeyer, joining me now. Let's talk about the strategy here, Brian. Why ask for the contents of this motion to be made public? Kira, so I'm only reading the tea leaves here, but in my opinion, uh, as a former public defender and, and Brian Koberger is being represented by a public defender as well, is the media and the information against Brian Koberger 
is in many ways just negative towards him. I think this is a way of trying to get some of that information out in a positive right. Try to push back, so to speak, on the court of public opinion and maybe have a more even view of this case because ultimately, there's not going to be a plea deal in this case. It's going to go to trial. And when you're picking your jury, you want them to hear some beneficial information about your client in your case before they potentially get selected. So how realistic is this request from the Koberger team? I mean, can we actually expect to see this happen and see what's in these filings? So, Kira, the specific request is just for the defense's motion to reconsider and to uh, dismiss the indictment to potentially have an interlocutory, meaning uh, a kind of pause on the proceedings where they go and appeal to a higher court or a potential stay. They also want the prosecution's response to that motion to come out. Now, typically, a motion of this nature is heavily in the legal aspect and kind of light on the factual portions. They're not really talking about, well, this evidence and this evidence proves that Brian Koberger is guilty or not guilty. They're really talking about procedurally uh, why this indictment should be dismissed. And so for that purpose, I think it could come in. There could be a good chance. And that's what they're arguing. They say this is a lot different than the restrictions on the grand jury, which is very fact-intensive, very evidence-intensive. And it's understandable why the gag order may exist for that. But we could see a procedural argument, that being the motion to dismiss, come out. It's just up to the judge and their interpretation of their own gag order, as well as Idaho law in restricting information to the public. All right. Well, we'll follow it, Brian. Appreciate you. Thank you. And coming up... The DOJ is set to release its investigation into the police response to the Uvalde mass school shooting. What we know when we return. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. I've never seen a place like this in my life. Oh my God, look! Watching America's number one streaming news. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. I'm Martha Raddatz in Lviv, Ukraine. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Glad you're streaming with us. Some other top headlines we're tracking for you this hour. The Department of Justice set to release a major report on the response to the Uvalde school shooting back in 2022. The critical incident review will provide a comprehensive look at how police responded to that shooting that left 19 kids and two teachers dead. Local and state officials have been sharply criticized that response at Robb Elementary School when it took over an hour for any of the 400 responding officers to actually confront the shooter. The FAA says that 40 Boeing 737 MAX 9 planes have been inspected. The agency plans to thoroughly review data now from those planes before it approves final inspection protocols. This comes just days after a door blew off that Alaska Airlines plane mid-flight. FAA says nearly 200 MAX 9 planes will remain grounded until further tests can be done. 
And a Costco crackdown. According to USA Today, the retail giant is testing out ways to make sure the person entering the store is actually a member and not just someone borrowing your card or a friend's card. Costco is testing devices where customers would scan their membership cards on the way in to prevent any illegal entry. But don't worry, a hot dog and drink will still only cost a buck fifty. Jason Kelsey speaking out now about reports that he's retiring. The seven-time Pro Bowler spent all 13 of his seasons in the NFL with the Philadelphia Eagles. And now in a new podcast episode, he's telling his brother Travis that he doesn't know what next year is going to look like. And he's not ready to make an official announcement. Will Reeve has all the scoop. Reports Jason Kelsey is saying goodbye to the game he loves. When he says he's done, it's just going to be because he's tired of playing yeah. because he's still at the top of yeah, his he's... profession. The future Hall of Famer reportedly telling his Philadelphia Eagles teammates after their Monday night playoff loss that he's retiring after 13 seasons. Well, that looks like a man filled with emotion right now. But this morning on the latest episode of the New Heights podcast, Kelsey telling brother Travis it was too soon to make an official announcement. I don't think that it would be uh, respectful or even accurate uh, to be able to do that right after a game like that. Yeah. The 36-year-old Kelsey was the best center of his generation, selected to seven Pro Bowls, six All-Pro teams, and winning a Super Bowl but his notoriety far exceeding the norm for an offensive lineman. His outsized personality regularly making headlines on New Heights, the popular podcast he hosts with brother Travis. You were People Magazine's finalist for Sexiest Man Alive, and um, unfortunately, would you come in like second? According to People, but if you ask Twitter, I was first. One of the greatest Eagles players ever. He's a man amongst the people. I used to joke around with him, whenever you retire, we always have a job for you. He was a force at the front of the Eagles' signature play, the Brotherly Shove. Brotherly Shove again. Touchdown, Philadelphia. And known for that brotherly love with brother Travis, who said he chose his number 87 with the Chiefs to honor the year his big brother was born. You're the only reason why I wear 87 anyway. <laughs> Never told you that, man. You started the legacy. The two playing each other in last year's Super Bowl in November on the eve of what would end up being the final time Jason and Travis faced each other in the NFL. It's, it's their mom really Donna reflecting on what a trip it's all been. Do How does the dream of what you might have had for your boys growing up compare to the reality that they're living now? Oh, this far surpasses anything I could have imagined. Jason's wife Kylie, the mother of their three daughters, looking forward to the next chapter. I would love for Jason to retire. I always say I would love for him to retire when he can still get down on the floor and play with the girls. Fly, eagle, fly. Jason himself looking forward to what's next in the Amazon Prime documentary, Kelsey. At every meaningful part of my life, I've had people there to reaffirm me, whether it's my parents, whether it's my family members, or this whole city. They've been there. How can you not love those boys? Will Reeve, thank you so much. And thanks so much for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. The news never stops, neither do we. We have a lot more on the other side. We'll be right back. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. 
Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Traveling with President Biden in Ireland, I'm Karen Travers. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, border bill talks and funding for Ukraine. Could we actually see bipartisanship in an election year? We're live on the Hill as the president invites congressional leaders to the White House. Plus, it's been 30 years now since the historic Northridge earthquake in California. 60 people died, thousands more were injured. We're going to look back at the damage that day and how it changed the way we prepare for earthquakes now. And shining a light on black markets, human trafficking, hitmen, and more. An inside look at the new season of Trafficked from National Geographic. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, a conversation about more cash at the White House. President Biden is meeting with top congressional leaders about the ongoing standoff over his national security package, including funding for Ukraine, Israel, and the southern border. The $106 billion request made by Biden in October has been stalled amid fierce debate on immigration policy and the southern border. Leading us off this hour, Jay O'Brien, there on Capitol Hill. So let's talk about, uh, I guess, the big four who will be uh, there at the White House for this meeting and what they hope to accomplish. Well, one of those big four is Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, who just left the Capitol here moments ago, saying that he wants, quote unquote, results out of this meeting. The question is, how far can everybody in that room get? The others that will be there, as you see on your screen, Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, the top Democrat in the House, the top Republican in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, and of course the Majority Leader in the Senate, the top Democrat in that chamber, Chuck Schumer. They are all been summoned to the White House by President Biden to see what agreements they can reach as it relates to that massive national security package, and particularly that hang-up that Republicans said they wanted included in that package, which are changes to immigration policy. Republicans consistently over the last few months have said that they are not going to vote for this package, which is $100 billion plus of aid for Ukraine and aid for Israel and also assistance for Taiwan without changes to U.S. immigration policy included in that package. We know that a bipartisan group of Republicans and Democrats have been meeting in the Senate along with administration officials for nearly a month at this point, if not months, to try to hammer out where they can agree. But nothing's come out of those negotiations on paper, although we've heard from senators today who have said that they are optimistic that they might be close, guys. So, Jay, these are some of the biggest issues before the country right now when it comes to foreign policy, right? Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, uh, and the, the border, our international border. What's your sense of where they're going to go? And really, have you got a sense of what the congressional leaders, uh, what their bottom line is as well? Well, there's optimism in the Senate as to moving this quickly, that they might be close to some kind of an agreement. Even Mitch McConnell at a press conference moments ago said that he believes that there could be a vote on this package uh, as early as next week. He is far more optimistic about the quickness of the Senate uh, than I am, guys. But, but the reality is the Senate thinks it's close. But the question hanging over all of this, Terry, is what do you define as a change to immigration policy? Because Republicans in the Senate have said they're open to change asylum policies and things of that nature in the House, Republicans have been a little bit more unclear as to what they want. They want stricter border security measures, but it's uncertain if they want changes to U.S. immigration law included in that as well. Here's what Mike Johnson said earlier today about what his message is to the president. Before we even talk about Ukraine, I'm going to tell the president what I'm telling all of you and we've told the American people, border 
border, border. We have to take care of our own house. We have to secure our own border before we talk about doing anything else. And Republicans have signaled while they want stricter border measures, it's uncertain as to where they are as to bigger changes to U.S. immigration law, stuff that Senate Republicans want. So if everyone's on the same page going into this meeting is very much an open question. All right. All right. Jay O'Brien, thanks very much. I know you'll be tracking it all as it goes down to the wire. So we're going to now turn to politics. Donald Trump has successfully made all of the courtrooms that he is in right now <laughs> the campaign trail, essentially. And once again today, he's there before Judge Donald Trump, this time in New York City. A, a civil defamation trial. You might have missed this one. The former president's trial will determine whether he will have to pay. The former columnist for Elle magazine, there she is, Jean Carroll, even more cash for defaming her uh, in 2019 when he denied her allegations of sexual abuse. And after the, the verdict against him, he doubled down. That's what this trial's about. So Carol is taking the stand once again. She's detailing the assault, saying that she is there because Donald Trump assaulted her. The former president seated just feet away from her also during that testimony. Our senior investigative correspondent, Eric Kintis Katursky, is outside uh, Manhattan federal court there for us. What more do we uh, know from what has happened today? You've been there from the very beginning. What has stood out? E. Jean Carroll is now under cross-examination by defense attorney Alina Haba, and it was a discordant start to cross-examination. Haba tried to introduce a bit of evidence, and the, the judge was confused about how she was trying to go about it at one point, uh, saying, Ms. Haba, we're going to do this my way. And it really continued a pattern of the judge and the defense sparring with one another. Earlier in the day, the, the judge told Haba to sit down after he repeatedly denied an objection that she was seeking. Uh, Trump called the judge nasty, and his attorney said the judge has been displaying general hostility after the judge tried to kick Trump or thought about kicking Trump out of the courtroom because he was being disruptive by muttering things within earshot of the jury. So it's been a tense day. Uh, and and uh, some pretty cringeworthy moments, in fact, as these exchanges take place. Well, Aaron, as you well know, having covered so much of this, uh, this these trials, all of them, especially ones in New York, uh, is one of the great demonstrations of political jujitsu anyone has ever accomplished <laughs> in history. Whatever the prosecutors and the civil litigants thought they were going to do to get Trump, he's turning it around, and it's clear, you know, it's helped him politically. Uh, it sure has, uh, Terry, and I think you don't have to look farther than the, the Iowa caucuses where two-thirds of caucus goers said they would find Trump fit for office even if he were to be convicted of a crime. But uh, beyond that, he does seek to turn his legal liabilities into political weapons, and that's part of the reason why he's off the campaign trail while his rivals grind it out in New Hampshire and South Carolina, and he detours here to court uh, because he finds it an effective way to get his message out when the judge threatened to, to boot him from the courtroom because of his disruptions uh, the, the Trump threw up his arms and said I would love that and the judge said I know you would because you can't control yourself uh, it, it was a knowing remark from both Trump and the judge and later we expect Trump to go to one of his buildings here in lower Manhattan and make remarks to camera Terry <laughs> it's amazing. Can't make it up. I mean, the movie has been written, <laughs> and, it, and it continues. How does it end? Uh, that's the question. We will know in November. Uh, Aaron Katursky, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, uh, to the weather now, just as people finished digging out from last week's storm up in western New York, now they're going to get hit with another round of lake effect snow today. At least three people have died up in Erie County. This is serious weather, obviously, since these storms began with travel bans and advisories in effect for much of that area. Our affiliate reporter, Michael Schwartz, uh, from WKBW, has been on the story for us from the very beginning. Uh, first, he was talking about the uh, Bills fans helping shovel out the snow. Now that. he's talking about the Blackhawk fans digging in on this one. He's got more for us. Well, Kira, this is just round two of that lake effect snow that we already saw over the weekend that postponed that playoff Bills game to Monday night. Take a look at conditions right now in downtown Buffalo. The winds have been whipping around all morning from last night 
until Thursday morning. Buffalo and areas around it could see one to three feet of snow, but that lake effect bend can be very unpredictable. Tonight's Sabres game, just a few blocks away from here downtown, has been postponed to tomorrow night. Not because of how much snow fell, uh, the players can get there, but it's a safety concern for fans. These roads, some of them are clear, but some are still being worked on from the last lake effect snow, and they are worried about the fans' safety. There are roads that I just traveled on a few blocks away that are more open and not uh, in between city streets uh, with buildings that are really hard to drive on. They're not plowed or those winds are whipping around this really fluffy like snow uh, that is blinding and causing whiteout conditions. I want to show you an example right here. While the snow right now is up to my ankles, uh, even above Right here, a few feet away, you could see the blades of grass. So this is a clear indication of that wind that is really building snow mounds and drifts at times, really making it up to your knees from a few feet away where the, you could see blades of grass. The governor, Kathy Hochul, encouraging businesses to send their employees home now. That development came out later this afternoon, and I even just got off the phone with the Buffalo police commissioner who said they had to rescue someone who contacted us first on the highway. Major highways around this area are closed as a travel ban is in for much effect of South Buffalo and areas around it. But south of the city, leading into Orchard Park, where that Buffalo Bills game was postponed, they're getting slammed once again. They're also seeing that lake effect snow ban even travel up north, and this is going to hang around here again until tomorrow. Kira? All right, Michael Schwartz, appreciate it. Appreciate our affiliate WKBV, too. For, for sure for giving him to us for all these reports. Well, coming up, uh, was it a case of mistaken identity? A family in Illinois says a police officer tased their autistic 14-year-old son. We've got the latest on the investigation. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. So an Illinois family says that a police officer used a taser on their 14-year-old son who has autism. And they say that their teen, Avarius Thompson, was just coming home after getting snacks from a grocery store when that officer used the taser on him in his own backyard. He was later hospitalized. The family's attorney says this was a case of mistaken identity, adding that police must be held accountable. Samantha Chapman of our ABC station in Chicago reports. Get your hands up! Hands up! Hands up! Sit down! 
On the morning of November 20th of last year, 14-year-old Avarius Thompson, who has autism, was tased by a Dalton police officer. Seconds later, Don't move! he's tased again. You gotta get some more. When you're looking at that body cam video and you see your son, you see him being tased, as a parent, what goes through your mind when you're watching that? It was frightening. It was very scary. And I can see he was confused. He didn't know what was going on. According to the incident report, Dalton police were called to assist Riverdale police who were searching for four black males. Two of the males were said to have fled on foot with rifles and a handgun, according to the report. Get your hands up! At around 10.53 a.m., a Dalton police officer spots Thompson in a backyard, pursues him, and tases him. Don't move! Don't move! According to the police report, Thompson was positively identified as one of the offenders. But in this body cam video, you can hear what appears to be another officer questioning whether they got the right person. I don't think this is him, bro. We lost one, though. This might not be him. Thompson's sister comes outside asking why they have her brother. He a little boy! What did you do? I didn't do nothing. I know you didn't do nothing. Thompson's mother, Gwendolyn Torin, says she rushed to the hospital where her son was being treated. Come here. Come here. Come here. You can't arrest an autistic kid, man. Y'all taste him. Y'all did that. Listen, listen After being treated at the hospital, the family says their son was turned over to Riverdale police, who released the boy later that day. Far too often we're seeing this happen, not just in Illinois, across the country. The family's attorney, Calvin Townsend II, says to his knowledge, his client has not been charged with a crime. He says this was a case of mistaken identity. He's a great kid. Attorney Townsend says his client's clothing was similar to the suspect's description, which made him a target. He's a 14-year-old kid, um, and having officers rush towards you with what we know as tasers but could be perceived as guns is scary. Then you add the autistic aspect, uh, again, it's very confusing. Thompson's parents tell me their son suffered bruising, tase marks on his body, and a fractured hip. They say it was a traumatic experience for their son and the entire family. He's just a lovable kid, you know, and I just, I couldn't believe that this could happen to my kid. You see so many stories of stuff like this happening to kids and they go to jail, they don't come out. Something happens, they end up dying. That happens every day in this world. And I don't want to see it happen to my son or anybody's kid. Wow, and our thanks to uh, Samantha Chapman there for reporting. WLS uh, did ask Dalton police if charges were filed and if they did, in fact, pursue the wrong person in the case. The village of Dalton says that they have no comment recording the, regarding the incident. Riverdale's police chief says that multiple people were arrested and charged in this incident. Cook County's district attorney was also asked if Avarius Thompson was charged. They said that they were not contacted about charges in this incident for anyone related to this case. Well, turning now to, it's an anniversary, 30 years ago today, Southern California was rocked by a massive earthquake. Dozens of people were killed, thousands others were hurt. 6.7 magnitude quake struck Northridge in the darkness of the night. Millions of people were sleeping, just unaware and unprepared. It was the first quake to knock out power in every area of the Los Angeles region. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, reporting tonight from Los Angeles. Good evening, everybody. It was 30 seconds that seemed like an eternity. To say that uh, this part of the world has been badly shaken is more than a play on words. It's true. I was there uh, at the time, and it was, it was terrifying. At least 57 people were killed, nearly 12,000 treated at area hospitals. Property losses, roughly $40 billion from that quake. Our Will Carr is in Southern California and uh, Northridge, they're, they're marking this day. Um, going back and just remembering uh, the footage there, Peter Jennings will never forget it. He was there on the scene, you were there. I'm from there, a lot of my family members uh, impacted that day. Um, why talk about today, 30 years later, Will? 
Yeah, guys, you heard Peter Jennings say it right there. The Northridge quake only lasted a matter of seconds, but it packed such a punch that it is constantly on the mind of people who live here in California. Behind me, we have the interchange between the 5 and the 14, and one of the most iconic images was part of the overpass there crumbling. There were fires spread out across this area, power outages, at least 57 people killed, thousands injured, and tens of billions of dollars of damage. So what does this mean for us 30 years later? Well, the USGS just put out a forecast that says that 75 percent of the country, not just the West Coast, but the entire United States, is at risk of an earthquake. That's hundreds of millions of people. Here on the West Coast, we do have an early earthquake warning system, which is something we didn't have uh, 30 years ago. Also, the USGS is asking for everybody uh, across the country that 75 uh, percent of people who could be impacted to have a plan so I want to show you guys part of my plan which is I have an earthquake uh, kit in my car water uh, first aid kit I got a bag here that has a blanket in it in case you're in overnight and Kira and Terry, one of the most important things that I have, I've got about three or four of these guys in my car, in my bags, is a whistle because you never know where you're going to be. You might lose your voice along the way. And a whistle, as simple as it may seem, may be the thing that could save your life. Guys. Wow. It's amazing that kind of preparation. And you talked about the early warning system. I remember a couple of days before the Northridge quake, I was in a movie theater, and there was a little soft rumble through the movie theater. A lot of people got up and left. I thought, okay, well, there, that's my earthquake, because I'm from the Midwest, right? I'd never felt anything. And a day or two later, wham! Ha have you experienced how this early warning sy system works? How confident are Californians in it? Uh, what's, the, what's the state of the science there? So in recent years, it's been getting better and better. The way it works right now is there's two things you can do. You can actually download an app called the MyShake app, or you have your cell phone. It's part of the emergency alert system now. So if there's an earthquake of a magnitude 5 or higher, you're going to get that alert on your cell phone. So you look back 30 years, technology has come a long way. They're still tweaking this. Uh, knock on wood, thankfully, we haven't had a huge one yet where everybody got these alerts. Uh, but there have been some uh, smaller earthquakes where the system has been very successful. So uh, it is good to know that the technology is constantly improving, guys. Absolutely. Will Carr, thank you very much for that. Took me back, for sure. Thanks very much. Coming up, an inside look at the criminal underworld. Award-winning investigative journalist Ariana Van Zeller is here describing her experiences with drug smugglers, human traffickers, even hitmen. You won't want to miss it. Inside that pen is a slice of human brain. I've never seen a place like this in my life. America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Hit me with them good vibes, pictures on my phone lights. Everything is so fine, little bit of sunshine. Dance more, just a little bit. Breathe more, just a little bit. Smile a little more in a minute. Ah, 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 ah. number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Weeknights on ABC News Live. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. 
Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Reporting from Taiwan, I'm Brick Clennett. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Oh. Award-winning investigative journalist Mariana Van Zeller is shining a light on black markets, actually going underground with human traffickers, drug dealers, even hitmen. It's a part of her new season of Trafficked from National Geographic. Van Zeller takes us inside some of the most dangerous black markets in the world, talking with people who are behind illegal trafficking networks. We saw you yesterday, you were making the drugs. Are you here to give it so they transport it, or do you actually transport the drugs too? Oh, in this car? Packed as if it's a suitcase? Wow. It's heavy. Very heavy, huh? How much is this? 30 kilos, 30 kilos, 10 kilos. Uh, just for now, I'm going to go to the house. I'm going to go to the Wow. Uh, season four of Traffic covers everything from the trade in body parts and hired assassins to the smuggling of brides. And Mariana joins us now for more. Mariana, it's great to see you, given the, the danger of what you're doing. I want to ask you <laughs> about how you get access and, and what it is like uh, being up close with these people. The access is definitely the hardest part of our, my job and my team's job. We know we spent months, sometimes even years, trying to gain access and trying to convince people to talk to us. I've gotten used to a lot of no's in my life. I always say that for every yes we get, we get about do dozens of sometimes even hundreds of no's. But at the end of the day, I think that people agree to talk to us um, because we spent a lot of time convincing them, but because also I think it's a very human characteristic that we all have of wanting to be understood. And I always tell people, you know, I'm here with empathy. I'm not here with judgment. I really want to understand why you do what you do, and I think that goes a very long way. You have knowledge mm. that this is not happening. So, have you ever been worried that maybe some of the people aren't who they say they are, right? These are people in the shadows. How do you know they're legit? How do you verify their claims that they're doing this stuff, or I guess you witness some of it, right? You know, we make that actually part of the episodes that we film, where there's a lot of transparency around what is believable and what is not. You know, a lot of people, when they're, you know, drug traffickers, they like to inflate how much, you know, they're worth or how much money they make. Um, but that's part of the reporting that we do, and we're very transparent with our audiences about what I'm seeing, what I'm believing, and what I'm not. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it is actually quite risky for them to agree to meet with us. So it's not really in their interest to pretend to be who they're not. So and then we also talk talk to a lot of people around that belong to that network. So when we're interviewing, for example, a guy who's known as King Coyote because he's one of the, he runs one of the largest operations of transporting uh, migrants from the southern border of Mexico to the border with the United States. We're also talking to his team and the people that work with him, the transporter. They have, they, in this case, this guy actually had a finance department. Um, so we got, we get very close and really unique access to, to these criminal uh, operations. It's amazing. Yeah, it, I mean, we've watched all the clips. I can't wait to watch the, the new season. Uh, in the episode that actually premieres tonight, you tracked down this assassin. This really drew me in. You sat down with him. Let's just listen to a little bit of this, and I have a couple questions for you, Mariana. Sure thing. So, JoJo, right? Yes. It's okay if I call you JoJo? It's fine. Well, how, how did you start? How did you get into this business? There's only the killing that needs to be done. Every day, somebody needs to die. Whether drugs, taxis, even politics now, it's busy. Constantly, people need to die. How did you track him down? Um, and why did you want to tell his story? And did you find out anything about his background that you mm -hmm. thought was intriguing that led just to this lifestyle? Absolutely. You know, I think it's a little known fact, but about 3,000 people around the world are killed every year from the hired uh, hitmen like JoJo. And so I've always been fascinated by this subject matter. I always, you know, 
comes from my empathy with people in the criminal underground, but it's very hard to have empathy towards assassins who do the worst of the worst, with it, which is take away a person's life. So it took a long time to, to find people who would be willing to talk to us. And actually, the first interview we did was about 15 minutes from my own home in Los Angeles, and we'll see it tonight in the premiere episode. But in this case, we also went to uh, South Africa because it has one of the highest assassination rates in the world, and spent time with this assassin, this hitman called Jojo, and what was so interesting about his life is that his parents had also been killed by a hitman when he was young. And when he talked about how he goes about his assassinations and the people he's killed and he's paid to kill, he always said, like, I do not kill women and children. And I asked him, you do realize, though, that what happened to you and how much you suffered as an orphan because your parents were killed, you're causing to other children and, you know, wives uh, here in your country. And he said he'd never thought about that, that cycle of violence which was mm. really fascinating to me. Fascinating, great, brave work. Mariana Van Zeller, thanks very much. It's like Mariana becomes a therapist <laughs> in these situations. Ways, you know, yeah. she gets them thinking about their lives. Incredible work. Trafficked Underworlds with Mariana Van Zeller it premieres today, National Geographic, and streaming the next day on Hulu. You won't want to miss it, for sure. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. The news never stops, neither do we. We have a lot more on the other side. Stay with us. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Today on ABC News Live, border bill talks and funding for Ukraine. Could we actually see bipartisanship in an election year? We're live on the Hill as the president invites congressional leaders to the White House. Plus, it's been 30 years now since the historic Northridge earthquake in California. 60 people died, thousands more were injured. We're going to look back at the damage that day and how it changed the way we prepare for earthquakes now. And shining a light on black markets, human trafficking, hitmen, and more. An inside look at the new season of Trafficked from National Geographic. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. And our top story this hour, a conversation about more cash at the White House. President Biden is meeting with top congressional leaders about the ongoing standoff over his national security package, including funding for Ukraine, Israel, and the southern border. The $106 billion request made by Biden in October has been stalled amid fierce debate on immigration policy and the southern border. Leading us off this hour, Jay O'Brien, there on Capitol Hill. So let's talk about, uh, I guess, the big four who will be uh, there at the White House for this meeting and what they hope to accomplish. Well, one of those big four is Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, who just left the Capitol here moments ago, saying that he wants, quote unquote, results out of this meeting. The question is, how far can everybody in that room get? The others that will be there, as you see on your screen, Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, the top Democrat in the House, the top Republican in the Senate, Mitch McConnell, and of course the Majority Leader in the Senate, the top Democrat in that chamber, Chuck Schumer. They are all been summoned to the White House by President Biden to see what agreements they can reach as it relates to that massive national security package, and particularly that hang-up that Republicans said they wanted included in that package, which are changes to immigration policy. Republicans consistently over the last few months have said that they are not going to vote for this package, which is $100 billion plus of aid for Ukraine and aid for Israel and also assistance for Taiwan without changes to U.S. immigration policy included in that package. We know that a bipartisan group of Republicans and Democrats have been meeting in the Senate along with administration officials for a, nearly a month at this point, if not months, to try to hammer out where they can agree, but nothing's come out of those negotiations on paper, although we've heard from senators today who have said they are optimistic that they might be close, guys. So, 
Jay, these are some of the biggest issues before the country right now when it comes to foreign policy, right? Israel, Ukraine, Taiwan, uh, and the, the border, our international border. What's your sense of where they're going to go? And really, have you got a sense of what the congressional leaders, uh, what their bottom line is as well? Well, there's optimism in the Senate as to moving this quickly, that they might be close to some kind of an agreement. Even Mitch McConnell at a press conference moments ago said that he believes that there could be a vote on this package uh, as early as next week. He is far more optimistic about the quickness of the Senate uh, than I am, guys. But, but the reality is the Senate thinks it's close. But the question hanging over all of this, Terry, is what do you define as a change to immigration policy? Because Republicans in the Senate have said they're open to change asylum policies and things of that nature in the House, Republicans have been a little bit more unclear as to what they want. They want stricter border security measures, but it's uncertain if they want changes to U.S. immigration law included in that as well. Here's what Mike Johnson said earlier today about what his message is to the president. Before we even talk about Ukraine, I'm going to tell the president what I'm telling all of you and we've told the American people, border 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 we have to take care of our own house we have to secure our own border before we talk about doing anything else and republicans have signaled while they want stricter border measures it's uncertain as to where they are as to bigger changes to u.s immigration law stuff that senate republicans want so if everyone's on the same page going into this meeting is very much an open question all right, all right. Jay O'Brien, thanks very much. I know you'll be tracking it all as it goes down to the wire. So we're going to now turn to politics. Donald Trump has successfully made all of the courtrooms that he is in right now the campaign trail, essentially. And once again today, he's there before Judge Donald Trump, this time in New York City. A, a civil defamation trial. You might have missed this one. The former president's trial will determine whether he will have to pay. The former columnist for Elle magazine, there she is, Jean Carroll, even more cash for defaming her uh, in 2019 when he denied her allegations of sexual abuse. And after the, the verdict against him, he doubled down. That's what this trial is about. So Carol is taking the stand once again. She's detailing the assault, saying that she is there because Donald Trump assaulted her. The former president seated just feet away from her also during that testimony. Our senior investigative correspondent, Eric Katursky, is outside uh, Manhattan federal court there for us. What more do we uh, know from what has happened today? You've been there from the very beginning. What has stood out? E. Jean Carroll is now under cross-examination by defense attorney Alina Haba, and it was a discordant start to cross-examination. Haba tried to introduce a bit of evidence, and the, the judge was confused about how she was trying to go about it at one point, uh, saying, Ms. Haba, we're going to do this my way. And it really continued a pattern of the judge and the defense sparring with one another. Earlier in the day, the, the judge told Haba to sit down after he repeatedly denied an objection that she was seeking. Trump called the judge nasty, and his attorney said the judge has been displaying general hostility after the judge tried to kick Trump or thought about kicking Trump out of the courtroom because he was being disruptive by muttering things within earshot of the jury. So it's been a tense day uh, and, and uh, some pretty cringeworthy moments, in fact, as these exchanges take place. Well, Aaron, as you well know, having covered so much of this, uh, this, these trials, all of them, especially ones in New York, uh, is one of the great demonstrations of political jujitsu anyone has ever accomplished <laughs> in history. Whatever the prosecutors and the civil litigants thought they were going to do to get Trump, he's turning it around, and it's clear, you know, it's helped him politically. Uh, it sure has, uh, Terry, and I think you don't have to look farther than the, the Iowa caucuses where two-thirds of caucus goers said they would find Trump fit for office even if he were to be convicted of a crime. But uh, beyond that, he does seek to turn his legal liabilities into political weapons, and that's part of the reason why he's off the campaign trail while his rivals grind it out in New Hampshire and South Carolina, and he detours here to court uh, because he finds it an effective way to get his message out when the judge threatened to, to boot him from the courtroom because of his disruptions uh, the, the Trump threw up his arms and said I would love that and the judge said I know you would because you can't control yourself uh, it, it was a knowing remark from both Trump and the judge and later we expect Trump to go to one of his buildings here in lower Manhattan and make remarks to camera Terry
It's amazing. <laughs> Can't make it up. I mean, the movie has been written. <laughs> and, it, and it continues. How does it end? Uh, that's the question. We will know in November. Uh, Aaron Katursky, thank you so much. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, uh, to the weather now, just as people finish digging out from last week's storm up in western New York, now they're going to get hit with another round of lake effect snow today. At least three people have died up in Erie County. This is serious weather, obviously, since these storms began with travel bans and advisories in effect for much of that area. Our affiliate reporter Michael Schwartz uh, from WKBW has been on the story for us from the very beginning. Uh, first, he was talking about the uh, Bills fans helping shovel out the snow. Now that. he's talking about the Blackhawk fans digging in on this one. He's got more for us. Well, Kira, this is just round two of that lake effect snow that we already saw over the weekend that postponed that playoff Bills game to Monday night. Take a look at conditions right now in downtown Buffalo. The winds have been whipping around all morning from last night until Thursday morning. Buffalo and areas around it could see one to three feet of snow, but that lake effect bend can be very unpredictable. Tonight's Sabres game, just a few blocks away from here downtown, has been postponed to tomorrow night. Not because of how much snow fell, uh, the players can get there, but it's a safety concern for fans. These roads, some of them are clear, but some are still being worked on from the last lake effect snow, and they are worried about the fans' safety. There are roads that I just traveled on a few blocks away that are more open and not uh, in between city streets uh, with buildings that are really hard to drive on. They're not plowed or those winds are whipping around this really fluffy like snow uh, that is blinding and causing whiteout conditions. I want to show you an example right here. While the snow right now is up to my ankles, uh, even above Right here, a few feet away, you could see the blades of grass. So this is a clear indication of that wind that is really building snow mounds and drifts, at times really making it up to your knees from a few feet away where the, you can see blades of grass. The governor, Kathy Hochul, encouraging businesses to send their employees home now. That development came out later this afternoon, and I even just got off the phone with the Buffalo police commissioner who said they had to rescue someone who contacted us first on the highway. Major highways around this area are closed as a travel ban is in for much effect of South Buffalo and areas around it. But south of the city, leading into Orchard Park, where that Buffalo Bills game was postponed, they're getting slammed once again. They're also seeing that lake effect snow ban even travel up north, and this is going to hang around here again until tomorrow. Kira? All right, Michael Schwartz, appreciate it. Appreciate our affiliate WKBV, too. For, for sure for giving him to us for all these reports. Oh, coming up, uh, was it a case of mistaken identity? A family in Illinois says a police officer tased their autistic 14-year-old son. We've got the latest on the investigation. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Give it to me. When it matters most, America turns to David Muir and ABC's World News Tonight. So an Illinois family says that a police officer used a tape of their 14-year-old son who has autism. And they say that their teen, Avarius Thompson, was just coming home after getting snacks from a grocery store when that officer used the taser on him in his own backyard. He was later hospitalized. 
The family's attorney says this was a case of mistaken identity, adding that police must be held accountable. Samantha Chapman of our ABC station in Chicago reports. Get your hands up! On the morning of November 20th of last year, 14-year-old Avarius Thompson, who has autism, was tased by a Dalton police officer. Seconds later, Don't move! he's tased again. You gotta get some more. When you're looking at that body cam video and you see your son, you see him being tased. As a parent, what goes through your mind when you're watching that? It was frightening. It was very scary. And I can see he was confused. He didn't know what was going on. According to the incident report, Dalton police were called to assist Riverdale police who were searching for four black males. Two of the males were said to have fled on foot with rifles and a handgun, according to the report. Get your hands up! At around 10.53 a.m., a Dalton police officer spots Thompson in a backyard, pursues him, and tases him. Don't move! Don't move! According to the police report, Thompson was positively identified as one of the offenders. But in this body cam video, you can hear what appears to be another officer questioning whether they got the right person. I don't think this him, bro. He lost one, though. This might not be him. Thompson's sister comes outside asking why they have her brother. He's a little boy! What did you do? I didn't do nothing. I know you didn't do nothing. Thompson's mother, Gwendolyn Torin, says she rushed to the hospital where her son was being treated. Come here. Come here. Come here. After being treated at the hospital, the family says their son was turned over to Riverdale police, who released the boy later that day. Far too often we're seeing this happen not just in Illinois, across the country. The family's attorney, Calvin Townsend II, says to his knowledge, his client has not been charged with a crime. He says this was a case of mistaken identity. He's a great kid. Attorney Townsend says his client's clothing was similar to the suspect's description, which made him a target. He's a 14-year-old kid. Um, and having officers rush towards you with what we know as tasers but could be perceived as guns is scary. Then you add the autistic aspect, uh, again, is very confusing. Thompson's parents tell me their son suffered bruising, tase marks on his body, and a fractured hip. They say it was a traumatic experience for their son and the entire family. He's just a lovable kid, you know, and I just, I couldn't believe that this could happen to my kid. You see so many stories of Stuff like this happening to kids, and they go to jail, they don't come out. Something happens, they end up dying. That happens every day in this world. And I don't want to see it happen to my son or anybody's kid. Wow, and our thanks to uh, Samantha Chapman there for reporting. WLS uh, did ask Dalton police if charges were filed and if they did, in fact, pursue the wrong person in the case. The village of Dalton says that they have no comment recording the, regarding the incident. Riverdale's police chief says that multiple people were arrested and charged in this incident. Cook County's district attorney was also asked if Avarius Thompson was charged. They said that they were not contacted about charges in this incident for anyone related to this case. Well, turning now to, it's an anniversary, 30 years ago today, Southern California was rocked by a massive earthquake. Dozens of people were killed, thousands others were hurt. 6.7 magnitude quake struck Northridge in the darkness of the night. Millions of people were sleeping, just unaware and unprepared. It was the first quake to knock out power in every area of the Los Angeles region. From ABC, this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings, reporting tonight from Los Angeles. Good evening, everybody. It was 30 seconds that seemed like an eternity. To say that uh, this part of the world has been badly shaken is more than a play on words. It's true. I was there uh, at the time, and it was, it was terrifying. At least 57 people were killed, nearly 12,000 treated at area hospitals. Property losses, roughly $40 billion from that quake. Our Will Carr is in Southern California and uh, Northridge, they're, they're marking this day. Um, going back and just remembering uh, the footage there, Peter Jennings will never forget it. He was there on the scene, you were there. I'm from there, a lot of my family members uh, impacted that day. Um, why talk about today, 30 years later, Will? 
Yeah, guys, you heard Peter Jennings say it right there. The Northridge quake only lasted a matter of seconds, but it packed such a punch that it is constantly on the mind of people who live here in California. Behind me, we have the interchange between the 5 and the 14, and one of the most iconic images was part of the overpass there crumbling. There were fires spread out across this area, power outages, at least 57 people killed, thousands injured, and tens of billions of dollars of damage. So what does this mean for us 30 years later? Well, the USGS just put out a forecast that says that 75% of the country, not just the West Coast, but the entire United States is at risk of an earthquake. That's hundreds of millions of people. Here on the West Coast, we do have an early earthquake warning system, which is something we didn't have uh, 30 years ago. Also, the USGS is asking for everybody uh, across the country, that 75 uh, percent of people who could be impacted to have a plan. So I want to show you guys part of my plan, which is I have an earthquake uh, kit in my car, water, uh, first aid kit. I got a bag here that has a blanket in it in case you're in overnight. And Kira and Terry, one of the most important things that I have, I got about three or four of these guys in my car, in my bags, is a whistle because you never know where you're going to be. You might lose your voice along the way. And a whistle, as simple as it may seem, may be the thing that could save your life. Guys. Wow. It's amazing that kind of preparation. And you talked about the early warning system. I remember a couple of days before the Northridge quake, I was in a movie theater and there was a little soft rumble through the movie theater. A lot of people got up and left. I thought, okay, well, there, that's my earthquake because I'm from the Midwest, right? I'd never felt anything. And a day or two later, wham. Ha have you experienced how this early warning sy system works? How confident are Californians in it? Uh, what's, the, what's the state of the science there? So in recent years, it's been getting better and better. The way it works right now is there's two things you can do. You can actually download an app called the MyShake app, or you have your cell phone. It's part of the emergency alert system now. So if there's an earthquake of a magnitude 5 or higher, you're going to get that alert on your cell phone. So you look back 30 years, technology has come a long way. They're still tweaking this. Uh, knock on wood, thankfully, we haven't had a huge one yet where everybody got these alerts, uh, but there have been some uh, smaller earthquakes where the system has been very successful. So uh, it is good to know that the technology is constantly improving, guys. Absolutely. Will Carr, thank you very much for that. Took me back, for sure. Thanks very much. Coming up, an inside look at the criminal underworld. Award-winning investigative journalist Ariana Van Zeller is here describing her experiences with drug smugglers, human traffickers, even hitmen. You won't want to miss it. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt someone's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. You're watching America's number one streaming news, ABC News Live. Breaking news, exclusives, live reporting across the globe. Keep streaming with ABC News Live. We're coming to you from the top of Carnarvon Castle in Wales. I'm Maggie Rooley. Whatever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Oh. Award-winning investigative journalist Mariana Van Zeller is shining a light on black markets, actually going underground with human traffickers, drug dealers, even hitmen. It's a part of her new season of Traffic from National Geographic. Van Zeller takes us inside some of the most dangerous black markets in the world, talking with people who are behind illegal trafficking networks. We saw you yesterday, you were making the drugs. Are you here to give it so they transport it or do you actually transport the drugs too? Oh, in this car? Packed as if it's a suitcase? 
Wow. It's heavy. Very heavy, huh? How much is this? 30 kilo, 30 kilo, 60 kilo. Just a little bit of 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 a little Mariana joins us now for more. Mariana, it's great to see you, given the, the danger of what you're doing. I want to ask you <laughs> about how you get access and, and what it is like uh, being up close with these people. The access is definitely the hardest part of our, my job and my team's job. We know we spent months, sometimes even years, trying to gain access and trying to convince people to talk to us. I've gotten used to a lot of no's in my life. I always say that for every yes we get, we get about do dozens of sometimes even hundreds of no's. But at the end of the day, I think that people agree to talk to us um, because we spent a lot of time convincing them, but because also I think it's a very human characteristic that we all have of wanting to be understood. And I always tell people, you know, I'm here with empathy. I'm here, not here with judgment. I really want to understand why you do what you do, and I think that goes a very long way. You have knowledge mm. that this is happening. So, have you ever been worried that maybe some of the people aren't who they say they are, right? How, yeah, they, these are uh, people in the shadows. How do you know they're legit? How do you verify their claims that they're doing this stuff? Or I guess you witness some of it, right? You know, we make that actually part of the episodes that we film, where there's a lot of transparency around what is believable and what is not. You know, a lot of people, when they're, you know, drug traffickers, they like to inflate how much, you know, they're worth or how much money they make. Um, but that's part of the reporting that we do, and we're very transparent with our audiences about what I'm seeing, what I'm believing, and what I'm not. Not. But at the end of the day, you know, it, it is actually quite risky for them to agree to meet with us. So it's not really in their interest to pretend to be who they're not. So and then we also talk to a lot of people around that belong to that network. So when we're interviewing, for example, a guy who's known as King Coyote because he's one of the he runs one of the largest operations of transporting uh, migrants from the southern border of Mexico to the border with the United States, we're also talking to his team and the people that work with him, the transporter. They have, they, in this case, this guy actually had a finance department. Um, so we got we get very close and really unique access to to these criminal uh, operations. It's amazing. Yeah, it, I mean, we've watched all the clips. I can't wait to watch the the new season. Uh, in the episode that actually premieres tonight, you tracked down this assassin. This really drew me in. You sat down with him. Let's just listen to a little bit of this, and I have a couple questions for you, Mariana. Sure thing. So, Jojo, right? Yes. It's okay if I call you Jojo. It's fine. Well, how, how did you start, how did you get into this business? There's always a killing that needs to be done. Every day, somebody needs to die. Whether drugs, taxis, even politics now, it's busy. Constantly, people need to die. How did you track him down? Um, and why did you want to tell his story? And did you find out anything about his background that you thought was intriguing that led just to this lifestyle? Absolutely. You know, I think it's a little known fact, but about 3,000 people around the world are killed every year from the hired uh, hitmen like JoJo. And so I've always been fascinated by this subject matter. I always, you know, comes from my empathy with people in the criminal underground, but it's very hard to have empathy towards assassins who do the worst of the worst, with it, which is take away a person's life. So it took a long time to, to find people who would be willing to talk to us. And actually, the first interview we did was about 15 minutes from my own home in Los Angeles, and we'll see it tonight in the premiere episode. But in this case, we also went to uh, South Africa because it has one of the highest assassination rates in the world, and spent time with this assassin, this hitman called Jojo, and what was so interesting about his life is that his parents had also been killed by a hitman when he was young. And he, when he talked about how he goes about his assassinations and the people he's killed and he's paid to kill, he always said, like, I do not kill women and children. And I asked him, you do realize, though, that what happened to you and how much you suffered as an orphan because your parents were killed, you're causing to other children and, you know, wives uh, here in your country. And he said he'd never thought about that, that cycle of violence which was really fascinating to me. Fascinating, great, brave work. Mariana Venzeller, thanks very much. It's like Mariana becomes a therapist in these situations. In ways, you know, yeah. she gets them thinking about their lives. Incredible work. Trafficked Underworlds with Mariana Vanzeller premieres today, National Geographic, and streaming the next day on Hulu. You won't want to miss it, for sure. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. And I'm Terry Moran. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. The news never stops, neither do we. We have a lot more on the other side. Stay with us. Tonight, the
the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Inside that pen is a human brain. I've never seen a place like this in my life. He told me I've killed before and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt someone's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Mola Lange on the border of Lebanon and Israel. Wherever the story goes, we'll take you there. You're watching ABC News Live. Hello, everyone. I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're watching for you this hour on ABC News Live. Donald Trump once again before a judge, this time in New York City, for his civil defamation trial. The former president's trial will determine whether he will have to pay former Elle magazine columnist E. Jean Carroll taking the stand today. She's detailing the assault, saying that she's there because Donald Trump assaulted her. The former president seated just feet away from her during that testimony. Trump was already found liable last year for sexually assaulting Carol in a department store dressing room in the 90s and for defaming her in 2022. Now a jury will determine how much more money and damages Trump must pay her, this time for his 2019 defamatory statements about her sexual assault allegations. And today, President Biden is meeting with top congressional leaders at the White House discussing the ongoing standoff over his national security package that includes funding for Ukraine, Israel, and the southern border. Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, House Speaker Mike Johnson, House Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, and Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer all in attendance as Biden's $106 billion request made by Biden in October has been stalled amid fierce debate on immigration and policy and also the southern border. Speaker Mike Johnson says his message for Biden is clear. We have to secure our own border before we talk about doing anything else. The House Speaker is set to deliver remarks following today's meeting. We'll bring that to you live as soon as it happens. And we have some sad news to report out of the NBA. The Golden State Warriors assistant coach, Dejan Milojevic, has sadly passed away, according to a statement we just received from the team. The 46-year-old was hospitalized last night in Salt Lake City after suffering a heart attack at a private team dinner. He was in his third season as an assistant coach with the Warriors and was a member of the team's coaching staff during their 2022 NBA championship run. The NBA has postponed tonight's game between the Warriors and the Utah Jazz as the Warriors grieve this tragic loss. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, context, and analysis. You can always find us on various streaming services as well, the ABC News app, and of course at abcnews.com. The news never stops. GMA3 starts right now. What you need to know right now on GMA3. A new blast of brutal cold, more than 100 million Americans under wind chill alerts across at least 26 states, from North Dakota to Florida. The suspect in the Long Island serial killings entered a not guilty plea to a fourth murder charge. Our team with the latest developments and the high profile case. And we'll meet the nation's first active duty Miss America, Madison Marsh. 
GMA3 Deep Dive, the new changes proposed to the au pair program, why that could mean trouble for many families relying on it for child care. Also, Tori's here bringing the winter warmth in today's deals and steals. And no doubt, it's welcome news for music fans. Look who's reuniting to headline at Coachella and in sync fans with a big reason to celebrate too. It's something I've written never changed your life. Absolutely. Absolutely. My dining room table was wobbly as hell. Oh my God. When your last book came out, it was like perfect. Plus, the performance and film getting plenty of Oscar buzz. We'll sit down with American Fiction's Jeffrey Wright. Now, from Times Square, Eva Pilgrim and DeMarco Morgan with Dr. Jen Ashton and What You Need to Know. Seems like a summer song. It's it freezing so outside. I don't know if somebody's being funny. I want to keep them clothes on. Are they trying to punk us this morning? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to What You Need to Know on this chilly Wednesday. Yeah, it is good to see you guys, and welcome back to you from Iowa. I said, how was it, Eva? She said it was freezing. <laughs> it was very cold. <gasps> very cold. Mm. And it's cold here now, too. It is cold. Let's check in with Dr. Jen Ashton. She's joining us from L.A. today. Hey, Dr. Jen. Hey, good morning, good afternoon. It's not that, well, it's early here, but it's not as cold. You know, Eva, I was worried about you and checked on you because I didn't want you to be frozen solid, but you are one tough cookie. And oh, you said, she is. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> yeah, she always no. says, I'm okay. I had heated uh, things to put over me. So, you know, those and like battery pack too. stuff. So yeah. I wasn't exposed to the elements. Um, let's talk about some wow. of the headlines, Dr. Jen. A brand new study in the world of obesity medicines looking at how fruit juices can impact weight, even those with no added sugar. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, because I have a little one at home, how do we know, uh, what huh? do we know about how this affects children? Because you see little kids drinking fruit juice all, all the, the time. time. Right, and before we get to it, I want to set it up for you because, you know, we most of us think if it's natural or 100% fruit juice, it's okay. So let me take you through this study just published in JAMA Pediatrics. They looked at available data from 42 prior studies looking at 100% fruit juice consumption and weight gain in adults and children. And what they found is that for each additional serving, just eight ounces one serving per day, it showed a small but significant increase in weight in children um, under the age of eight. They didn't see the same type of linear increase in adults, but big picture, almost 15 million ch children and teenagers in this country live with obesity. So American Academy of Pediatrics and Nutrition is really reinforcing that it should be limited, even if it's 100% fruit juice in children and really water is best, and that goes for adults as well. All right, Doc, we'll check in with you later. Good to see you again. You bet. All right, let's check it out with ABC's Maria Villarreal, who is back with us, and it is always good to see you, my friend. They let me back in the building again. Of course. Guys. <laughs> Great to join you from bitter juice news to now the bitter cold. We start with the brutally cold winter weather. 105 million Americans facing wind chill alerts from North Dakota to Florida. ABC's Samara Theodore has our forecast. Good afternoon, guys. Take a look at this video from Buffalo, New York. Now, this is a traffic cam, nearly white out conditions, roads completely coated there, cars really taking their time. And here's why that lake effect snow machine has gotten cranked up. It's been snowing and it'll continue to snow through Thursday night. They could see up to four feet of snow in parts of Buffalo and Watertown, New York. Meanwhile, on the West Coast, we're tracking our next cross country storm. Four to six inches of rain possible from Seattle to San Francisco, an additional one to two feet of snow potentially in the Rockies and the Plains. Back to you all. All right, thank you so much. Republican candidates are fanning across New Hampshire, hoping to overtake rival frontrunner former President Donald Trump. Nikki Haley trailing her former boss by single digits, betting big on the Granite State after her third place finish in Iowa. The New Hampshire primary is less than a week away. And the Biden administration is taking on and trying to slash bank overdraft fees. The Consumer Financial Protection Bureau proposing to cut individual fees from $35 to get this, as low as $3. The move could save consumers about three and a half billion, I'm talking billions of dollars here each year. 
All right, if you're a Costco lover like me, get ready. The retail giant Costco is reportedly the latest big company to crack down on membership sharing. USA Today says Costco is testing a new program that scans ID cards at the door rather than at the registers, which they say can slow down checkout lines for customers. All right, take this pink ribbon off my eyes. I'm exposed, and there's no big surprise. Or maybe this is a big surprise. No doubt, this is a welcome blast from the past for music fans. Gwen Stefani and her band reuniting at Coachella this spring. And taking you to a better place also, NSYNC fans have been waiting on this one. A new video from Justin Timberlake and the gang behind the scenes of their Trolls hit just dropped. I watched it. It is a lot of fun, very much reminiscing. But I hate to share some sad news. Uh -oh. I have to go back to Texas, so I'm bye, bye, bye. Uh -oh. Today, that was very clever. Yeah, there. I did too. I'm rolling with it today. We'll you see you on the two. Yeah, and we'll yes, have you back. Yes. yes, and maybe we'll even see you out on the road. But less, <laughs> less glam, more, more just jeans and shirts for me. So it's been, a, it's been fun. I love it you guys. It's been a pleasure having you. We love you yes. too. You know that. Love my G GMA three family. It's been Thank really you. lovely yeah. having you. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's much more ahead here on GMA three on this Wednesday. It's a story that's gripped the nation's attention. Our team with the deep dive into the Long Island serial killer case. Now a fourth murder charge for the suspect. And later here, the young woman making history as the first active duty military Miss America. Come on back. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live, streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is OK. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. 
All right, welcome back to GMA3. Prosecutors in Long Island's Gilgo Beach serial killer case have charged suspect Rex Heuerman with a new murder. And this brings his total number of alleged killings to four. Let's bring in ABC News contributor Brian Buckmeyer and correspondent Stephanie Ramos. Stephanie, let's start with you. So he had previously been charged for the killings of three women. He's pleaded not guilty to those. Explain to us this current update. Right, so authorities announced a major breakthrough in this case last summer when they charged Heuerman uh, with the murder of three out of these four women. And then yesterday, of course, we saw on Long Island that he was charged with second degree murder for this fourth woman. So uh, let's keep in mind that this case against Heuerman has been building over the last two years. Uh, authorities collecting information, collecting evidence. Uh, they were able to obtain more than 300 subpoenas, search warrants, collecting evidence to try and tie Heuerman conclusively to these murders. And so, Brian, let's talk about the victim. Uh, Maureen Brainerd Barnes. Uh, she disappeared back in 2007. Her body wasn't discovered until 2010. So how does this connection, the alleged connection between uh, the suspect and this victim, where does it come into play? Yeah, so Ms. Brainerd Barnes lived in Connecticut. From what we understand, she would travel to New York City as a sex worker. And I say that because that seems to be the M.O. of Rex Heuerman, that he preys upon these women. She's actually 4'11", very petite. But the connection they're making is with one of the three belts that were used to restrain her, this H.M. or W.H., depending on how you look at it. Law enforcement believes that it's W.H. for William Heuerman, one of Rex Heuerman's relatives. And they take a hair from that belt buckle and they test it. Now, it doesn't connect to Rex Heuerman, but what they do throughout this investigation that Stephanie's talking about is they follow the daughter on the Long Island Expressway, get a can that she throws away, test the DNA from that can, and they're able to say it is more likely to the degree of 7.9 trillion times get here. that this hair is related to the wife of Rex Heuerman. Now, as we're kind of joking before, I know, statistically speaking, my wife's hair is somewhere on me. I kissed her goodbye. She's always next to my suit. So that hair is planted there in the way they think that Rex Heuerman must have interacted with this woman and left his wife's hair on the victim. All right, Stephanie, so they have released a treasure trove of evidence yeah. here. Walk us through it. So I would say the most significant piece of evidence and probably the most disturbing is this deep dive that they were able to do on Heuerman's digital footprint. Authorities were able to collect hundreds of devices, uh, some of which were burner phones that they say he used to contact some of the victims and their families once the victims had disappeared. They also uncovered multiple searches for autopsy photos, Google searches on serial killers, the status of the investigation, even software that could assist you in wiping away data. But the most significant key piece of evidence, uh, as Brian mentioned, was that hair, that hair that was able to, to be DNA tested. Uh, authorities saying that the hair of Heuerman's wife was found near or on three of the four women and that a hair found near another victim was linked to their daughter. So, so much evidence that investigators had to sift through. Yeah, the evidence in this case is fascinating to say the least. So, Brian, prosecutors say Heuerman's now estranged wife and his children. They were out of town when Brainard Barnes disappeared, fitting an alleged pattern. So, where do we go from here? What do we know about this? So what it appears from what the prosecution and probably even what the defense would argue as well is that there was this pattern that uh, through cell phone records as well as bank statements, the wife and daughter would go to Atlantic City or to other places uh, for weeks on end. And this is when Rex Heuerman, if you're the defense, decided to indulge himself in the sex in sex workers. Or for the prosecution, they would say, this is when he laid his trap. He, he told the wife and kids to leave, and this is when he tracked the women, the, the cell phone data, the, the internet searches. He found them, he killed them, and disposed of their bodies. That's what the prosecution is arguing, because it happened with each and every one of these four women. This time frame of family's gone, and Rex Heuerman is interacting with these women, and then they disappear, and their bodies are found years later. All right, Stephanie Ramos and Brian Buckmeyer, good to see you both. Fascinating case here. Coming up next, a new Miss America making history. The first woman to hold the title who's also an active duty member of the Air Force. We'll meet her when we come back. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television, World News Tonight with David Muir. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman 
was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. What you get to watch, Reed? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City, getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime, we'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, wherever you stream your news, only on ABC News Live. Give it to me. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start here. Now, that's a part of the story that you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News live. All right, welcome back to GMA3. On Sunday, a new Miss America was crowned. Madison Marsh, representing Colorado, won the competition, and she's the first active duty officer to ever hold the title. And she is here today to share her historic win and tell us what's next for her reigning year. Please welcome Miss America 2024, Madison Marsh. The queen is here. Woo! Thank you so much for having mm -hmm. me. So, I'm curious what you're hoping to accomplish in this next year. So obviously a big thing is the military. I would love to bring back the USO tour with Miss America and being able to go speak to people all around the world about what it means to be second Lieutenant Marsh and Miss America because obviously I wouldn't have been able to do anything without the Air Force's help. And then another big part of my year would be the Whitney Marsh Foundation, which is what I started in my mom's memory. And I really want to be able to go global and advocate and educate people on pancreatic cancer and really being able to share my mom's story. That's a good platform there. Thank so when you. did you decide to join the Air Force? I hear you love speaking to little girls and <laughs> encouraging them to join the military and yes. become a pilot. Yes, so I, so I think I was in the eighth grade, if I'm correct, when I started looking at the Air Force Academy. And uh, there was a funny story, my congressman that represented me from back home, when I decided I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy, I wrote out like an entire resume, all of my fact sheet, and I walked up to him in a hallway, and I said, hello, so nice to meet you, I want to be like your next candidate to go to the Air Force Academy. Oh, you were and serious. So, <laughs> I was serious from day one. And look at what you're doing now. Oh, thank yeah. you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's talk about the purple ribbon that you have yes. um, there on your sash. Y your platform, your community service is about pancreatic cancer. Mm -hmm. Why is that so important to you? So I lost my mom on November 1st, 2018 to pancreatic cancer. Uh, she was misdiagnosed for a while and only survived nine months from the moment that she was diagnosed to the day that she passed and was only 41 and had no symptoms beforehand. We don't have a cancer history in our family, so it is so important to me to educate people to know the signs. I mean, looking for, um, maybe it's jaundice, maybe it's unexplained back pain, abdominal pain, all the different signs to make sure that you're advocating for yourself because we didn't know that's what my mom had. And I can only imagine if we would invest more in research and advocacy and education, she could still be here. And even though she can't be here, I still get to be. So I want to be a voice for her and all the other patients, past, present, and future. So I'm really excited to get to do that this year. And before we go, if your mom were here, what do you think she would think of you? Oh, you know, she never actually got to see me compete in pageants because I started after she passed. And I think she would be the one person that would not have been shocked mm. that I joined pageants. <laughs> uh, I just think that she would be so excited. And a big thing for her is she wanted to be remembered for who she was and not what pancreatic cancer had made her. And that's exactly what I want to do this year to share her life and her love with everyone all around the globe. 
and we love you for that. Oh, thank you yes. so much. All right, once again, Madison Marsh, a.k.a. Miss America. Congratulations and <laughs> thank thanks for coming you. on. You got it. Well, coming up on GMA3, Dr. Jen with what you need to know if you're thinking about an over-the-counter sleep aid. And later on, we're going to do a deep dive into a program that a lot of parents rely on and the proposed changes. Stay with us. Bravo. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's going to get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories, start here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. ABC News Live Prime, winner of the Gracie Award for Best News Program in All of Television. Stream ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis, weeknights on ABC News Live. All right, Dr. Jen is back looking at a new study finding the number of breast cancer deaths is down pretty significantly. Break this down for us. Yep, you guys, here is the actual study published in JAMA. You know we love to bring good news um, in medical headlines, particularly in the world of oncology cancer. Um, this study looked at deaths due to breast cancer from 1975 to 2019 using all kinds of mathematical models and basically found overall a 58% reduction mm. in deaths due to breast cancer, largely due to better screening and better treatment, particularly for stage one, two, and three breast cancer and for metastatic breast cancer. So, uh, you know, I think it's so important when people hear the word, you have cancer, which no one wants to hear, particularly breast cancer, it's really about the treatment that has advanced massively um, over the last 25 plus years and it's saving lives and the, this study and data really shows that. And this is good news here, but talk about how important it is to not let your guard down, to still get your screenings and learn more about the situation here. Well, you know, I say all the time, cancer is like the weather. What type of cancer are you talking about? But across the board in general, the earlier you find a cancer, the better the prognosis will be. And um, breast cancer with screening really speaks to that point. Now we just have to get better at prevention. Mm -hmm. And that's the next step. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jane. We appreciate it. We're back you in a Stay with us.
told me I've killed before, and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today, we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt someone's going to get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. everyone, I'm Kira Phillips. Some of the top headlines we're watching at ABC News Live this hour. A New York judge declining to dismiss involuntary manslaughter charges against Daniel Penny in that subway chokehold death of Jordan Neely. Penny was recorded placing Neely in a fatal cho chokehold last summer, but says he didn't intend to kill him and that Neely was behaving in a threatening manner. Penny's attorneys say that they disagree with that decision, but are confident a jury will deliver a just verdict. He is due back in court on March 20th. His trial will start no later than the fall. 30 years ago today, Southern California was rocked by a massive earthquake. Dozens of people were killed. Thousands of others were hurt. The 6.7 magnitude quake struck Northridge in the darkness of night. Millions of people were sleeping unaware and unprepared. It was the first quake to knock out power in every area of Los Angeles. At least 57 people were killed. Nearly 12,000 were treated at area hospitals. Properties were lost, roughly $40 billion in damages. And the royal family hit with a double health scare. King Charles is set to have a corrective procedure next week to treat an enlarged prostate. The palace says that it is benign and non-cancerous. And this comes as Kate Middleton, the Princess of Wales, is on the mend after undergoing a successful abdominal procedure in a London hospital. The palace says the surgery was a success and that the medical issue was non-cancerous as well. She's expected to remain hospitalized for up to 14 days as she recovers. Thanks for streaming with us. I'm Kira Phillips. ABC News Live is here for you anytime with the latest news, contents, and analysis. You can always find us on your favorite streaming service, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. The news never stops. More GMA3 right now. You're as cold as ice. All right, we have Dr. Jen again. Let's get her answer now to one of your health and wellness questions. Here it is. Are there ways to regain core strength after having a C-section? Mm. Dr. Jen, so many women worry about this after they have a baby. Yeah, so um, the first part of my answer, which is really important, and Kashawn may not like to hear this because it might not help her, um, is to strengthen your core 
before pregnancy. That is critically important because you don't know whether you're going to have a C-section. Either way, those abdominal muscles take a big hit during pregnancy because they get stretched out. Um, so the stronger your core is before pregnancy, the better. After a C-section, remember, that is a laparotomy. That's major abdominal surgery. So we normally recommend no strenuous exercise for about six to eight weeks afterwards. But basically, you know, once you can get up and walk around, you can do gentle cat-cow, nothing that directly puts pressure on that incision. And it's not the incision in the skin that matters, you guys. It's internally. It's that fascia that we really need uh, time to heal. So again, about six weeks, but you can start working your core 360 degrees, which involves your back muscles, side muscles, and the front you know, gently as soon as you can get up mm -hmm. and walk around. And give yourself some grace, because it mm -hmm. takes some time. Right, you just grew a human, and you had major <laughs> right. abdominal surgery, life. so be patient. Yeah. All right, Doc, thank you very much. We appreciate it. And you folks, bet. we would love to hear from you, so hit us up on Instagram with all of your medical questions for Dr. Jan at ABC GMA3. And just ahead here on GMA3, why some families are scrambling over proposed changes to the popular au pair program. And later, deals in steals products and savings sure to warm you up. Tori Johnson is in the house. Come on back. You never take advice. Someday you Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News. This is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Welcome back to GMA3. For many working families in the U.S., the au pair program has been a popular and affordable child care solution for those willing to host young adults from around the world. But the Biden administration's newly proposed changes could make the practice prohibitively expensive for some families who rely on it. Here's ABC's Alexis Christophorus. 
The Griffin family of Houston, Texas, says having a live-in au pair care for their three kids has been a lifesaver. We would not have survived the pandemic if it hadn't been for our amazing au pair from Sweden. And now we are on our fifth au pair who is from Germany. Launched as a cultural exchange visa program by the State Department in 1986, today about 29,000 young adult foreigners who meet the federal requirements like age and education live with American families for up to two years, caring for children and exchange for a room and board, transportation, and educational expenses. We're really excited to invite someone into our family that could help teach language, culture. These women truly become part of our families. And at an average cost of $25,000 a year, au pairs can be more affordable than most full-time nannies or daycare. I think the biggest misconception is people think it's only for the uber rich, and it's really not. A lot of middle-class families in the United States hire au pairs. But some experts say a Biden administration proposal meant to ensure that au pairs are paid fairly could price out up to 70% of families who use the program. It could be devastating for the working families that currently rely on the au pair program for flexible childcare. And it will force some of those families into the already overcrowded daycare market. The families that participate in this program are comprised of military families, teachers, first responders, medical professionals. And to have these families no longer have access to a program like this would be such a difficult situation, particularly at a time where we're really facing an unprecedented child care crisis. The proposed changes would reduce an au pair's work week from 45 hours to 40, unless parents pay time and a half for the additional hours. Schedule changes would have to be pre-approved by the au pair agency. And the current weekly stipend of $195 would be increased to match the minimum wage in the state where the host family lives. Cora, Cora. For Christine and Ken Lim Lee, that would be a deal breaker. Living in New Jersey with one of the highest minimum wages, that was kind of shocking. The Lim Lees say the proposed changes would triple the stipend they pay their au pair to watch their two toddlers to more than $600 a week. It's not broccoli, but it's still yummy. Would this price you out of the au pair program if these changes happen? Yes, it would probably price us out. For the program. Massachusetts adopted similar rules in 2019 and saw a nearly 70% drop in the number of au pairs in the state. You start taking this family home and turning it into a work site. You take this relationship between host parent and au pair and it turns into employer, employee, a checklist mentality. The State Department tells ABC News it is deeply committed to the au pair program and has an ultimate goal of increasing protections for au pairs and ensuring affordability for American families. Former au pair Carolyn Broker of Germany praises some of the proposed changes like higher pay, but says the relationships she made were priceless. I'm still in contact after like six months with my host family. I just my host kid is just my little sister for me, and I'm a big sister for her. So having these experiences is will just be with me for my lifetime. So guys, how was your movie today? What have you watched? For the Griffins, they'll have to find alternate child care if the changes go through. It takes away a lot of the flexibility. It increases the price substantially, but I think it'd be a shame. I think it's such a special thing in my kids' lives. Yeah. So I feel like it, it'll just be a shame if other families don't get to experience that. <laughs> So many of us having to think about the costs mm -hmm. of child care is a real problem for a lot of American families. Our thanks to Alexis for that report. The State Department has extended public comment on the proposed changes to the au pair program until January 28th. The agency telling ABC News it will consider all comments before determining next steps. All right, up next, you're going to want to bundle up with some of these goodies right here. Tori Johnson's Deals and Steel to bring us some much-needed warmth in this chilly winter. We'll be right back. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's gonna get me. The case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors Speaks, the Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. Ingmar Kortelak, one of the biggest unclimbed rock faces on the planet. Now I'm starting to get very excited. If we manage to climb Ingmar Kortelak, 
It'll be the biggest first ascent we've ever done. Oh my god, it's so scary! Uh, ultimately, what's at stake with climbing? This is not what I signed up for. It's always your life. Rock, 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 rock! Ice, ice, ice! at stake. So much on the line. More Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News World News Tonight with David Muir. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. What's good to watch, read? Where can I get a great deal on what I'm just dying to buy? Oh, it's all right here. GMA Life. Get the latest celebrity buzz, deals and steals, and the coolest lifestyle tips from GMA. I love that so much. Streaming weekends on ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. I'm Rebecca Jarvis reporting from the New York Stock Exchange, and wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. You're as cold as ice. All right, welcome back, everyone. It is Wednesday, so that means it is time for Deals and Steals, and Tori Johnson has some big savings on products to keep you warm and cozy this winter season. Boy, do we need it. You can start shopping by pointing your cell phone camera to that QR code right there on the screen. All right, Tori. Let's do it. Yes. Let's do it. First up, the original wearable blanket. That is the comfy. And it, it looks so like good. a blanket. It's cozy like a blanket. Yeah. So you're feel you like the inside of that, mm -hmm. right? It's so good. the inside is this luxurious Sherpa lining, which fe feels it, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. You can't so stop soft. touching. It's really soft. <laughs> and then the outside's just a great microfiber. Uh, super comfy. We've got options for kids and adults. Huge assortment. Plus, that's their giant blanket. It's eight. Right here? Yep. Eight feet by eight feet Whoa, it's wow. like it is a really giant blanket so when you are on wow. the couch and you don't want to share or you're on the bed and you don't want to share uh there's a lot of cuddling that can happen this in that nice. in that big one yeah, yeah and or it's if you super have a soft. blanket stealer <laughs> that's right if you have a blanket stealer there's enough for both of you this is just it this is a fun product uh barbara corcoran made it even more fun where i'm commenting on the uh, the picture of her on the back mm -hmm. looks really fun she knows those good shark tank finds and so do you guys because these today slash and half starting at 2150. Okay. Right, the other problem with the cold is it zaps your batteries. <laughs> it does zap your batteries. So this is going to do two things. Put okay. this in your hand. Feel that. Oh my gosh. So that is from oh, Zippo. Sorry, I'm taking this with this That is a combination hand warmer and phone charger <gasps> built in one. Wow. So there's feel that. Feel how good that is, right? Mm -hmm. These are these are like really warm. They're very warm. Yes. So imagine you've got this in your pocket and you can stay powered up when you're on the go. They make three different options for three six and nine hours of uh, warmth and power mm. on the go. So this is just a really smart one. To, it fits also obviously right into your pocket. Yeah. So mm. when your hands are in your pocket uh, and you're on the go, you want one of these. Oh, we also warm. have their uh, rechargeable candle lighter, but this is the product. These hand warmers and, and chargers are where it's at. Slash in half, all the prices start at $15. This is amazing. Well, it's a good one, right? I'm Actually, surprised you're putting just, it back. I'm you're going to continue holding it. Okay. So we're going to stick with warmth here. This is Zadro. These are towel warmer. So grab that towel oh. in there. Oh, so, this is nice. Yeah, so it's been sitting out here a little bit, but you see, imagine a uh. cold day, get out of the shower, and you want a warm towel for that spa-like spa experience. Treatment. Yeah. That's like spa treatment, yeah. That's a fancy treatment. hotel. Like a fancy hotel is exactly mm. right. And you can put in here uh, a towel, you could put a robe in there, socks, lot. whatever it is that you want to be able to stay warm. And then we also have their steamer here. Oh, What's good about cool. these is that is to steam washcloths. They're hot. Be careful. that That's to steam washcloths so that when you uh, want that spa-like experience yeah. on your face and hands, those are fabulous. 
from Zadro at Sauce Slash and have starts at $40. That's amazing. That's genuinely amazing. And now I'm back to the hand holder. Yeah, back to the hand holder. Okay, so this is from Nola to help you sleep better. You made a confession to me about a weighted blanket that you teased me about last week. The weighted blanket, it works. I can't sleep without it now. There you go. There you go. So if you are like him and you need a weighted blanket, this is a chunky knit weighted blanket. That All right, straight to the White House. You see Speaker Johnson there uh, addressing reporters as the four key leaders uh, met with the president about the spending bill. Let's listen in. ...and catastrophe, and I articulated that to the president in the meeting now. We understand that there's concern about uh, the safety, security, sovereignty of Ukraine, but the American people have those same concerns about our own domestic sovereignty and our safety and our security. We, we have talked about the necessary elements to solve this problem. We, we passed our bill, and it has critical elements. It's a restore, restoration of the Remain in Mexico policy. It is the end of catch and release. It is reform to the broken uh, asylum and parole systems. Uh, we're not insistent upon a particular name of a, of a piece of legislation, but we are insistent that the elements have to be meaningful. The House is ready to act, but the legislation has to solve the problem, and that, that's the critical point. Uh, we understand the necessity about Ukraine funding, and we want to say that the status quo is unacceptable. We need the commander-in-chief of this country, the president of the United States, to, to show strength on the world stage and not weakness. We cannot continue with the current status quo. We understand the importance of what's uh, been needed, but when I met with President Zelensky just last month, uh, right before Christmas, he said that the necessary ingredient is the proper weapons systems that they need. Um, there, there are certain things that are, that are needed to ensure that they can prevail. We need the questions answered about the, the strategy, about the end game, and about the accountability for the precious treasure of the American people. We understand that all these things are important, but we must insist, we must insist that the border be the top priority. I, I think we have some consensus around that table. Everyone understands the urgency of that, and we're going to continue to press for it. I want to thank my colleagues here, the chairman of our committees of jurisdiction, for being here, and, and thank uh, everyone for the time today. Thank well, you. Mr. Speaker, did you hear anything from the president that made you change your calculus in these negotiations? Do you have any new ideas when it comes to border policies? Sir, does the status quo mean no more aid or new aid? All right, just outside the West Wing there, you saw Speaker Johnson uh, flanked by uh, other leaders as uh, he was speaking with reporters about just meeting with the president about the ongoing standoff over his national security package, uh, talking about funding for Ukraine, Israel, and the southern border. Uh, as you heard the speaker there making it clear, the border, in their eyes, is the number one priority. And he's not going to budge, although he did say that he met with you great Ukrainian president uh, about the situation and the need for aid over there. He wants to deal with the border first and foremost. Let's bring in our Jay O'Brien, who's up on the Hill. Uh, also, our White House correspondent, uh, Selena Wang, uh, will be joining the conversation as well. Jay, let's start with you. Um, really didn't say anything new. Uh, did you get a sense that there were results that came out of this meeting? I don't think we're going to have a sense of that until we speak to Speaker Johnson a little bit more when he returns back here to the Capitol. Certainly from those remarks, you didn't get answers to some of the key questions, which are, number one, was there any meaningful progress in that meeting? And number two, what kinds of agreements have there been on immigration policy changes? We've got Chuck Schumer speaking now. We don't come to Ukraine's aid that the consequences for America around the globe would be nothing short of devastating. And within a year, we would be on our back foot doing all kinds of things that we, that we wouldn't want to do. That it was essential, essential, and there was Democratic and Republican agreement that it was essential we help Ukraine. We also talked about the border and how it's so important to deal with the border. The president himself said over and over again that he is willing to make uh, to move forward on border. And so we said we have to do both. There were a couple of people in the room who said, let's do border first. We said we have to do both together. In the Senate, and let me make one more point, the only way we will do border and Ukraine, or even either of them, is bipartisan. You cannot, cannot do things with one party in a divided Congress. And so anyone who says, any party that says do it my way or no way, we're not going to get anything done. 
And I think there was broad agreement in the room that we had to do this in a bipartisan way. Speaking in the Senate, we are making really good progress. I am more optimistic now that we can come to an agreement on border and Ukraine in one package, along with aid to Israel, along with humanitarian aid for the Palestinians in Gaza, and along with helping us Indochina. I am more optimistic than ever before that we'd come to an agreement. I put the chances a little bit greater than half now, and that's the first time I can say that. And so we hope to fund the government this week, and then if we can come to an agreement, we haven't come to an agreement yet in the Senate, move very quickly uh, to, on the uh, supplemental uh, very shortly thereafter. What was the president's nope. response? Yeah. Thank you, Leader Schumer. Uh, I'm thankful to President Biden for convening the legislative leadership from both the House and the Senate. It was a very positive, forward-looking, candid discussion about the issues of importance to the American people. First and foremost, that funding the Ukrainian war effort is in America's national security interests. And it's important that we sustain the effort, not simply just for the good of the Ukrainian people, though they are allies of the United States, and that's incredibly important, but it is urgently necessary that we continue to support the Ukrainian effort for the good of the free world, for the good of democracy, and for the good of America's national security interests. And there was broad agreement on that point. As Leader Schumer has indicated, there was also an openness to, in a bipartisan way, addressing the situation at the border. It has to be bipartisan. It has to be reasonable. It has to be effective. It has to be consistent with American values. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Any closer to an agreement, sir? All right, as you saw with Speaker Johnson and now with um, uh, Hakeem uh, Jeffries there and Senate Majority Leader uh, Chuck Schumer, uh, the reporters asking the same questions. Were there any results? Uh, n neither leader there or even the House Speaker uh, could answer that question. They just said it was forward thinking and candid conversation uh, about uh, the funding for Ukraine, Israel, and the southern border, this national security package that the president has been trying to get over the finish line. Our White House uh, correspondent, Selena Wang, uh, also following this. So it sounds like Speaker Johnson says, the border issue should be a priority. But if you listen to Schumer and Jeffries there, they're saying, look, it's got to be Ukraine and the border uh, of equal priority. So it doesn't sound like they got anywhere today with regard to results, but uh, plenty of candid conversation. Yeah, Kira, you make a very good point. It's very unclear how this meeting actually moves the ball forward. They've been stalled on the supplemental for months, and one meeting with the president that was focused on national security and the funding need for Ukraine, unclear how that is productive and effective here, since most of the disagreement comes around what to do about border policy, with GOP members are looking for much more stringent, harsher rules. And the White House here was really making the case, focusing this on why we desperately, urgently need to fund more aid to Ukraine right now. Earlier up, I was on the Hill and McConnell, who was also in the meeting, he was saying that he, his, he is urging other Senate GOP members to urgently pass the supplemental. His point is that we should look at this seriously because it's a unique opportunity when you can extract some pretty significant concessions from Democrats when it comes to border policy because they are tying it to Ukraine. It's being tied to something that Democrats urgently want passed. But when it comes to this White House meeting, as you said, a lot of candid conversations. But where do things stand on the border policy? Where does that stand? Clearly something House Speaker Johnson has made very clear is their number one priority. So what happens now, Selena? Well, look, the senators up on the Hill, the leaders, they were just saying today that they're very confident and they are feeling optimistic that something could be passed pretty soon in the Senate. But then the question is, what happens when it gets to the House? 
House Speaker Johnson already pouring cold water of anything that comes out of the Senate. House GOP members, many of them are looking for much harsher border policies. They don't believe what's going to come out of the Senate is going to satisfy their demands. So this could still be a very long time until we actually see something passed on the supplemental. But clearly we see President Biden personally amping up his involvement in all of this, wanting to make his mark on why this is urgent for the American people, not just for what the situation in Ukraine, but the argument is that this is about American national security as well. White House correspondent Selena Wang, thanks so much, Selena. And I'm Kira Phillips. Thanks so much for streaming with us. A lot more news ahead. Don't go far. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. Right now, there's just so much happening in our world. So much at stake at the start of every morning. Making sense of it all? That's not always so easy. And that's where we come in. Good morning, America. We want you to know every morning. We're right here and we got gotcha. you. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes fall up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel Hamas War. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. And we begin here with some breaking news. We have breaking news now on ABC News Live. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles. The big four congressional leaders just emerging from this high stakes meeting with President Biden at the White House to discuss his request for more than $100 billion in funding that would include additional U.S. aid for both Ukraine 
and Israel. ABC News senior White House correspondent Selena Wang and ABC News Jay O'Brien are joining us with the latest on this. So Jay, let's start here with you. Uh, you know, we know we've been talking about it for a long time that the president wants this funding for both Ukraine and Israel, but Republicans, what they want is to secure the southern border. And we heard separately from from these congressional leaders. First, the Republicans came out, and Speaker Johnson again, Jay, sort of laid out some of the more specific things that he wants. Although Jay, he continues to say he's not looking for comprehensive immigration reform here. And that's key, Kena, because we're not quite sure then what Speaker Johnson wants and what he views as quote unquote comprehensive immigration reform and what he just views as border security based immigration reform, which he said he's more in favor of. And that's really important because for weeks there have been these ongoing negotiations in the Senate between Republicans, Democrats, and Biden administration officials as to what kinds of changes to U.S. immigration policy everybody could agree on to put into this supplemental aid package for aid for Israel and Ukraine and make that package passable with Republicans in both the House and the Senate who have demanded that there be some kind of immigration provision in that larger foreign aid package. So exactly what Mike Johnson wants and what's a deal breaker for Mike Johnson and what's a sweetener for Mike Johnson is really important in this because if that package were to get written and get passed through the Senate, it would be up to Mike Johnson to put it on the House floor. And we didn't get much of an inkling from his remarks just there in front of the White House as to exactly where these talks are and if he heard anything in that meeting with the president that gives him a better sense of if this is legislation that he can get behind and he could really be the spoiler in all this. He's actually returning right here to Capitol Hill moments from now um, and we may be able to ask him some more questions as to exactly how that meeting went, get a better sense of where we are here. Yeah, I, I hope that you are able to track him down there, Jay. And, and Selena, with you here with us, let's go ahead and take a moment uh, to listen to what Speaker Johnson said as he emerged from this meeting. And I want to reiterate before we listen to him that he brought up some things that we continue to hear from Republican leadership in terms of the border. He talked about, uh, you know, the Remain in Mexico policy. He talked about reinstating the catch and release po policy and reforming what it means to seek asylum. So those, those are some of the things that he sort of listed off there. But again, we know that there's a lot more to it than that. So let's take a quick listen to what he said when he emerged from this meeting. The House is ready to act, but the legislation has to solve the problem. And that, that's the critical point. Uh, we understand the necessity about Ukraine funding, and we want to say that the status quo is unacceptable. So you heard again, he said that again and again, that the status quo is unacceptable. And Selena, as we turn here to you, I see you nodding. You know, when Democrats, when those congressional leaders came out to talk, when Chuck Schumer uh, took to the microphone alongside Hakeem Jeffries, we heard a little more optimism uh, from this meeting, I would say, than we heard from Republicans. What do you think? Well, it's clear that these big four leaders, they are not all on the same page. I was up on the Hill earlier and some of these Senate Republican leaders, they were actually expressing some optimism as well. But again, that is in the Senate. It would also need to clear the House. And clearly, they have different demands. And Speaker Johnson, he's already been pouring cold water over whatever bill comes out of the Senate. But look, Mitch McConnell, he said that he's urging Republican members to pass the supplemental because it's a unique time when they can extract some significant concessions from Democrats because they desperately want this aid to Ukraine, this foreign aid, and they are being tied together. So his message is, let's do it now. There's no better time time to get what we want. But the question is, once when it moves to the House, there are clearly still sticking points, even in the Senate, around asylum policy, around presidential parole. There are far more conservative members in the House that want far more stringent policy. So this could still drag out for a very long time. But we are seeing with this meeting today that the president convened. He is trying to get more personally involved in this, trying to move the ball forward. But again, this has already been stalled for months. It certainly has been. And now we can go ahead and we can take a listen to some of the things that Chuck Schumer said. And again, as Selena points out there, he reiterated time and time again that a deal is only going to come, especially in terms of border policy, in a bipartisan way. So let's take a listen there. That was essential we help Ukraine. We also talked about the border and how it's so important to deal with the border. The president himself said over and over again that he is willing to make uh, to move forward on border. And 
And so, Jay, I want to bring this back here to you because one thing that we heard from Speaker Johnson when he emerged from this meeting was that, you know, he said domestic sovereignty is also a concern for Americans because they are having to react to the president saying, we need to fund Ukraine, we need to fund Israel. And he's saying, what about our domestic sovereignty? And one thing, Jay, I want to point out to you is that we heard uh, from National Security Spokesperson John Kirby earlier today saying that he thought in this meeting that President Biden might take this time to highlight to members of Congress what's really going on on the battlefield there in Ukraine to try and create some urgency. Yeah, a couple of things I want to tick through there because you made some excellent points. First and foremost, I have breaking but disappointing news for you. Mike Johnson, my producer, is texting me from downstairs, is back in the building, uh, and he didn't answer any questions. So we have no extra detail and no extra color of exactly what went on in that meeting. But to that question of talking about Ukraine and Mike Johnson's opinion of continued U.S. aid for Ukraine, when John Kirby said earlier that he believes the president would pull out classified information, as you noted, to try try to te demonstrate to these high-profile lawmakers the seriousness of the need for continued aid for Ukraine, that's really targeted almost directly and nearly exclusively at Mike Johnson. Every other congressional leader in that room has publicly said that they are very much in support of continued aid for Ukraine. Particularly Democrats, Chuck Schumer, Hakeem Jeffries have said they don't want it tied to everything. Mitch McConnell, who I've been told that Ukraine aid he views as a central part of his legacy, has said that he's very much in support for continued aid for Ukraine, but also wants it tied into immigration reform. Mike Johnson's the only one that's been skeptical of aid for Ukraine. So those efforts to try to make sure that lawmakers understand the severity of this, they they are very much directed at the speaker. I'm very curious if we'll ever learn those details in that meeting. And again, Schumer saying that if we don't fund Ukraine, it, there could be devastating consequences uh, for the United States and we could find ourselves in a bad situation uh, in a year. So uh, we'll continue to watch as this develops. Selena and Jay, our thanks to both of you. Also now here this evening on a busy day, the judge in E. Jean Carroll's defamation case against Donald Trump threatened to kick the former president out of the courtroom today. This is after he repeatedly ignored warnings not to talk loudly while she she testified. The judge telling Trump, quote, I hope I don't have to consider excluding you from the trial, adding, I understand you're probably eager for me to do that. And Trump responding with, quote, I would love it. Well, E. Jean Carroll did take the stand, testifying about the damage that she, she says Trump has caused to her reputation and her career, saying that his attacks on her haven't stopped and that he's made multiple social media posts about her in recent days. This, of course, is the second trial involving the former magazine columnist who was awarded $5 million in damages after a jury found Donald Trump liable for sexually assaulting her in a department store dressing room back in the 90s. Trump is appealing that ruling and denies any wrongdoing here. ABC News senior investigative correspondent Aaron Katursky is joining me live from outside the courthouse right now. Aaron, thank you for being here with us. And first, let's start here with Trump. Uh, what was he saying during Carol's testimony that drew that warning from the judge today? They were playing some of Trump's statements about E. Jean Carroll and the case she brought, calling it a witch hunt, calling it a con job, and he was overheard muttering within earshot of the jury, it is a witch hunt. It is a con job and, and saying some other things that the plaintiff's attorneys were concerned the jury might hear. And so they brought that to the attention of the judge. The judge had admonished Trump to, to be quiet, uh, not to, to be disruptive, uh, especially when conferring with his attorneys to keep any remarks to a, a, a whisper. And, and when it kept happening, that's when Judge Lewis Kaplan threatened to kick him out of court and he said I hope I don't have to do that but but you know that's what it may come to and, and at that point Trump threw up his hands and said I would love it I would love it and Judge Kaplan came right back saying I know you would because you can't control yourself I think it's a knowing comment by the judge about why the former president may be choosing to be here in court over the campaign trail uh, but nonetheless uh, the former president's behavior uh, threatened at least for a moment to overshadow the wrenching testimony of Eugene Carroll. Quite the back and forth there, Aaron. And also today, you know, Carroll said that Trump's accusations of her being a liar essentially upended her life and that she suffers these threats that are happening online. I mean, we've heard this before and Trump has already been found liable for defaming her. Uh, so what is the goal here? H how does her testimony today sort of set the stage for the second trial? And I hope you can hear me there, Aaron. I know it's loud. Yeah, I got a, oh, that's New York City, just have a, a yeah. fire truck going by. But the, um, 
this is all about money, Kena, and the, the, the jury in the last trial awarded E. Jean Carroll $5 million in damages. She's asking for at least $10 million this time uh, because she says that her reputation has been shattered by Trump's defamatory statements that continue, she says, to this day. She told the jury she gets hundreds uh, of threats uh, daily sometimes, and the defense tried to suggest that she's just overplaying it. All right, the unflappable Aaron Katursky on a loud New York City street for us tonight. Aaron, thank you so much. And now to some other news that we are following. The British royal family hit with a double health scare. King Charles is set to have corrective procedure here next week to treat an enlarged prostate, while Kate, the Princess of Wales, is in the hospital after having abdominal surgery. So joining us right now is our ABC News foreign correspondent, James Longman. James, we're so happy to have you here with us tonight. What's the latest here on both the royals? Yeah, strange day here, Kena. The head of the royal family, the most important member of the family, the king, and the most popular member, Catherine, both with announcements on their health. First, uh, the king. We're told that he's had this issue with his prostate for some time. It's obviously that the doctors have been monitoring it. He is going to go into the hospital for one night next week. Uh, this is an issue that uh, mo a lot of men in this country deal with. One in three, in fact, that... Uh, uh, King Charles's age, 75, deal with this, and the palace has used this as an opportunity to uh, kind of uh, sort of draw awareness uh, to this issue. He is a healthy man. You know, we know that both his parents lived uh, long lives. Uh, he had a couple of breakages when he was younger, fell off horses, and so to speak, but his health is good. Kate, that's a much more serious uh, issue. She's going to be in the hospital for 14 days. Uh, everybody in this country hoping that she comes out uh, soon and she can be back to her duties just as soon as possible. Kena. Absolutely. James Longman, our thanks to you as always. And coming up next here, snow and ice creating dangerous conditions on the road, sending buses and trucks sliding out of control. We'll bring you a live report from frozen over Buffalo and the new winter storm that's on the way. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming. ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Okay, it's time now to turn to a winter weather emergency. Over 100 million Americans are on alert for dangerously low temperatures with parts of Texas setting new lows, about 10 degrees there. Uh, snow and ice are creating slick conditions on the roads, sending buses and trucks sliding out of control. There have been thousands of flights can canceled. Oh my gosh, that's so scary to watch those big rigs like that. Uh, eastern cities are getting ready for more disruptive snow as we close out the week. And we have some images of a classroom. This is a classroom in Ohio. Look at that. A student took this picture after the heater in the school went out and the temperature 
on the classroom thermostat dropped into the 40s, although it appears it might even be lower. Uh, ABC News' Michael Schwartz is joining us now uh, from Buffalo, New York. Michael, thank you for being with us in the cold. And I know that this cold is a situation you've been dealing with for some time now. What's, what's going on out there? Yeah, Kana, good evening to you. Well, we spoke on Monday when the Bills game was postponed from Sunday. We're dealing with round two of lake effect snow that has really walloped downtown Buffalo. It was more in the south the first time around over the weekend, but now we have seen more than 60 inches of snow from this weekend into today. You can see parts of it up to my knees right now. Erie County Executive confirming at least three deaths related to the lake effect snow since this weekend. And actually, right now is the perfect time to be joining you because we are in for round two, two and a half coming back. This lake effect band is going throughout western New York up and down. It went a little north. Now it's coming back down. That's why they canceled the Sabres game tonight here downtown. The hockey team will play the Chicago Blackhawks tomorrow night because these roads, uh, they're calm right now, but the winds only expected to ramp up the snow blowing that really fluffy uh, powdery snow all over. Visibility was very, very tough here downtown. Not as bad as over the weekend, but even in the south areas closer to where the Bills did play, uh, the towns had very uh, slow traffic and zero visibility. Travel bans were put into effect in those areas, and they remain in parts of Erie County tonight. As I mentioned, we are expecting that lake effect snow to return today. The wind's expecting, and snow tomorrow. Tomorrow commute is going to be really, really challenging. At the airport this morning, Kena, they recorded three inches in just 30 minutes, but overall, no impact right now to the Bills game coming this weekend. Three inches in 30 minutes. That is so tough to deal with. Michael Schwartz, our thanks to you. Go back and get warm now. Uh, ABC News meteorologist Melissa Griffin has been tracking that new storm system and these freezing temperatures that are settling in across the country. Melissa, what's the latest there? And Kana, so much winter weather to talk about, really coast to coast, with lake effect storm warnings there in parts of the western New York, including Buffalo, getting more snow there. We have new winter storm watches just posted now for parts of the mid-Atlantic as a new storm makes its way east, and that storm right now is here in the Pacific Northwest with blizzard warnings for parts of Montana. That snow is going to track into the central plains as we head into the day tomorrow. So places like South Dakota, Nebraska, eventually into Missouri getting in on that snow, and it combines with another storm in the south bringing another round of snow to the Great Lakes and into the Northeast throughout the day on Friday. D.C., Philly, New York, you're going to get yet another round of snow after just breaking your snowless streak. More is on the way. An additional one to three inches on top of what we saw here in the Northeast yesterday. Parts of the Great Lakes could see three to six inches throughout the day on Thursday and Friday. So yet another cross-country winter storm we're tracking. And that cold moderating now, but it's not over because another cold blast is on the way. Take a look at this. Late Later this week, as we head into Saturday, it feels like negative 22 in Kansas City. It feels like negative 14 in Chicago. And by the weekend, Kana, it's going to feel like 8 degrees there in New York City. Oh, my gosh, still so far to go. ABC News meteorologist Melissa Griffin, thank you. Coming up next here, why some families might be now scrambling for a new child care option if proposed changes to the popular au pair program are adopted. That's after the break. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. You're along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News. 
This is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. I'm Matt Rivers, and that is the Panama Canal. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. And welcome back. For many working families in the U.S., the au pair program has been really popular and affordable. It's childcare, and it's a solution for those willing to host young adults from around the world. But the Biden administration's newly proposed changes could make it prohibitively expensive for some families who rely on it as a lower cost option for their childcare. ABC's Alexis Christophorus brings us this report. Requirements like age and education live with American families for up to two years, caring for children in exchange for room and board, transportation, and educational expenses. Now we're having a little audio difficulty there, but our thanks to Alexis Christophers for that reporting. And a note here that the State Department has extended public comments on that proposed change, and she will continue to follow that for us. We have a lot more news ahead here on ABC News Live. In today's big story, the countdown to the New Hampshire primary, now less than a week away after Donald Trump's landslide victory in Iowa. Will this second contest spell the end for the campaigns of Ron DeSantis and Nikki Haley, or will one of them rise up and stop the former president's momentum. Also in our spotlight, the Supreme Court taking up a case pitting fishing companies against the federal government. Our panel weighs in on why it could send regulatory agencies reeling. In an interview, you talked about how you felt the boogeyman was coming. Yeah. But since I was a, a kid, I felt something's going to get me. In the case of Jonathan Majors, the actor convicted of charges. What happened exactly, do you know? No, I don't know. She's unconscious. Your defense team has said that you were the victim of that night. Who received injuries in the car? I did. Jonathan Majors speaks. The Impact by Nightline exclusive, now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crushing the families Trump. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Friday.
Friday night. He told me, I've killed before, and I'm not afraid to kill again. The 2020 true crime mystery. Deep in the heart of Texas, in a trailer near a darkened wood, something even more terrifying than a body. Answers from beyond the grave to a deadly mystery. Today, we meet the devil himself. There is a monster in me. The true crime event. Nobody ever suspected him. Nobody. David Muir, Deborah Roberts, the all-new 2020, Friday night at 9, 8 central on ABC. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. We are here in Israel, a nation at war. We've seen tank after tank pouring into this area. This is where it all began. Bullet holes all up the wall. Within minutes, the air raid sirens going off. You can hear the sound of an explosion. We are pinned down here. Tonight, Israel waging a fierce bombardment of Gaza. The Israel-Hamas war. For nonstop live coverage, stream ABC News Live. Reporting from southern Israel. From the front lines. In downtown Ramallah. In Beirut. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. ABC News Live. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. National forests are good places to get away, to forget about troubles you may have, or just relax. But sometimes bad things happen in good places. We got a very critical call that just scared everybody. A missing hiker that was up on Blood Mountain. As soon as she didn't come home, everybody's radar went up. There's something wrong here. When we arrived at the trailhead, my knees went weak. All I could see was the torso and feet sticking up. This is a human skull. Three different national forests, three different cases, and they're all hikers. Most average killings are not like this. They don't think of hiding the body in the national forest. But you can hide a body pretty easily. If you get the hell out of here, you can get away with it. At some point, there will be more victims. We were against the clock. Find that evidence and bring them to justice. We hunt humans as prey. Just the devil incarnate. I've never saw that kind of evil before. You read about stuff, but you never believe it would be you. She's not just some 24-year-old girl. Everybody here loves her. This was my wife. If you can't find out what happened within a couple of days, it's going to go cold quickly. It's like a cat and mouse game. I know which him. Dad's got to hurry. Once you've taken someone, you either kill them or you get caught. Send a few cold chills down my spine. It's the stuff of nightmares. How many more victims are out there? Wild crime at Blood Mountain. Now streaming only on Hulu. The GOP presidential candidates gearing up for the next primary battle as Donald Trump holds on to a commanding lead. I'm Kana Whitworth here in Los Angeles, and that is our big story today. The former president calling on his supporters to award him the biggest victory possible in New Hampshire next week to help propel him to the nomination. So can Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis shift that momentum in their favor, or is this whole race already a wrap? We'll discuss. Also in our spotlight, fishing companies looking to take a bite out of the power of the federal government. Our panel weighs on in on the potential broad implications of a new case right now before the Supreme Court.
All right, we, of course, begin here with our big story. The second primary contest of the 2024 GOP presidential race quickly approaching. The latest polling average from our partners at 538 has Donald Trump leading by double digits less than a week before the state's primary. Nikki Haley uh, climbing in recent weeks, but still 13 points behind. Meanwhile, Ron DeSantis is already moving on to South Carolina, which, of course, is Haley's home state, ahead of the third primary contest there next month. So joining us for more is our ABC News Deputy Political Director, Avery Harper, who's in Manchester, New Hampshire. So Avery, thank you so much for being here with us. And I'm really curious to hear your perspective there on the ground. What does it look like right now as we're hearing that potentially in New Hampshire, either we're going to see Trumpism win out or someone is finally going to prove themselves as the Trump alternative? Right. Well, I, listen, I think everything is kind of speculation until we see exactly what happens when voters head out to the polls on Tuesday. Uh, if Trump is to win and he is to win by a large margin, I think that gives him the ammunition and his campaign the ammunition to argue that the party should unite uh, behind his campaign uh, through this primary process. Uh, but if we see another candidate, uh, namely Nikki Haley, who is uh, narrowing the gap between herself and Trump uh, in recent polling, if she comes in close to him or uh, wins the New Hampshire primary, uh, then she could gain some momentum heading into her home state of South Carolina. Well, let's talk about our New Hampshire embed, Kelsey Wall. She wrote something really interesting for us. The candidates in New Hampshire have sort of shifted their focus from these personal engagements that we know are so important to voters there in New Hampshire. And now their movements are essentially moving more towards their policies and things outside of the state. So how are Nikki Haley and Ron DeSantis, you know, making themselves look different in their own movements? Right. Well, I think for former President Trump and for Nikki Haley, both of them have uh, abandoned uh, the sort of retail style politicking that we often see of candidates uh, in the lead up to the New Hampshire primary. Uh, neither of those candidates are holding town halls, which would allow for voters uh, to ask them questions about uh, anything that they want. Uh, particularly for Nikki Haley, we've seen her answer questions and uh, make some uh, headlines, uh, not necessarily positive ones for her campaign in recent weeks here. And so uh, you could think that uh, Nikki Haley and her campaign are trying uh, to uh, have their hand at some uh, bit of self-preservation there by avoiding some of those questions from uh, New Hampshire voters who are, are really high information voters there. Uh, while Ron DeSantis has been holding town halls here in the state of New Hampshire, he's also been uh, kind of splitting his time. Earlier this week, he did some events in South Carolina, an indication that he is uh, shifting his focus to the next primary state up. We know that he is trailing in single digits when you look at recent polling here in the state. Right, going right for Nikki Haley's home state. And so, Avery, I'm going to ask you a question. I asked this of Nikki Haley's surrogate, and I can't really get an answer from them. But essentially, my question is, what is the margin there for Nikki Haley? What does an actual win or second place victory really look like in terms of numbers, especially considering that she's betting big on New Hampshire and then has to go into her home state? I mean, does she want to go into her home state third or a very distant second? Right. I think it's unsurprising that you haven't been able to get an answer from the Haley campaign on that. Uh, they have avoided setting uh, specific expectations for themselves uh, so that they can claim that they have a strong finish. That's uh, what we heard Nikki Haley say about uh, what she wants to do uh, in Iowa, uh, here in New Hampshire, uh, and in her home state of South Carolina. Here in New Hampshire, like I mentioned a little bit earlier, she is narrowing the gap uh, between herself and former President Trump. And I think that she's really going to be relying on independent voters here in the state to run up the score. Uh, independents can vote in New Hampshire's uh, open primary here. Uh, and she's hoping that gives her even more momentum as she heads back to her home state. But it's going to be an uphill battle. Former President Trump has establishment support, wide support among uh, South Carolina Republicans. And so we'll have to see what happens. Certainly, and we know that independent voters make up a large portion of that New Hampshire electorate. Uh, okay, let's talk a little bit about Ron DeSantis real quickly. We're hearing reports that a pro Ron DeSantis super PAC is actually cutting staff from its payroll, and that includes staffers in both Iowa and then Nevada, which of course comes after South Carolina. Uh, so what is the super PAC saying about these layoffs? 
Right, they are indicating that uh, this is sort of a, a natural fluctuation of staffing uh, after uh, an election. Uh, but I, I would caution that this is coming before most folks have voted. And so uh, that could indicate some uh, instability in the planning around uh, how they're going to, uh, you know, continue this campaign. But, uh, you know, right now we know that uh, Ron DeSantis is still in this race. And so uh, time will tell. Time will tell. Avery Harper, thank you so much for spending time with us in New Hampshire. We so appreciate it. And now let's bring our big story to our panel here. Joining us today is our ABC News contributor and Sirius XM radio host, Mike Muse, ABC News contributor and former Republican congressman for New York, John Katko, our Democratic strategist, Alencia Johnson, and ABC News contributor and op-ed columnist for the Los Angeles Times, LZ Granderson. So thank you all for being here with us. John, let's jump in here with you. Do you think that Trumpism is going to win there in New Hampshire? I thought it was really interesting that Avery Harper said his campaign might start to make the argument, look, it's time for Republicans to rally around me. Well, it's a very different state than uh, than Iowa, for sure. So this is going to be a real test for everybody. And I think one thing that we uh, people are discounting is, you know, a very conservative state like Iowa, only half the people voted for Trump, an incumbent. So there is still some concern out there. And I think now that the field is winnowed, I think Haley's making the argument that she caught, she caught fire a little bit in Iowa, and if she does really well in New Hampshire, uh, her argument is, if you look at the polls, I not only win, I win big enough to take the House and Senate and local races with me, and that's not what Trump has got. So that argument was going to be put to the test here, and if, it, and if people respond to it, I think she may be onto something, but no, make no mistake about it, this is a very important state for her. I think DeSantis is kind of conceding it to some extent, and I don't know where he goes from here, but... It really is kind of shaping out to be a two-person race if she does strong in New Hampshire. Yeah, and that's an important point about what she could do for people that are really engaged, as we know voters are in New Hampshire, if she makes that argument about a divided Congress, right? Uh, Alencia, let's go here right. to you. We heard Vice President Kamala Harris tell our own Mary Bruce that, look, Biden beat Trump once. He's going to do it again. Uh, <laughs> but is there a Republican outcome that the Biden-Harris you know, Harris campaign should be worried about? Listen, I wholeheartedly actually believe that the Biden-Harris team will beat Donald Trump again if he is the nominee. But I do think Nikki Haley would bring some kind of complication and that as we were just talking about how New Hampshire voters are a little bit different. There are some moderates and independents that do like a Nikki Haley. The problem, though, for Nikki Haley to capitalize on that momentum she would not be able to be Donald Trump's running mate. And that is the only way that the Republican Party could actually try to use her in order to get more people to vote for them in the general election. And so that is an interesting scenario. But again, with Donald Trump at the top of the ticket, it is actually an easier win for the Biden-Harris campaign, as long as they also continue to listen to the voters who have some very real concerns about the direction for a second term for President Biden should he get reelected. Yeah, those are all really interesting points. Uh, LZ, how about for you? Do you think that it's smart for Ron DeSantis to be looking as far as South Carolina after coming in second, again, with this huge margin behind Trump? And some people feel like he's kind of overlooking New Hampshire. Well, you know what's really interesting about the New Hampshire-Iowa conversation is that President Biden actually was awful in both of those. And he really didn't turn his campaign around until after New Hampshire. So I understand mm -hmm. our, you know, desire to want to try to characterize this election as being decided early on because of how Trump finished in Iowa. But, you know, recent history has shown that the American people are a lot more complicated than that. And I think it doesn't do any of us, a, 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 you know, any good to make the assumptions that Donald Trump has it wrapped up because of this early start that he's had. Yeah, you're right. Um, my producer, right. Lisa Rodriguez, pointed that out to me earlier today. She said it wasn't until South Carolina that Biden really became popular. And Mike, for you, what message does it send to these voters in New Hampshire uh, that DeSantis is, you know, essentially absent? I think it shows that DeSantis is playing strategy and being a political tactician, uh, recognizing mm -hmm. that New Hampshire does, isn't reflective of his demographic of a base that would typically come out and vote for him, where South Carolina is more of his demographic with the evangelical. It's more reflective of Iowa uh, than it is New Hampshire. And I think with Nikki Haley's position is that Nikki Haley has to win. At some point, you have to put a W up on the board, mm -hmm. and New Hampshire is most likely where her demographic is in terms of high information 
affirmation of voters, independents, moderates. And so she has to prove that she can win New Hampshire because when she goes to South Carolina, she came in third. Her campaign was, say, a distant second, tied statistically with Ron DeSantis. But South Carolina looks more like Iowa than it does New Hampshire, where President Trump has a commanding lead in South Carolina, which is her own state, uh, which is why DeSantis is going down there to keep her on her heels and a little of the gamesmanship that's happening there. But Nikki Haley has got to win in New Hampshire. Right, and imagine it's in the back of her mind, right, every day in New Hampshire that Ron DeSantis is going after her home state every day. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike, John, Alinzia, and LZ, our thanks mm -hmm. to you, and make sure you stay with us. Coming up here, the Supreme Court in the spotlight after it takes up a case on fishing that could, yes, reel in the power of the federal government agencies. We'll dive into that with our panel next. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Yay! Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. We can change the course of history. You will fight against oppression by any means necessary. Brothers and sisters, are you ready? We must be a little daring. This is our reality now. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. Me and everybody around me is concerned about that, highly concerned about that, because the margins are so tight right now. We don't mind taking observers. You know, we, we have for decades now. But to be told to pay for it just isn't right. On our spotlight, a Supreme Court fishing fee case today. Justice has heard arguments over a bid to further limit regulatory powers of federal agencies. At the center of this dispute are two fishing companies and a government-run program to monitor the overfishing of herring off New England's coast. So for decades, fishermen have been required to take federal inspectors on their boats when they go out on the water. But a rule in 2020 requires those fishermen to pay the salaries of those inspectors and bring aboard adding $700 a day. Now, although the government has since suspended this program, the fishermen, they're saying they don't need to pay the fees right now, but lawyers for the fishermen are asking justices to overturn this 1984 landmark ruling known as the Chevron Doctrine, which essentially directs courts to defer to federal agencies' interpretations of laws that are passed by Congress, so as long as it's reasonable. Now, in Chevron, the Supreme Court reasoned that agencies have specialized expertise and Congress Congress gave them the regulatory authority. Experts say that if the court reverses itself, it will transfer a lot of policymaking power from federal agencies and then give it to federal judges 
which then includes the Supreme Court. So I want to bring back our panel here. Mike Mee is John Katko, Alencia Johnson, and joining us is our ABC News legal contributor and law professor at the University of Baltimore, Kim Whaley. So thank you all for being here with us. Kim, let's start here with you. I mean, this is a lot to unpack, and I know you've been following this really closely. So how did this case, first of all, make its way to the Supreme Court? And ultimately, in the most simple terms, what is really at stake? So these cases are pretty routine. Um, basically, Congress creates agencies, anything that has the word Department of in its title or commission in its title, and it, gets, it gives them the power to make regulations. And that's been something that conservatives have had problems with for decades, the idea being we don't like regulations, so we'll make it harder for agencies to actually pass them. And so here we've got, as you indicated, a regulation relating not so much to having the monitor on the boats, but the temporary uh, requirement that these fishermen pay that uh, fee to have the monitors on the boats. So they challenged the agency saying, listen, this is outside the power that Congress gave you. And instead of kind of looking at that specific question of that day-to-day -day payment, the court went right into the bigger issue. That is, uh, should courts defer to agencies when they fill in the blanks left by Congress, or should courts decide? Should courts make policy instead of Congress. And of course, if the court reverses that case you mentioned, Chevron, Congress has only passed a handful of things this year. It's not doing a whole lot. So what's the end result? A lot of deregulation, and it's deregulation happening through unelected judges uh, versus having to deal with thorny elections and bureaucrats and things like that. Well, and in the meantime, we have real people and real jobs here at stake. Our Devin Dwyer did extensive reporting on this as well as you're seeing him a lot in this video. Uh, John, this case is, again, it's about federal power and regulation. But how much of a difference do you think that these government agencies should have, I mean, when it comes to fishing? Well, I mean, this may be kind of a wonky discussion, but as a professor pointed out, it, it's really important. Um, I, our founding fathers never could have conceived of the federal agencies that are this big and this powerful. And they make economic decisions that can have devastating impacts on economies. So yeah, it's about deregulation, but yeah, it's really about where is that line between legislating and, uh, and, and, and carrying out the laws that the legislatures promulgate. And that's really complicated in a big modern economy like ours. So they, there's gonna be pushback and ebb and flow, but make no mistake about it. This is a very important uh, case and if it ends up in making a landmark decision, it's going to have a profound effect on the way agencies interpret uh, rules going forward. So it's it's a very important case to watch. Well, and it's important because you, as you talk about that, they're how they interpret interpret the cases moving forward. And it's not just about fishing at that point. It's a lot of other things here at right. stake. So, Alencia, justices, right, are essentially being asked to curb the federal power for you know, all aspects of American life. What's your take? Well, I want to bring up the fact that we've found there have been a lot of research over the past few years about this Supreme Court and their ability to make decisions that are based on precedent or their political affiliation. And to be honest, majority of the American people don't trust that the Supreme Court will uphold precedents. We actually have seen that in the past couple of years of decisions around Roe v. Wade, around affirmative action. And so an activist Supreme Court taking up this case when two of the justices, Justice Clarence Thomas and Gorsuch, already told you how they feel about the precedent. Now, the other thing that I want to say is that conservatives often cite that the federal government has too much overreach when it comes to the economy, but they don't talk about the fact that these federal agencies are in place to protect our environment, to protect people, to protect the health, which is what it means to strengthen <coughs> these regulations. And I'm concerned that if this case uh, is decided by these conservative activists, unfortunately, it disempowers our government and it just boosts not only these judges, but corporations. And, and Mike, to you, I mean, what yeah. about the fishermen, though? I mean, you heard him out there saying, though, Mike, look, our margins are so thin. How could we be asked to pay for this? Yeah, I'm really enjoying this robust conversation, Kana, because this is one of those Supreme Court cases that actually surprisingly keeps me up at night. Totally understanding what you're alluding to with the fishermen. I think there should be a solve in terms of, you know, could the state pull the resources together in order for it to pay for the fees? Should the federal government you know, provide subsidies um, to offset the cost of having to pay these monitored salaries per year? But I actually enjoy the Chevron deference because for me, I think that it's part of the quote equal branches of government that allows the federal agencies in order to put 
these regulations into it, into effect, and then it allows the Supreme Court to look at it from like a legal perspective, but which is why they always do the Chevron deference to it. These issues that some of these agencies are coming up with, Kane, are, are very scientific. When you look at the Department of Energy, and we look at Environmental Protection Agency, that's science. A lot of the cases we've been seeing so far coming from the Supreme Court have to do with ideology, ideology rooted in race, religion, and identity. Some of this has come down to science, and I think that needs to be regulated to agencies who has career appoint, career civil service employees versus political appointees that study the science on a daily basis. Yeah, certainly. I, we will watch this very closely. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Mike, John, Alencia, and Kim, our thanks to all of you. Coming up here on our last call is Jason Kelsey hanging up his cleats. We have the latest news out of Philadelphia on the Eagles Center and his future. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Give it to me. Tonight, the GOP race heads to New Hampshire. As the frontrunner juggles court and his campaign, voters get set to make their voices heard. More Americans turn to the most watched newscast on television. World News Tonight with David Muir. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. From America's number one news source comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and it can customize to you and your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience what all the buzz is about. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Reporting from the war in Ukraine, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Any of you guys retire and have options to keep playing? I don't think you really know until you get out. It's getting harder and harder to stay healthy. I would like him to retire when he will still be able to get down on the floor and play with our kids comfortably. All right, it's time for our last call. And what you were just watching, there was a clip from Eagles Center Jason Kelsey's prime video documentary. It's called Kelsey. ESPN is now reporting that the 36-year-old told his teammates that he is retiring after 13 seasons. He said that in the locker room, allegedly after their Monday night playoff loss to the Tampa Bay Bucks. So Kelsey is seen as one of the best centers of his generation, making six all pro teams and winning a Super Bowl. Uh, but his popularity, I mean, it far exceeds that of the average offensive lineman, uh, part in thanks to his on the field prowess, but his affable demeanor, his outsized personality on his podcast that he has with his brother, Travis Kelsey, you might have heard of him, <laughs> the star tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, so I want to bring back our panel here, Mike, John, Alencia, and LZ. Uh, John, let's start here with you. He, he did kind of say on his podcast today, you know, it's like it's not an official announcement. And then if and when he does want to retire, he has a lot of people that he wants to thank and he wants to be respectful. I mean, this isn't a done deal just yet. He seems like a pretty cool dude. I just say this much for offensive linemen, they retire. 
get a good look at them. A year from now, they're about 100 pounds lighter because they're not on 7,000 calorie diets to say stay big, and they look great. So if he wants to prioritize his family, God bless him. I know, what an important message, right? LZ, let's talk about this really quickly because this is something that he mentions in his uh, documentary. He talks about CTE. He talks about the concern for his long-term health. And sometimes we've seen that that, you know, persuades an NFL player to retire a little earlier. A absolutely, you know, uh, you know, he's not even in the top 10 in terms of age, but however, right. given how long the Philadelphia Eagles go into the postseason, he's got the extra hits of players who perhaps maybe wrapped up in a regular season. So he's got more bruises to be thinking about than maybe some other players. But I will tell you this, I 